Book XXXAX. Marcus Emilius, the consul, having subdued the Ligurians, made a road from Placentia as far as Ariminum, and connected it with the Flaminian Way. The commencement of luxury, introduced by the Asiatic army, is related. All the Ligurians who dwell on the hither side of the Apennines were subdued. The Bacchanalia, a Grecian sacred ceremony, held at night, a hotbed of every vice, after having become a conspiracy including great numbers, were discovered by one of the consuls and suppressed, while many of those concerned were punished. Lucius Quinctius Flamininus, the brother of Titus, was expelled the Senate, by the censors Lucius Valerius Flaccus and Marcus Porcius Cato, who was most distinguished in the arts of war and peace, for the following reason, because when, as consul, he had held the province of Gaul, he slew with his own hand a certain Gaul, at the request of Philip, a Carthaginian, his noble minion. Or, as some have stated, because he had beheaded a condemned criminal at the request of a courtesan of Placentia, with whom he was desperately in love. The speech of Marcus Cato against him is still extant. Scipio died at Laternum. And, as if fortune destined for the same period the death of the two most distinguished men of the day, Hannibal committed suicide by taking poison, when he was on the point of being given up to the Romans by Prusias, king of Bithynia. To whom he had fled for refuge on the defeat of Antiochus, the Romans had sent Titus Quinctius Flamininus to demand Hannibal. Philippemon likewise, the general of the Achaeans, a most distinguished man, after having fallen into the hands of the Messenians in war, was put to death by poison. Colonies are planted at Potentia, Pisaurus, Medina, and Parma. This book contains in addition the success over the Celtiberians, and the commencement and cause of the Macedonian War. The origin of which proceeded from the following source, Philip was dissatisfied that his kingdom was being diminished by the Romans, and because he was compelled to withdraw his garrisons from Thrace and other places. 1. While these things are done at Rome, if they were truly transacted in this year, both the consuls were employed in the war with the Ligurians. This enemy seemed born for the purpose of preserving military discipline among the Romans, during the intervals between important wars, nor was any province better calculated to form a soldier to active valor. For Asia, from the enticing pleasures of its cities, the abundance of every production both of land and sea, the unwarlike temper of the enemy, and the wealth of its princes, made Roman armies rich, rather than brave. Under the command of Gnaeus Manlius, particularly, the troops were kept in a state of idleness and licentiousness. Therefore, in Thrace, a passage somewhat more difficult, and a more vigorous enemy, checked them with severe loss. Whereas in Liguria there was every circumstance that could invigorate the courage of soldiers. The country mountainous and rugged, so that even the taking possession of unoccupied posts, and much more the dislodging of an enemy from those already in possession, was attended with much labor, the roads hilly, narrow, and exposed to ambuscades. The enemy light, active, and energetic in their motions, so as to allow no season or place to be quiet or secure, the necessary attack on the strong forts with much toil and danger. And the country so poor as to constrain the soldier to a sparing mode of living, while it afforded but a small share of booty. Accordingly, no sutler followed the army, no long train of baggage horses extended its line of march, nothing was to be seen but arms, and men having all their hopes in their arms. Nor was either subject or cause for hostilities with them ever wanting, because on account of their poverty at home they made frequent incursions on the territories of their neighbors, they did not. However, fight a battle which could decide the entire war. 2. The consul, Caius Flaminius, after several successful battles against the Phrynian Ligurians in their own country, received the submission of that tribe, and ordered them to deliver up their arms. As they did not give them up honorably, and were reproved for their behavior, who abandoned their villages, and fled to the mountain called Auginus, whither the consul immediately followed them. A part of the enemy again betook themselves to flight, and, running with precipitate haste, the greatest part without arms, over pathless tracts and rocky precipices, they escaped to places where an enemy could not follow them. Thus they got away beyond the Apennine, the rest, who remained in the camp, were surrounded and reduced by assault. The legions were then led over the Apennine. 
Then the enemy, assisted by the height of the mountain, which they had occupied at first, stood on their defense, but, in a little time, submitted. Their arms were then sought for with greater care and all taken from them. The war was then transferred to the Apuan tribe of Ligurians, who had made so many incursions into the territory of Pisa and Bononia, that it could not be cultivated. These being entirely subdued, the consul restored peace to the neighborhood. And, as he had effected the security of the province from the war, he made a road from Bononia to Anicium, that he might not keep the soldiers in a state of idleness. The other consul, Marcus Emilius, ravaged with fire and sword the lands of the Ligurians, together with their villages that stood in the plains, while the inhabitants remained posted on two mountains, Ballista and Suismantium. He then attacked those who were on the mountains, harassed them for some time in skirmishes, and, at last, compelled them to come to an engagement, and utterly defeated them in a regular battle, in which he vowed a temple to Diana. Having now reduced all on this side of the Apennine, he marched against those on the other side of that mountain. Among whom were the Brinian tribe, which had not been attacked by Flaminius, Emilius subdued them all, stripped them of their arms, and obliged the multitude to come down from the mountains into the plains. The Ligurians being brought to a state of peace, he led his army into the Gallic territory, and drew a road from Placentia to Ariminum, to meet that made by Flaminius. During the last engagement, when he fought a pitched battle with the Ligurians, he vowed a temple to Imperial Juno. Such were the transactions of this year in Liguria. 3. In Gaul, the praetor, Marcus Furius, seeking a pretext for war in the midst of peace, deprived the unoffending Kenomanians of their arms. The Kenomanians complained of this to the Senate at Rome, and were by them referred to the consul Emilius, whom the Senate authorized to examine into and determine the cause, after a warm contest with the praetor they gained their cause. The praetor was ordered to restore their arms to the Kenomanians, and quit the province. The Senate afterwards gave audience to envoys of the Latin Confederation, who had come, in great numbers, from all parts of Latium. On their complaint that a great multitude of their citizens had been removed to Rome, and had been assessed there in the survey, a commission was given to Quintus Terentius Cullio, the praetor, to make inquiry after such persons. And on the allies proving that those persons themselves, or their fathers, had been assessed in the surveys of their states in the censorship of Caius Claudius and Marcus Levius, or at some time subsequent to their censorship. He was ordered to compel all such to return to the several states wherein they had been so raided. In consequence of this inquiry, twelve thousand Latins returned home, as the multitude of foreigners even then burdened the city. 4. Before the consuls came home to Rome, Marcus Fulvius, the proconsul, returned from Aetolia. He, when he had as usual recited to the Senate, in the Temple of Apollo, the services which he had performed in Aetolia and Cephalenia, then requested of the fathers, that, in consideration of his having conducted the business of the public with good fortune and success, they would think proper to order public thanks to be offered to the immortal gods, and to decree a triumph to him. Marcus Abucius, a tribune of the commons, gave notice, that, if anything were determined on that subject before the arrival of Marcus Emilius, he would enter his protest, for the consul intended to oppose that measure. And, at his setting out for his province, had given him a charge to keep the discussion of it open until he should come home. That Fulvius would suffer a loss of nothing but time. For, notwithstanding the presence of the consul, the Senate would determine according to their own wishes. Fulvius replied, that, even if the quarrel subsisting between him and Marcus Emilius was unknown to the world, or with what overbearing, and, in some measure, tyrannical rancor, that man prosecuted his enmity. Yet it was insufferable, that the absence of the consul should both obstruct the worship of the immortal gods, and delay a triumph merited and due. That a commander, after performing signal services, and his victorious army with its booty and prisoners, should remain outside the gates, until a consul, who purposely delayed abroad, should be pleased to return to Rome. But, in the present case, when the animosity between him and the consul was most notorious, what fair dealing could any one expect from a man who procured clandestinely, in a thin house, and lodged in the treasury, a decree of the senate? 
that it did not appear that Embracia was taken by force a town which was attacked with mounds and engines. Where, after the works were burned, others were constructed anew, where a fight was carried on around the walls for fifteen days, both above and underground. Where, from the first dawn, when the soldiers mounted the walls, a battle, for a long time doubtful, lasted until night, and where more than three thousand of the enemy were killed. Then, again, what a malicious misrepresentation did he make to the pontiffs, of the temples of the immortal gods being plundered in a captured city. If it were allowable that Rome should be decorated with the ornaments of Syracuse, and other conquered places, then the laws of war must lose their force in the case of Ambracia alone, among conquered towns. For his part, he besought the conscript fathers, and requested the tribunes, not to suffer him to become a subject of derision to a most haughty enemy. 5. All around were in his favor. And some entreated the tribune to desist, while others sharply reproved his conduct. The speech of his colleague, Tiberius Gracchus, moved him most, that, for a man in office to prosecute even his own quarrels, was an example of no good tendency. But, that a tribune of the people should take upon himself to be a solicitor in the quarrel of another, was infamous, and highly unworthy of the power and sacred laws of the order to which he belonged. That men ought to love or hate others, approve or disapprove of measures, according to the dictates of their own judgment. But that a tribune ought not to depend on the look or nod of another man, veer about at the movements of another's will, and make himself a tool to his displeasure. Nor remember a private charge, committed to him by Marcus Emilius, and forget that the tribuneship was a public charge, entrusted to him by the Roman people, for the protection and liberty of private citizens. Not to aggrandize the arbitrary power of a consul. His colleague did not seem to consider that this circumstance would be committed to record and posterity, that, of two plebeian tribunes of the same college, one sacrificed his own resentment to the public good. The other prosecuted the resentment of another man which was merely entrusted to him. When the tribune, overcome by these severe rebukes, had withdrawn from the meeting, a triumph was voted to Marcus Fulvius, on the motion of Servius Sulpicius, the praetor. When he returned thanks to the conscript fathers, he then mentioned, that, on the day of his taking Embracia, he had vowed to celebrate the great games in honor of Jupiter the supremely good and great. That a contribution for that purpose had been made to him by the several states, amounting to one hundred and ten pounds weight of gold. And he requested them to order that sum to be set apart, out of the money which he was to deposit in the treasury, after being born in triumph. The senate ordered the college of pontiffs to be consulted, whether it were necessary that the whole of that sum should be expended on the games, when the pontiffs had answered, that it mattered little to religion what was the expense of the games. The Senate gave permission to Fulvius to expend as much as he thought proper, provided he did not exceed 80,000 sesterces. 282 He, at first, intended to celebrate his triumph in the month of January. But, hearing that the consul Emilius, in consequence of a letter from the tribune Abutius, concerning his waiving his protest, was coming in person to Rome, to hinder his triumph, but had been obliged, by sickness to halt on the road. He hastened the time of the celebration, lest he should have more contests about it than he had met in the war. He triumphed over the Aetolians and Cephalenia on the tenth day before the Calends of January. There were carried before his chariot, golden crowns to the amount of 112 pounds weight, of silver, 83,000 pounds. Of gold, 243,000, of Attic tetradrachms, 118,000, 283 of the coin called Philippians, 12,422, 284 brazen statues, 285. Marble statues, 230, arms, weapons, and other spoils in great quantities, besides these, catapultas, ballistas, and engines of every kind. And in the procession were led twenty-seven commanders, either Aetolian and Cephalenian, or belonging to King Antiochus, and left with them. Before he rode into the city, in the Flaminian Circus, he presented great numbers of tribunes, prefects, horsemen, centurions, both Romans and allies, with military gifts. To each of the soldiers he distributed out of the booty twenty-five denariuses, two eighty-five double to a centurion, triple to a horseman. 6. 
the time of the election of consuls now approached. And as Marcus Emilius, to whose lot that business had fallen, could not attend, Caius Flaminius came home to Rome. Spurius Postumius Albinus and Quintus Marcus Philippus were elected consuls by him. Then were chosen as praetors, Titus Manius, Publius Cornelius Sulla, Caius Calpurnius Piso, Marcus Licinius Lucullus, Caius Aurelius Scorus, and Lucius Quintius Crispinus. At the close of the year, after the magistrates were appointed, on the third day before the Nones of March, Gnaeus Manlius Volso triumphed over the Gauls inhabiting Asia. The reason of his deferring his triumph so long was, to avoid standing a trial under the Petilian law, during the praetorship of Quintus Terentius Cullio. And the being involved in the ill consequences of the sentence passed on another, that by which Lucius Scipio was condemned. Especially as the judges would be more disposed to severity against him than against Scipio, for this reason, because fame had reported, that he, Scipio's successor, had, by tolerating every description of licentiousness, ruined military discipline. So strictly preserved by his predecessor. Nor were the facts which were reported to have happened in the province far from the eyes of spectators, the only things that disgraced his character, but still more so, those circumstances which were every day beheld in his soldiers. For by this army returning from Asia was the origin of foreign luxury imported into the city. These men first brought to Rome gilded couches, rich tapestry, with hangings and other works of the loom. And, what were then deemed magnificent furniture, single-footed tables and buffets. At entertainments, likewise, were introduced female players on the harp and timbrel, with buffoons for the diversion of the guests. Their meats also began to be prepared with greater care and cost. While the cook, whom the ancients considered as the meanest of their slaves both in estimation and use, became highly valuable, and what was considered as a servile office began to be considered an art. Nevertheless, those introductions which were then looked on as remarkable were scarcely even the seeds of the future luxury. 7. Gnaeus Manlius carried in the triumph two hundred golden crowns of twelve pounds weight. Two hundred and twenty thousand pounds weight of silver, two thousand two hundred and three of gold, one hundred and twenty seven thousand Attic tetradrachms, two eighty six two hundred and fifty thousand Sistophrases. 287 16,320 golden Philippians, 288 together with abundance of Gallic arms and spoils in chariots. 52 generals of the enemy were led before his car. He distributed to each of his soldiers 42 denariuses, 289 and double that sum to a centurion, to the foot soldiers double pay, to the horsemen triple. Great numbers of all ranks, whom he had distinguished by gifts, accompanied him. The verses thrown out by the soldiers were of such a kind, that it was quite evident that they were sung to a commander who had been indulgent to them, and courted their affections. It was indeed evident that the triumph was celebrated with a greater degree of favour by the troops, than by the citizens. The friends of Manlius, however, were able to acquire for him the regard of the people also. Through whose efforts a decree of the senate was passed, ordering, that, such part of the soldiers' pay, contributed to the public funds by the people, as was not yet repaid, should be discharged out of that which had been carried in the procession to the treasury. Accordingly the city praetors, with care and fidelity, paid twenty-five denariuses and a half two ninety instead of each thousand asses. Two ninety-one about this time two military tribunes arrived from the two Spains with letters from Caius Atinius and Lucius Manlius, who governed those provinces. From these letters it appeared, that the Celtiberians and Lusitanians were in arms, and ravaging the territories of the Allies, the Senate, however, deferred all consideration of that business until the new magistrates should come into office. This year, during the celebration of the Roman games which Publius Cornelius Cethegus and Aulus Postumius Albinus exhibited, a pole in the circus, being loosely set in the ground, fell on the statue of Pollentia, and threw it down. The Senate moved by such a religious circumstance, voted that one day should be added to the celebration of the games, that two statues should be set up instead of the one, and that one of them, a new statue, should be gilded. The plebeian games were likewise repeated for one day, by the aediles Caius Sempronius Blasus and Marcus Furius Luscus. 8. 
The following year diverted Spurius Postumius Albinus and Quintus Martius Philippus, from the care of armies, and wars, and provinces, to the punishing of an intestine conspiracy. The praetors cast lots for their provinces, Titus Manius obtained the city jurisdiction, Marcus Licinius Lucullus, that between citizens and foreigners, Caius Aurelius Scorus, Sardinia, Publius Cornelius Sulla, Sicily. Lucius Quintius Crispinus, hither Spain, Caius Calpurnius Piso, farther Spain. The making inquisition concerning clandestine meetings was decreed to both the consuls. A Greek of mean condition came, first, into Etruria, not with one of the many trades which his nation, of all others the most skillful in the cultivation of the mind and body, has introduced among us, but a low operator in sacrifices. And a soothsayer. Nor was he one who, by open religious rites, and by publicly professing his calling and teaching, imbued the minds of his followers with terror, but a priest of secret and nocturnal rites. These mysterious rites were, at first, imparted to a few, but afterwards communicated to great numbers, both men and women. To their religious performances were added the pleasures of wine and feasting, to allure a greater number of proselytes. When wine, lascivious discourse, night, and the intercourse of the sexes had extinguished every sentiment of modesty, then debaucheries of every kind began to be practiced. As every person found at hand that sort of enjoyment to which he was disposed by the passion predominant in his nature. Nor were they confined to one species of vice, the promiscuous intercourse of free-born men and women, but from this storehouse of villainy proceeded false witnesses, counterfeit seals, false evidences, and pretended discoveries. From the same place, too, proceeded poison and secret murders, so that in some cases, even the bodies could not be found for burial. Many of their audacious deeds were brought about by treachery, but most of them by force. It served to conceal the violence, that, on account of the loud shouting, and the noise of drums and cymbals, none of the cries uttered by the persons suffering violation or murder could be heard abroad. 9. The infection of this mischief, like that from the contagion of disease, spread from Etruria to Rome, where, the size of the city affording greater room for such evils, and more means of concealment, cloaked it at first. But information of it was at length brought to the consul, Postumius, principally in the following manner. Publius Abucius, whose father had held equestrian rank in the army, was left an orphan, and his guardians dying, he was educated under the eye of his mother Duronia, and his stepfather Titus Sempronius Rutilus. Duronia was entirely devoted to her husband. And Sempronius, having managed the guardianship in such a manner that he could not give an account of the property, wished that his ward should be either made away with, or bound to compliance with his will by some strong tie. The Bacchanalian rites were the only way to effect the ruin of the youth. His mother told him, that, during his sickness, she had made a vow for him, that if he should recover, she would initiate him among the Bacchanalians. That being, through the kindness of the gods, bound by this vow, she wished now to fulfill it. That it was necessary he should preserve chastity for ten days, and on the tenth, after he should have supped and washed himself, she would conduct him into the place of worship. There was a freedwoman called Hispala Ficenia, a noted courtesan, but deserving of a better lot than the mode of life to which she had been accustomed when very young, and a slave, and by which she had maintained herself since her manumission. As they lived in the same neighborhood, an intimacy subsisted between her and Abucius, which was far from being injurious either to the young man's character or property, for he had been loved and wooed by her unsolicited. And as his friend supplied his wants illiberally, he was supported by the generosity of this woman. Nay, to such a length did she go under the influence of her affection, that, on the death of her patron, because she was under the protection of no one, having petitioned the tribunes and praetors for a guardian, when she was making her will. She constituted Abucius her sole heir. 10. As such pledges of mutual love subsisted, and as neither kept anything secret from the other, the young man, jokingly bid her not be surprised if he separated himself from her for a few nights. As, on account of a religious duty, to a vow made for his health, he intended to be initiated among the Bacchanalians. On hearing this, the woman, greatly alarmed, cried out, May the gods will more favorably. 
affirming that, it would be better, both for him and her, to lose their lives than that he should do such a thing, she then imprecated curses, vengeance, and destruction, on the head of those who advised him to such a step. The young man, surprised both at her expressions and at the violence of her alarm, bid her refrain from curses, for it was his mother who ordered him to do so, with the approbation of his stepfather. Then, said she, your stepfather, for perhaps it is not allowable to censure your mother, is in haste to destroy, by that act, your chastity, your character, your hopes, and your life. To him, now surprised by such language, and inquiring what was the matter, she said, after imploring the favor and pardon of the gods and goddesses, if, compelled by her regard for him, she disclosed what ought not to be revealed. That, when in service, she had gone into that place of worship, as an attendant on her mistress. But that, since she had obtained her liberty, she had never once gone near it, that she knew it to be the receptacle of all kinds of debaucheries, that it was well known that, for two years past, no one older than twenty had been initiated there. When any person was introduced he was delivered as a victim to the priests, who led him away to a place resounding with shouts, the sound of music, and the beating of cymbals and drums, lest his cries, while suffering violation, should be heard abroad. She then entreated and besought him to put an end to that matter in some way or other, and not to plunge himself into a situation, where he must first, suffer, and afterwards commit, everything that was abominable. Nor did she quit him until the young man gave her his promise to keep himself clear of those rights. 11. When he came home, and his mother made mention of such things pertaining to the ceremony as were to be performed on this day, and on the several following days, he told her that he would not perform any of them. Nor did he intend to be initiated. His stepfather was present at this discourse. Immediately the woman observed, that he could not deprive himself of the company of Hispala for ten nights. That he was so fascinated by the caresses and baneful influence of that serpent, that he retained no respect for his mother or stepfather, or even the gods themselves. His mother on one side and his stepfather on the other loading him with reproaches, drove him out of the house, assisted by four slaves. The youth on this repaired to his aunt Abusha, told her the reason of his being turned out by his mother, and the next day, by her advice, gave information of the affair to the consul Postumius, without any witnesses of the interview. The consul dismissed him, with an order to come again on the third day following. In the meantime, he inquired of his mother-in-law Sulpicia, a woman of respectable character, whether she knew an old matron called Abusha, who lived on the Aventine Hill. When she had answered that, she knew her well, and that Abusha was a woman of virtue, and of the ancient purity of morals, he said that he required a conference with her, and that a messenger should be sent for her to come. Abusha, on receiving the message, came to Sulpicia's house, and the consul, soon after, coming in, as if by accident, introduced a conversation about Abusius, her brother's son. The tears of the woman burst forth, and she began to lament the unhappy lot of the youth, who, after being robbed of his property by persons whom it least of all became, was then residing with her, being driven out of doors by his mother, because. Being a good youth, may the gods be propitious to him, he refused to be initiated in ceremonies devoted to lewdness, as report goes. 12. The consul, thinking that he had made sufficient inquiries concerning Abusius, and that his testimony was unquestionable, having dismissed Abusia, requested his mother-in-law to send again to the Aventine, and bring from that quarter Hispala. A freed woman, not unknown in that neighborhood. For there were some queries which he wished to make of her. Hispala being alarmed because she was sent for by a woman of such high rank and respectable character, and being ignorant of the cause, after that she saw the lictors in the porch, the multitude attending on the consul and the consul himself, was very near fainting. The consul led her into a retired part of the house, and, in the presence of his mother-in-law, told her, that, she need not be uneasy, if she could resolve to speak the truth. She might receive a promise of protection either from Sulpicia, a matron of such dignified character, or from himself. That she ought to tell him, what was accustomed to be done at the Bacchanalia, in the nocturnal orgies in the Grove of Stimula. When the woman heard this, such terror and trembling of all her limbs seized her, that for a long time she was unable to speak. 
But recovering, at length she said, that, when she was very young, and a slave, she had been initiated, together with her mistress, but for several years past, since she had obtained her liberty, she knew nothing of what was done there. The consul commended her so far, as not having denied that she was initiated, but charged her to explain all the rest with the same sincerity. And told her, affirming that she knew nothing further, that, there would not be the same tenderness or pardon extended to her, if she should be convicted by another person, and one who had made a voluntary confession. That there was such a person, who had heard the whole from her, and had given him a full account of it. 13. The woman, now thinking without a doubt that it must certainly be Abutius who had discovered the secret, threw herself at Sulpicius' feet, and at first began to beseech her. Not to let the private conversation of a freedwoman with her lover be turned not only into a serious business, but even capital charge. Declaring that, she had spoken of such things merely to frighten him, and not because she knew anything of the kind. On this Postumius, growing angry, said, she seemed to imagine that then too she was wrangling with her gallant Abutius, and not that she was speaking in the house of a most respectable matron, and to a consul. Sulpicia raised her, terrified, from the ground, and while she encouraged her to speak out, at the same time pacified her son-in-law's anger. At length she took courage, and, having censured severely the perfidy of Abutius, because he had made such a return for the extraordinary kindness shown to him in that very instance, she declared that she stood in great dread of the gods, whose secret mysteries she was to divulge, and in much greater dread of the men implicated, who would tear her asunder with their hands if she became an informer. Therefore, she entreated this favor of Sulpicia, and likewise of the consul, that they would send her away to some place out of Italy, where she might pass the remainder of her life in safety. The consul desired her to be of good spirits, and said that it should be his care that she might live securely in Rome. Hispala then gave a full account of the origin of the mysteries. At first, she said, those rites were performed by women. No man used to be admitted. They had three stated days in the year on which persons were initiated among the Bacchanalians, in the daytime. The matrons used to be appointed priestesses, in rotation. Pecula Minia, a Campanian, when priestess, made an alteration in every particular, as if by the direction of the gods. For she first introduced men, who were her own sons, Minutius and Herenius, both surnamed Serenius. Changed the time of celebration, from day to night, and, instead of three days in the year, appointed five days of initiation, in each month. From the time that the rites were thus made common, and men were intermixed with women, and the licentious freedom of the night was added, there was nothing wicked, nothing flagitious, that had not been practiced among them. There were more frequent pollution of men, with each other, than with women. If any were less patient in submitting to dishonor, or more averse to the commission of vice, they were sacrificed as victims. To think nothing unlawful, was the grand maxim of their religion. The men, as if bereft of reason, uttered predictions, with frantic contortions of their bodies. The women, in the habit of bacantes, with their hair disheveled, and carrying blazing torches, ran down to the Tiber. Where, dipping their torches in the water, they drew them up again with the flame unextinguished, being composed of native sulfur and charcoal. They said that those men were carried off by the gods, whom the machines laid hold of and dragged from their view into secret caves. These were such as refused to take the oath of the society, or to associate in their crimes, or to submit to defilement. Their number was exceedingly great now, almost a second state in themselves, and among them were many men and women of noble families. During the last two years it had been a rule, that no person above the age of twenty should be initiated. For they sought for people of such age as made them more liable to suffer deception and personal abuse. 14. When she had completed her information, she again fell at the consul's knees, and repeated the same entreaties, that he might send her out of the country. The consul requests his mother-in-law to clear some part of the house, into which Hispala might remove. Accordingly, an apartment was assigned her in the upper part of it, of which the stairs, opening into the street, were stopped up, and the entrance made from the inner court. Thither all Ficenia's effects were immediately removed, and her domestics sent for. 
Abutius, also, was ordered to remove to the house of one of the consul's clients. When both the informers were by these means in his power, Postumius represented the affair to the Senate, laying before them the whole circumstance, in due order. The information given to him at first, and the discoveries gained by his inquiries afterwards. Great consternation seized on the senators. Not only on the public account, lest such conspiracies and nightly meetings might be productive of secret treachery and mischief, but, likewise, on account of their own particular families. Lest some of their relations might be involved in this infamous affair. The Senate voted, however, that thanks should be given to the consul because he had investigated the matter with singular diligence, and without exciting any alarm. They then commit to the consuls the holding an inquiry, out of the common course, concerning the bacchanals and their nocturnal orgies. They order them to take care that the informers, Abutius and Ficenia, might suffer no injury on that account. And to invite other informers in the matter, by offering rewards. They ordered that the officials in those rites, whether men or women, should be sought for, not only at Rome, but also throughout all the market towns and places of assembly, and be delivered over to the power of the consuls. And also that proclamation should be made in the city of Rome, and published through all Italy, that no persons initiated in the Bacchanalian rites should presume to come together or assemble on account of those rites. Or to perform any such kind of worship. And above all, that search should be made for those who had assembled or conspired for personal abuse, or for any other flagitious practices. The Senate passed these decrees. The consuls directed the curule ediles to make strict inquiry after all the priests of those mysteries, and to keep such as they could apprehend in custody until their trial. They at the same time charged the plebeian ediles to take care that no religious ceremonies should be performed in private. To the capital triumvirs the task was assigned to post watches in proper places of the city, and to use vigilance in preventing any meetings by night. In order likewise to guard against fires, five assistants were joined to the triumvirs, so that each might have the charge of the buildings in his own separate district, on this side the Tiber. 15. After dispatching these officers to their several employments, the consuls mounted the rostrum. And, having summoned an assembly of the people, one of the consuls, when he had finished the solemn form of prayer which the magistrates are accustomed to pronounce before they address the people, proceeded thus, Romans. To no former assembly was this solemn supplication to the gods more suitable or even more necessary, as it serves to remind you, that these are the deities whom your forefathers pointed out as the objects of your worship, veneration, and prayers, and not those which infatuated men's minds with corrupt and foreign modes of religion, and drove them, as if goaded by the furies, to every lust and every vice. I am at a loss to know what I should conceal, or how far I ought to speak out, for I dread lest, if I leave you ignorant of any particular, I should give room for carelessness, or if I disclose the whole, that I should too much awaken your fears. Whatever I shall say, be assured that it is less than the magnitude and atrociousness of the affair would justify, exertions will be used by us that it may be sufficient to set us properly on our guard. That the Bacchanalian rites have subsisted for some time past in every country in Italy, and are at present performed in many parts of this city also, I am sure you must have been informed, not only by report but by the nightly noises and horrid yells that resound through the whole city. But still you are ignorant of the nature of that business. Part of you think it is some kind of worship of the gods, others, some excusable sport and amusement, and that, whatever it may be, it concerns but a few. As regards the number, if I tell you that they are many thousands, that you would be immediately terrified to excess is a necessary consequence, unless I further acquaint you who and what sort of persons they are. First, then, a great part of them are women, and this was the source of the evil, the rest are males, but nearly resembling women, actors and pathics in the vilest lewdness. Night revelers, driven frantic by wine, noise of instruments, and clamors. The conspiracy, as yet, has no strength, but it has abundant means of acquiring strength, for they are becoming more numerous every day. Your ancestors would not allow that you should ever assemble casually, without some good reason, that is, either when the standard was erected on the geniculum, and the army led out on occasion of elections. 
or when the tribunes proclaimed a meeting of the commons, or some of the magistrates summoned you to it. And they judged it necessary, that wherever a multitude was, there should be a lawful governor of that multitude present. Of what kind do you suppose are the meetings of these people? In the first place, held in the night, and in the next, composed promiscuously of men and women. If you knew at what ages the males are initiated, you would feel not only pity but also shame for them. Romans, can you think youths initiated, under such oaths as theirs, are fit to be made soldiers? That arms should be entrusted with wretches brought out of that temple of obscenity? Shall these, contaminated with their own foul debaucheries and those of others, be champions for the chastity of your wives and children? 16. But the mischief were less, if they were only effeminate by their practices, of that the disgrace would chiefly affect themselves, if they refrained their hands from outrage, and their thoughts from fraud. But never was there in the state an evil of so great magnitude, or one that extended to so many persons or so many acts of wickedness. Whatever deeds of villainy have, during late years, been committed through lust, whatever, through fraud. Whatever, through violence, they have all, be assured, proceeded from that association alone. They have not yet perpetrated all the crimes for which they combined. The impious assembly at present confines itself to outrages on private citizens. Because it has not yet acquired force sufficient to crush the commonwealth, but the evil increases and spreads daily, it is already too great for the private ranks of life to contain it, and aims us views at the body of the state. Unless you take timely precautions, Romans, their nightly assembly may become as large as this, held in open day, and legally summoned by a consul. Now they one by one dread you collected together in the assembly. Presently, when you shall have separated and retired to your several dwellings, in town and country, they will again come together, and will hold a consultation on the means of their own safety, and, at the same time, of your destruction. Thus united, they will cause terror to every one of you. Each of you, therefore, ought to pray that his kindred may have behaved with wisdom and prudence. And if lust, if madness, has dragged any of them into that abyss, to consider such a person as the relation of those with whom he has conspired for every disgraceful and reckless act, and not as one of your own. I am not secure, lest some, even of yourselves, may have erred through mistake, for nothing is more deceptive in appearance than false religion. When the authority of the gods is held out as a pretext to cover vice, fear enters our minds, lest, in punishing the crimes of men, we may violate some divine right connected therewith. Numberless decisions of the pontiffs, decrees of the senate, and even answers of the aruspices, free you from religious scruples of this character. How often in the ages of our fathers was it given in charge to the magistrates, to prohibit the performance of any foreign religious rites, to banish strolling sacrificers and soothsayers from the forum, the circus, and the city. To search for, and burn, books of divination, and to abolish every mode of sacrificing that was not conformable to the Roman practice. For they, completely versed in every divine and human law, maintained, that nothing tended so strongly to the subversion of religion as sacrifice, when we offered it not after the institutions of our forefathers, but after foreign customs. Thus much I thought necessary to mention to you beforehand, that no vain scruple might disturb your minds when you should see us demolishing the places resorted to by the Bacchanalians, and dispersing their impious assemblies. We shall do all these things with the favor and approbation of the gods. Who, because they were indignant that their divinity was dishonored by those people's lusts and crimes, have drawn forth their proceedings from hidden darkness into the open light. And who have directed them to be exposed, not that they may escape with impunity, but in order that they may be punished and suppressed. The Senate have committed to me and my colleague, an inquisition extraordinary concerning that affair. What is requisite to be done by ourselves, in person, we will do with energy. The charge of posting watches through the city, during the night, we have committed to the inferior magistrates. And, for your parts, it is incumbent on you to execute vigorously whatever duties are assigned you, and in the several places where each will be placed, to perform whatever orders you shall receive. And to use your best endeavors that no danger or tumult may arise from the treachery of the party involved in the guilt. 17. 
They then ordered the decrees of the Senate to be read, and published a reward for any discoverer who should bring any of the guilty before them, or give information against any of the absent, adding, that, if any person accused should fly. They would limit a certain day upon which, if he did not answer when summoned, he would be condemned in his absence. And if any one should be charged who was out of Italy, they would allow him a longer time, if he should wish to come and make his defense. They then issued an edict, that no person whatever should presume to buy or sell anything for the purpose of leaving the country, or to receive or conceal, or by any means aid the fugitives. On the assembly being dismissed, great terror spread throughout the city. Nor was it confined merely within the walls, or to the Roman territory, for everywhere throughout the whole of Italy alarm began to be felt, when the letters from the guest friends were received, concerning the decree of the Senate. And what passed in the assembly, and the edict of the consuls. During the night, which succeeded the day in which the affair was made public, great numbers, attempting to fly, were seized, and brought back by the triumvirs, who had posted guards at all the gates. And informations were lodged against many, some of whom, both men and women, put themselves to death. Above seven thousand men and women are said to have taken the oath of the association. But it appeared that the heads of the conspiracy were the two Catinii, Marcus and Caius, Roman plebeians, Lucius Apaternius, a Felician, and Minius Serenius, a Campanian, that from these proceeded all their criminal practices, and that these, were the chief priests and founders of the sect. Care was taken that they should be apprehended as soon as possible. They were brought before the consuls, and, confessing their guilt, caused no delay to the ends of justice. 18. But so great were the numbers that fled from the city, that because the lawsuits and property of many persons were going to ruin, the praetors, Titus Manius and Marcus Licinius, were obliged, under the direction of the Senate, to adjourn their courts for thirty days, until the inquiries should be finished by the consuls. The same deserted state of the law courts, since the persons, against whom charges were brought, did not appear to answer, nor could be found in Rome necessitated the consuls to make a circuit of the country towns, and there to make their inquisitions and hold the trials. Those who, as it appeared, had been only initiated, and had made after the priest, and in the most solemn form, the prescribed imprecations, in which the accursed conspiracy for the perpetration of every crime and lust was contained, but who had not themselves committed, or compelled others to commit, any of those acts to which they were bound by the oath, all such they left in prison. But those who had forcibly committed personal defilements or murders, or were stained with the guilt of false evidence, counterfeit seals, forged wills, or other frauds, all these they punished with death. A greater number were executed than thrown into prison, indeed, the multitude of men and women who suffered in both ways, was very considerable. The consuls delivered the women, who were condemned, to their relations, or to those under whose guardianship they were, that they might inflict the punishment in private. But if there did not appear any proper person of the kind to execute the sentence, the punishment was inflicted in public. A charge was then given to demolish all the places where the Bacchanalians had held their meetings. First, in Rome, and then throughout all Italy, excepting those wherein should be found some ancient altar, or consecrated statue. With regard to the future, the Senate passed a decree, that no Bacchanalian rites should be celebrated in Rome or in Italy and ordering that, in case any person should believe some such kind of worship incumbent on him, and necessary. And that he could not, without offence to religion, and incurring guilt, omit it, he should represent this to the city praetor, and the praetor should lay the business before the Senate. If permission were granted by the Senate, when not less than one hundred members were present, then he might perform those rites, provided that no more than five persons should be present at the sacrifice. And that they should have no common stock of money, nor any president of the ceremonies, nor priest. 19. Another decree connected with this was then made, on a motion of the consul, Quintus Martius, that, the business respecting the persons who had served the consuls as informers should be proposed to the Senate in its original form. When Spurius Postumius should have finished his inquiries, and returned to Rome. They voted that Minius Serenius, the Campanian, should be sent to Ardia, to be kept in custody there. 
and that a caution should be given to the magistrates of that city, to guard him with more than ordinary care, so as to prevent not only his escaping, but his having an opportunity of committing suicide. Spurius Postumius some time after came to Rome, and on his proposing the question, concerning the reward to be given to Publius Abucius and Hispala Ficenia, because the Bacchanalian ceremonies were discovered by their exertions. The Senate passed a vote, that, the city questors should give to each of them, out of the public treasury, one hundred thousand asses. 292 And that the consuls should desire the plebeian tribunes to propose to the commons as soon as convenient, that the campaigns of Publius Abucius should be considered as served, that he should not become a soldier against his wishes. Nor should any censor assign him a horse 293 at the public charge. They voted also, that Hispala Ficenia should enjoy the privileges of alienating her property by gift or deed, of marrying out of her rank, and of choosing a guardian, as if a husband had conferred them by will. That she should be at liberty to wed a man of honorable birth, and that there should be no disgrace or ignominy to him who should marry her. And that the consuls and praetors then in office, and their successors, should take care that no injury should be offered to that woman, and that she might live in safety. That the Senate wished, and thought proper, that all these things should be so ordered. All these particulars were proposed to the commons, and executed, according to the vote of the Senate. And full permission was given to the consuls to determine respecting the impunity and rewards of the other informers. 20. Quintus Martius, having completed the inquiries in his district, prepared at length to proceed into the province of Liguria, for the service of which he received a supply of three thousand Roman foot and one hundred and fifty horse with five thousand Latin foot and two hundred horse. The same province, and the same numbers of horse and foot, had been voted to his colleague, and they received the armies which, during the preceding year, the consuls, Caius Flaminius and Marcus Emilius, had commanded. They were also ordered, by a decree of the Senate, to raise two new legions, and they demanded from the allies and Latins twenty thousand foot and one thousand three hundred horse. Besides, they levied three thousand Roman foot and two hundred horse. It was resolved that all this army, except the legions, should be led to reinforce the army in Spain. The consuls, therefore, while they themselves were engaged in the inquisitions, appointed Titus Manius to hold the levy. When the trials were finished, Quintus Martius first marched against the Apuan Ligurians. While he pursued these into very remote fastnesses, which had always served them as lurking places and receptacles, he was surrounded in a disadvantageous position, a narrow defile which the enemy had previously seized. Here four thousand soldiers fell, and three standards of the second legion, with eleven ensigns of the Latin allies, were taken. Abundance of arms were likewise lost, which were thrown away by the men in every direction, because they impeded their flight through the woody paths. The Ligurians ceased to pursue, sooner than the Romans to fly. As soon as the consul had effected his escape out of the enemy's territories, he disbanded the troops, in the country of their friends, in order that the greatness of the loss sustained might not appear. But he could not obliterate all memorial of his misconduct, for the pass, from which the Ligurians put him to flight, has been called the Martian Pass. 21. A little before this intelligence from the war in Liguria was made public, a letter from Spain was read to them, which brought joy mingled with grief. Caius Atinius, who, two years before, had gone to that province in quality of praetor, fought in the territory of Asta a pitched battle with the Lusitanians. About six thousand of the enemy were killed, the rest routed, driven from the field, and their camp taken. He then led his legions to attack the town of Asta, which he took with little more trouble than he met at the camp. But, Having been wounded whilst he was approaching the walls too incautiously, he died in a few days from the effects of the wound. When the letter was read, acquainting them with the propraetor's death, the senate voted, that a courier should be sent to overtake the praetor, Caius Calpurnius, at the port of Luna, and inform him. That the senate thought proper that he should hasten his journey lest the province should be without a governor. The person who was sent reached Luna on the fourth day, but Calpurnius had set out some days before. In hither Spain, Lucius Manlius Asidinus, who had come into that province at the same time when Caius Atinius came into his, fought a battle with the Celtiberians. 
They quitted the field, the victory being undecided with the exception of this, that the Celtiberians removed their camp from that quarter on the following night, permission was thus afforded to the Romans to bury their dead, and collect the spoils. In a few days after, the Celtiberians, having gathered a large army, attacked the Romans, near the town of Caligures. Nothing is recorded respecting the cause that rendered them weaker after their numbers were increased, but they were defeated in the battle. Twelve thousand of their men were killed, more than two thousand taken, and the Roman army got possession of their camp, and had not a successor, by his arrival, checked the career of the conqueror. The Celtiberians would have been completely subdued. Both the new praetors drew off their armies into winter quarters. 22. During the time in which this intelligence was announced from Spain, the games called Torilia 294 were celebrated, during two days, on a religious account. Then Marcus Fulvius exhibited games, which he had vowed in the Aetolian War, and which lasted ten days. Many artists, out of respect to him, came from Greece on the occasion. And now, for the first time, the Romans had an opportunity of seeing contests of wrestlers, they were also presented with a hunt of lions and panthers, the games were celebrated with almost the variety and abundance of the present age. The nine-day solemnity succeeded, because showers of stones had fallen, for three days, in Picinum, and fires from heaven were said to have arisen in various places, and singed the clothes of many persons by slight flashes. By order of the pontiffs, a supplication, of one day's continuance, was added because the temple of Ops, in the capital, was struck by lightning. The consuls sacrificed victims of the larger kinds, and purified the city. At the same time, an account was brought from Umbria, of a hermaphrodite, twelve years old, being found there. The consuls wishing to get rid of the prodigy, as it was a fearful omen, ordered that it should be removed instantly out of the Roman territory, and put to death. During this year, a body of Transalpine Gauls came into Venetia, without committing depredation or hostility, and pitched on a spot for building a town, not far from that where Aquileia now stands. Ambassadors were sent from Rome, over the Alps, on this business, and to them an answer was given that, they had not emigrated by the authority of their state, nor did their countrymen know what they were doing in Italy. About this time Lucius Scipio celebrated games, which he said he had vowed during the war with Antiochus, they lasted ten days, and the money was contributed for the purpose by the kings and states of Asia. Valerius Antius asserts, that, after his condemnation, and the sale of his effects, he was sent as ambassador into Asia, to adjust disputes between the kings Antiochus and Eumenes. That there the money was contributed for him, and actors collected through Asia, and that after his embassy, the subject of those games, of which he had made no mention after the war, in which he asserted that they had been vowed, was at length introduced in the Senate House. 23. As the year was now drawing to a conclusion, Quintus Martius, then abroad, was soon to go out of office. Spurius Postumius, after having conducted the inquisitions with the utmost care and propriety, held the elections. Appius Claudius Pulcher and Marcus Sempronius Tadidinus were chosen consuls. Next day, Publius Cornelius Cethegus, Aulus Postumius Albinus, Caius Afranius Stelio, Caius Attilius Serenus Lucius Postumius Tempsinus, and Marcus Claudius Marcellus were elected praetors. Towards the close of the year, because the consul Spurius Postumius reported that in travelling along the coasts of Italy, for the purpose of holding the inquisitions, he had found two colonies deserted, Cypontum on the upper sea, and Buxentum on the lower. In pursuance of a decree of the Senate, Lucius Scribonius Libo, Marcus Tuchius, and Gnaeus Bibius Tamphilus, were appointed commissioners for conducting colonies thither, by Titus Manius, city praetor. The war with King Perseus and the Macedonians, which was impending, has not derived its origin from what most persons imagine, nor from Perseus himself. The preliminary steps were taken by Philip, and, if he had lived some time longer, he would himself have carried on that war. When the conditions of peace were imposed on him, when he was vanquished, one particular chagrined him more than all the rest. This was because the liberty of wreaking his vengeance on such of the Macedonians as had revolted from him in the course of the war, was taken from him by the Senate. 
Although, because Quintius had left that point undetermined, when Lai was adjusting the Articles of Pacification, he had not despaired of the possibility of obtaining it. Afterwards, on the defeat of Antiochus at Thermopylae, the armies being separated at the time when the consul Asilius carried on the siege of Heraclea, and Philip besieged Lamia, because he was ordered to retire from the walls of Lamia. As soon as Heraclea was taken, and the town was surrendered to the Romans, he was grievously offended with this circumstance. The consul, indeed, in some measure, soothed his resentment, for, when he was hastening to Naupactum, where the Aetolians had reassembled after their flight, he gave Philip permission to make war on Amenander and Athamania. And to annex to his dominions the cities which the Aetolians had taken from the Thessalians. Without much difficulty, he expelled Amenander from Athamania, and got possession of several cities. He also reduced under his dominion the city of Demetrius, a place of great strength, and convenient in every respect. With the whole of the Magnesian state. Afterwards, finding that several cities in Thrace, through an abuse of the liberty which they had lately acquired, and to which they had not been accustomed, were distracted by dissensions among their leading men, he, by uniting himself to the parties that were worsted in their disputes with their countrymen, made himself master of them all. 24. By these means the king's wrath against the Romans was appeased for the present. But he never abandoned the project of collecting such a force during peace, as would enable him to maintain a war, whenever the fortunate occasion should be offered. He augmented the revenues of his kingdom, not only out of the produce of the lands and the port duties, but also he worked the mines, both the old ones which had been neglected, and new ones which he opened in many places. Then, in order to restore the former degree of population, which had been diminished by the calamities of war, he not only caused an increase in the offspring of that generation, by compelling everyone to marry and rear children. But he transplanted a great multitude of Thracians into Macedonia, and, during a long suspension of arms, he employed the utmost assiduity in augmenting, by every possible means, the strength of his kingdom. Causes afterward occurred, which served to revive his animosity against the Romans. Complaints made by the Thessalians and Peribibians, of his holding possession of their towns, and, by ambassadors from King Eumenes, of his having forcibly seized the cities of Thrace, and transplanted great numbers of their people into Macedonia, had been received in such a manner as plainly evinced that they were not thought unworthy of attention. What made the greatest impression on the Senate, was, their having been informed, that Philip aimed at the possession of Enus and Moronia, as to the Thessalians, they regarded them less. Ambassadors came, likewise, from the Athamanians, complaining not of the loss of a part of their territory, nor of encroachment on their frontier, but that all Athamania had been brought under the dominion and jurisdiction of the king. Exiles from Moronia also appeared, who had been expelled by the king's troops, for having supported the cause of liberty, who reported, that not only Moronia, but Enus too, was held in subjection by him. Ambassadors came from Philip to defend his conduct, who asserted, that, nothing bad been done without permission from the Roman commanders. That, the states of the Thessalians, Peribibians, and Magnesians, and the nation of the Athamanians, with Amenander, had all been engaged in the same cause with the Aetolians. That after the expulsion of King Antiochus, the consul, being himself busy in reducing the towns of Aetolia, had named Philip to subdue those states, and they remained subject to him in consequence of their being conquered by his arms. The Senate, too, that they might not make any decision concerning the king in his absence, sent Quintus Cassilius Metellus, Marcus Bibius Tamphilus, and Tiberius Sempronius, ambassadors to adjust those disputes. Previous to their arrival, a convention of all those states who had disputes with the king, was summoned to meet at Tempe in Thessaly. 25. When all were seated there, the Roman ambassadors in the character of arbitrators, the Thessalians, Peribibians, and Athamanians professedly as accusers, and Philip as defendant, to hear the accusations brought against him. Those who were the heads of the embassies, according to their several tempers, their favor, or their hatred towards the king, spoke, some with acrimony, others with mildness. Philippopolis, Tricca, Philoria, Euromini, and the other towns in their neighborhood, became the subject of dispute. 
The point in controversy was, whether these towns were the property of the Thessalians, when they were forcibly taken from them, and held by the Aetolians, for from these it was acknowledged that Philip had received them. Or whether they were originally belonging to the Aetolians, Asilius having granted them to the king, on the condition that they had been the property of the Aetolians. And if they had sided with the Aetolians of their own free will, and not compelled by violence and arms. The question in regard to the towns of the Parabibians and Magnesians turned on the same points. For the Aetolians, by holding possession of them occasionally, had confused the rights of all. To these particulars, which were matter of discussion, the complaints of the Thessalians were added, that, if these towns were now restored to them, they would come into their hands in a state of desolation, and depopulated. For besides the loss of inhabitants through the casualties of war, Philip had carried away five hundred of their young men of the first rank into Macedonia, and abused their labor by employing them in servile offices. And had taken pains to render useless whatever he should be compelled to restore to the Thessalians. That Thebes in Thyotis was the only seaport they had, which formerly produced much profit and advantage to the inhabitants of Thessaly. But that Philip, having collected there a number of ships of burthen, made them steer their course past Thebes to Demetrius, and turned thither the whole commerce by sea. That he did not now scruple to offer violence, even to ambassadors, who, by the law of nations, are everywhere held inviolable, but had laid an ambush for theirs who were going to Titus Quintius. That the Thessalians were in consequence seized with such dread, that not one of them, even in their own states, or in the general assemblies of the nation, ventured to open his lips. For the Romans, the defenders of their liberty, were far distant, and a severe master close at their side, debarring them from using the kindness of the Romans. If speech were not free, what else could be said to be so, at present, through confidence in the protection of the ambassadors, they uttered their groans rather than words. But, unless the Romans would take some precautions that both the fears of the Greeks bordering on Macedonia and the arrogance of Philip should be abetted, his having been conquered, and their being set at liberty, would prove utterly fruitless. Like a restive, unmanageable horse, he required to be cheeked with a strong bridle. These bitter expressions were used by the last speakers among them, those who spoke before having endeavored by mildness to mitigate his resentment. Requesting of him, that he should pardon persons pleading in defense of their liberty, that he should, laying aside the harshness of a master, generally display himself an ally and friend. That he should imitate the Roman people, who wished to unite their allies to them by the ties of affection, rather than of fear. When the Thessalians had finished, the Parabibians pleaded that Gonicondylos, to which Philip had given the name of Olympias, belonged to Perhebia, and ought to be restored to them. And the same demand was made with respect to Malia and Aracinium. The Athamanians claimed a restoration of liberty, and the forts Athenius and Poetnius. 26. Philip began his discourse also with complaints, that he might maintain the appearance of an accuser rather than of a defendant. He complained that, the Thessalians had taken by force of arms, Menelaus in Delopia, a town belonging to his dominions, likewise, Petra in Pyria was taken by the same Thessalians and the Parabibians. That they had reduced under their government Zinii, which unquestionably belonged to Aetolia, and that Perichelous, which was under Athamania, was, without any just claim, subjected to the jurisdiction of the Thessalians. As to the charges brought against him, concerning an ambush laid for ambassadors, and of seaports being frequented or deserted, the one was quite ridiculous, as if he were to account for what harbors merchants or sailors should frequent. And the other the constant tenor of his conduct rejected with scorn. During a number of years, ambassadors had never ceased carrying complaints against him, sometimes to the Roman generals, at others to Rome to the Senate. Which of them had ever been injured, even in words? They said, indeed, that an ambush was once laid for some who were going to Quintius, but they are silent in regard to consequences. Such were the accusations of men searching for false imputations, because they had no truth on their side. He said, that, the Thessalians, insolently and wantonly, abused the indulgence of the Roman people, too greedily drinking, as it were, strong draughts of liberty after a long thirst. And thus, in the manner of slaves lately set free, 
made trial of their voices and tongues, and prided themselves in invectives and railings against their masters. Then, hurried on by passion, he added, that, his son had not set yet. Which expression, not only the Thessalians, but the Romans also, took as a menace to themselves. And when a murmur of displeasure followed his words, and was at length hushed, he replied to the ambassadors of the Parabibians and Athamanians, that the cases of the cities of which they had spoken were the same. The consul Asilius and the Romans gave them to him, when they were the property of enemies. If the donors chose to resume what they had given, he knew he must submit, but in that case they would, for the gratification of inconstant and unprofitable allies, do injury to a more useful and more faithful friend. For no favor produced less permanent gratitude than the gift of liberty, especially among people who were ready to corrupt it by using it badly. After examining the merits of the cause, the ambassadors pronounced their judgment, that, the Macedonian garrisons should be withdrawn from the cities in question, and that the kingdom of Macedonia should be limited by its ancient boundaries. That with regard to the injuries which both parties complained of being done to them, it would be requisite to institute some compact for the attainment of justice, in order to decide the controversies between those states and the Macedonians. 27. The king being grievously offended, the ambassadors proceeded thence to Thessalonica, to give a hearing to the business concerning the cities of Thrace. Here the ambassadors of Eumene said, that, if the Romans wished that Enus and Moronia should be independent, the king felt ashamed to say more, than to recommend it to them to leave those people free in fact, and not in words. Nor to suffer their kindness to be intercepted by another. But if they had not so much concern for the states situated in Thrace, it was much more reasonable that Eumene should possess, as the rewards of war, the places which had been under the dominion of Antiochus, than Philip. And that, either on account of his father Attalus's deserts in the war, waged by the Roman people against Philip himself, or on account of his own, because he had shared all the toils and dangers on land and sea, during the war with Antiochus. Besides, he had the previous judgment of the ten ambassadors to that purpose, who, when they granted the Chersonesus and Lysimachia, surely yielded at the same time Enus and Moronia. Which, even from the proximity of situation, were but a sort of appendage to the larger gift. For, as to Philip, by what merits towards the Roman people, or what right of dominion, had he put garrisons into those places, which were at so great a distance from the borders of Macedonia? They then desired that the Romans would order the Maronites to be called, from whom they would receive more positive information of the condition of those cities. The Maronite ambassadors being called in, declared, that, not in one spot of the city, as in other garrison towns, but in every quarter of it, there was a party of the king's troops, and that Moronia was full of Macedonians. In consequence of which, the favorites of the king domineered over the rest, they alone had liberty of speaking either in the senate or assemblies of the people. All posts of eminence they assumed to themselves, or conferred on whom they thought proper. That the most deserving persons, who had a regard for liberty and for the laws, were either expelled their country, and in exile, or remained in silence, dishonored and subjected to men of the worst description. They added also a few words respecting their right to the frontier places, affirming, that, Quintus Fabius Labio, when he was in that country, had fixed as a boundary line to Philip, the old royal road leading to Pararia, in Thrace. Which in no place leads towards the sea. And that Philip afterwards drew a new one in another direction, in order to include the cities and lands of the Maronites. 28. Philip, in his reply to these charges, took quite another course than when lately answering the Thessalians and Parabibians, and said, My dispute is not now with the Maronites, or with you manys, but with you yourselves, Romans. From whom I have long ago seen that I can obtain no justice. The cities of Macedonia, which had revolted from me during a suspension of arms, I thought should in justice be restored to me. Not that they would have made any great accession to my dominions, because the towns are small in themselves, and besides, are situated on the extremities of the frontiers. But because the example was of great consequence towards retaining the rest of the Macedonians in their allegiance. This was refused me. In the Aetolian War, I was ordered by the consul, Manius Asilius, to lay siege to Lamia, 
and when I had there undergone a long course of fatigue in fighting and constructing works, and was on the point of mounting the walls. The consul recalled me from the city when almost in my possession, and compelled me to draw off my troops from it. As some consolation for this hard treatment, I received permission to seize on some forts, rather than cities, of Thessaly, Perhebia, and Athamania. These also you yourselves, Quintus Cicilius, have taken from me a few days ago. The ambassadors of Eumenes, just now, took for granted, it seems, that Eumenes would with more justice than I possess whatever belonged to Antiochus. I judged the matter to be widely different. For Eumenes could not have remained on his throne, unless the Romans had engaged in the war, and not unless they had conquered. Therefore he has received a favor from you, not you from him. Whereas, so far were any part of my dominions from being in danger, that, when Antiochus voluntarily offered to purchase my alliance, with three thousand talents and fifty decked ships, guaranteeing to me all the cities of Greece of which I had heretofore been in possession, I rejected that offer. I avowed myself his enemy, even before Manius Asilius brought over an army into Greece. In conjunction with that consul, I supported whatever share of the war he gave me in charge. To the succeeding consul, Lucius Scipio, when he proposed leading his army by land to the Hellespont, I not only gave a passage through my dominions, but also made roads for him, built bridges, supplied him with provisions, and escorted him. Not only through Macedon, but likewise through Thrace. Where, besides other business, I had to procure peace from the barbarians. In requital of this seal, not to call it merit, towards you, whether would it be proper in you, Romans, to enlarge and increase my dominions by acts of generosity, or to ravish from me what I possessed. Either in my own right or through your kindness. The cities of Macedon, which you acknowledge to have belonged to my kingdom, are not restored. Eumenes comes to plunder me as he would Antiochus, and, if you choose to believe him, covers his most shameless chicanery under the decree of the ten ambassadors, by which principally he can be refuted and convicted. For is it not expressly and plainly set down in that writing, that the Chersonese and Lysimachia are granted to Eumenes, and where are Enus, Moronia, and the cities of Thrace annexed to it in writing? That which he did not dare even to ask from them, shall he obtain from you, as if under their grant. It is a matter of importance in what light you choose to consider me. If you are resolved to persecute me as an enemy and foe, proceed to act as you have begun, but, if you have any consideration for me as a king in friendship and alliance with you, I must entreat you not to judge me deserving of such injurious treatment. 29. The king's discourse made a considerable impression on the ambassadors. They therefore left the matter in suspense, by this indecisive resolution, that, if the cities in question were granted to Eumenes by the decree of the ten ambassadors, they would make no alteration. If Philip subdued them in war, he should, by the laws of war, hold them as the prize of victory. If neither were the case, then their judgment was, that the decision should be referred to the Senate. And in order that all things might remain in their original state, the garrisons in those cities should be withdrawn. These causes, principally, alienated the regard of Philip from the Romans, so that the war naturally seems not set on foot by his son Perseus for any fresh causes, but rather for these causes, bequeathed by the father to the son. At Rome there was hitherto no suspicion of a war with Macedonia. Lucius Manlius, the proconsul, had by this time come home from Spain. On his demanding a triumph from the senate assembled in the temple of Bologna, the greatness of his exploits justified the demand, but precedent opposed it. For it was a rule, established by ancient practice, that no commander, who had not brought home his troops, should triumph, unless he had delivered up the province to his successor, in a state of thorough subjection and tranquillity. An honor of a middling grade was conferred on Manlius, namely, that he should enter the city in ovation. He carried in the procession fifty-two golden crowns, 122 pounds weight of gold, with 16,300 pounds of silver. And announced in the Senate, that his quester, Quintus Fabius, was bringing 10,000 pounds weight of silver, and 80 of gold, and that he would carry it likewise to the treasury. During that year there was a formidable insurrection of the slaves in Apulia. Lucius Postumius, praetor, 
governed the province of Tarentum, and conducted with much severity inquiries into a conspiracy of peasants, who had infested the roads and public pastures with robberies. Of these, he passed sentence on no less than seven thousand, many of whom made their escape, and on many punishment was inflicted. The consuls, after being long detained in the city by the levies, set out at length for their provinces. 30. This year, Caius Calpurnius and Lucius Quintius, the two praetors in Spain, drew their troops out of winter quarters, at the commencement of spring, and making a junction of them in Baeturia. For they were resolved to proceed in the operations of the campaign with united zeal and harmony, advanced into Carpatania, where the enemy's camp lay. At a small distance from the towns of Hippo and Toledum, a fight began between the foraging parties, to whom when reinforcements came from both armies from the camps, the entire armies were by degrees drawn out into the field. In this irregular kind of battle, the advantage of the ground and the manner of fighting were in favor of the enemy. The two Roman armies were routed, and driven into their camp, but the enemy did not pursue the dismayed Romans. The Roman praetors, lest their camp should be attacked next day, giving the signal in silence, led away their army in the dead of the following night. At the first dawn, the Spaniards came up to the rampart in battle array, and entered the camp which, beyond their expectation, was deserted, and made prey of whatever had in the hurry and confusion been first left behind. And then, returning to their own station, remained, for a few days, at rest within their camp. Of the Romans and allies, there were killed in the battle and the pursuit, five thousand men, out of whose spoils the enemy furnished themselves with arms. They then advanced to the river Tagus. All the intermediate time the Roman praetors employed in collecting aid from the allied Spanish states, and reviving the spirits of their men after the dismay occasioned by their defeat. When their strength appeared adequate, and the soldiers too called for their enemy, to blot out in vengeance their former disgrace, they pitched their camp at the distance of twelve miles from the river Tagus. But decamping thence at the third watch, and marching with their army in a square, reached the bank of the river at break of day. The enemy's camp was on a hill at the other side of the river. They immediately led their army across the river where it was fordable in two places, Calpurnius having the command of the right, Quintius of the left. The enemy continued motionless, since they were surprised at the sudden arrival of the Romans, and busy in consultations, when they might have excited confusion among the troops during their hurry in passing the river. In the meantime the Romans brought over all their baggage, and threw it together in a heap, and seeing the enemy, at length, begin to move, and having no time for fortifying a camp, they formed their line of battle. In the center were placed the fifth legion, serving under Calpurnius, and the eighth, under Quintius, which composed the principal strength of their army. All the way to the enemy's camp they had an open plain, free from all danger of ambush. 31. When the Spaniards saw the two bodies of Romans, on their side of the river, they rushed suddenly out of the camp, and advanced to battle at full speed, that they might fall upon them before they should unite and put themselves in order. The fight, in the beginning, was urged with great fury, the Spaniards being elated by their late success, and the Roman soldiery inflamed to rage, by a discomfiture to which they were unaccustomed. The center, consisting of two legions of the greatest bravery, fought with the utmost vigor. The enemy, seeing that they could not be forced from their ground by any other means, resolved to make their attack in form of a wedge. And this body, becoming continually more numerous and more compact, pressed hard on them. When the praetor, Calpurnius, perceived that his line was distressed in this part, he hastily dispatched two lieutenants general, Titus Quintilius Varus and Lucius Juventus Thalna, to animate the courage of the two legions, who were ordered to say that all hopes of victory and of retaining possession of Spain depended entirely on them. If they should give ground, not a man in that whole army would ever see Italy, no, nor even the farther bank of the Tagus. He himself, at the head of the cavalry of the two legions, making a small circuit, charged the flank of the wedge, which was pressing upon his center Quintius, likewise, with his cavalry, charged the enemy on the other flank. But the horsemen of Calpurnius fought with far greater spirit, while the praetor himself exceeded all others. He was the first that struck down one of the enemy, 
and he pushed in among the troops in the center, in such a manner that it was hard to distinguish to which side he belonged. Thus the horse were animated by the extraordinary valor of the praetor, and the infantry by that of the horse. Shame, because they saw the praetor in the midst of the enemy's weapons, inspired the foremost centurions. They all, therefore, earnestly pressed the standard-bearers, urging them to carry forward the ensigns, and the soldiers to follow with speed. All set up the shout anew, and made an attack as violent as if it were made from the higher ground. Like a flood, therefore, they broke and bore down the enemy in dismay, nor could they be resisted, pouring in one after another, the cavalry pursued the fugitives to their camp, and mixing with the crowd of the runaways. Penetrated within the rampart. Here the fight was renewed by the troops left to guard the camp, and the Roman horsemen were obliged to dismount. While they were engaged, the 5th legion came up, and afterwards the rest of the troops joined them with all the speed they could. The Spaniards were cut to pieces in all parts of the camp, not more than 4,000 men made their escape. Of these about 3,000, who kept their arms, took possession of a mountain in the neighborhood, and 1,000, who were in general but half-armed, dispersed through the country. This army of the enemy had contained 35,000 men, of whom that very small number survived the battle. 133 standards were taken. Of the Romans and allies, a few more than 600 fell. And of the provincial auxiliaries, about 150. The loss of five military tribunes, and a few Roman horsemen, served principally to give the victory the appearance of being a bloody one. The army lodged in the enemy's camp, as they had not had time to fortify one of their own. Next day the cavalry was praised by Calpurnius in an assembly, and presented with trappings. And he declared publicly, that through their bravery, principally, the enemy had been defeated, and their camp stormed and taken. Quinctius, the other praetor, presented his cavalry also with chains and clasps. A great many centurions also, of both the armies, received gratuities, especially those who were in the center. 32. The consuls, as soon as they had finished the levies, and other business which required to be done at Rome, led the army into their province, Liguria. Sempronius marched from Pisces against the Appuan Ligurians, and by ravaging their lands, and by burning their villages and forts, he opened that difficult country, as far as the river Macra and the harbour of Luna. The enemy took possession of a mountain which had been the ancient retreat of their forefathers, but the difficulty of access being overcome, they were dislodged by force. Appius Claudius, against the Ingonian tribe, rivaled in several successful battles the good fortune and bravery of his colleague. He also stormed six of their towns, in which he made many thousand prisoners, beheading forty-three of the chief promoters of the war. The time of the elections now drew near. But Claudius came home to Rome sooner than Sempronius, to whom the business of presiding at the elections had been allotted, because his brother, Publius Claudius, stood candidate for the consulship. His competitors, of patrician rank, were Lucius Emilius, Quintus Fabius Labio, and Servius Sulpicius Galba, who had been candidates before, and now renewed their suit, for an honor which was the more justly due to them, owing to their repulses. As it had been refused before. Besides, as it was not lawful that more than one patrician should be appointed, there was a closer contest between the four candidates. The plebeian candidates likewise were men in high esteem. Lucius Porcius, Quintus Terentius Cullio, and Gnaeus Bibius Tamphilus, these two had been disappointed, but had cherished hopes of attaining the honor at some future time. Claudius was the only new candidate. Quintus Fabius Labio and Lucius Porcius Licinus were marked out by public opinion as the successful persons. But Claudius, the consul, unattended by his lictors, canvassed with his brother through all parts of the forum, notwithstanding the loud remonstrances of his opponents and the greater part of the Senate, who insisted that he ought to remember that he was consul of the Roman people, rather than the brother of Publius Claudius. Why should he not rather sit on his tribunal? content himself with presiding, and remain a silent spectator of the business. Yet he could not be restrained from a display of his immoderate zeal. The election was, also, 
several times interrupted by contentions between the plebeian tribunes, some of whom struggled hard in opposition to the consul and others in support of the cause which he favored. At last, Appius conquered all opposition, so as to set aside Fabius and bring in his brother. Thus was Publius Claudius Pulcher elected consul, beyond his own, and indeed the general expectation. Lucius Porcius Licinus carried his election also, because the contest among the plebeian candidates was conducted with a decent degree of warmth, and not with the violence of Claudius. Then was held the election of praetors. Caius Decimius Flavus, Publius Sempronius Longus, Publius Cornelius Cethegus, Quintus Naevius Matho, Caius Sempronius Blasus, and Aulus Terentius Varro, were made praetors. Such were the occurrences at home and abroad of this year, during the consulate of Appius Claudius and Marcus Sempronius. 33. In the beginning of the following year, Publius Claudius and Lucius Porcius, the consuls, when Quintus Cicilius, Marcus Bibius, and Tiberius Sempronius, who had been sent to adjust the matters in dispute between the kings, Philip and Eumenes. And the states of the Thessalians, had given an account of their embassy, introduced to the senate ambassadors from those kings and states. On this occasion, the same arguments were repeated by all parties, which had been urged before the ambassadors in Greece. The Senate then decreed that a new embassy, the principal man of which was Appius Claudius, should be sent into Macedonia and Greece, to know whether the several states had been restored to the Rhodians, Thessalians, and Peribibians. Instructions were given to the same, that the garrisons should be withdrawn, from Enus and Moronia, and that all the sea coast of Thrace should be made free and independent of Philip and the Macedonians. They were ordered also to go to Peloponnesus, from which the former ambassadors had departed, leaving affairs in a more unsettled state than they would have been if they had not come thither. For besides other matters, they were even sent away without an answer by the Achaean council, nor was an audience of that body granted to them at their request. When Quintus Cicilius made a heavy complaint on this subject, and at the same time the Lacedaemonians deplored the demolition of their walls, the carrying off their poor people into Achaia, the selling of them there, and the depriving them of the laws of Lycurgus, by which the nation had been supported unto that time, the Achaeans labored principally to excuse their having refused a meeting of the council by quoting a law which enacted. That a council should not be summoned, except on business of peace or war, or when ambassadors should come from the senate with letters or written instructions. That this kind of excuse should not be made in future, the Senate observed to them, that they ought to take care that Roman ambassadors should at all times have an opportunity of applying to their council. In like manner as an audience of the Senate was always given to them, at any time when they wished it. 34. After those embassies were dismissed, Philip, being informed that he must yield up the states, and evacuate the towns in question, was highly enraged against all, yet vented his fury on the Maronites in particular. He gave a charge to Onomastus, who had the command of the sea coast, to put to death the leaders of the opposite party. This man, through the agency of a person called Cassander, a partisan of the kings, who had resided a long time in Moronia, having introduced Thracians by night, put the inhabitants to the sword, as if the city had been taken by storm. When the Roman ambassadors complained of his acting with such cruelty towards the innocent Maronites, and with such presumption towards the Roman people, in killing, as enemies. Those very persons to whom the Senate had adjudged the restoration of liberty, he denied that any of those matters concerned him, or any one belonging to him. That they had quarreled among themselves, and fought, because some wished to bring over their state to his side, others to that of Eumenes. That they might easily ascertain this, and they had only to ask the Maronites themselves. For he was confident, that while they were all under the impression of terror, since the late massacre, not one of them would dare to utter a word against him. Appius said, that, a case so clear ought not to be examined into as if it were doubtful. But if he wished to remove the guilt from himself, let him send Onomastus and Cassander, the actors in that business, to Rome, that the Senate might examine them. At first, these words so entirely disconcerted the king, that neither his color nor his looks remained unchanged. Then, after some time, having collected his thoughts, he replied, that, he would send Cassander, who had been in Moronia, 
if it was their desire, but as to Onomastus, how could that matter affect him, who, so far from being in Moronia, was not even near it? He was more careful of Onomastus, as a more valued friend, yet he dreaded him much more lest he might make discoveries, because he had, in person, conversed with him on the subject, and he had made him an agent and accomplice in many similar acts. Cassander is supposed to have been taken off, that the truth might not be divulged, by poison administered by persons sent to escort him through Epirus to the sea coast. 35. The ambassadors departed from the conference with Philip in such a manner that they made it manifest that none of these acts pleased them, and Philip, with a full resolution to have recourse again to arms. Because his strength was as yet insufficient for that purpose, he resolved, in order to procure delay, to send his younger son Demetrius to Rome, to clear him from the above-named charges, and at the same time to deprecate the wrath of the Senate. Philip had strong expectations that the young man himself, because he had, while a hostage at Rome, exhibited proofs of a princely disposition, would have a good deal of influence now. Meanwhile, under the pretense of carrying succor to the Byzantians, but in reality with design to strike terror into the chieftains of the Thracians, he marched into their country, utterly defeated them in an engagement. In which he took their commander, Amaticus, prisoner, and then returned to Macedonia, having first dispatched emissaries to induce the barbarians, living near the Danube, to make an eruption into Italy. The arrival of the Roman ambassadors, who had been ordered to go from Macedonia into Achaia, was expected in Peloponnesus. And in order that the Achaeans might settle their plans of conduct towards them beforehand, their praetor, Lycordas, summoned a general council. Here the affair of the Lacedaemonians was taken into consideration. It was observed that, from enemies, they were turned accusers, and there was reason to fear lest they should prove more formidable, after having been conquered, than when at war, for in it the Achaeans had the Romans as allies in their cause. Now the same Romans were more favorable to the Lacedaemonians than to the Achaeans. Even Arius and Alcibiades, both restored from exile through the kindness of the Achaeans, had undertaken an embassy to Rome, in prejudice to a nation to which they were so much obliged. And had used language so severe, that they seemed to have been banished from their country, instead of being restored to it. A general clamor arose, requiring him to put the question on each of them by name. And as everything was directed by passion, not by reason, they were condemned to die. In a few days after this the Roman ambassadors arrived, and a council was summoned to meet them at Clitter, in Arcadia. 36. Before they transacted any business, alarm was excited in the Achaeans, accompanied by the reflection, how unlikely the dispute was to receive impartial judgment, when they saw in company with the ambassadors Arius and Alcibiades whom in their last council they had condemned to death. Yet none of them dared to utter a word. Appius acquainted them that the Senate was much displeased at those matters, of which the Lacedaemonians made complaint before them. First, the massacre that took place at Compasium of those who, in obedience to the summons of Philippemon, came to stand a trial. Then after such barbarity had been exercised towards men, that their cruelty might be felt in every part, the having demolished the wall of that famous city, having abrogated its laws of the greatest antiquity, and abolished the discipline of Lycurgus, so famed throughout the world. After Appius had spoken to this effect, Lycordas, both because he was praetor and because he was of the faction of Philippemon, the adviser of all that was done at Lacedaemon, answered him thus, Appius Claudius. Our speech before you is attended with more difficulties than we had lately before the Senate at Rome. For then we had to answer the accusations of the Lacedaemonians, but now we stand accused by yourselves, before whom our cause is to be heard. But to this disadvantage of situation we submit with this hope, that you will hear us with the temper of a judge, laying aside the character of an advocate, in which you just now appeared. I at least, though the matters of which the Lacedaemonians complained formerly in this place, before Quintus Cicilius, and afterwards at Rome, have been just recapitulated by you, yet shall consider myself as answering for them, not to you. But before you. You charge us with the murder of those men, who being called out by the praetor, Philippemon, to trial, were put to death. This I think a charge of such a nature, that it ought not to be advanced against us either by you, 
Romans, or by any in your presence. Why so? Because it was written in the treaty with you, that the Lacedaemonians should not intermeddle with the cities on the coast. At the time when they, taking up arms, seized by assault in the night those towns with which they had been forbidden to interfere. If Titus Quintius, if a Roman army had been in Peloponnesus, as formerly, the captured and oppressed inhabitants would surely have fled to them for relief. As you were at a great distance, to whom else would they fly but to us, your allies, whom they had seen at a former time bringing aid to Jithium, whom they had seen in conjunction with you, besieging Lacedaemon on their account? In your stead, therefore, we undertook a just and rightful war. And when other men approve of this step, and even the Lacedaemonians cannot censure it, the gods themselves, also, by giving us the victory, have shown their approbation of it. How then can acts done under the laws of war come under civil disquisition? Of these acts, however, the greatest part nowise affect us. The summoning to trial men, who had excited the populace to arms, who had stormed and plundered the towns on the coast, who had murdered the principal inhabitants, was our act. But the putting them to death when they were coming into the camp was yours, Arius and Alcibiades, who now, since it is the will of the gods, arraign us, and not ours. The Lacedaemonian exiles, in the number of whom, these two men then were, were then in our camp, and believing that they were the objects of attack because they had chosen the maritime towns for their residence, made an assault on those by whose means they had been banished, and who they perceived with indignation would not suffer them even to grow old in exile with safety. Lacedaemonians therefore, not Achaeans, slew Lacedaemonians, nor is it of any consequence to dispute whether they were slain justly or unjustly. 37. But then, Achaeans, the abolition of the laws and ancient discipline of Lycurgus, with the demolition of the walls, are unquestionably your acts, now how can both these charges be brought forward by the same persons? Since the walls of Lacedaemon were built, not by Lycurgus, but a few years ago, for the purpose of subverting the discipline of Lycurgus? The tyrants erected them lately as a fortress and defense for themselves, not for the state, and if Lycurgus should rise this day from the dead, he would rejoice at their ruins, and would say that he now acknowledged his country, and ancient Sparta. You ought not to have waited for Philippemon, or the Achaeans, you should have removed and raised, with your own hands, every vestige of tyranny, for these were the foul scars of slavery. And as during almost eight hundred years, while ye were without walls, ye were free, and for some time even chiefs of Greece, so, after being bound with walls, as with fetters, ye were slaves for one hundred years. As to what concerns the abrogating their laws, I conceive that the tyrants took away the ancient laws of Lacedaemon, and that we did not deprive them of their own laws which they did not possess, but gave them ours. Nor did we neglect the interests of their state, when we made it a member of our council, and incorporated it with ourselves, so that the whole Peloponnesus should form one body in one council. If we were living under laws different from what we imposed on them, in that case I think they might complain of being treated unfairly, and consequently be displeased. I know, Appius Claudius, that the kind of discourse which I have hitherto used is not proper either for allies, addressing their allies, or for an independent nation, but, in truth, for slaves pleading before their masters. For if the herald's proclamation, in which you ordered the Achaeans, first of all the states of Greece, to be free, was anything more than empty sound. If the treaty be valid, if the alliance and friendship be maintained on equal terms, why do not I inquire what you Romans did, on the taking of Capua, as well as you demand what we, the Achaeans, did towards the Lacedaemonians? When we conquered them in war, some persons were killed, suppose, by us. What? Did not you behead the Campanian senators? We demolished their walls, you not only destroyed the walls, but you took the city and the lands. But you say, the treaty is on equal terms only in appearance, but, in reality, the Achaeans possess a precarious state of freedom, while the Romans enjoy supreme power. I am sensible of it, Appius, and if I ought not, I do not remonstrate. But, I beseech you, let the difference between the Romans and Achaeans be as great as it may, not to place people, who are foes to both, on an equal footing with us, your allies, or even on a better. 
For, as to setting them on an equality, that we ourselves have done, when we gave them our own laws, when we made them members of the Achaean council. Vanquished, they are not content with what satisfies their conquerors. Foes, they demand more than allies enjoy. What we have ratified by our oaths, what we have consecrated as inviolable to eternal remembrance, by records engraved in stone, they want to abolish, and to load us with perjury. Romans, for you we have high respect, and, if such is your wish, dread also, but we more respect and dread to the immortal gods. He was heard with general approbation, and all declared that he had spoken as became the dignity of his office. So that it was easily seen, that the Romans could not support their ascendancy by acting gently. Appius then said, that, he earnestly recommended it to the Achaeans to conciliate friendship, while it was in their power to act voluntarily. Lest they might presently do so unwillingly and by compulsion. These words were heard by all with grief, but inspired them with fear of refusing compliance. They only requested the Romans, to make such alterations respecting the Lacedaemonians as they should judge proper, and not involve the Achaeans in the guilt of annulling what they had sanctioned with their oaths. Nothing more was done, only the sentence lately passed on Arius and Alcibiades was reversed. 38. In the beginning of this year, when the business of assigning the provinces to the consuls and praetors was taken under consideration at Rome, Liguria was decreed to the consuls, because there was no war anywhere else. As to the praetors, Caius Decimius Flavus obtained, by lot, the city jurisdiction, Publius Cornelius Cethegus, that between citizens and foreigners, Caius Sempronius Blasus, Sicily, Quintus Naevius Matho, Sardinia. He had also the charge of making inquisition concerning poisons, Aulus Terentius Varro, hither Spain, and Publius Sempronius Longus, farther Spain. From the two latter provinces deputies arrived about this time, Lucius Juventus Thalna and Titus Quintilius Varus. Who, having informed the Senate how formidable the war was that was finished by them in Spain, requested that, in consideration of such happy success, a thanksgiving should be performed to the immortal gods. And permission granted to the praetors to bring home the armies. The Senate decreed a thanksgiving for two days, and ordered that the question respecting the armies should lie over, and be proposed when they would be deliberating concerning the armies for the consuls and praetors. A few days after this, they voted to the consuls, for Liguria, two legions each, which Appius Claudius and Marcus Sempronius had commanded. With regard to the armies in Spain, there was a warm contention between the new praetors and the friends of the absent ones, Calpurnius and Quintius. On each side were plebeian tribunes, and, on each, a consul. The former threatened, if the Senate voted for bringing home the armies, to protest against their decree, the latter, that, if such a protest were made, they would not suffer any other business to proceed. At last, the interest of the absent praetors was overpowered, and a decree of the Senate passed, that, the praetors should enlist four thousand Roman foot, and four hundred horse. With five thousand foot, and five hundred horse, of the Latin confederates, whom they should carry with them into Spain. That, when they should have divided these between the legions, they should discharge whatever number should then be in each legion, above five thousand foot and three hundred horse. Dismissing those first who had served out their number of campaigns, afterwards the others according to their bravery displayed under Calpurnius and Quintius. 39. After this dispute was ended, another immediately arose, in consequence of the death of a praetor, Caius Decimius. There stood candidates for his place, Gnaeus Sicinius and Lucius Pupius, who had been aediles the year before. Caius Valerius, the flamen of Jupiter, and Quintus Fulvius Flaccus, who, though he did not appear in the white gown, because he was curule aedile elect, yet pressed his suit with more warmth than any of them. The contest lay between him and the priest of Jupiter. Fulvius at the beginning seemed to have an equal chance with the flamen, and afterward surpassed him. On which, some of the plebeian tribunes insisted that no account should be taken of him, because one person could neither hold nor administer two offices, especially curule ones, at the same time. While others of them thought it proper that he ought to be exempted from the laws, in order that the people might have the power of electing praetor the person whom they wished. The consul, Lucius Porcius, was, from the beginning, 
inclined to refuse admitting him a candidate. And afterwards, wishing to have the countenance of the Senate in so doing, he called the members together, and told them that he desired their judgment in the case where a curule edile elect, without any color of law, and setting a precedent insufferable in a free state, stood candidate for the praetorship. For his part, unless they determined otherwise, he intended to hold the election according to law. The Senate voted that the consul, Lucius Porcius, should recommend to Quintus Fulvius, not to obstruct the elections for substituting a praetor in the room of Caius Decimius from proceeding according to law. When the consul, in pursuance of this decree, applied to him on the subject, he answered, that he would do nothing unworthy of himself, by which indeterminate answer he left room for people to interpret his intention agreeably to their wish. And that he meant to submit to the direction of the Senate. But, in the assembly, he urged his pretensions with more eagerness than ever, alleging as a charge, that the kindness of the Roman people was being wrested from him. And an odium excited against him on account of his suing for a second post of honor. As if it were not manifest that, when elected praetor, he must instantly abdicate the aedileship. The consul, seeing the candidate's obstinacy increase, and the public favor inclined to him more and more, dissolved the assembly, and summoned a meeting of the senate. Where, in a full house, they passed a vote, that, inasmuch as the directions of the senate had produced no effect on Flaccus, the affair concerning him should be laid before the people. A general assembly being summoned, when the consul made a full representation of the matter, Fulvius, not even then swerving from his determination. Returned thanks to the Roman people, for the great zeal which they had shown in their desire to make him praetor, as often as opportunity had been given them of declaring their sentiments. And assured them that, it was his resolution not to disappoint such instances of the attachment of his countrymen. This determined declaration increased the ardor of people for his cause to such a degree, that he would undoubtedly have been chosen praetor, if the consul had admitted him to stand. The tribunes maintained a violent altercation, both with their colleagues and with the consul, until, at length, the senate passed a decree, that, whereas the obstinacy of Quintus Flaccus, and the ill-judged party zeal of many among the people, had prevented the assembly for filling the place of a praetor, from being held according to law. The senate therefore gave their judgment, that the present number of praetors was sufficient, that Publius Cornelius should hold both jurisdictions in the city, and celebrate the games of Apollo. 40. No sooner was this election stopped by the prudence and firmness of the Senate, than another ensued, in which the contest was still greater. Since it was concerning a more important subject, and between competitors more numerous and more powerful. The censorship was the object of contention of the following candidates, Lucius Valerius Flaccus, Publius Scipio, Lucius Scipio, Gnaeus Manlius Volso, and Lucius Furius Perperio, patricians. Marcus Porcius Cato, Marcus Fulvius Nobilier, Tiberius Sempronius Longus, Marcus Sempronius Tiditinus, plebeians. But Marcus Porcius far surpassed all of them, both plebeians and patricians of the highest ranks. So great powers of mind and energy of intellect were in this man, that no matter how lowly the position in which he was born, he appeared capable of attaining to the highest rank. No one qualification for the management of business, either public or private, was wanting to him. He was equally skilled in affairs relating to town and country. Some have been advanced to the highest honors by their knowledge of the law, others by their eloquence, some by military renown. But this man's genius was so versatile, and so well adapted to all things, that in whatever way engaged, it might be said, that nature formed him for that alone. In war, he was most courageous, distinguishing himself highly in many remarkable battles, and, when he arrived at the highest posts, was likewise a most consummate commander. Then, in peace, if consulted on a point of law, he was the wisest counsellor, if a cause was to be pleaded, the most eloquent advocate. Nor was he one of those whose oratory was striking only during their own lives, without leaving after them any monument of it. On the contrary, his eloquence still lives, and will long live, consecrated to memory by writings of every kind. His orations are many, spoken for himself, for others, and against others, for he harassed his enemies, not only by supporting prosecutions against them, 
but by maintaining causes in opposition to them. Enmities in abundance gave him plenty of employment, and he never permitted them to lie dormant, nor was it easy to tell whether the nobility labored harder to keep him down, or he to oppress the nobility. His temper, no doubt, was austere, his language bitter and unboundedly free, but his mind was never conquered by his passions, his integrity was inflexible, and he looked with contempt on popularity and riches. In spare diet, in enduring toil and danger, his body and mind were like iron, so that even old age, which brings all things to dissolution, did not break his vigor. In his eighty-sixth year he stood a trial, pleaded his own cause, and published his speech, and in his ninetieth year, he brought Servius Galba to trial, before the people. 41. On this occasion, when he was a candidate for censorship, as in all his previous career, the nobility endeavored to crush him. All the candidates, likewise, except Lucius Flaccus, who had been his colleague in the consulship, combined to disappoint him of the office, not merely with a view to their own success, in preference to him. Or because they felt indignant at the idea of seeing a man of no family censor, but because from one who had received offense from most of them, and who wished to retaliate, they anticipated a severe censorship. That would endanger the reputations of many. For, even while soliciting, he uttered frequent menaces, and upbraided them with using their interest against him, because they dreaded an impartial and courageous execution of the duty of censor. At the same time, giving his interest to Lucius Valerius. He said, that, he was the only colleague, in conjunction with whom he could correct modern profligacy, and re-establish the ancient morals. People were so inflamed by such discourses, that, in spite of the opposition made by the nobility, they not only made Marcus Porcius censor, but gave him for his colleague Lucius Valerius Flaccus. Immediately after the election of censors, the consuls and praetors went abroad to their provinces, except Quintus Naevius, who was detained from going to Sardinia, for no less than four months, by inquisitions concerning poisonings. A great part of which he held out of the city, in the corporate towns and villages. For that method was judged the more eligible. If we are to credit Valerius Antius, he condemned about two thousand men, Lucius Postumius, the praetor, to whose lot the province of Tarentum had fallen, punished numerous conspiracies of the peasants, and, with great care, finished the remainder of the inquiries concerning the Bacchanalians. Many of these, who had not appeared on being summoned, or had deserted their bail, were then lurking in that part of Italy. Some of them he sentenced to punishment, and others he sent under a guard to the Senate at Rome, where they were all committed to prison by Publius Cornelius. 42. In farther Spain, the Lusitanians being weakened by the late war, matters remained quiet. In hither Spain, Aulus Terentius took the town of Corbia, in Suicitania, by engines and regular works, and sold the prisoners, after which the troops had rest in their winter quarters in that province also. The former praetors, Caius Calpurnius Piso and Lucius Quintius, came home to Rome, a triumph was voted to both by the Senate with great unanimity. Caius Calpurnius triumphed first, over the Lusitanians and Celtiberians. He carried in procession eighty-three golden crowns, and twelve thousand pounds weight of silver. In a few days after, Lucius Quintius Crispinus triumphed over the same Lusitanians and Celtiberians, bearing in his triumph the same quantity of gold and silver. The censors, Marcus Porcius and Lucius Valerius, while anxious curiosity was blended with fear, made their survey of the Senate. They expelled seven from the Senate, one of them a man of consular rank, highly distinguished by nobility of birth and honorable employments, Lucius Quintius Flaminius. It is mentioned, as a practice instituted in the memory of our forefathers, that the censors should annex marks of censure to the names of such as they degraded from the Senate. There are severe speeches of Cato, against those whom he either expelled the Senate, or degraded from the equestrian rank, but by far the most so is that against Lucius Quintius. Had he spoken, in the character of prosecutor, previous to the censure, and not in that of censor after it, not even his brother Titus, if he were his colleague, could have suffered Quintius to remain in the Senate. Among other charges, he objected to him, that he had, by hopes of extraordinary presence, prevailed on Philip, a Carthaginian and academite, to accompany him into his province of Gaul. 
that this youth, in order to enhance the merit of his complaisance to the consul, used frequently, in wadden squabbling, to upbraid him for having quitted Rome just before the show of gladiators. It happened, that while they were at a feast and heated with wine, a message was brought into the place of entertainment, that a boyan, of high rank, had come as a deserter with his children, and wished to see the consul, that he might, in person, receive his assurance of protection. He was accordingly introduced into the tent, and began to address him through an interpreter, but while he was speaking, Quintius said to his catamite, Since you left the show of gladiators, have you a mind to see this Gaul dying? When he had assented, but scarcely in earnest, the consul, drawing a sword that hung over his head, first struck the Gaul as he was speaking, and then, when he was running out, and imploring the protection of the Roman people, and of those present, ran him through the side. 43. Valerius Antius, as he was one who never read Cato's speech, and only gave credit to a tale published without authority, tells the story in another manner, but similar to this in lust and cruelty. He writes, that, at Placentia, the consul invited to an entertainment a woman of ill fame, with whom he was desperately enamored. There, displaying his importance to this courtesan, he told her, among other matters, with what severity he had conducted the inquisitions, and how many he had then in prison under sentence of death, whom he intended to behead. Then she, being next him on the couch, said, that having never seen an executioner perform his office, she was very desirous of seeing such a thing. On which, the indulgent lover ordered one of those wretches to be dragged to the spot, and there cut off his head. The deed of death, whether committed as the censor or as Valerius reports it, was barbarous and inhuman. That in the midst of feasting in cups, when it is customary to offer libations to the gods, and to pray for happiness, a human victim should be butchered, and the table stained with his blood. And this for the entertainment of an acknowledged wanton. In the latter part of Cato's speech, he proposes to Quintius, that if he denied this fact, and the others of which he accused him, he should give security to abide a legal trial. But if he confessed them, could he suppose, he asked him, that any one would be sorry for his disgrace, the disgrace of him who, in the midst of a feast, being intoxicated with wine and lust, had sported with the blood of a human being. 44. In the review of the knights, Lucius Scipio Asiaticus was degraded. In fixing the rates of taxation, also, the censor's conduct was harsh and severe to all ranks of men. People were ordered to give account upon oath, of women's dress, and ornaments, and carriages exceeding in value fifteen thousand asses. Two ninety-five and it was further ordered, that slaves, younger than twenty years, which, since the last survey, had been sold for ten thousand asses two ninety-six or more, should be estimated at ten times their value. And that, on all these articles, a tax should be laid of three denariuses two ninety seven for each thousand asses. Point two ninety eight. The censors took away water which belonged to the public running or carried into any private building or field. And they demolished within thirty days all buildings or sheds, in possession of private persons, that projected into public ground. They then engaged contractors for executing national works, with the money decreed for that purpose, for paving cisterns with stone, for cleansing the sewers where it was requisite, and forming new ones on the Aventine. And in other quarters where hitherto there had been none. Then, dividing their tasks, Flaccus built a mole at Neptunia, on the coast, and made a road through the Formian mountains. Cato purchased for the use of the people two halls, the Menian and Titian, in the Latumii, and four shops, and built there a court of justice, which was called the portion. They farmed out the several branches of the revenue at the highest prices, and bargained with the contractors for the performance of the public services on the lowest terms. When the Senate, overcome by the prayers and lamentations of the publicans, ordered those bargains to be revoked, and new agreements to be made. The censors, by an edict, excluded from competition the persons who had eluded the former contracts, and farmed out all the same branches at prices very little reduced. This was a remarkable censorship, and the origin of many deadly feuds, it rendered Marcus Porcius, to whom all the harshness was attributed, uneasy during the remainder of his life. This year, two colonies were established, 
Potentia in Picinum, and Pisorum in the Gallic territory. Six acres were given to each settler. The same commissioners had the ordering of both colonies, and the division of the lands, Quintus Fabius Labio, Marcus Fulvius Flaccus, and Quintus Fulvius Nobilior. The consuls of that year performed nothing memorable at home or abroad. 45. They elected to serve as consuls for the ensuing year, Marcus Claudius Marcellus and Quintus Fabius Labio. These, on the Ides of March, the first day of their assuming the administration, proposed to the Senate to determine their provinces, and those of the praetors. The praetors appointed were, Caius Valerius, Flamen of Jupiter, who had been candidate the year before, Spurius Postumius Albinus, Publius Cornelius Cicena, Lucius Pupius, Lucius Julius, and Gnaeus Sicinius. Liguria was ordered to be the province of the consuls, and the armies were assigned to them, which Publius Claudius and Marcus Porcius had commanded. The two Spains, without being put to the lot, were reserved for the praetors who held them the year before, and also their own armies. The praetors were ordered to regulate their casting lots, in such a manner, that the flamen of Jupiter should have one or other of the judicial employments at Rome. The foreign jurisdiction fell to his lot, that between citizens to Cornelius Cicena. Sicily was assigned to Spurius Postumius, Apulia to Lucius Pupius, Gaul to Lucius Julius, Sardinia to Gnaeus Sicinius. Lucius Julius was ordered to hasten to his province, because some Transalpine Gauls, as was mentioned before, having made their way through the forests into Italy, by an unknown road, were building a town in the country which now forms the district of Aquileia. Orders were given to the praetor to prevent their doing so, as far as might lie in his power without appealing to arms. And, if it should be necessary to stop them by force, to give information to the consuls, one of whom was, in that case, directed to march his legions against those Gauls. Towards the close of the preceding year, an assembly had been held for the purpose of electing an augur, in the room of Gnaeus Cornelius deceased, when Spurius Postumius Albinus was chosen. 46. In the beginning of this year, Publius Licinius Crassus, chief pontiff, died, in whose room was appointed Marcus Sempronius Tidinus, and Caius Servilius Geminus was raised to the place of chief pontiff. On occasion of the funeral of Publius Licinius a largess of flesh was distributed to the people, and 120 pair of gladiators fought. The funeral games lasted three days, and, after the games, a public feast was given. During the feast, and while the couches were spread over the forum, a storm came on with violent gusts of wind, and compelled most of the people to pitch tents in that place. The same, on the weather clearing up, in a short time after, were removed. It was rumored about, that they had fulfilled a prophecy which soothsayers had pronounced, among the decrees of the fates, that, inevitably, tents would be pitched in the forum. As soon as they were relieved from those religious fears, they were struck with new ones, by showers of blood falling for two days, in the area of Vulcan's temple. And a supplication was ordered by the Decembers for the sake of expiating the prodigy. Before the consuls set out for their provinces, they introduced the embassies from the countries beyond the sea to an audience of the Senate, and at no time was there in Rome such a number of people from those regions. For, as soon as a report spread through the nations which border on Macedon, that accusations and complaints against Philip were listened to by the Romans with some degree of attention, and that it had been of advantage to many to complain. All these states and nations, and even individuals, on their own accounts, for he was a troublesome neighbor to every one, flocked to Rome, with hopes of obtaining either redress of their injuries, or, at least, the consolation of expressing their griefs. An embassy came also from King Eumenes, with his brother Athenius, to complain of the garrisons not being withdrawn by Philip out of Thrace, and, likewise, of his sending succors into Bithynia, to Prusias, who was at war with Eumenes. 47. Demetrius, who was then very young, had to answer all these representations, and it was no easy matter to retain in memory either all the charges which were brought against his father, or what was proper to be said in reply. For the charges were not only numerous, but most of them exceedingly frivolous, of disputes about boundaries, of men forced away and cattle driven off, 
of justice, either capriciously administered or refused. Of property adjudged either by force or influence. When the Senate perceived that Demetrius could not explain any of those matters distinctly, and that they could not gain satisfactory information from him, and when, at the same time, the youth, through inexperience and bashfulness, was much embarrassed, they ordered that he should be asked whether he had received from his father any written instructions on those points. And on his answering that he had, it appeared to them better and more proper to receive the answers of the king himself, on each particular head, so they immediately called for the scroll, but afterwards gave him leave to read it to them in person. Here were his apologies on each subject, compressed into a narrow compass, informing them that, in some cases, he had acted in conformity to the determinations of the ambassadors. In others, that the fault of not conforming to them, lay not in him, but actually in the persons themselves who accused him. He had interspersed, also, complaints concerning the injustice of the decrees, and the partiality with which the discussion was carried on in presence of Cecilius, and of the insults that were offered him. In a most unworthy and unmerited manner by all. The Senate inferred from these marks that his mind was irritated. Nevertheless, on the young man apologizing for some things, and undertaking that others should be performed in the manner most agreeable to the Senate, they ordered the answer to be given him. That, in no instance had his father acted with more propriety, or given more pleasure to the Senate, than in his choosing, whatever the nature of those transactions might be, to send his excuses for them to the Romans, by his son Demetrius. That the Senate could leave unnoticed, forget, and put up with, many past matters, and believe also that they might place confidence in Demetrius. For though they restored his person to his father, they still had his mind as a hostage, and were convinced that, as far as he could, without infringing on his duty to his father, he was a friend to the Roman people. That, to do him honor, they would send ambassadors into Macedon, in order that, if anything which ought to have been done was left undone, it might then be effected, but still without requiring an atonement for former omissions. That they wished Philip also to be sensible, that it was owing to the kind offices of his son Demetrius, that the treaty between him and the Roman people remained inviolate. 48. These declarations, which were made with the intention of adding to the dignity of his character, proved to the young man the cause of immediate envy, and of not far distant ruin. The Lacedaemonians were next introduced, when many insignificant disputes were agitated. Those which might be deemed important were, whether the persons whom the Achaeans had condemned, should be reinstated or not. Whether they slew with justice or the reverse those whom they put to death. The question was debated also whether the Lacedaemonians should continue in the Achaeans' council, or, as had formerly been the case, that single state in Peloponnesus should have separate independence. It was determined off that the condemned should be reinstated, and the sentences passed reversed, that Lacedaemon should continue in the Achaean council, and that this decree should be committed to writing, and signed by the Lacedaemonians and Achaeans. Quintus Martius was sent ambassador into Macedon, with orders, likewise, to take a view of the affairs of the allies in Peloponnesus. For there also disturbances still subsisted, in consequence of the old quarrels, and Messini had revolted from the Achaean Confederacy. But if I were to trace out the cause and progress of this war, should deviate from the resolution by which I determined not to treat of foreign events, further than they are connected with the affairs of Rome. 49. One event deserves to be mentioned, that, notwithstanding the Achaeans had a superiority in the war, Philippemon, their praetor, was taken prisoner on his march to secure Corone, which the enemy meant to attack, being, with a small party of horse. Surprised in a dangerous defile. It is said that he might have effected his own escape, by the aid of some Thracians and Cretans who were with him, but the shame of deserting his horsemen, the most distinguished youths in the nation, selected by himself a short time before. Detained him there. Whilst he is procuring for these an opportunity of getting clear of the narrow defile, by closing the rear in person, and sustaining the assaults of the enemy, his horse fell. By the shock of his fall, and the weight of the horse, which fell upon him, he was very nearly killed on the spot. For he was now seventy years old, and his strength had been greatly impaired by a tedious illness, from which he was but just recovered. 
Lying thus on the ground, the enemy pouring on, secured him. Out of respect to his character, however, and from regard to his merit, they raised him up, when they recognized him, with as much care as if he had been their own commander, and revived him, and carried him out of that remote valley into the road. And they scarcely believed their own senses, on account of the unexpected joy. However, some of them sent on messages to Messini, that the war was at an end, for they were bringing Philippeman prisoner. At first it seemed so incredible, that the messenger was deemed either a liar or a madman. Afterwards, when numbers came, one after another, all asserting the same, credence was at length given to the matter. And, before they well knew whether he was come near the city, all, freemen and slaves, with even women and children, poured out to enjoy the sight. Insomuch that the multitude quite closed up the gate, whilst each person seemed unlikely to consider the thing as certain unless he should obtain certain belief by his own eyesight. Those who conducted Philippemen, with difficulty removing those in their way, were able to enter the gate, but the dense crowd completely blocked up the street. And, as the greatest part of these were excluded from the sight, they suddenly filled a theater which was contiguous to the street, and all with one voice insisted that he should be brought thither for the public view. The magistrates and leading men, fearing that compassion for so great a man, on seeing him, would cause some disturbance. As many would be moved by respect for his former dignity, when they compared it with his present condition, and many by the recollection of his transcendent merits, placed him where he could be seen at a distance. And quickly after hurried him away out of the sight of the people, who were told by the praetor, Dinocrates, that there were some subjects intimately connected with the decision of the war, on which the magistrates wished to interrogate him. Having carried him thence to the senate house, and called the council together, they began a consultation on the measures to be pursued. 50. The evening came on while they were still at a loss, not only about other matters, but even about the place where he might be kept with proper security during the following night. They were quite confounded at the greatness of his former fortune and merit, and they neither dared to undertake the guarding of him at their houses, nor thought it safe to trust the custody of him to any individual. At last some persons reminded them of a public treasury underground, enclosed with hewn stone, into this place he was put down, in chains, and a huge stone, with which it is generally covered, was placed over it, with the help of a machine. After having thus determined to trust to the place, rather than to any man, for his safe keeping, they waited with impatience for the dawn. On the following day, the whole populace, mindful of his former services to the state, declared their opinion, that they ought to spare him, and to seek through his means some remedies for their present misfortunes. But the authors of the revolt, in whose hands was the management of affairs, consulting in secret, unanimously resolved to put him to death, but whether they should do it speedily, or defer it, was for some time a matter of doubt. The party that were more eager for his immediate execution, at length prevailed, and a person was sent to him with poison. They relate, that on receiving the cup, he only asked if Lycordas, the other commander of the Achaeans, and the horsemen had escaped. And being told that they were safe, he said, it is well, and then intrepidly drinking the contents of the cup, expired shortly after. The actors of this piece of cruelty, however, did not long rejoice at his death. For Messini being conquered in war, delivered up the guilty individuals to the Achaeans, when they positively demanded them. The bones of Philippemen were restored, and his funeral was attended by the whole Achaean council, every human honor being heaped on him to such a degree, that they did not withhold divine ones. So much is conceded to this man by historians, both Greek and Latin, that several of them have recorded, as a circumstance remarkably distinguishing this year, that three illustrious commanders died in it, Philippemen, Hannibal, and Publius Scipio. To such an extent have they placed him on an equal footing with the most consummate generals of the two most powerful nations. 51. Titus Quintius Flamininus came ambassador to King Prusias, who had incurred the jealousy of the Romans, by entertaining Hannibal after the flight of Antiochus, and by making war on Eumenes. At the court of Prusias, either because, among other discourse, he reproached him with his giving protection to a person, who, of all men living, was the most inveterate enemy to the Roman nation, who had incited, first his own country. 
And afterwards, when its power was reduced, King Antiochus, to make war on Rome. Or because Prusias himself, with the design of gratifying Flamininus and the Roman people, conceived the design of killing Hannibal, or delivering him into their hands. Immediately after the first conference with Flamininus, a party of soldiers was sent to guard Hannibal's house. The Carthaginian had always foreseen some such end of his life. For he knew the implacable hatred which the Romans bore him, and placed little confidence in the faith of kings. Besides, he had experienced the fickle temper of Prusias, and had, for some time, dreaded the arrival of Flamininus, as an event fatal to him. Encircled by enemies on every side, in order to have always some path open for flight, he had made seven passages from his house, of which some were concealed, lest they might be invested by a guard. But the imperious government of kings suffers nothing to remain secret which they choose to discover. They surrounded the circuit of the entire house with guards in such a manner, that no one could escape from it. Hannibal, on being told that some of the king's soldiers were in the porch, endeavored to escape through a back door, which was the most private, and from which the passage was most secret. But, perceiving that to be guarded by a body of soldiers, and every avenue round to be blocked up by the guards that were posted, he called for poison, which he had long kept in readiness to meet such an event, and said, Let us release the Romans from their long anxiety, since they think it too long to wait for the death of an old man. Flamininus will gain no very great or memorable victory over one unarmed and betrayed. What an alteration has taken place in the behavior of the Roman people, this day affords abundant proof. Their fathers gave warning to Pyrrhus, their armed foe, then heading an army against them in Italy, to beware of poison. The present generation have sent an ambassador, of consular rank, to persuade Prusias villainously to murder his guest. Then imprecating curses on the head of Prusias, and on his kingdom, and calling on the gods who presided over hospitality, and were witnesses of his breach of faith, he drank off the contents of the cup. This was the end of the life of Hannibal. 52. Both Polybius and Rutilius say, that Scipio died in this year, but I do not agree either with them, or Valerius. Not with them, because I find that in the censorship of Marcus Porcius and Lucius Valerius, the censor himself, Lucius Valerius, was chosen prince of the senate, although Africanus had occupied that place for the three preceding lustrums. And, if he were alive, unless he had been displaced from the senate, which disgrace no one has recorded, another prince would not have been chosen in his room. The authority of Antius is refuted by the plebeian tribunate of Marcus Naevius, against whom there is extant a speech signed by Publius Africanus. Now, this Marcus Naevius, in the register of the magistrates, appears to have been plebeian tribune in the consulate of Publius Claudius and Lucius Porcius. But he entered on the tribuneship in the consulate of Appius Claudius and Marcus Sempronius, on the fourth day before the Ides of December, from which time to the Ides of March, when Publius Claudius and Lucius Porcius became consuls. There are three months. Thus it appears that he was living in the tribunate of Marcus Naevius, and might have been prosecuted by him, but that he died before the censorship of Lucius Valerius and Marcus Porcius. The deaths of the three most illustrious men of their respective nations have a similarity, not only in respect to the concurrence of the times, but in this circumstance also, that no one of them met a death suitable to the splendor of his life. In the first place, neither of them died or was buried in his native soil. Hannibal and Philippemon were taken off by poison, Hannibal breathed his last in exile, betrayed by his host, Philippemon in captivity, in a prison, and in chains. Scipio, though neither banished nor condemned, yet under prosecution, and summoned as an absent criminal to a trial, at which he did not appear, passed sentence of voluntary exile, not only on himself while alive, but likewise on his body after death. 53. During these transactions in Peloponnesus, from which my narration digressed, the return of Demetrius with the ambassadors into Macedonia, affected people's minds in various manners. The generality of the Macedonians, whom the apprehension of an impending war with the Romans had struck with terror, looked with the highest esteem on Demetrius, as the promoter of peace. And, at the same time, with confident hope, destined for him the throne, after the demise of his father. They argued, 
that, although he was younger than Perseus, yet he was born of a wife, and the other of a concubine. That the latter, born of a mother who prostituted her person, had no likeness to any particular father, whereas the former had a striking resemblance of Philip. Besides it was probable that the Romans would place him on the throne of his father, as Perseus had no pretensions to their favor. Such was the conversation of people, in general. Fear tortured Perseus, lest his age alone might not sufficiently secure his interest, his brother having the advantage of him in every other particular. While Philip himself, believing that it would scarcely rest with his decision which of them he should leave heir to his dominions, began to think that his younger son encroached on him more than he could wish. He was sometimes displeased at the numerous attendants of the Macedonians round Demetrius, and chagrined at perceiving that there was a second court during his own lifetime. The young prince no doubt came home much elevated in his own estimation, elated with the honours paid him by the senate, and their having conceded to him, what they had refused to his father. Insomuch that every mention of the Romans, whatever degree of respect it procured him from the rest of the Macedonians, created an equal degree of envy, not only in the breast of his brother, but also in that of his father. Especially after the Roman ambassadors arrived, and the king was obliged to evacuate Thrace, to withdraw his garrisons, and to perform the other articles. Either according to the decisions of the former ambassadors or the late regulations made by the Senate. But all this he did with great reluctance, and even with anguish of mind, the more on this account, because he saw his son more frequently in company with them than with himself. Nevertheless, to avoid giving any pretense for an immediate commencement of hostilities, he acted submissively towards the Romans. Thinking it necessary to turn away their thoughts from a suspicion of any such designs, he led an army into the heart of Thrace, against the Odrysians, Dantheletians, and Bessians. He took the city of Philippopolis, after it was deserted by the inhabitants, who fled with their families to the tops of the nearest mountains, and, by wasting the country, reduced the barbarians living in the plains to submission. Then leaving a garrison in Philippopolis, which, was soon after expelled by the Odrysians, he began to build a town in Duriopus. This is a district of Paeonia, near the river Erigonus, which, flowing from Illyricum through Paeonia, falls into the river Axius. Not far from the old city of Stobi he built his new one, which he ordered to be called Perseus, that this honour might be conferred on his eldest son. 54. While these things passed in Macedonia, the consuls went to their provinces. Marcellus sent forward an express to Lucius Porcius, the proconsul, to lead up the legions to the new town of the Gauls, they surrendered themselves to the consul on his arrival. There were of these twelve thousand fighting men, most of whom had arms, which they had forced from the inhabitants, all which, to their great mortification, were taken from them. As was everything else which they had either acquired by plundering in the country, or had brought along with them. They sent ambassadors to Rome to complain of those proceedings, who being introduced to an audience of the Senate, by the praetor Caius Valerius represented that, in consequence of a redundancy of people in Gaul they had been compelled by the want of land, and indeed of everything, to cross the Alps in quest of a settlement, that they had settled in those lands which they found waste and uncultivated without doing injury to any. They had likewise begun to build a town, which was a proof that they did not come to ravage either city or lands. That some time ago, Marcus Claudius sent them a message, that unless they surrendered to him he would march against them, and that preferring a certain, though not very honourable peace, to the uncertainties of war. They had thrown themselves on the protection of Rome before they submitted to its power. That in a short time after, being ordered to quit the country, they had intended to remove without murmuring to whatever part of the world they were able. And that, notwithstanding, their arms, and finally all the property which they had brought with them, or driven before them, were taken from them. They therefore besought the Senate and people of Rome not to treat harmless people, who had surrendered themselves, with greater severity than they would enemies. To this discourse the Senate ordered the following answer to be given, that neither had they acted properly in coming into Italy, and attempting to build a town in the territory of others. Without permission from any Roman magistrate commanding in that province. Nor did the Senate approve of people who had surrendered being stripped of their property. They would therefore send to the consuls ambassadors, 
who would order all their effects to be restored, provided they returned to the place whence they came. And who would also proceed to the other side of the Alps, and give warning to the Gallic states to keep their people at home. That the Alps, an almost impassable barrier, lay between the two countries, and whoever should pass in future, should meet no better fate than those who first proved them to be passable. The ambassadors sent were Lucius Furius Perperio, Quintus Minutius, Publius Manlius Asidinus. The Gauls, on the restoration of such property as they were in possession of, without wronging any man, withdrew out of Italy. 55. The Transalpine states answered the Roman ambassadors in terms of kindness. Their elders even found fault with the excessive lenity of the Roman people, in suffering men to depart with impunity, who, without an order of their nation, left their home, attempted to seize on lands belonging to the Roman Empire, and to build a town in a territory which belonged to others. They ought, they said, to have paid a heavy penalty for their inconsiderate conduct. And as to the restoration of their effects, they expressed a fear, lest, in consequence of this too great forbearance, others might be encouraged to attempts of a like nature. They not only entertained the ambassadors, but conferred considerable presents on them. The consul, Marcus Claudius, when he had sent the Gauls out of his province, began to prepare for a war with the Istrians, and wrote to the Senate for permission to lead the legions into their country. That measure pleased the Senate. They formed an intention of establishing a colony at Aquileia, nor were they able to decide whether it should consist of Latins or Roman citizens, at last however they passed a vote in favor of a Latin settlement. The commissioners appointed for the purpose were, Publius Scipio Nasica, Caius Flaminius, and Lucius Manlius Asidinus. In the same year, colonies of Roman citizens were led out to Mutina and Parma. Two thousand men were settled in each colony, on lands which lately belonged to the Boians, and formerly to the Tuscans, they received at Parma eight acres, at Mutina five each. These colonists were conducted by Marcus Emilius Lepidus, Titus Abucius Carus, and Lucius Quintius Crispinus. The colony of Satinia, also consisting of Roman citizens, was settled on the lands of Caeltra, by Quintus Fabius Labio, Caius Afranius Stelio, and Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. Ten acres were assigned to each man. 56. In the same year Aulus Terentius Varro, the proprietor, fought some successful battles with the Celtiberians, not far from the river Iberus, in the territory of Azida, reducing several towns, which they had fortified in that quarter. The farther Spain was quiet during the whole year, because Publius Sempronius, the proprietor, was seized with a lingering disorder, and the Lusitanians, when no one attacked them, very opportunely kept quiet. In Liguria nothing extraordinary was performed by Quintus Fabius, the consul. Marcus Marcellus being recalled out of Istria to attend the elections, disbanded his army, and came home to Rome. He elected Gnaeus Bibius Tamphilus and Lucius Emilius Paulus consuls. This latter had been curule edile, along with Marcus Emilius Lepidus, from the time of whose consulate this was the fifth year. And this very Lepidus had been made consul after two repulses. Then Quintus Fulvius Flaccus, Marcus Valerius Lavinus, Publius Manlius a second time, Marcus Ogonius Gallus, Lucius Cicilius Denter, and Caius Terentius Istra, were elected praetors. Towards the close of the year, a supplication was performed on occasion of prodigies, for people were persuaded that it had rained blood for two days in the court of the Temple of Concord. And an account was received, that near the coast of Sicily a new island, which had never been there before, rose out of the sea. Valerius, of Antium, asserts that Hannibal died in this year, and that besides Titus Quintius Flamininus, whose name was celebrated in this business, Lucius Scipio Asiaticus, and Publius Scipio Nasica, were sent ambassadors to Prussia's on that occasion. Book XL When Philip had ordered the children of those whom he had put to death, to be sought after as hostages, Theoxena, fearing the king's passion for her own children and those of her sister, who were still quite young, brought forward swords in a cup in which there was poison, and persuaded them to escape, by putting an end to their existence, the mockery that awaited them. After administering which advice, she in company with her husband plunged headlong from the ship into the sea. 
the quarrels between Perseus and Demetrius, the sons of Philip, king of Macedon, are related. And how that Demetrius was first assailed by accusations invented through his brother's guile, and among the rest, an impeachment for parricide and aspiring to the throne, and at last, since he was the friend of the Roman people, cut off by poison. And the kingdom of Macedon, on the death of Philip, fell to Perseus. It contains likewise the exploits successfully achieved by very many commanders in Liguria, and against the Celtiberians in Spain. Under the geniculum, in the field of L. Petilius, the secretary, the books of Numa Pompilius were found by the laborers of the field, enclosed in a stone chest, written in both Latin and Greek characters. In which, when the praetor, to whom they had been brought, had read very many things calculated to overthrow the present system of religion, he swore to the Senate that their being read and preserved would be detrimental to the state. And by a decree of the Senate they were burned in the Comitium. The colony of Aquilia was planted. Philip, worn out by the pangs of conscience, because, influenced by the false information of his other son Perseus, he had by poison removed from life seen his son Demetrius. Both resolved on the punishment of Perseus and desired to leave his friend Antigonus, rather than him, as his successor. But, whilst forming this project, he was hurried off by death. Perseus received the kingdom. 1. At the commencement of the next year, the consuls and praetors determined the provinces by lot. For the consuls there was no province to be decreed, except Liguria. The city jurisdiction fell to Marcus Ogonius Gallus, that among foreigners, to Marcus Valerius, of the Spains, the hither, to Marcus Fulvius Flaccus. The farther, to Publius Manlius, Sicily, to Lucius Tacilius Denter, and Sardinia, to Caius Terentius Istra. The consuls were ordered to hold levies, for Quintus Fabius had written from Liguria, that the Apuani seemed inclined to a renewal of hostilities, and that it was to be feared that they would make an eruption into the district of Pisi. From the Spains, also, they received intelligence that the hither province was in arms. That the war still continued with the Celtiberians, that, in the farther province, because the praetor had been for a long time indisposed, military discipline was relaxed by intemperance and inactivity. For these reasons it was decreed that new armies should be raised. For legions for Liguria, that each might contain 5,200 foot, and 300 horse, and to these same were added, 15,000 foot and 800 horse of the Latin allies. These were to complete the two consular armies. They were ordered, also, to enroll 7,000 foot and 400 horse, of the allies and Latins, and to send them into Gaul to Marcus Marcellus, whose command was prolonged on the expiration of his consulship. They were ordered to be levied, of Roman citizens, 4,000 infantry and 200 cavalry, and of the allies, 7,000 infantry with 300 cavalry, which should be also led into both Spains. And to Quintus Fabius Labio, with the army which he had in Liguria, was the command prolonged for a year. 2. The spring of this year was remarkable for storms. On the day before the Feast of Pales, a tremendous hurricane arose about midday, and made havoc in many places, both sacred and common. It threw down the brazen statues in the capital. Tore away a gate from the Temple of Luna, which is on the Aventine, and fastened it to the back parts of the Temple of Ceres, overturned other statues in the Circus Maximus, together with the pillars on which they stood. Tore off several cupolas from the roofs of temples, and scattered them in an unseemly manner. This storm was converted into a prodigy, and the Aruspices ordered it to be attended to. At the same time expiation was made, because it had been reported that a three-footed mule was born at Riate, and that the temple of Apollo, at Formii, and at Caida, was struck with lightning. On account of these prodigies, a sacrifice of twenty larger victims was offered, and there was a supplication of one day's continuance. About the same time information was obtained from a letter of Aulus Terentius, the proprietor, that Publius Sempronius, after being sick for more than a year, had died in the farther province, on this account the praetors were ordered to set out sooner for Spain. The foreign embassies were then brought before the Senate, and first, those of the king's Eumenes and Farnaces, and of the Rhodians, complaining of the sufferings of the inhabitants of Sinope. 
There came also, about the same time, the ambassadors of Philip, the Achaeans, and Lacedaemonians. Answers were given to these, after Martius, who had been sent to inspect the affairs of Greece and Macedonia, had first received an audience. To the Asiatic kings and the Rhodians, they answered, that the Senate would send ambassadors to examine into those matters. 3. Martius had increased their anxiety respecting Philip. 4. He acknowledged that the latter had acquiesced with the will of the Senate in such a manner, as to render it very evident, that he would conform to it no longer than necessity obliged him. Nor was it difficult to see, that he intended to renew hostilities, and that everything which he then said and did had a tendency that way. Now, in the first place, he removed almost the whole body of the citizens, with their families, from the maritime cities, into Amathia, which is its modern name, it was formerly called Peonia. He gave up those cities to be inhabited by Thracians, and other barbarians, thinking that this kind of people would prove more faithful to him in case of a war with Rome. This proceeding caused great discontent over all Macedonia. And of those who, with their wives and children, left their dwellings, few concealed their grief in silence, and, their hatred overcoming their fear, imprecations against the king were heard, as they proceeded along in groups. His mind, rendered savage by these things, entertained suspicions of all men, places, and seasons. At last he began to confess openly, that he had nothing sufficiently safe without seizing and confining the sons of those whom he had destroyed, and sending them out of the world at different times. 4. This cruelty, horrible in itself, the calamities of one particular family rendered still more so. Philip had, many years before, put to death Herodicus, a Thessalian of distinction, and afterwards his sons-in-law. His daughters were left widows, having each a little son. The names of the women were Theoxena and Arco. Theoxena, though courted by many, rejected every offer of marriage. Arco married a certain Poris, by far the first of the Aenean nation. And, after bearing him many children, died, leaving them all quite young. Theoxena then, in order that her sister's children might be educated under her own inspection, married Poris, and as if she herself had borne them all, treated her own and her sister's sons with the same affectionate care. When she heard of the king's order for seizing the children of the persons who had been put to death, supposing that they were destined to afford sport not only to the king's lust, but to that of his guards, she formed in her mind a horrid project. And had the hardiness to declare, that she would kill them all with her own hand, rather than they should come into the power of Philip. Poris, abhorring the mention of such a dreadful deed, told her that he would carry them away to Athens, to some faithful friends, and would himself accompany them in their flight. They all went from Thessalonica to Enea, to a stated sacrifice, which they offer yearly, with great solemnity, in honor of Aeneas, the founder of the nation. Having spent the day there, in the anniversary feast, about the third watch, when all were asleep, they embarked in a vessel ready prepared by Poris, as if intending to return to Thessalonica, but their design was to cross over to Euboea. However, daylight surprised them at a small distance from the land, struggling in vain against a contrary wind, and the king's officers, who commanded the garrison of the port, dispatched an armed bark to bring back their ship. With a strict injunction not to return without it. When they were now drawing nigh, Poris was intently occupied in animating the rowers and sailors, and, at times, raising his hands towards heaven, supplicated the gods to assist him. Meanwhile, the woman, with desperate fury recurring to the shocking design which she had long premeditated, dissolves some poison, and produces swords. Then, placing the cup in their view, and unsheathing the swords, she says, Death is our only refuge. These paths lead thither, by whichever of them each one's inclination leads them to adopt, let them escape the tyranny of the king. Come then, dear youths, let those of you who are the elder, first take the sword, or, if a slower death is your choice, drain the cup. At the same time the enemy was fast approaching, and she, who urged them to dispatch themselves, was urgent. The young men, having put an end to their lives some by the one and some by the other fatal expedient, were thrown expiring into the sea. Then, embracing her husband and companion in death, she plunged into the deep. 
the king's officers then took possession of the ship, deserted by its owners. 5. The barbarity connected with this deed added fresh fuel to the flame of public resentment kindled against the king, insomuch that most people uttered imprecations on himself and his children. Which curses being in a short time heard by all the gods, caused him to vent his cruelty on his own blood relations. For Perseus, when he perceived that the popularity and high reputation of his brother Demetrius among the Macedonian people, and interest among the Romans, increased more and more every day. And that no hope was left him of obtaining the crown save by the instrumentality of some wicked device, bent all his thoughts to that one object. But not thinking himself alone strong enough even for the dastardly project, which he meditated in his effeminate mind, he began to tamper with each of his father's friends by dark suggestions. At first, several of these showed an appearance of rejecting with scorn any such overtures, because they entertained higher expectations from Demetrius. Afterwards Philip's animosity to the Romans increased every day, which Perseus fomented. But Demetrius, with all his might, opposed. Foreseeing the fatal doom of the youth, who heeded not a brother's guile, and thinking that they must lend their assistance to the accomplishment of what was likely to take place, and cherish the hopes of the more powerful. They united themselves to Perseus. They defer the execution of other measures till their proper season. For the present, it seems good that the king should by every strenuous exertion be inflamed against the Romans, and urged to form resolutions for war, to which he had already of his own accord turned his attention. At the same time, in order that Demetrius might be a greater object of suspicion every day, they used deliberately to prolong the conversations even to the use of insulting language towards the Romans. Thereupon, when some depreciating their manners and institutions, some their military achievements, some the appearance of the city itself, unadorned either by public or private structures. Others spoke scornfully of some particular individuals among their principal men. On these occasions, the young prince unwary, both out of affection for the Roman nation, and opposition to his brother, by maintaining their cause in all things, rendered himself an object of suspicion to his father and a fit subject for their accusations. His father therefore kept him a stranger to all his designs respecting the Romans, he was entirely devoted to Perseus, and held with him, daily and nightly, deliberations on that subject. The envoys had returned whom he happened to have sent to the Bastarnians, to solicit aid, and brought with them from thence young men of distinction, and some of royal extraction. One of whom promised his sister in marriage to Philip's son, and the connection with that nation raised the king's spirits. Hereupon Perseus said, What does that avail? There is by no means as much protection afforded by foreign aid, as there is danger arising from domestic treachery. I am unwilling to call him traitor, but a spy we certainly have in our bosom, and although the Romans have restored to us his body, since he was a hostage at Rome, yet they still possess his heart. The faces of almost all the Macedonians are turned towards him, and they think they are to have no other king but him whom the Romans would give them. By such discourses the old man's mind, distempered in itself, was stimulated to passion, and these imputations he received deeper in his mind, than appeared from his countenance. 6. It happened to be the time of the purification of the army. Which ceremony is thus performed, the head and forepart of a dog cut through the middle is laid at the right side of the way, and the hinder part with the entrails at the left. Between the parts of the victim, thus divided, the forces are led under arms. In the front of the van, are carried the remarkable suits of armor of all the kings of Macedon, from the remotest origin. Next follows the king himself, with his children, then the royal cohort and bodyguards, and the remaining body of the Macedonians close the rear. The two young sons of the king attend by his side. Perseus being now in his thirtieth year, Demetrius five years younger, the former in the full strength of manhood, the latter in its bloom, the mature offspring of a fortunate parent, if his mind had been influenced by reason. The custom was, that when the purificatory sacrifice was finished, the army should perform their evolutions, and the two lines divided on both sides should engage in a mock fight. The young princes were appointed commanders in this mock engagement. But it was not the mere representation of a battle, for they engaged as if they were fighting for the throne, 
many wounds were given with stakes, nor was anything but the steel wanting to give it the form of a regular battle. The party which was under the command of Demetrius, was far superior. While Perseus was vexed thereat, his considerate friends rejoiced, and said, that that very circumstance would afford grounds for impeaching the youth. 7. Each of the princes gave an entertainment that day to his comrades, who had exercised under his command. Perseus being invited to supper by Demetrius, refused, kind hospitality in youthful merriment led both to excess in wine. Thereupon mention was made of the mock engagement, and numerous remarks were thrown out against the antagonists in such a manner as not to spare even the leaders themselves. To learn these expressions, a spy was sent from among the guests of Perseus, but not conducting himself with sufficient caution, he was detected by some young men who happened to come out of the banqueting room, and severely beaten. Demetrius, knowing nothing of this matter, said, Why do we not go to my brother, join with him in merriment, and by our frankness and gaiety assuage his resentment, if any, arising from the engagement, as yet remains. All with one accord cried out that they would attend him, except those who were afraid of the immediate revenge of the spy that had been beaten by them. When Demetrius pressed these also, they concealed swords under their clothes, with which they might defend themselves if any violence should be offered. In the case of domestic discord, nothing that is concealed can remain so. Both houses were full of spies and traitors. An informer ran on before to Perseus, and told him, that four young men, armed with swords, were coming with Demetrius. Though the reason was evident, for he had heard that his guest had been beaten by them, yet, for the purpose of blackening the matter, he ordered his gate to be locked, and from the upper part of the house and the windows facing the street. He drives away the revellers, as if they were come to murder him, from the entrance to the gate. Demetrius flushed with wine, having for a little exclaimed loudly at his being shut out, returns home to his own feast entirely ignorant of the meaning of the whole proceeding. 8. Next day, Perseus, as soon as an opportunity of seeing his father was afforded him, entered the palace, and with looks expressive of disquietude stood silent in the presence of his sire but at some distance. Of whom when his father inquired, if all was well, and what was the cause of that sadness, he answers, know that it is by the sufferance of another that your son survives. We are now attacked by my brother with no secret treachery. He came by night to my house, with armed men to take away my life, and it was by shut doors, and the protection afforded by the walls, that I was saved from his fury. When he had inspired into his father a horror mixed with wonder, he adds, If you can listen to me, I shall cause you to understand the affair as an evident truth. But Philip replied that he would hear him, and ordered Demetrius to be instantly summoned. He then sent for two friends of advanced age, Lysimachus and Onomastus, who never interfered in the juvenile disputes of the brothers, and were of late rare visitors in the palace, that he might have their assistance in council. While his friends are coming he walked about by himself, secretly revolving many things in his mind, his son still standing at a distance. On being told that they had arrived, he retired with his two friends, and the same number of his lifeguards, into an inner apartment, he permitted each of his sons to bring in three persons unarmed. Here, having taken his seat, he says, I, the most unhappy of fathers, sit here as judge between my two sons, the accuser and the accused of the crime of fratricide. About to find, in my nearest of relations, the foul stain either of falsehood or a commission of crime. For a long time, indeed, I have apprehended an impending storm, after I perceived your mutual looks, which showed no sign of brotherly affection, and after I had overheard some expressions. But I sometimes cherished the hope that your passions would subside, and that your suspicions could be removed, that even enemies lay down their arms and form a treaty, and that the private disputes of many have been ended. And I trusted that the remembrance of your fraternal relationship would at some time or other occur to you, and of the simplicity and intimacy that subsisted between you in your boyish days. And finally, of my instructions, which, I fear, I have fruitlessly poured into deaf ears. How often have I, in your hearing, mentioned, with abhorrence, examples of the disagreements of brothers, and recounted the dreadful consequences of them, by which themselves, their offspring, their houses, and their kingdoms. Have been utterly ruined. 
I have represented, on the other hand, more laudable examples, also the social intercourse between the two kings of the Lacedaemonians, beneficial to themselves and to their country for many ages. And that this same state, after the custom of each one arbitrarily seizing on absolute power prevailed, was quite overturned. Then, that these brothers, Eumenes and Atlas, raised their dominions, from so small circumstances, that they were almost ashamed of the title of king, to an equality with mine, or with those of Antiochus, or indeed of any monarch of this age. And by nothing else than by brotherly concord. Nor did I decline showing you examples even from among the Romans that I had either seen or heard, as of Titus and Lucius Quintius, who carried on the war against me, the two Scipios, Publius and Lucius, who vanquished Antiochus. And their father and uncle, the lasting harmony of whose life even death could not dissolve. But neither could the wickedness of the former, attended by an issue suitable to their crimes, deter you from your foolish quarrels. Nor could the sound judgment and good fortune of the latter bend you to wisdom. While I am alive and in health, you have both in your hopes and wicked desires laid hold on my inheritance. You wish me to live just so long as that, surviving one, I should, by my death, make the other king without a competitor. You cannot endure to have either brother or father. You have no sense of affection, no religion, your insatiable passion for regal sway alone has supplied the place of all other feelings. Come, then, pollute your father's ears, contend with mutual accusations, as you soon will with the sword. Speak openly either whatever truth you can, or are pleased to invent. My ears are now opened, which henceforward will be shut against all secret charges of one against the other. When with furious passion he had uttered these words, tears gushed from the whole assembly and a sorrowful silence long prevailed. 9. At length Perseus spoke to this effect, I ought then, it seems, to have opened my gate in the night, and admitted those armed revellers, and held out my throat to their swords. Since nothing less than the perpetration of the deed can gain belief, and since I, who have been assailed by secret treachery am accosted in the same language as a robber and an assassin might expect. It is not without reason, that those people say that you have but one son, Demetrius, and that I am supposititious, and born of a concubine. For if I held in your breast the rank of a son, or the affection due to one, you would wreak your anger not on me, who complain of discovered treachery, but on him who was the author of it. Nor would my life be so worthless in your eyes, that you should neither be moved by the danger which I have already undergone, nor by that to which I must be exposed in future, if punishment be not inflicted on the assassins. If, therefore, it be our doom to die secretly let us be silent, only offering prayers to the gods that the wickedness commenced with me may terminate in me, and that you be not aimed at through my side. But if, as nature itself suggests to those encompassed with perils in a desert place, to implore assistance even from men whom they had never seen, so I, on seeing a sword drawn against me, may be allowed to raise my voice. I beseech you then, by your own person, by the name of Father, and you long know which of us reveres that title most, that you may hear me in the same manner as you would if, roused by cries and lamentations by night, you had come up. When I was crying for help, and in the dead of night had found Demetrius, with armed men, in the porch of my house. What I should, at that time, and in that case, have exclaimed with terror, I now, next day, lay before you in form of a complaint. Brother, it is long since you and I lived together on the terms of mutual hospitality, you certainly wish to be king. This my expectation, my age, opposes, the law of nations opposes, the ancient practice of Macedon opposes, and moreover the judgment of my father opposes. These you can surmount by no other means than by shedding my blood. You are making every scheme and every attempt. Hitherto, either my care or fortune has prevented the fratricide you intended to commit. Yesterday, on occasion of the purification, the military exercise and mock representation of a fight, you almost rendered it a bloody battle, nor was I saved from death by any other means than by suffering myself and my party to be overcome. Pretending brotherly sport, you wanted to drag me from a hostile fight to your house to supper. Father, do you think that I, to whom they came in arms, that they might drink with me, would have supped there with unarmed guests? 
Do you think that I would have been in no danger from their swords by night, when they almost killed me with stakes, of which you were a spectator? Why, Demetrius, did you come at that time of night, why an enemy come to a person provoked? Why with young men in arms? I did not venture to trust myself with you as a guest, and shall I admit you as a reveller, coming with armed men? Father, if the gate had been open, you would be preparing my funeral at this moment, in which you are hearing my complaint. I do not, as an accuser, urge anything for the purpose of accusation. Nor by collecting doubtful circumstances, in a train of artful arguments. For what can he say? Does he deny that he came to my gate with a large party, or that there were armed men with him? Send for the persons, whom I will name. They who dared to do this, might dare to do anything, nevertheless, they will not dare to deny it. If I brought before you any who had been caught within my doors in arms, you would consider this an evident proof. Consider those who confess in the same light as if actually caught in the fact. 10. Curse now thirst for dominion. Call up the furies, the avengers of the wrongs of brothers, but, Father, let not your curses be undiscriminating. Separate and distinguish the assassin, and him by treachery assailed, and charge the guilty head. Let him, who intended to kill a brother, feel the wrath of the gods, of his father. And let him, who was to have perished by a brother's wickedness, find refuge in his father's compassion and justice. For where else shall I seek refuge, who cannot find safety in the solemn purification of your army, in the exercise of the troops, in my own house, in a feast, nor in the night, which nature's bounty granted to mankind for a season of repose? If I go to my brother, according to his invitation, I must die. If I admit my brother to a party of pleasure within my own gates, I must die. Neither by going, nor by staying, do I escape secret treachery. Whither then shall I betake me? Father, I have courted nothing save the gods and thee. I have not the Romans, to whom I may fly. They seek my destruction, because I grieve at the injuries which they have done you. Because I resent your being deprived of so many cities, so many nations, and, lately, of the coast of Thrace. They have no hope that Macedonia will ever be their property, while either you or I am safe. If a brother's wickedness shall have carried off me, and old age thee, or if even this should not be waited for, they know that both the king and kingdom of Macedonia will become theirs. If the Romans had left you anything beyond the limits of Macedon, I would suppose that even that had been left me as a shelter. But I have protection enough in the Macedonians. You were an eyewitness yesterday of the attack made on me by the soldiers. What did they want, but the steel? And what they wanted, in the day, my brother's guests took to themselves in the night. Why need I mention the greater part of the nobles, who have placed all their hopes of honour and fortune in the Romans, and in him who is all-powerful with the Romans? Nor, in truth, do they prefer him merely to me, his elder brother, but, they want little of preferring him to yourself, his king and father. For, he is the person out of regard to whom the senate remitted to you the intended punishment, who now screens you from the Roman arms, who thinks it fit that your advanced age should be under obligation to, and dependent on, his youth. Him the Romans, him the cities freed from thy jurisdiction, and him the Macedonians, rejoicing at the peace with Rome, defend, but for me, Father, what hope or protection have I anywhere except in thee? 11. What do you suppose to be the intention of the letter lately sent to you by Titus Quintius, in which he not only says, that you acted wisely for your own interest in sending Demetrius to Rome, but also advises you to send him back again? With a greater number of ambassadors, and nobles of Macedonia? Titus Quintius is now his counsellor, and master, in everything. Having renounced you his father, he has substituted him in your place. There in preference to all other places their secret plans are concocted. When he desires you to send greater numbers, and the chief men of Macedon they are seeking assistance in their schemes. For those who go from this place unchanged and uncorrupted, and impressed with the idea that they had Philip as their king, return from thence tainted, infected by Roman blandishments. Demetrius alone is everything to them. They give him the title of king already, even in his father's lifetime. 
If I express my indignation at these things, you must forthwith understand that the crime of thirsting for dominion has been laid to my charge. Not only by others, Father, but even by you. But this charge, if made against both, I do not admit, for whom do I remove from his place, that I may succeed in his room? My Father alone is before me, and that he may long be so, I entreat the gods. I his survivor, and may I be so only on these terms, if, by my desert, he shall wish me to be so, shall receive the inheritance of his kingdom, provided my father shall bequeath it to me. He covets rule, and covets it with criminal passion, since he hastily overleaps the order of age, of nature, of the Macedonian custom, and of the laws of nations. An elder brother stands in his way, to whom by right, and by the wish of his father, the kingdom belongs. Let him be carried off, I shall not be the first that acquired a kingdom by spilling a brother's blood. My father, being old, and forlorn from being bereaved of his son, will rather fear for himself, than revenge his son's death. The Romans will rejoice, they will approve, they will defend the deed. Father, these prospects are uncertain, but they are not groundless. For the matter stands thus, you can repel from me the fatal danger, by inflicting punishment on those who have taken up arms to kill me. If success attend the daring deed, you the very same shall not be able to avenge my death. 12. When Perseus concluded his speech, the eyes of all present were turned to Demetrius, as if he were going to reply immediately. Then, when it was evident to all that, bathed in tears, he was unable to speak, silence for a long time reigned, at length necessity itself, inasmuch as they called on him to speak, overcame his grief, and he began thus, Father. All the aids which heretofore have been the privilege of the accused, my accuser has preoccupied. By his tears, counterfeited for the purpose of working another's ruin, he has caused my unfeigned tears to be suspected by you. Although, ever since I returned from Rome, he, by holding secret consultations with his confederates, labors night and day to ensnare me, yet nevertheless he represents me in the character, not only of a conspirator, but of an open assassin and murderer. He terrifies you with his danger, in order to hasten, through your means, the ruin of an innocent brother. He asserts, that he has a place of refuge nowhere in the world, that I may have no remaining hope even in thee. Circumvented, destitute, and helpless as I am, he loads me with odium arising from foreign favor, which proves detrimental rather than advantageous. Then how, accuser-like, has he blended that which was the crime of this night with other invectives against my conduct, that he might, by representing the tenor of the rest of my life, throw a color of guilt both on the late transaction. The true nature of which you shall soon understand and that he might support the other groundless insinuations respecting my views, wishes, and designs, by this latter, fictitious, fabricated story. He had, at the same time, this design, that his accusation might appear to be sudden and by no means premeditated, as if occasioned by sudden fright and disturbance of this night. But, Perseus, if I were a traitor against my father and his government, if I had formed plans with the Romans, or with other enemies of my father, the tale of last night ought not to have been waited for. I ought to have been long ago brought to answer for my treason. And if the former charge apart from the latter were unfounded, and tended to discover your hatred towards me, rather than my guilt, it ought on the present day also to be either omitted or postponed to some future period. In order that it might clearly appear, whether I plotted against you, or you, with indeed a strange and singular kind of hatred, against me. However, I will, as well as I am able in my present unforeseen perturbation of mind, distinguish those matters which you have confounded, and I will unveil the plot of the preceding evening, whether mine or yours. Perseus wishes it to be believed, that I had formed a design to take his life, with the view, forsooth, that having removed the elder brother, on whom by the law of nations, by the custom of Macedonia, and likewise by your judgment, as he says. The kingdom was to devolve, I, the younger, should succeed in the room of him whom I had slain. What, then, can be the meaning of that other part of his speech, where he says that the Romans were courted by me, and from my reliance on them that I conceived hopes of the crown? For, if I believed that the Romans possessed such influence, that they could appoint whomsoever they pleased king of Macedon, 
and if I had such confidence in my interest with them, what need was there of fratricide? Could it be my wish to wear a diadem stained with a brother's blood, or to become execrable and odious in the eyes of those very people, with whom whatever interest I may happen to have, has been procured by zeal? Or at least affected integrity of conduct? Unless you believe that Titus Quintius, by whose power and advice you allege I am at present governed, though he lives in such cordial affection with his own brother, would recommend to me to murder mine. He has united for me, not only the favour of the Romans, but the opinions of the Macedonians, and the concurring sentiments almost of all the gods and men, by reason of all which he cannot believe that he would prove equal to me in the competition. Yet the same man accuses me of having, though I was inferior to him in every mode of proceeding, had recourse to an act of wickedness as my last resource. Do you wish that the formula of the judicial inquiry should be to this effect, that whichever feared lest the other should seem more worthy of the throne, shall be deemed guilty of designing his brother's destruction? 13. But let us examine the process of this accusation, in whatever manner it has been fabricated. He has arraigned me of attempting his life, by several methods, and all these modes of attack he has crowded into the space of one day. I intended to kill him by day when we engaged after the purification, and, if it seems good to the gods, even on the day of purification. I intended, when I invited him to supper, to take him off by poison of course. I intended, when some armed persons followed me to join his party in their conviviality, to kill him with the sword. You see what sort of opportunities were chosen for this murder, those of sport, feasting, and reveling. What? On what sort of a day? On the day in which the army was purified. In which, after the royal armor of all the former kings of Macedon was carried in procession between the divided victim, when we two only rode along with you, father, at your sides, and the body of the Macedonian troops followed. Now, even supposing that I had formerly been guilty of some crime requiring expiation, could I, after being purified and expiated in this sacred solemnity, at the very time especially when I was looking at the victim laid on each side of our road. Revolved in my mind fratricide, poisons and swords prepared against the feast. With what other sacred rites could I afterwards atone for the guilt of a mind, contaminated with every kind of villainy? But whilst his understanding, blinded by a desire for accusing, wishes to render everything an object of suspicion, it confounds one thing with another. For if I intended to take you off by poison at supper, what could be more incongruous with my design, than to provoke you to rage by an obstinate contest and engagement, that you might have reason to refuse, as you did, my invitation to supper? But when, in your anger, you had refused, whether ought I to have taken pains to pacify you, that I might find another opportunity, since I had got the poison ready, or to pass over, as it were, from that design to another, namely, that of killing you with the sword, and on that same day, under pretense of feasting with you? If I thought that you declined supping with me, through fear for your life, how could I suppose that you would not, through the same fear, have declined drinking with me also? 14. Father, I have no cause to blush, that on a festival day, among companions of my own age, I should have indulged too freely in wine. And I wish you would also inquire with what cheerfulness and mirth yesterday's entertainment, at my house, was rendered festive, that joy also, perhaps a blamable one, increasing it, our party not having been worsted in the fight. This my present misfortune, and my fears, have effectual dissipated the fumes of the liquor, but, if these had not intervened, we, the conspirators, would have been now lying fast asleep. If, Perseus, I designed to storm your house, and after the house had been taken to kill the owner, ought I not to have refrained from wine for that one day, and to have kept my soldiers sober? And that I should not be the only one to defend my cause with excessive candor, my brother himself also, not in the least inclined to malice or suspicion, says, I know nothing more, I charge them with nothing more. Then that they came in arms to drink with me. If I should ask, from what source have you become acquainted with that very circumstance? You must necessarily acknowledge, either that my house was full of your spies, or that my companions took arms so openly, as that every one could see them. Lest he should seem either on a prior occasion to have made any investigation, or now to adduce arguments for the purpose of convicting, 
he desired you to inquire of the persons whom he would name, whether they had swords, in order that, as it were. In a doubtful case, when you had investigated into that which they themselves confessed, they might be deemed convicted. Why do you not rather desire inquiry to be made after this, whether they carried swords for the purpose of killing you, whether by my direction and knowledge? This you wish to be believed, and not that which they confess, and what is, indeed, notorious, they say they carried them for the purpose of defending themselves. Whether they acted right or wrong, let them account for their own conduct. My cause, which is no way affected by this act, do not blend with it. Explain whether we intended to attack you openly, or secretly. If openly, why had we not all swords? Why had no one a sword except those who had beaten your spy? If privately, what was the arrangement of our plan? Were four to remain, in order to fall on you in your sleep, when the banquet broke up, and I your guest had departed? How would they have escaped detection, as being strangers, and belonging to me? And, above all, being liable to suspicion, because they had been in a quarrel a little before. But how were they to have escaped after having killed you? Could your house have been taken and stormed by two swords? 15. Why not rather, having dropped that fable of last night, recur to what really grieves you, what kindles your envy? Say, why, Demetrius, is mention made anywhere of your mounting the throne? Why do you appear, to some, a more worthy successor to your father's dignity than I? Why do you disturb with doubt and anxiety my hopes, which would be certain if you were not in being? These are the thoughts of Perseus, though he does not express them, these make that man my enemy, these create my accuser, these fill your house, these your kingdom, with accusations and suspicions. But, father, as I ought not now either to hope for the crown, or perhaps ever to contend for it, because I am the younger brother, and because you wish that I should yield to the elder. So neither ought I at any former time, or at the present, to act in such a manner as to appear undeserving of you my father, and of all. For I should attain that by my own vices, not by yielding to him on whose side is law both human and divine, not by moderation. You upbraid me with the Romans, and what ought to be deemed an honor, you convert into a crime. I did not request, that I should either be delivered a hostage to the Romans, or sent as an ambassador to Rome. Being commissioned by you, I did not refuse to go. On both occasions, I conducted myself in such a manner, as to be no disgrace to you, to your kingdom, or to the Macedonian nation. You, therefore, father, have been the cause of my friendship with the Romans. As long as peace shall subsist between you and them, so long will I also continue in friendship with them. But, if war should arise, I, the same who have been there a hostage, and no unprofitable ambassador in my father's behalf, will be their most determined enemy. Nor do I, this day, require that the favor of the Romans should be any advantage to me. I only entreat that it be not detrimental. It neither commenced in war, nor is it reserved for war. I have been a pledge of peace, and, to procure a continuance of peace, I was sent ambassador. Let neither be esteemed an honor or a crime. Father, if I have been guilty of any undutiful behavior towards you, or any criminal behavior towards my brother, I beg to be freed from no punishment. If I be innocent, let me not, I beseech you, be destroyed by envy when I cannot by crime. My brother's accusation, this day, is not the first that he has brought against me, but it is the first made openly, and owing to no offense given him by me. If my father were angry with me, it would become you, the elder brother, to intercede for the younger, you to obtain pardon for his youth, and you for his error, but in the very person from whom I ought to receive protection, in him I meet my ruin. From a feast and revelry I have been hurried, almost half asleep, to plead my cause on a charge of fratricide. Without advocates, without patrons, I am compelled to plead my own cause. If I were to speak for another, I would have taken time to study and compose a speech, though, what else would I endanger than that of my reputation for abilities? But, before I knew why I had been summoned, I heard you, in a paroxysm of passion, ordering me to account for my conduct, and my brother accusing me. He employed against me a speech long before prepared and studied. I had only the time in which the accusations were recited, 
for hearing what were the impeachments. During that short space whether should I listen to my accuser, or study a defense. Thunderstruck by the sudden and unthought of calamity, I was scarcely capable of understanding what was alleged against me, much less of being sufficiently aware what defense I should make. What hope indeed could I have, if I had not my father as judge, with whom, though I am outstripped by an elder brother in affection, yet surely, when accused, I ought not to be outstripped in his compassion. For my prayer is, that you would save me, for my sake, and for your own, he demands, that, for his security, you should put me to death. What do you think will he do, when you shall have delivered the kingdom into his hands, who even now thinks it reasonable that he should be gratified with my blood? While he was uttering these words, tears interrupted his breath and voice at the same time. Philip, having sent them away, and conferred a short time with his friends, declared, that he could not from a single hour's discussion give a formulary judgment on the cause between them, but by a scrutiny into the conduct and manners of both. And a close observation of their words and actions, on occasions great and small. That it appeared clearly to all, that the charge relating to the preceding night was effectually refuted, but that Demetrius' favor with the Romans had been an object of suspicion, as being too great. These, as it were, the seeds of the Macedonian war which was to be waged with Perseus, in particular, were sown, when Philip was still alive. 16. Both the consuls set out into Liguria, which at that time was the only consular province. A supplication for one day was decreed because prosperity had attended their affairs in that quarter. About two thousand Ligurians came to the extreme borders of the Gallic province, where Marcellus lay encamped, requesting him to receive their submission. Marcellus, having ordered the Ligurians to wait in the same place, consulted the Senate through the medium of a letter. The Senate ordered Marcus Ogonius, praetor, to write back to Marcellus, that, it would have been more proper for the consuls, whose province it was, than for them, to decide what might tend to the interest of the Republic. That in this case too it was their pleasure, if he should receive the surrender of the Ligurians, that their arms should not be taken from them admitted to a surrender. And that the Senate thought proper that the Ligurians should be sent to the consul. The praetors arrived at the same time in Spain, Publius Manlius in the farther province, which he had governed in his former praetorship, and Quintus Fulvius Flaccus in the hither one, and he received the command of the army from Terentius. For the farther province, by the death of the propraetor, Publius Sempronius, had been without a governor. The Celtiberians attacked Fulvius Flaccus while besieging a town of the Spaniards, called Urbicua. Many severe actions were fought there, and many of the Roman soldiers killed and wounded. They were vanquished by Fulvius' perseverance, because he could by no force be diverted from the siege. The Celtiberians, wearied out with so many battles, retired. The city, having lost their assistance, was within a few days taken and sacked, the praetor bestowed the booty on the soldiers. Fulvius having taken this town, and Publius Manlius having only gathered together his army, which had been scattered, without having achieved any other memorable action, led their armies into winter quarters. These were the transactions of that summer in Spain. Terentius, who had come home from that province, entered the city in ovation. He carried in the procession 9,320 pounds weight of silver, 80 pounds weight of gold, and two golden crowns of the weight of 67 pounds. 17. In the same year the Romans were arbitrators on the spot in a dispute, subsisting between the people of Carthage and King Massinissa, about a tract of ground. This ground Gala, father of Massinissa, had taken from the Carthaginians. Syphax had expelled Gala, and afterwards, from respect to Hasdrubal, his father-in-law, had made a present of it to the Carthaginians. In this year, Massinissa had expelled the Carthaginians. This matter was debated before the Romans with no less mental ardor than they had contended for it with the sword, even in the field of battle. The Carthaginians claimed the ground first, as having been the property of their ancestors. And next, because it had come to them from Syphax. Massinissa urged, that, he had retaken possession of it as part of his father's kingdom, and held it under the law of nations. And that he had the advantage, both in the merits of his cause and in the present possession. That, in this discussion, 
he had no other fear, than lest the moderation of the Romans might operate to his loss, whilst they dreaded the appearance of any partiality to a king who was their friend and ally. In prejudice to the common enemy of him and them. The deputies did not alter the right of possession, but referred the cause entire to the Senate at Rome. There was nothing done afterwards in Liguria. The inhabitants, at first, retired into pathless forests. And afterwards, disbanding their army, separated in every direction among the villages and forts. The consuls, too, wished to disband their forces, and consulted the senators on this matter. They ordered that one of them should discharge his troops, and come to Rome to elect magistrates for the year, and that the other, with his legions, should pass the winter at Pisces. A report prevailed, that the Transalpine Gauls were arming their young men, and it was not known on what quarter of Italy that multitude would pour itself. The consuls settled the matter between them, that Gnaeus Bebius should go home to the elections, because his brother, Marcus Bebius, was a candidate for the consulship. 18. The assembly for the election of consuls was held, and Publius Cornelius Cethegus and Marcus Bebius Tamphilus were chosen. The praetors were afterwards elected, Quintus Fabius Maximus, Quintus Fabius Budio, Tiberius Claudius Nero, Quintus Petilius Spurinus, Marcus Panarius Pasca, and Lucius Duronius. When the magistrates entered into office, the provinces fell to these by lot in the following order, to the consuls, Liguria, to the praetors, Quintus Petilius, the city, and Quintus Fabius Maximus, the foreign jurisdiction. To Quintus Fabius Budio, Gaul, to Tiberius Claudius Nero, Sicily, to Marcus Panarius, Sardinia. And to Lucius Duronius, Apulia, to which was annexed Istria also, because information was received at Tarentum and Brundusium, that the lands bordering on the sea were infested by robberies committed by foreign piratical ships. The Massilians made the same complaint, with regard to the ships of the Ligurians. The armies were then voted, to the consul's four Roman legions, each consisting of 5,200 foot and 300 horse. And 15,000 foot and 800 horse of the Allies and Latins. In the Spains, the old praetors were continued in command, with the armies which they then had. And as an augmentation, there were voted for them, 3,000 Roman citizens with 200 horse, and 6,000 foot and 300 horse of the Latin confederates. Nor was the business of the fleet neglected. The consuls were ordered to constitute duumvirs for conducting that department, by whom, twenty ships which they had launched were to be manned with Roman citizens who had been in servitude. With this proviso only, that freeborn officers should command them. The duty of guarding the coast was so arranged between the duumvirs, each of whom had the command of ten ships, that the promontory of Minerva formed the point of division between them, one was to defend the part on the right, as far as Marseilles. The other, that on the left, extending to the town of Barium. 19. Many horrid prodigies were seen at Rome this year, and reported from abroad. It rained blood in the courts of the temples of Vulcan and Concord, and the priests reported that spears moved, and that the image of Juno Sospita at Lanuvium shed tears. There was a pestilence in the country, in the market towns and marketplaces, and so violent was it in the city, that Libertina could scarcely supply the requisites for burying the dead. These prodigies, and the mortality, alarmed the Senate so much, that they ordered the consuls to sacrifice to such gods as they thought proper, victims of the larger kinds, and likewise the Decembers to consult the books. Pursuant to their direction, a supplication for one day was proclaimed, to be performed at every shrine in Rome. On the authority of these same, both the Senate voted, and the consuls announced, that there should be a supplication and holidays for three days throughout the whole of Italy. The pestilence raged with so great fury, that when, in consequence of the revolt of the Corsicans, and a war raised in Sardinia by the Ilientians, it seemed good, that, from among the Latin allies, eight thousand foot and three hundred horse should be raised, whom Marcus Panarius the praetor should convey with him into Sardinia. The consuls returned a representation, that so great a number of men had died, and so many were sick, in every place that the number of soldiers could not be made up. The praetor was ordered to take from Gnaeus Bebius, proconsul, who was in winter quarters at Pisces, 
as many soldiers as would make up the deficiency, and transport them from thence to Sardinia. To Lucius Duronius the Praetor, to whose lot Apulia had fallen, was given in addition the charge of making inquiry concerning the Bacchanalians. For some remaining seeds of the evils, formerly excited by those people, had shown themselves there the year before. The inquiries were rather commenced under the praetor, Lucius Pupius, than brought to any issue. The senate therefore ordered the new praetor to cut up that evil by the roots, lest it might spread again more extensively. The consuls, also, by direction of the senate, proposed to the people certain laws concerning canvassing for elections. 20. They next introduced the embassies to audience. And first, those of the kings, Eumenes and Ariarathes the Cappadocian, and Pharnaces of Pontus. No further answer was given to these, than that the senate would send persons to examine and decide their disputes. Ambassadors from the Lacedaemonian exiles, and from the Achaeans, were next brought in. Hopes were given to the exiles, that the senate would write to the Achaeans that they should be restored. The Achaeans gave an account, to the satisfaction of the Senate, of the recovery of Messini, and the settlement of affairs there. From Philip, king of Macedonia, came two ambassadors also, Philicles and Apelles. Not on any business with the Senate, but rather to pry into and inquire concerning the correspondence with the Romans, of which Perseus had accused Demetrius, and, particularly, into that with Titus Quintius, concerning the kingdom to the prejudice of his brother. The king had employed these men, believing them unbiased and inclined in favour of neither party, but they were accomplices and agents of Perseus, in his treacherous designs against his brother. Demetrius, ignorant of all except the villainous scheme of his brother which had lately broke out, at first neither utterly despaired, nor yet entertained much hope of being reconciled with his father. But afterwards he trusted less and less every day to Philip's affection, having observed that an audience with him was prevented by his brother. Wherefore, not to increase the suspicions lie laboured under, he used extreme circumspection in all his words and actions, and carefully avoided all mention of, and communication with, the Romans. To such a degree as to wish that they should not write, as he knew that his father's mind was principally exasperated by charges of this nature. 21. Philip, lest his troops should be enervated by inactivity, and at the same time, to avert all suspicion of his harboring any design of a war with Rome, ordered his army to assemble at Stobi, in Peonia, and thence he led it on into Medica. He had been seized with an earnest desire of ascending to the summit of Mount Hemus, for he gave credit to a vulgar opinion, that from thence could be seen at once the Pontic and Adriatic seas, the river Danube, and the Alps. And he thought that the having a view of all those places, would be of no small consequence towards forming his plans of a war with Rome. On inquiry, from people acquainted with the country, respecting the ascent to Mount Hemus, when it was ascertained from them all, that there was no way by which an army could go up it, but that there was access for a small party, lightly accoutred. That he might soothe with familiar discourse his younger son, whom he had determined not to take with him, he first asked his opinion, whether, as the difficulty of the journey was represented to be so great, he ought to persist in his design. Or not. He added, that, if he should resolve to proceed, he could not forget the caution of Antigonus, respecting undertakings of that kind. Who being tossed about by a violent storm, when he had all his family in the same ship with him, was said to have advised his sons to remember, and hand down to their children, this maxim, never to have the hardihood to rush into danger themselves and their whole family together. He would therefore attend to this warning, and not expose his two sons at once to the chance of those perils, which were represented to lie in his way. And as he meant to take his elder son with him, he would send back the younger into Macedon, as a reserve to his hopes, and as guardian of the kingdom. It did not escape Demetrius that he was sent out of the way, that Lai might not be present at their deliberations, when, in view of those places, they should consult which were the shortest roads to the Adriatic Sea and to Italy. And what was the general plan to be pursued in the war? He was obliged however not only to obey his father on the occasion, but to express his approbation of the measure, lest a reluctant obedience might beget suspicion. In order that his journey into Macedonia might be safe, Didus, 
one of the king's general officers and governor of Peonia, was ordered to escort him with a small party of men. Perseus took this man, as well as most of his father's friends, into the conspiracy to ruin his brother, from the time that it became plain to every one, from the tendency of the king's feelings. To which of the two the inheritance of the throne should come? And Perseus charged him on this occasion, to insinuate himself by every kind of obsequiousness into the most familiar communication with Demetrius, so as to draw from him all his secrets, and to pry into his hidden thoughts. The prince, therefore, set out with a guard more dangerous to him than if he had gone alone. 22. Philip marched first into Medica, then crossing the deserts that lie between Medica and Hemus, at length, at his seventh encampment, he reached the foot of the mountain. There he halted one day, to make choice of those who were to accompany him, and on the next proceeded on his journey. At first, while they ascended the lower parts of the hills, the fatigue was moderate. But as they advanced upwards, they found the ground more thickly covered with woods, and many places impassable. They then came to a part of the way so shaded by the thickness of the trees, and the branches so interwoven with each other, that the sky could scarcely be seen. But when they drew near to the top, what is rarely seen in other places, the whole tract was covered with so thick a fog, that they were impeded no less than if they were journeying by night. At last, on the third day, they arrived at the summit. On coming down they did not discountenance the vulgar opinion, more, I suppose, lest the folly of the journey should be exposed to derision, than that it was there possible to see those seas, and mountains, and rivers. So widely distant from each other. They were all greatly fatigued by the difficulty of the way, and chiefly the king himself, in proportion as he was less fitted for exertion, owing to his advanced age. After sacrificing to Jupiter and the sun, on two altars which he consecrated on the spot, he descended in two days, though the ascent had cost him three, for he was particularly afraid of the night cold. Which even at the rising of the dog star was like the cold of winter. After struggling with numerous hardships during those days, he found his camp in a condition not more pleasing, for as it lay in a country enclosed on all sides by deserts, there was extreme want. He halted therefore but one day, to refresh those whom he had taken with him, and then hastened away into the country of the Dentheletians, with a rapid march close resembling flight. These were allies, but the Macedonians, on account of their own necessities, plundered their country, as if it belonged to an enemy. For they first pillaged the country houses, and afterwards ravaged several villages, overwhelming the king with shame, when he heard the cries of his allies, calling in vain on the gods who witnessed their league, and on himself by name. Having carried off corn from hence, he marched back into Medica, and laid siege to a town called Petra. He pitched his camp in a plain, and sent his son Perseus with a small party to attack the city from the higher ground. The townsmen, when danger pressed them on all sides, gave hostages, and for the present surrendered themselves, but as soon as the army retired, regardless of the hostages, they deserted the city, and fled into fastnesses and mountains. Philip returned to Macedon, after having exhausted his troops by every kind of fatigue, without effecting any purpose, and with his suspicions of his son augmented through the treachery of the governor Didus. 23. This man being sent, as before mentioned, to escort Demetrius, had, by flattering discourses, and even expressing his own indignation at the treatment shown him, imposed on the open temper of the youth, who was too much off his guard and justly incensed against his relations. And by a voluntary offer of his assistance in all his measures, and giving a solemn assurance of fidelity, he elicited his secrets. Demetrius was meditating flight to Rome. And the governor of Peonia appeared to him to have been sent by the kindness of the gods to aid him in his design, through whose province he supposed he might make his escape. This scheme was immediately betrayed to his brother, and, by his direction, discovered to his father. A letter was brought the king while he was besieging Petra. And in consequence of it, Herodotus, who was the most intimate friend of Demetrius, was taken into custody, and an order was given that Demetrius himself should be guarded, without his perceiving it. These occurrences, added to what had passed before, made the king's arrival in Macedon a sad one. The present charges had an effect on him. 
Yet he resolved to wait the return of those whom he had sent to Rome, to procure intelligence of every particular. After he had passed several months under this uneasiness and anxiety, the ambassadors, who had preconcerted before they left Macedon, what information they should bring home from Rome, at last arrived. Who, in addition to other grounds of accusation, produced to the king a forged letter, sealed with a counterfeit seal of Titus Quintius. In this letter was a kind of interceding apology, that if the young prince, misled by the ambition of reigning, had offered some propositions to him on the subject, yet he was sure that Demetrius would never attempt anything against his relations. And that he himself was not such an individual as to appear capable of giving an undutiful advice. This letter confirmed the charges made by Perseus, Herodotus was, therefore, immediately put to the rack, which he endured a long time, and died under the torture, without giving information of any sort. 24. Perseus now brought before his father a second formal accusation against Demetrius. His preparations for flight through Peonia were alleged against him, and his having bribed certain persons to accompany him on the journey. But the forged letter of Titus Quintius pressed hardest on him. There was, however, no severe sentence pronounced openly, in order that he might be put to death in secrecy, which they considered a preferable course, nor was this done through regard for himself. But lest the inflicting punishment on him might unmask designs against the Romans. The king himself having occasion to go from Thessalonica to Demetrius, sent Demetrius, with the same attendant Didus, to Astrium in Paeonia, and Perseus to Amphipolis, to receive hostages from the Thracians, and is said, on parting with Didus, to have given him directions to put his son to death. A sacrifice was either intended or counterfeited by Didus, and Demetrius, being invited to be present at the solemnity, came from Astrium to Heraclea. It is said that poison was administered to him in that supper. The moment he had swallowed the draught, he was conscious of its deadly properties. And being quickly after seized with violent pains, left the banquet, and retired to a chamber, where he continued for some time in agony, complaining of the cruelty of his father, inveighing against the fratricide of Perseus. And the villainy of Didus. Then one Thersus of Stubera, and one Alexander of Beroia, were sent in, who, covering his head and mouth with blankets, suffocated him. In this manner perished that innocent youth, since in his case his enemies were not even content with a common kind of murder. 25. While these matters were passing in Macedon, Lucius Emilius Paulus, being, on the expiration of his consulate, continued in command, led his army at the commencement of spring into the country of the Ingonian Ligurians. He had no sooner pitched his camp in the enemy's territory, than ambassadors came to him under pretext of suing for peace, but in reality as spies. When Paulus declared that he would enter into no treaty whatever, unless they first surrendered. To this they did not object, but said that it would require time to procure the consent of such a rude kind of people. When, for that purpose, a suspension of arms for ten days was granted, then they further requested that his men might not go beyond the mountains for wood or forage, for that was the part of their lands which they had under tillage. After they obtained this request, they collected all their forces behind those mountains, which they had prevented the Romans from approaching, and on a sudden, with a vast multitude, assaulted every gate of his camp at once. During that whole day, they prosecuted the attack with such vigor, that Paulus had not time to march out of the camp, nor room to draw out his troops, crowding together at the gates, they defended their camp by blocking up the passage. Rather than by fighting. When the enemy had retired a little before sunset, the general dispatched two horsemen to Pisces, to Nias Bibius, proconsul, with a letter, requesting him to come with all speed to his relief, as he was besieged in the midst of a truce. Bibius had given up his army to Marcus Panarius, the praetor, who was going into Sardinia, but he informed the senate by letter that Lucius Emilius was besieged by the Ligurians, and also wrote to Marcus Claudius Marcellus, whose province lay the nearest, that, if he thought proper, he should march his army out of Gaul into Liguria, and relieve Lucius Emilius from the blockade. These suckers would have come too late. The Ligurians returned next day to the attack of the camp. Emilius, although he was aware that they would come, and although he could have drawn out his army to meet them, 
yet kept his men within the lines. In order that he might protract the business until such time as Bebius should come with his army from Pisces. 26. Bebius's letter caused a great alarm at Rome, and it was increased by this circumstance, that, in a few days after Marcellus coming to Rome, having given up the command of the army to Fabius, banished all hope of a possibility of the forces. Then in Gaul, being removed into Liguria. For hostilities had commenced with the Istrians, who obstructed the settlement of the colony of Aquileia, and, as Fabius had led his army thither, he could not quit that country now that the war was begun. There was but one hope of relief, and even that too slow for the exigency of the time, this was, that the consuls might hasten their march into that province, and the senators earnestly pressed them to do so. The consuls declared that they would not set out until the levies were completed, and that no indolence in them, but the violence of the epidemic sickness, was the cause of their being so long in finishing the levy. However, they could not withstand the united wishes of the whole senate, in urging them to depart in the military habit, and to proclaim a day to the troops which they had enlisted, on which they should assemble at Pisces. Authority was given them to enlist hasty levies on their march, wherever they should go, and take them with them. Orders were likewise issued to the praetors, Quintus Petilius and Quintus Fabius, that Petilius should raise two tumultuary legions of Roman citizens, and compel every person under fifty years of age to enlist. And that Fabius should demand from the Latin allies, fifteen thousand foot and eight hundred horse. Two commanders were appointed to the fleet, Caius Matinus and Caius Lucretius, and ships were put in readiness for them. An order was given Matinus, whose station was at the Gallic Bay, to steer his squadron, with all expedition, to the coast of Liguria, and to try if he could be of any service to Lucius Emilius and his army. 27. Emilius, when no aid appeared in any quarter, believing that his couriers had been intercepted, resolved to wait no longer, but to make a trial of fortune by himself. And for this purpose, before the coming of the enemy, who now made their attacks with less briskness and vigor, he drew up his troops at the four gates, that, on a signal being given, might sally out from all sides at once. To four independent cohorts of auxiliaries, he added two others, and gave the command to Marcus Valerius, lieutenant general, with orders to make his sally by the Praetorian gate. At the right gate of the first cohort he formed the spearmen of the first legion, placing the first rank men of the same legion in reserve. Marcus Servilius and Lucius Sulpicius, military tribunes, had the command of these. The third legion was drawn up opposite to the left gate of the first cohort, with this difference only, that here the first rank men were posted in front, and the spearmen in reserve. Sextus Julius Caesar and Lucius Aurelius Cotta, military tribunes, had the command of this legion. Quintus Fulvius Flaccus, lieutenant general, with the right wing of the allies, was posted at the Quistorian gate, and two cohorts, with the veterans of the two legions, were ordered to stay within to guard the camp. The general himself went round by all the gates, haranguing the troops, and excited the wrath of the soldiers by all the incentives that he could use. At one time declaiming against the treachery of the enemy, who after suing for peace, and obtaining a truce, had come during the very time of that truce, in violation of the law of nations, to attack his camp. At another, setting before them what a shame it was that a Roman army should be besieged by Ligurians, people more properly styled robbers than a regular enemy. With what face, continued he, if you make your way hence by the assistance of others, and not by your own valour, will any of you meet, I do not say those soldiers that conquered Hannibal, or Philip, or Antiochus. The greatest kings and generals of the present age, but those who often drove those very Ligurians before them, flying like cattle through pathless forests, and put them to the sword. What the Spaniards, the Gauls, the Macedonians, or Carthaginians, never dared to attempt, a Ligurian enemy dares, he marches up to the trenches of a Roman camp, unexpectedly besieges and assaults it. Although, formerly, we, searching carefully the recesses of the forests, were with difficulty able to find them lurking in their hiding places. This was answered by a general clamour, that it was no fault of the soldiers, as no one had given them the order to sally forth let him but give the order, and he should soon be convinced. That both the Romans and the Ligurians were the same that ever they were. 
28. There were two camps of the Ligurians on the hither side of the mountains, from which, on the former days, they had marched forward at sunrise, all in order and regular array. On this day they did not take arms until they had made a full meal of food and wine, and then they came out in loose order, and regardless of their ranks, as they expected with certainty, that the enemy would not venture out beyond the rampart. As they were approaching in this disorderly manner, the shout being raised by every one in the camp at once, even by the sutlers and servants, the Romans rushed out by all the gates at the same time. This event was so entirely unexpected by the Ligurians, that they were confounded no less than if they had been caught in an ambush. For a short time, some appearance of a fight was maintained, and then followed a hasty flight, and a general slaughter of the fugitives. When the signal was given to the cavalry to mount their horses, and not to suffer any to escape, they were all driven in a confused flight to their camps, and soon beaten out of them also. Above fifteen thousand of the Ligurians were killed, and two thousand five hundred taken. In three days after, the whole state of the Ingonian Ligurians gave hostages, and surrendered. The masters and crews of the ships, which had been employed in piracies, were carefully sought, for, and thrown into prison, and thirty-two ships of that description were taken by Caius Matinus, one of the two on the Ligurian coast. Lucius Aurelius Cotta, and Caius Sulpicius Gallus, were sent to Rome to announce these transactions and bring a letter to the Senate, and at the same time to request that, as the business of the province was finished. Lucius Emilius might have permission to leave it, and to bring away his troops and disband them. Both requests were granted by the Senate, and a supplication was decreed, at all the shrines, for three days. The praetors Petilius and Fabius received orders, the former to discharge the city legions, the latter to excuse the allies and Latins from the levies, and that the city praetor should write to the consuls. That the senate thought proper that the occasional soldiers, enlisted on account of the sudden alarm, should be immediately discharged. 29. The colony of Gravisca was established this year in a district of Etruria, formerly taken from the Tarquinians, and five acres of land were given to each settler. The commissioners who conducted it were Caius Calpurnius Piso, Publius Claudius Pulcher, and Caius Terentius Istra. The year was rendered remarkable by a drought, and a scarcity of the productions of the earth. It is handed down on record, that during the space of six months no rain fell. In the same year, some workmen in the farm of Lucius Petilius, a notary, at the foot of the geniculum, digging the ground deeper than usual, discovered two stone chests, about eight feet long and four broad, the covers of which were soldered with lead. Both the chests had inscriptions in Greek and Latin letters, one signifying that therein was buried Numa Pompilius, son of Pompo, and king of the Romans, the other, that therein were contained the books of Numa Pompilius. When the owner of the ground had, by the advice of his friends, opened these chests, the one which, according to its inscription, contained the body of the king, was found perfectly empty. Without any trace of a human body or of anything else having ever been in it. The whole being consumed by the decay of such a number of years. In the other were found two bundles, tied round with waxed cords, and each containing seven books, not only entire, but apparently quite fresh. Seven were in Latin, and related to the pontifical law, and seven in Greek, containing the doctrines of philosophy, such as might have been known in that age. Valerius Antius adds, that they contained the doctrines of Pythagoras, supporting, by this plausible fiction, the credit of the vulgar opinion, that Numa had been a disciple of Pythagoras. The books were read, first, by Petilius's friends, who were present at the discovery. Afterwards, when they became publicly spoken of in consequence of many others reading them, Quintus Petilius, the city praetor, having a desire to read those books, borrowed them from Lucius Petilius, with whom he was familiarly acquainted. In consequence of Quintus Petilius having, when Quester, made him a notary, and chosen him as one of ten. On reading the principal heads of the contents, he perceived that most of them had a tendency to undermine the established system of religious doctrines, and, thereupon, he told Lucius Petilius that he was determined to throw those books into the fire. But before he did so, he gave him leave, if he thought he had any right or appeal to demand the restitution of them, 
to make the trial, which he might do and preserve his favor. The notary applied to the plebeian tribunes, and the tribunes referred the matter to the senate. The praetor declared, that he was ready to make oath that those books ought not to be read or preserved. And the senate decreed, that, the praetors having offered his oath ought to be deemed sufficient evidence that those books should, without delay, be burned in the commissium. And that such a price should be paid to the owner as might be judged reasonable by the praetor, Quintus Petilius, and the majority of the plebeian tribunes. The notary did not receive the money. The books, however, were burned in the commissium, in the view of the people, the fire being made by the public servants, whose duty it was to assist at sacrifices. 30. A formidable war broke out this summer in the hither Spain, where the Celtiberians assembled such a force as they had hardly ever brought into the field before, amounting to no less than thirty-five thousand men. Quintus Fulvius Flaccus was governor of this province, who, because he heard that the Celtiberians were arming their young men, drew together all the succors he could procure from the allies. But he was by no means equal to the enemy in point of numbers. Early in spring, he marched his army into Carpitania, and fixed his camp close to the town of Abura, in which he posted a small garrison. In a few days after, the Celtiberians pitched their camp at the foot of a hill, about two miles from that place. When the Roman praetor was informed of their approach, he detached his brother, Marcus Fulvius, with two troops of the allied horse, to the enemy's post, to take a view of them. Ordering him to advance as near as possible to their rampart, so as to form a judgment of the size of the camp, and not to engage in fight, but to retreat if he should see the enemy's cavalry coming out. He acted according to his instructions, and for several days there was nothing further done than these two troops showing themselves, and then retreating when the enemy's cavalry sallied from their tents. At length, the Celtiberians came out, with their entire force of horse and foot together, and drawing up in a line, posted themselves about midway between the two camps. The whole plain was level, and convenient for fighting, and here the Spaniards stood waiting for their enemy. The Roman general kept his men within the rampart during four successive days, while the others constantly drew up theirs, and formed in the same place. No motion was made by the Romans. And from that time the Celtiberians, because they had not an opportunity of engaging, remained quiet in their camp, their cavalry only advanced as outposts, to be ready in case of any movement being made by Fulvius. Both parties went for wood and forage behind their own camps, neither interrupting the other. 31. When the Roman praetor thought that, by his inactivity for so many days, he had created in the Celtiberians a firm persuasion that he would not be first in any movement, he ordered Lucius Acilius. With the left wing of allies and six thousand provincial auxiliaries, to make the circuit of a mountain behind the enemy, and as soon as he should hear the shout, to pour down from them on their camp. This party, to avoid being seen, set out in the night. At the dawn of day Flaccus sent Caius Scribonius, a prefect of the allies, with the allied cavalry of the left wing, to the enemy's rampart. When the Celtiberians, observing that they approached nearer, and were also more numerous than usual, all their cavalry poured forth from the camp, and at the same time the signal is given to the infantry to sally forth. Scribonius, according to his instructions, no sooner heard the neighing of the enemy's cavalry than he wheeled about and retreated to the camp, on which they pursued with the more violence. First the cavalry, and in a short time the line of infantry, came up, confidently expecting that they should be able to assault the camp before night, and they were five hundred paces, not more, from the rampart. Flaccus, therefore, thinking that they were now drawn far enough from their camp, to hinder them from giving it any succor, as he had his troops already formed within the works, burst out from three sides at once. And at the same time raised the shout, not only to inspire ardor for the fight, but also that the party on the mountain might hear it. Nor did these make any delay, but, according to their orders, poured down on the camp, where five thousand men, not more, were left to guard it, and when the smallness of their numbers. The multitude of the assailants and the unexpectedness of the affair, had struck terror into them, the camp was taken almost without a struggle. Asilius set fire to that part of the camp which was most exposed to the view of the combatants. 32. 
The Celtiberians in the rear of their own line first observed the flames, and the news spread quickly through the whole army, that the camp was lost, and was even then completely in a blaze, which filled them with dismay. While it gave fresh spirits to the Romans. For now the shouts of victory raised by their friends struck their ear, and the enemy's camp appeared all on fire. The Celtiberians hesitated for some time, uncertain how to act, but when they considered that, in case of a defeat, they had no place of refuge, and that their only hope now lay in their arms, they renewed the combat afresh, with greater obstinacy. Their center was pressed hard by the 5th Legion, but their men advanced with more confidence against the left wing, where they saw that the Romans had posted the provincial auxiliaries, troops of their own kind. The left wing of the Romans was now near being defeated, had not the 7th Legion come to its support. At the same time, the troops left in garrison at Abura came up during the heat of the battle, and Asilius closed on the enemy's rear. Thus surrounded, the Celtiberians were, for a long time, cut off in great numbers, and at last the survivors betook themselves to flight in every direction. The cavalry, in two divisions, were sent in pursuit, and made great havoc. There were killed, of the enemy, on that day, twenty-three thousand, and four thousand seven hundred were taken, with more than five hundred horses, and eighty-eight military ensigns. The victory was great, but not obtained without loss of blood. There fell, of the two Roman legions, a few more than two hundred men, of the Latin confederates, eight hundred and thirty, and of foreign auxiliaries, about two thousand four hundred. The praetor led back his victorious troops to their tents, Asilius was ordered to remain in the camp which he had taken. Next day the spoils of the enemy were collected, and those whose bravery had been remarkable were presented with gifts in a public assembly. 33. The wounded were then conveyed into the town of Abura, and the legions marched through Carpatania, against Contribia. The garrison there, on being invested, sent for succors to the Celtiberians. But these were long in coming, not because they were unwilling to give assistance, but that after they had begun their march the roads were rendered impassable, and the rivers swelled by continued rains, so that their countrymen, despairing of assistance, capitulated. Flaccus also, being compelled by the same severe weather, brought his whole army into the city. The Celtiberians, who were on their march, having heard nothing of the capitulation, when the rains abetted at last, passed the rivers, and came to Contribia. When they saw no camp before the town, supposing either that it was removed to the other side, or that the enemy had retired, they came up towards the walls in careless disorder. The Romans made a sally against them from two gates, and attacking them in confusion completely routed them. The same circumstance that disabled them from standing their ground and maintaining a fight, their not having come in one body, or in a regular disposition, round their standards. Proved favorable to many in making their escape, for they scattered themselves widely over the whole plain, so that the Romans could nowhere enclose any considerable body of them. However, there were about twelve thousand killed, and more than five thousand taken, with four hundred horses, and sixty-two military standards. The stragglers, flying homewards, turned back another body of Celtiberians, whom they met on the road, by informing them of the surrender of Contribia, and their own defeat. Whereupon they all immediately dispersed, and made the best of their way to their several villages and forts. Flaccus, leaving Contribia, led his legions through Celtiberia ravaging the country. He stormed many forts until at length the greatest part of the Celtiberians surrendered. 34. Such were the transactions of that year in hither Spain. In the farther province, Manlius fought several successful battles with the Lusitanians. In the same year the Latin colony of Aquileia was established in the Gallic territory. Three thousand foot soldiers received each fifty acres, centurions a hundred, horsemen a hundred and forty. The three commissioners who conducted the settlement were Publius Cornelius Scipio Nasica, Caius Flaminius and Lucius Manlius Asidinus. Two temples were dedicated this year, one to Venus Aracena, at the Colline Gate. Lucius Porcius Licinius Duumbur, son of Lucius, dedicated it. This temple had been vowed, during the Ligurian War, by Lucius Porcius, the consul the other to piety, in the herb market. Manius Asilius Glabrio, the Duumbur, dedicated this temple. 
he erected a gilded statue of his father Glabrio, the first of the kind that ever was seen in Italy. This was the person who vowed the temple, on the day whereon he gained the decisive victory over King Antiochus, at Thermopylae, and who, likewise, had contracted for its being built, in pursuance of a decree of the Senate. At the same time when these temples were consecrated, Lucius Emilius Paulus, the proconsul, triumphed over the Ingonian Ligurians. He carried in the procession twenty-five golden crowns, but no other article of either gold or silver. Many Ligurian chiefs were led captives before his chariot, and he distributed to each of his soldiers three hundred asses. 299 The arrival of ambassadors from the Ligurians, begging that a perpetual peace might be established, enhanced the reputation of this triumph, and they asserted, that, the Ligurians had come to a resolution never again to take arms. On any occasion, except when commanded by the Roman people. This answer was given to the Ligurians, by Quintus Fabius, the praetor, by order of the Senate, that such kind of language was not new with the Ligurians. But it concerned chiefly their own interest that their disposition should be new, and conformable to their language. They must go to the consuls, and perform whatever was commanded by them. For the Senate would never believe, from any other than the consuls, that the Ligurians were really and sincerely disposed to peace. Peace however was made with that people. In Corsica, a battle was fought against the inhabitants. The praetor, Marcus Panarius, slew in the field about two thousand of them, by which loss they were compelled to give hostages, and a hundred thousand pounds of wax. The army was then carried over into Sardinia, and some successful battles were fought against the Ilientians, a nation, even at the present day, not in every particular friendly to us. In this year a hundred hostages were restored to the Carthaginians, and the Roman people enabled them to live in peace, not only among themselves, but also with Massinissa, who at that time with an armed force held possession of the land in dispute. 35. The consuls had nothing to do in their province. Marcus Bibius, being summoned home to Rome to preside at the elections, created consuls Aulus Postumius Albinus Luscus and Caius Calpurnius Piso. Then Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, Lucius Postumius Albinus, Publius Cornelius Mamula Titus Minutius Maliculus, Aulus Hostilius Mancinus, and Caius Manius were made praetors. All these entered into office on the Ides of March. In the beginning of this year in which Aulus Postumius Albinus and Caius Calpurnius Piso were consuls, Lucius Minutius, lieutenant general, and two military tribunes, Titus Manius and Lucius Terentius Massilicta, who had come from hither Spain from Quintus Fulvius Flaccus, were introduced to an audience of the Senate by Aulus Postumius the consul. These, after informing the Senate of the two victories gained, of the submission of Celtiberia, and of the conclusion of the business of the province, and that there was no occasion either to send pay, as usual, or corn to the army for that year. Requested, first, that, on account of these successes a thanksgiving should be performed to the immortal gods. And, then, that leave should be given to Quintus Fulvius, on his quitting the province, to bring home from it the army which had served under him and many former praetors, with much bravery. They represented, that this measure, besides the propriety of it, was in some degree necessary, for the troops were so obstinately bent on it, that it did not seem possible to keep them longer in the province. But, if they were not disbanded, they would either leave it without orders, or, if any one would attempt to detain them by compulsion, would break out into a dangerous mutiny. The Senate ordered, that Liguria should be the province of both the consuls. The praetors then cast lots for theirs. The city jurisdiction fell to Aulus Hostilius, the foreign, to Titus Minutius, Sicily, to Publius Cornelius. Sardinia, to Caius Manius, farther Spain, to Lucius Postumius, and hither Spain, to Tiberius Sempronius. As this last was to succeed Quintus Fulvius Flaccus, and wished that the province might not be stripped of the veteran troops, he spoke thus, Quintus Minutius, I demand of you, since you assert, in your report, that your province is subdued. Do you think, that the Celtiberians will always faithfully observe the treaty, so that the province may be kept in obedience without an army? If you cannot give us any assurance of, or undertake to answer for, the fidelity of the barbarians, but think that, 
at all events, there must be an army maintained there, I pray you. Whether would you recommend to the Senate to send a reinforcement into Spain, in order that those soldiers only who have served out their time may be discharged, and the recruits mixed with the veterans? Or to withdraw the veteran legions, and enlist new ones, and send them in their place? And this, although the contempt entertained for such new recruits might rouse barbarians of more pacific tempers to a renewal of war. Would it be a matter easier said than done, to reduce to complete subjection a province naturally fierce, and constantly renewing the war? A few states, as I am informed, who were awed, more than the rest, by the nearness of our winter quarters, have submitted to our authority and dominion, while those more remote are in arms. This being the case, conscript fathers, I now give notice beforehand, that, with the army at present there, I will undertake to execute the business of the Republic. But, if Flaccus bring those legions home with him, I will choose some quiet part of the country for winter quarters, and will not expose raw soldiers to an enemy so remarkably ferocious. 36. To these questions, which he had been asked, the lieutenant general answered, that neither he nor any other could possibly divine what were the sentiments of the Celtiberians, or what they would be in future. Therefore he could not deny that it would be proper to send an army among a barbarous people, who, though reduced to a state of quiet, were not yet sufficiently inured to subjection. But whether a new army or a veteran one might be requisite, rested with him to decide who could ascertain with what sincerity the Celtiberians would observe the peace. And who, at the same time, had assurance that the troops would remain quiet, if kept longer in the province. If a conjecture were to be formed of their intentions, either from their conversations with each other, or from the expressions with which they interrupted the general's harangues, they had openly and loudly declared that they would either keep their commander in the province, or come home with him to Italy. This discussion, between the praetor and the lieutenant general, was suspended by the consuls introducing other matters, for they thought it right, that their own provinces might be adjusted before they deliberated concerning the army of the praetor. An army entirely new was decreed to the consuls, two Roman legions to each, with their proportion of cavalry, and of the Latin allies, the usual number of fifteen thousand foot and eight hundred horse. With these forces, they were directed to make war on the Apuan Ligurians. Publius Cornelius and Marcus Bibius were continued in command, and ordered to hold the government of the provinces until the consuls should arrive. They were ordered then to disband their troops, and return to Rome. Then they deliberated concerning the army under Tiberius Sempronius. The consuls were ordered to enlist for him a new legion of 5,200 foot and 400 horse, and also a thousand Roman foot and 500 horse. And to command the allies of Latium to furnish 7,000 foot and 300 horse. With this army it was determined that Sempronius should go into hither Spain. Permission was granted to Quintus Fulvius, with respect to all those soldiers, whether Romans or allies, who had been transported into Spain previous to the consulate of Spurius Postumius and Quintus Martius. And likewise to such as, after the junction of the reinforcements, should be found in the two legions, above the number of 10,400 foot and 600 horse. And in the Latin auxiliaries above 12,000 foot and 600 horse, who had behaved with courage under Quintus Fulvius in the two battles with the Celtiberians, these, if he thought proper, he might bring home. Thanksgivings were also decreed, because he had managed the Republic successfully, and the rest of the praetors sent into their provinces. Quintus Fabius Budio had his command in Gaul. It was resolved that eight legions should be employed this year, besides the veteran army then in Liguria, which expected to be speedily disbanded. And that very army was made up with difficulty, in consequence of the pestilence which continued, for the third year, to depopulate the city of Rome and all Italy. 37. Tiberius Minucius, the praetor, died of this malady. And soon after, Caius Calpurnius, the consul, also many illustrious men of all ranks, so that at last this calamity began to be considered as a prodigy. Caius Servilius, chief pontiff was ordered to find out proper atonements for the wrath of the gods, the decembers to inspect the books, and the consul to vow offerings, and to present gilded statues, to Apollo Aesculapius, and health. Which he vowed and gave. 
The Decembers proclaimed, on account of the sickness, a supplication of two days in the city, and in all the market towns and villages. All persons above the age of twelve years offered the supplication, with garlands on their heads, and holding laurels in their hands. There had, also, crept into people's minds the suspicion of human villainy in regard to it whereupon Caius Claudius, the praetor, who had been substituted in the room of Tiberius Minutius, was commissioned by a decree of the Senate. To make inquisition concerning acts of poisoning committed in the city, or within ten miles of it. And Caius Manius was ordered to do the same, before he passed over to his province, Sardinia, in the market towns and villages beyond the tenth stone. The death of the consul was most suspected. It was reported that he had been murdered by his wife, Corda Hostilia, and when her son, Quintus Fulvius Flaccus, was proclaimed consul in the room of his stepfather, the death of Piso began to excite much more suspicion. Four witnesses appeared, who testified, that, after Albinus and Piso were declared consuls, in which election Flaccus had suffered a disappointment, his mother upbraided him with being refused the consulship a third time. And then desired him to make ready to stand candidate again, saying, she would take such measures that within two months he should be made consul. This expression verified by the event, which was but too real, joined to many other evidences of the same tendency, appeared such strong proof, that Hostilia was condemned. In the spring of this year, the levies detained the new consuls at Rome. While the death of one of them, and the holding of the assembly to substitute another in his place, occasioned still further delays. In the meantime Publius Cornelius and Marcus Bibius, who, in their consulate, had done nothing worth mention, led their troops into the country of the Apuan Ligurians. 38. The Ligurians, who did not expect an attack before the arrival of the consuls in the province, were surprised, and surrendered to the number of twelve thousand men. Cornelius and Bibius, having consulted the Senate by letter, determined to bring them down from their mountains into a plain country, so far from home, that they should have no hope of a return. For they were convinced, that before this was done no end could be put to the war in Liguria. There was a tract of land in Samnium, the public property of the Roman people, formerly occupied by the Taurusinians. When they intended to transplant the Apuan Ligurians to this country, they published an order, that this people should quit the mountains, with their wives and children, and bring all their effects along with them. The Ligurians made, by their ambassadors, many humble supplications that they might not be compelled to relinquish their native home, the soil in which they were born, and the tombs of their forefathers. They promised to give up their arms, and deliver hostages. After they failed in all their solicitations, and were destitute of strength for the maintenance of a war, they obeyed the order. Forty thousand men, of free condition, with their women and children, were transplanted at the expense of the public, and a hundred and fifty thousand sesterces three hundred were given them, to provide necessaries for their new habitations. Cornelius and Bibius, who removed them, were commissioned to divide and apportion the lands, but, at their own request, the Senate appointed five other commissioners, by whose advice they should act. When they had finished this business, and brought home their veteran soldiers to home, a triumph was decreed them by the Senate. These were the first who ever triumphed without having fought an enemy. Hostages only were led before their chariots. For there appeared not, in their triumphs, either spoils to be carried, or prisoners to be led captives, or money to be distributed to the soldiers. 39. In the same year Fulvius Flaccus, the proconsul in Spain, as his successor did not come to the province at the usual time, having drawn out the troops from their winter quarters, proceeded to lay waste the farther part of Celtiberia whose inhabitants had not come in to make submission. But by this proceeding he rather provoked than terrified the spirits of the barbarians, so that, having collected secretly a body of forces, they beset the Monlian Pass, through which they knew, with certainty, that the Roman army would march. Gracchus had commissioned his colleague, Lucius Postumius Albinus, who was going to the farther Spain, to desire Quintus Fulvius to bring his forces to Taraco, where he intended to discharge the veterans to distribute the reinforcements among the respective corps, and reorganize the entire army. The day also was mentioned to Flaccus, and that not very distant, on which his successor would arrive. 
When tidings of this new arrangement had compelled Flaccus to drop the business which he had undertaken, and to lead away the troops in haste out of Celtiberia, the barbarians, unacquainted with the reason. And supposing that he had discovered their revolt and secret assembling of an army, and that he was retreating through fear, beset the pass with the greater determination. When the Roman army entered this defile, at the dawn of day, immediately the enemy starting up attacked it at two sides at once. And when Flaccus saw this, he put down the confusion arising among the soldiers by giving orders through the centurions that every man should keep his post, in the order of march, and make ready his arms. Then collecting the baggage and beasts of burden, into one spot, partly by himself, partly by the help of the lieutenants general, and military tribunes, he formed his troops as the time and place required, without any confusion. He put them in mind, that they were to engage with men who had been twice reduced to submission, that guilt and perfidy, not valor or courage, were their only accessions. That these people had put it in their power to make their return to their country which otherwise would have been ignoble, glorious and splendid, for they would now carry home their swords red from the slaughter, and spoils dropping blood. The time did not allow more to be said, as the enemy were rapidly advancing upon them, the extremities of the wings were already engaged, and quickly after the entire lines. 40. The battle was furious in every part, but the success various. The two legions fought with extraordinary bravery, nor were the two cohorts of the allies remiss, but the foreign auxiliaries were hard pressed, by men armed like themselves, and rather a better description of soldiers. Nor were they able to maintain their ground. The Celtiberians, as soon as they perceived that, in a regular line, and in fair fighting, they were no match for the legions, made a charge against them, in the form of a wedge, in which sort of attack they excel so much. That on whatever part they direct their assault they cannot be withstood. On this occasion, too, the legions were ordered, and the line was almost broken. When Flaccus observed this disorder, he rode up to the legionary cavalry, asking them, Have we any support in you? Is the whole army to be lost? Whereupon they called to him from all sides, to tell them what he wished to be done, and that it should be instantly attempted. Cavalry of the two legions, double your troops, he replied, and charge the wedge, which is attacking our soldiers. You will make a more violent charge, if you spur your horses without bridles against the foe. This expedient is recorded to have been often employed by the Roman cavalry with great advantage. They obeyed his orders, and taking off the bits of the bridle, they spurred in full career through that body twice, forward and backward, breaking their spears to pieces, and making great havoc of the enemy. The Celtiberians, on this dispersion of their wedge, on which had been their whole reliance, were quite dismayed, and almost giving over the fight, looked about for ways to escape. And now, when the allied horse saw this brilliant exploit of the Roman cavalry, they were so inflamed by the example of their bravery, that without waiting for orders, they made a charge on the enemy, while they were in confusion. Then truly all the Celtiberians scatter and fly, and the Roman general, when he saw their backs, vowed a temple to equestrian fortune, and games in honor of Jupiter supremely good and great. The fugitives, dispersing, were pursued with much slaughter, through the whole length of the pass. Seventeen thousand of the enemy are recorded to have been killed on this occasion, and more than four thousand taken, with two hundred and seventy-seven military standards, and near one thousand one hundred horses. The victorious army pitched no camp on that day. This victory, however, was not gained without loss. 472 Roman soldiers, 1019 of the Allies and Latins, and besides these 3000 of the auxiliaries perished. The victorious army, having thus reasserted their former renown, finished their march to Taraco. The praetor, Tiberius Sempronius, who had arrived two days before, came out to meet Fulvius on the road, and congratulated him on the important services which he had rendered to the commonwealth. They then, with perfect unanimity, settled what soldiers they should discharge, and what they should retain, and Fulvius, embarking the disbanded soldiers in the fleet, set sail for Rome, while Sempronius led the legions into Celtiberia. 41. Both the consuls led their armies into Liguria, but on different sides. 
Postumius, with the first and third legions, invested the mountains of Ballista and Suez Montium. And, by securing the narrow passes leading thereto with guards, cut off all supplies of provisions, and by one of everything he reduced them to an entire obedience. Fulvius, with the second and fourth legions, marched from Pisces against the Apuan Ligurians. And having received the submission of that part of them which inhabited the banks of the river Macra, he put them, to the number of seven thousand men, on board ships, and sent them along the Etrurian coast to Nepolis. From whence they were conducted into Samnium, and lands were assigned to them among their countrymen. The vineyards of the Ligurians of the mountains were cut down and their corn burnt by Aulus Postumius, until, compelled by all the calamities of war, they surrendered and delivered up their arms. From thence Postumius proceeded, by sea, to visit the coast of the Inganian and Intimelian tribes. Before these consuls joined the army which had been ordered to meet at Pisi, Aulus Postumius, and a brother of Quintus Fulvius, Marcus Fulvius Nobilier, had the command of it. Fulvius was military tribune of the Second Legion. He in his months 301 of command disbanded the legion, after obliging the centurions to swear, that they would carry the money in their hands to the treasury, and deliver it to the questors. When this was announced to Aulus at Placentia, to which place he happened to have made an excursion, he set out with some light horsemen, in quest of the disbanded men. And such as he could overtake, he sharply rebuked and brought back to Pisces, and then apprised the consul of the whole matter. When he laid the business before the Senate, a decree was passed that Marcus Fulvius should be banished into that part of Spain beyond New Carthage, and a letter was given him by the consul, to be carried into farther Spain, to Publius Manlius. The soldiers were ordered to return to their standards, and it was decreed, that, as a mark of disgrace, that legion should, for that year, receive but half a year's pay. The consul was likewise ordered to sell the person and property of every soldier who should not return to the army. 42. In the same year Lucius Duronius, who had been praetor the year before, returned with ten ships from Illyricum to Brundusium, and leaving the fleet in that harbour, came to Rome. And in giving a recital of the services which he had performed in his province, he threw the blame of all the piracies committed by sea, on Gentius, king of Illyricum, as their undoubted cause. From his kingdom, he said, came all the ships that had ravaged the coast of the Hadriatic, that he had sent ambassadors on the subject, but they were not even allowed an audience of the king. Some time before this, ambassadors had come to Rome from Gentius, who said, that, when the Romans came for the purpose of holding a conference with the king, he happened to be sick in a remote part of his dominions. And that Gentius requested of the Senate, not to give credit to the forged charges which his enemies had made against him. Duronius added, that injuries were offered to many Roman citizens and Latin allies, in Gentius's dominions. Some of whom he held in confinement in Corsera. It was their pleasure that all these should be brought to Rome, that the praetor, Caius Claudius, should inquire into that business. And that until this were done, no answer should be given to King Gentius, or his ambassadors. Among many others whom the pestilence of this year cut off, several priests also died. Lucius Valerius Flaccus, a pontiff, died of it. And in his room was substituted Quintus Fabius Labio. Publius Manlius, who had lately come home from the farther Spain, and was triumvir of religious feasts, died also, Quintus Fulvius, son of Marcus, then a mere youth, succeeded him. The appointing of a king of the sacrifices in the room of Gnaeus Cornelius Dolabella, gave rise to a dispute between Caius Servilius, chief pontiff, and Lucius Cornelius Dolabella, naval duumbra, whom the pontiff ordered to resign his office, to the end that he might inaugurate him, and on the duumbra's refusing to do this, a fine was therefore imposed on him by the pontiff. And when the latter appealed, they contended about the affair before the people. After a majority of the tribes, being called in, had ordered that the duumbra should comply with the requisition of the pontiff, and that if he would resign his commission the fine should be remitted. An unfavorable omen from the heavens intervened, which broke off the proceedings of the assembly. After this the pontiffs were prevented by religious scruples from inaugurating Dolabella. They consecrated Publius Clelius Siculus, who had been installed in the second place. Towards the end of the year, 
Caius Servilius Geminus, the chief pontiff, also died, the same was December of religious affairs. In his room, as pontiff, Quintus Fulvius Flaccus was nominated by the college. But Marcus Emilius Lepidus, was elected chief pontiff, though many illustrious men sought that office, and Quintus Martius Philippus was appointed to the office of the same, as December of religious affairs. Spurius Postumius Albinus, an augur, died, and the augurs elected into his place Publius Scipio, son of Africanus. On the request of the people of Cumi that year, leave was granted them to use the Latin language in their public business, and that their auctioneers should have a right to use the Latin language in selling. 43. To the Pisans, offering ground for the establishment of a Latin colony, thanks were returned by the Senate, and triumvirs were appointed to conduct that business. These were Quintus Fabius Budio, Marcus Pompilius Leinas, and Publius Pompilius Leinas. A letter was brought from Caius Manius, the praetor, to whom, after that the province of Sardinia had fallen to his lot, orders were given to make inquisition concerning sorceries, in places more than ten miles distant from the city. The purport of which was, that he had already passed sentence on three thousand people. And that still, in consequence of fresh discoveries, the business of the Inquisition increased so much on his hands, that he must either drop the prosecution of the inquiries, or give up the province. Quintus Fulvius Flaccus returned to Rome from Spain, with a high reputation for his military exploits, and while he waited without the city in expectation of a triumph, was elected consul with Lucius Manlius Asidinus. And after a few days, he rode through the city in triumph, accompanied by the soldiers whom he had brought with him. He carried in the procession a hundred and twenty-four golden crowns, together with thirty-one pounds weight of gold, and of coined Oscan silver a hundred and seventy-three thousand two hundred pieces. Three o two he gave out of the booty to each of the soldiers fifty denariuses, double that sum to a centurion, triple it to a horseman, and the same sums to the Latin allies, with double pay to all. This year, for the first time, a law was proposed by Lucius Villius, plebeian tribune, ascertaining at what ages men might sue for, and hold each office in the state. Hence the surname Annalise was given to his family. 44. For praetors were elected, after a lapse of many years, by the Babian law, which enacted that four should be elected every alternate year. And the persons appointed were Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, Caius Valerius Lavinus, Quintus Mucius Sivola, and Publius Mucius Sivola, sons of Quintus. To the consuls, Quintus Fulvius and Lucius Manlius, was decreed the same province as to the preceding ones, and the same number of forces, infantry, cavalry, citizens, and allies. In the two Spains, Tiberius Sempronius and Lucius Postumius were continued in command, with the same armies which they then had. And to recruit their numbers, the consuls were ordered to enlist, of Romans 3,000 foot and 300 horse, and of the Latin allies, 5,000 foot and 400 horse. Publius Mucius Sivola obtained by lot the city jurisdiction, and likewise the business of the inquisitions concerning sorcery, in the city, and within ten miles of it, Gnaeus Scipio, the foreign jurisdiction, Quintus Mucius Sivola, Sicily. And Caius Valerius Lavinus, Sardinia. The consul, Quintus Fulvius, before he meddled with any of the public business, declared that he intended to acquit both himself and the state of the obligation of fulfilling the vows which he had made. That on the day of his last battle with the Celtiberians, he had vowed to perform games in honor of Jupiter supremely good and great, and to build a temple to equestrian fortune. And that by the Spaniards a contribution of money had been made for these purposes. A vote was passed that the games should be performed, and that Duumvirs should be appointed to contract for the building of the temple. With regard to the expenses, a limitation was fixed, that no greater sum should be expended on the games than that which had been voted to Fulvius Nobilier, when he exhibited games on the conclusion of the Aetolian War. And that the consul should not, on account of these games, send for, collect, or receive, or do anything contrary to the decree of the Senate passed concerning games in the consulate of Lucius Emilius and Gnaeus Bibius. The Senate qualified their vote in this manner, on account of the lavish expense occasioned by the games of Tiberius Sempronius, the Aedile, 
which had been burthensome not only to Italy and the Latin allies, but even to the provinces abroad. 45. The winter of that year was rendered severe by falls of snow and storms of every kind, those kinds of trees which are susceptible of injury from cold, were all blighted, and it continued at that time somewhat longer than on other occasions. Wherefore a tempest coming on suddenly, and with intolerable violence, shortly after, interrupted the Latin festivals on the mount, and they were celebrated afterwards, pursuant to an order of the pontiffs. The same storm also threw down many statues in the capital, disfigured very many buildings by lightning, as the Temple of Jupiter at Terracina, the White Temple at Capua, and a Roman gate. And in some places the battlements of the wall were overthrown. Among the rest of these prodigies, an account was received from Riate, that a three-footed mule had been foaled there. On account of those portents, the Decembers, having been ordered to consult the books, declared to what gods, and with how many victims, sacrifices should be performed. And that on account of very many places being disfigured by lightning, a supplication of one day should be performed at the Temple of Jupiter. Then the votive games of the consul Quintus Fulvius were exhibited with great magnificence, during ten days. Soon after was held the election of censors. Marcus Emilius Lepidus, chief pontiff, and Marcus Fulvius Nobilier, who had triumphed over the Aetolians, were chosen. Apparent hostilities existed between these men, which were frequently displayed in many violent disputes, both in the Senate and in the assemblies of the people. When the election was ended, the censors, according to ancient custom, seated themselves in curule chairs in the Campus Martius, near the altar of Mars. Whither in a few minutes came the principal senators, accompanied by the body of the citizens, of whom Quintus Cicilius Metellus spoke as follows. 46. Censors, we are not unmindful that you have been just now. By the whole body of the Roman people, set over our morals. And that we ought to be admonished and ruled by you, not you by us. Nevertheless, that should be pointed out which in you may either give offence to all good men, or at least what they would wish to be altered. When we look at you separately, Marcus Emilius, Marcus Fulvius, we know not, in the whole state, any one person whom, if we were called back again to vote, we could wish to be preferred to you. But when we behold you both together, we cannot avoid fearing that you are but ill associated. And that the public may not reap as much advantage from your being exceedingly pleasing to every one of us, as injury, from your being displeasing one to another. You have for many years past harbored an enmity, violent in its degree, and detrimental to yourselves, and it is to be feared, that from this day forward it may prove more detrimental to us and to the state, than it has been to you. As to the reasons why we fear this, many observations which might be made occur to yourselves, had you not happened to be implacable they would have engrossed your senses. These feuds we all beseech you to terminate this day, in that sacred place, and to suffer those whom the Roman people have united by their suffrages, to be united by us, through this re-establishment of friendship also. May you, with unanimity and harmony, choose the Senate, review the Knights, hold the census, and close the lustrum, as truly and sincerely as you would wish that to happen which you express in the words, used in almost all your prayers. That this affair may prove good and prosperous to me and my colleague and cause us men also to believe that you really desire that which you entreat of the gods. Titus Tatius and Romulus, after they had engaged in battle as public enemies, in the midst of the forum of this city, reigned there with unanimity. Not only quarrels, but wars, are ended. And from deadly foes men frequently become faithful allies, nay, sometimes, even fellow citizens. The Albans, after the demolition of Alba, were brought over to Rome, the Latins, the Sabines, were admitted into the number of citizens. It is a common saying, and, because founded in truth, has become a proverb, that, friendships ought to be immortal, but enmities mortal. A roar of approbation burst forth, and presently after, the voices of every one present, joining in the same request, interrupted his speech. Then Emilius, besides other complaints, represented, that through Marcus Fulvius he had been twice deprived of the consulship, which seemed sure. On the other hand, Fulvius complained that he had always been assailed by Emilius, and that security had been given for him, which was attended with great disgrace. 
Nevertheless, each of them intimated that if the other would wish, he was ready to submit to the direction of such a number of the most respectable members of the state. And all present urgently repeating their request, they mutually pledged their right hands, and their honor, to dismiss in reality and forget all animosity. Then the whole assembly expressing the highest applause of their behavior, they were escorted to the capital. Both the attention paid to such a matter by the persons of the first consequence, and the compliance of the censors, were most warmly approved and commended by the Senate. The censors then demanded that a sum of money should be assigned to them, which they might expend in public works, and the customs of one year were accordingly decreed to them. 47. In the same year the proprietors in Spain, Lucius Postumius and Tiberius Sempronius, settled between them, that Albinus should march through Lusitania, against the Vacchians, and thence return into Celtiberia. And Gracchus penetrate into the remotest parts of that province, if the commotions there were more dangerous. First, having made an unexpected assault on the city of Munda, by night, he took it by storm. Then, after having received hostages and placed a garrison, he proceeded to attack their forts and ravage the country with fire, until he arrived at another very strong city, the Celtiberians call it Sertima, there. When he was already advancing his works, deputies came out from the town, whose speech partook of all the simplicity of the earliest times, not dissembling their wishes to continue the war, if they had strength to support it. For they requested permission to go into the camp of the Celtiberians, and procure assistance from them, and said, that, if they did not obtain it they would then deliberate apart from them. By the permission of Gracchus they went. And in a few days after brought with them ten other ambassadors. It was midday. The first thing that they asked of the praetor was, that he would order some drink to be given them. After drinking off the first caps, they asked a second time, causing thereby loud laughter from those present, at minds so unpolished and ignorant of all civilization. The eldest of them then says, We have been sent by our nation to ask, On what do you rely that you attack us? To this question Gracchus answered, That, he came relying on an excellent army. Which if they chose to see, in order to carry back more certain information to their friends, he would give them an opportunity. And he orders the military tribunes to draw up, in array, all the forces both horse and foot, and make them go through their exercise in arms. After this sight, the ambassadors, being dismissed, deterred their people from attempting to succor the besieged city. When the townsmen had from the towers raised fires, which was the signal agreed upon, to no purpose, and had been disappointed in their only hope of relief, they capitulated. A contribution of 2,400,000 sesterces 303 was imposed on them. And they were ordered to furnish forty horsemen of the highest rank among them, not under the denomination of hostages, for they were ordered to serve as soldiers, but in reality to be pledges for their fidelity. 48. From thence Gracchus now marched to the city of Alce, where lay the camp of the Celtiberians, from which the ambassadors had lately come. When he had harassed them for some days with skirmishes, by sending his light troops to charge their advance guards, he made attacks more important every day, in order to entice them all out of their entrenchments. As soon as he perceived that his object had been effected, he gives orders to the prefects of the auxiliaries, that after a short contest they should suddenly turn their backs, as if they were overpowered by numbers. And fly with all haste to the camp, in the meantime he himself drew up all his forces in order, within the rampart, at all the gates. No long time had intervened, when he saw a body of his own troops flying back, according to the preconcerted plan, and the barbarians following in a disorderly pursuit. He had his army drawn up within the trench in readiness for this very opportunity. He therefore delayed only so long as to allow his own men to retreat into the camp by a free passage. Then, raising the shout, he rushed forth from all the gates at the same time. The enemy did not sustain the unexpected shock. They who came to assault his camp could not defend even their own. For they were instantly routed put to flight, driven in a panic within their trenches, and at last beaten out of them. On that day nine thousand of the enemy were killed, and three hundred and twenty taken, with a hundred and twelve horses and thirty-seven military ensigns. Of the Roman army there fell a hundred and nine. Forty-nine. After this battle, 
Gracchus led the legions to ravage Celtiberia. And when he was carrying and driving off all things from every quarter, some states voluntarily, others through fear, submitted to his yoke. Within a few days he received the submission of a hundred and three towns, he got immense booty. He then marched back to Alce, whence he came, and set about besieging that city. The townsmen withstood the first assault of the enemy. As soon as they found themselves attacked, not only by arms but by works also, having despaired of any protection in the city, they all retired to the citadel. And then at last they sent envoys, and surrendered themselves, and everything belonging to them, to the Romans. Great plunder was obtained from this. Many prisoners of distinction fell into his power, among whom were two sons and a daughter of Thurus. This chieftain, who governed those tribes, was by far the most powerful of all the Spaniards. On hearing the disasters of his countrymen he sent persons to request protection for himself when coming to the camp to Gracchus, and he came. And he first asked him, whether the lives of himself and his subjects would be spared. When the praetor answered that they would, he asked again, whether it would be allowed him to bear arms on the side of the Romans? To this too Gracchus assenting, he said, I will follow you then against my old allies, since they have not thought proper to pay any regard to me. From that time he united himself to the Romans, and by his brave and faithful exertions he in many places advanced the Roman interest. 50. After this, Bergavia, a celebrated and powerful city, terrified by the disasters of the surrounding states, opened its gates to the Romans. There are some writers who say, that this submission of the towns was not made with sincerity. That, from whatever district he might have led the legions, hostilities were there renewed forthwith, and that he afterwards fought, near Mount Conus, a pitched battle with the Celtiberians, from break of day to the sixth hour. That many fell on both sides, and that the Romans did not perform any feat from which you might believe that they were not vanquished, excepting that, next day. They offered battle to the enemy remaining in their entrenchments, that they employed that whole day in collecting the spoils, on the third day they fought again a more desperate battle. Then there was no doubt that the Celtiberians were at last completely defeated, and their camp taken and plundered. Twenty-two thousand of the enemy were killed on that day, more than three hundred taken, and almost an equal number of horses, and seventy-two military standards. This put an end to the war, the Celtiberians concluded a sincere peace, and did not waver in their allegiance as before. They say also, that during the same summer Lucius Postumius fought twice with success in the farther Spain against the Vacchians, killed thirty-five thousand of the enemy, and took their camp. It is however more probable, that he came into the province too late to succeed well in that summer. 51. The censors inspected the Senate with sincere unanimity. Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, the censor, who was likewise chief pontiff, was chosen head of the Senate, three were expelled from that body. Lepidus restored some who were rejected by his colleague. They completed these works with the money which had been assigned, and divided between them, Lepidus built a mole at Terracina, an unpopular work, because he had estates there. And brought into the account of the public expenditure what ought to have been done at his own expense. He contracted for the building of a theatre and stage near the Temple of Apollo, the widening of the Temple of Jupiter in the capital, and the columns around it. He also removed from those columns the statues that stood unseemingly before them, and took down from them the shields and military ensigns of all sorts hung thereon. Marcus Fulvius made contracts for works more numerous and of more use. A haven on the Tiber, and piers for a bridge across it, on which piers Publius Scipio Africanus and Lucius Mummius, who were the censors, many years after, bargained for the erection of arches. A court of justice behind the new bankers' houses, and a fish market surrounded with shops, which he sold to private persons, also a forum and portico, on the outside of the gate Trigemina. Another portico behind the dockyard, and one at the Temple of Hercules, also a Temple of Apollo Medicus, behind that of Hope, on the bank of the Tiber. They had besides, some of the money undivided, and out of this they jointly agreed to pay for water being brought, and arches being made, but Marcus Licinius Crassus hindered this work, for he would not suffer it to be brought through his grounds. 
They also established many port duties and customs, and took care that very many public chapels, which had been occupied by private individuals, should be public and consecrated, and open to the people. They likewise made an alteration in the mode of voting, for, through all the regions, they divided the tribes 304 according to the different ranks, conditions, and callings of men. 52. One of the censors, Marcus Emilius, petitioned the Senate, that a sum of money should be voted for the celebration of games, in honor of the dedication of the temples of Imperial Juno and Diana, which he had vowed eight years before. When employed in the Ligurian War, they accordingly voted 20,000 asses.305 He dedicated those temples each in the Flaminian Circus and celebrated theatrical games for three days after the dedication of the Temple of Juno, and for two after that of Diana, and each day in the circus. He also dedicated a temple to the deities of the C-306 in the field of Mars, which Lucius Emilius Regillus had vowed eleven years before this, in a naval engagement against the commanders of King Antiochus. Over the gate of the temple was hung up a tablet with this inscription, this temple was vowed by Lucius Emilius, the son of Marcus Emilius, on coming forth from a battle which he fought for the purpose of establishing peace. In which he concluded a mighty war and subdued kings, because under his auspices, command, and successful generalship, the fleet of King Antiochus, under the very eyes of Antiochus himself and his entire army, cavalry and elephants, was conquered. Thrown into confusion, shattered, and put to flight, on the eleventh day before the calends of January. And there on that day thirteen ships of war with all their crews taken. When that battle was fought, King Antiochus and his dominions.307 On this account he vowed a temple to the titular gods of the sea. In the same manner a tablet was placed over the gate of the temple of Jupiter, on the capital. 53. Two days after the censors had inspected the Senate, the consul Quintus Fulvius marched against the Ligurians. And having with his army crossed over pathless mountains and woody valleys, he fought a pitched battle with the enemy, and not only defeated them in the field, but took their camp the same day. 3,200 of the enemy, and all that tract of Liguria, surrendered. The consul brought down all those who surrendered into the lowlands, and posted guards on the mountains. His letters from that province quickly reached Rome, and thanksgivings for three days were voted on account of his successes. The praetors, during these thanksgivings, celebrated divine worship by sacrificing forty victims of the larger kind. By the other consul, Lucius Manlius, nothing worth recording was done in Liguria. Transalpine Gauls, to the number of three thousand, coming over into Italy, without offering to commit hostilities on any one, petitioned the consul and senate for some land, that they might live as peaceable subjects. Under the government of the Roman people. But the senate ordered them to quit Italy, and enjoined the consul Quintus Fulvius to search after and punish those who had been the first to advise them to cross the Alps. 54. This year died Philip, king of the Macedonians, being worn out with old age, and grief occasioned by his son's death. He spent the winter at Demetrius, in great anguish of mind, occasioned both by regret for his son and contrition for his own cruelty. His other son also disquieted his mind, who, both in his own opinion and that of others, was undoubtedly king. The eyes of all were turned to him, and his own old age was desolate. Some only waiting for his death, while others did not even wait for that event. By which circumstance he was still more distressed, and with him Antigonus, son of Echocrates, named after his uncle Antigonus, who had been guardian to Philip, a man of royal dignity. And famed also for a remarkable battle which he fought against Cleomenes the Lacedaemonian. The Greeks called him the guardian, to distinguish him from the other princes of that surname. 308 His nephew Antigonus, of all the friends whom Philip had honoured with his favours, alone remained uncorrupted. And this faithful attachment to him had made Perseus, who had been in no wise his friend, become now his most inveterate enemy. He, foreseeing in his mind with what danger to himself the inheritance of the kingdom would fall to Demetrius, as soon as he perceived the king's mind to waver, and that he sometimes sighed with regret for the loss of his son. At one time by listening, and at another by making mention of the deed, as being rashly done, he himself was at hand, 
adding his complaint to the frequent lamentations of the king. And, as the truth usually affords many traces of itself, he assisted with the most zealous diligence, in order that the whole might be brought to light as speedily as possible. Of the agents employed in that business, those who were most generally supposed guilty, were Apelles and Philicles, who had gone ambassadors to Rome, and had brought the letter under the name of Flamininus, which had proved so ruinous to Demetrius. They generally murmured in the palace, that it was a forgery, falsified by the secretary, and that the seal was counterfeited. 55. But while this thing was rather a matter of suspicion than of certainty, Antigonus accidentally met Zycus, whom he seized and brought to the palace. Then leaving him in custody of guards, Antigonus went on to the apartment of Philip, to whom he said, I think I understood from many conversations, that you would value it highly, if you could ascertain the whole truth respecting your sons. Which of the two was assailed by the other's deceit and secret machinations? Zycus, the only man in the world who can unravel this mystery, is now in your power. I met him by accident, and I have brought him to the palace, order him to be called into your presence. On being brought in, he at first denied. But with such irresolution, as showed that by a slight application to his fears he would become a ready informer. He did not withstand the sight of the executioner and the instruments of torture, but disclosed the whole process of the villainy of the ambassadors, and his own services therein. Persons were instantly dispatched to seize the ambassadors, and they apprehended by surprise Philicles, who was present, but Apelles, who had been sent in pursuit of a person called Cheria, having heard of the information given by Zycus, went over into Italy. With respect to Philicles, no certain account has been published, some say, that for a time he boldly denied all knowledge of the matter, but that when Zycus was confronted with him, he persisted no longer. Others, that he even suffered the rack without confessing. Philip's grief was renewed and doubled, and he felt his unhappiness, with regard to his children, pressed the heavier on him, because one of them was not. 56. When Perseus was told that all was discovered, he was too powerful to think that flight was necessary. He only took care to keep out of the way, intending to guard himself, in the meantime, during the remainder of Philip's life, from the flame, as it were, of his burning resentment. Who, having lost hopes of subjecting the person of Perseus to punishment, meditated on this, as the last resource, that he would not, besides impunity, enjoy the reward of his wickedness also. Therefore he addresses himself to Antigonus, to whom he was obliged for the discovery of the fratricide. And whom he supposed the Macedonians, considering the fresh renown of his uncle Antigonus, would neither be ashamed nor displeased at having for their king. Antigonus, says he, since I have been brought into such a situation that the being childless, a state which other parents reckon a curse, ought to be wished for by me, I am resolved to transfer to you the kingdom which I received from your uncle. And which his faithful and resolute guardianship not only preserved for me, but even enlarged. You are the only friend I have, whom I can judge worthy of the throne, and, if I had not one such, I should wish it to perish and become extinct, rather than be apprised to the treacherous villainy of Perseus. I shall think Demetrius recalled from the dead, and restored to me, if I can leave you substituted in his room, who alone have wept for his innocent death, and for my unhappy error. After this discourse he did not fail to advance him by conferring on him honours of every kind, and, as Perseus was absent in Thrace, he went round the cities of Macedon, and recommended Antigonus to the chief men. And, had his life been prolonged, there is no doubt but that he would have left him in possession of the throne. After leaving Demetrius, he stayed a very long time at Thessalonica. And when he had gone thence to Amphipolis, he was there seized with a severe sickness. Yet it was evident that it was a disorder of the mind rather than of the body, and that, owing to his anxieties and want of sleep, for apparitions and phantoms of his innocent murdered son ever and anon disquieted him. He breathed his last uttering awful imprecations on the other. Nevertheless Antigonus might have been first acquainted with the death of the king, had it not been immediately divulged. Calagenes, the physician, who had the charge of his treatment, not expecting the king's death, sent to Perseus, on the first appearance of desperate symptoms, messengers who had been previously stationed at different places. 
and till his arrival he concealed the death of the king from all but those who were in the palace. 57. Perseus therefore surprised them all, when not expecting, and totally ignorant of, his arrival, and seized on the throne, which was obtained by wickedness. The demise of Philip happened very seasonably for the purpose of gaining time and collecting strength for the support of a war, for, in a few days after, the nation of the Bastarnians, in consequence of long solicitation, set out from their own abodes, with a large force of infantry and cavalry, and crossed the Danube. Antigonus and Coto, the latter was a Bastarnian of distinction, and Antigonus had been sent, much against his will, with this same Coto, as ambassador, to persuade his countrymen to take arms, went forward. To carry intelligence of this to the king. But at a small distance from Amphipolis a rumor, and then authentic information, acquainted them with the king's death, which event disconcerted the whole arrangement of their plan. It had been arranged in this manner. Philip was to procure for the Bastarnians a safe passage through Thrace, and supplies of provisions. In order to be able to effect this, he had courted the chieftains in that country by presence, having pledged his faith that the Bastarnians should march through it in a peaceable body. It was proposed to exterminate the nation of the Dardanians, and to establish settlements for the Bastarnians in their country, from which measure a double advantage would accrue, if both the Dardanians, a nation ever hostile to Macedonia, and anxiously looking to the unfortunate periods of its kings, would be removed out of the way. And the Bastarnians, having left their wives and children in Dardania, might be sent to ravage Italy. That the road to the Adriatic Sea and Italy was through the country of the Scorditians, and that the army could not be led by any other way. That the Scorditians would readily grant a passage to the Bastarnians, for they would have no dislike to people resembling themselves in language and manners and would probably join them in an expedition. When they saw that they were on their way to the plunder of a most opulent nation, the remaining plans were accommodated to every kind of event that might take place. For if the Bastarnians would be cut off by the Romans, still the removal of the Dardanians, and the booty to be gained from the remains of the former, and the full possession of Dardania, would prove a consolation. Or if they should be successful, then, while the Romans would be employed in the Bastarnian war, he might recover what he had lost in Greece. Such had been the designs of Philip. 58. The Bastarnians commenced their march in a peaceable array, relying on the word of Coto and Antigonus. But, not long after the report of Philip's death, neither the Thracians were easily dealt with, nor would the Bastarnians be content with what they could purchase, nor could they be kept in a body, so as not to go out of the road. In consequence, injuries were committed on both sides, and, from the daily multiplication of these, war at last burst forth. When at last the Thracians were unable to withstand the great strength and numbers of the enemy, having deserted their towns in the plains, they betook themselves to a high mountain, they call it Danuka. When the Bastarnians wished to come up, such a tempest there discomfited them, when in vain approaching the summit of the mountain, as, we are told, destroyed the Gauls, when plundering Delphi. They were not only overwhelmed with a deluge of rain, followed by prodigious thick showers of hail, accompanied by tremendous noises in the sky, thunder, and lightning which dazzled their sight. But the thunderbolts, also, fell so frequently on all sides, that their bodies seemed to be aimed at, and not only the soldiers, but their officers also, being struck by them, fell. When therefore, in hasty flight, they, rushing on blindly, were scattered, and tumbling over very high rocks, and the Thracians also attacked them when already in dismay, they themselves then said, that the gods were the cause of the flight. And that the sky was falling on them. When, being dispersed by the storm, as by a shipwreck, they had returned, most of them half-armed, to the camp whence they had set out, they then began to consider what they should do. On which a disagreement ensued, some advising to return home, and others to advance to Dardania. About thirty thousand men, under the command of Clondicus, arrived at that place. The rest marched back, by the same road through which they came, to the country beyond the Danube. Perseus, having got possession of the kingdom, ordered Antigonus to be put to death. And, until he could settle his affairs on a firm foundation, sent ambassadors to Rome, to renew the treaty concluded by his father, 
and to request the Senate to give him the title of king. These were the transactions of that year in Macedon. 59. One of the consuls, Quintus Fulvius, triumphed over the Ligurians, which triumph, it was agreed, was granted rather to the greatness of his influence, than to that of his exploits. He carried in the procession a vast quantity of arms, taken from the enemy, but no money, yet he distributed to each soldier three hundred asses, double that sum to a centurion, triple it to a horseman. There was nothing in this triumph more remarkable, than that it happened to be celebrated on the same day of the year on which he had triumphed, after his praetorship, the year before. After the triumph he proclaimed the assembly of election, in which were chosen consuls, Marcus Junius Brutus, and Aulus Manlius Volso. Afterwards, a storm interrupted the election of praetors, though three had been already elected. But on the following day, the fourth before the Ides of March, 309 the other three were elected, Marcus Titinius Curvus, Tiberius Claudius Nero, and Titus Fontius Capito. The Roman games were renewed by the Curul Aediles, Gnaeus Servilius Cipio, and Appius Claudius Cento, on account of the prodigies which had occurred. In the public forum, where Electisternium was being celebrated, there was an earthquake, and the heads of the gods who were on the couches turned away their faces, and the cloak and robes placed on Jupiter fell off. It was also construed as a prodigy, that the mice gnawed the olives on the table. For the expiation of these, nothing more was done than repeating the celebration of the games. Book XLI The sacred fire was extinguished in the temple of Vesta. Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus conquered the Celtiberians and received their submission, and built the town Gracuris in Spain, as a memorial of his exploits. The Vacchians and Lusitanians also were subdued by the proconsul Postumius Albinus. Both generals triumphed. Antiochus, the son of Antiochus, having been delivered to the Romans by his father, as a hostage, on the death of his brother Seleucus, who had succeeded his father on his demise, being sent from Rome to the sovereignty of Syria, acted the part of a very worthless king, with the exception of his attention to religion, owing to which he erected many magnificent temples in various places. At Athens to Olympian, and at Antioch to Capitoline Jupiter. The lustrum was closed by the censors. 263,294 citizens are said to have been raided. Quintus Voconius Saxa, tribune of the people, proposed a law, that no one should make a woman his heir. Marcus Cato advocated the law, his speech is extant. This book contains besides the successes against the Ligurians, Istrians, Sardinians, and Celtiberians, and the commencement of the Macedonian War, which Perseus, the son of Philip, was planning. For he had sent an embassy to the Carthaginians, which had been heard by them at night, and besides he was tampering with different states of Greece. 310. 1. The Roman people had now carried their victorious arms over all parts of the world, and far and wide had penetrated countries at a vast distance, and separated by several seas. Nevertheless, in such a tide of success flowing according to their wishes, having obtained a high character for moderation, they were more powerful by their influence than by their military sway. And they boasted frequently that they carried more measures with foreign nations by policy, than by violence and terror. Never insulting conquered nations and kings, generous to their allies, seeking for themselves the honor of victory only, to kings they had preserved their rank, to nations their laws, rights, and liberty. Whether in a treaty formed with an equal or with an inferior. And although they had so encompassed, by their arms, both coasts of the Mediterranean, from Cadiz even as far as Syria, and had gained respect for the Roman name through immense tracts of territory, yet the only subjects they had were the nations of Sicily and the islands on the coast of Italy, and the tribes of the greater part of Spain, which had not yet learned to bear their yoke with resignation. It was the ill-timed treachery of their enemies and rivals, rather than their own ambition, that afforded them cause and material for the increase of their sway. As a special instance, the cruelty of Perseus, who obtained the kingdom of Macedon by treachery and crime, displayed towards his subjects, detested by all, his frantic avarice in the midst of boundless wealth. His inconsiderate levity in the adoption and prosecution of his plans, 
both destroyed him, and whatever could remain independent, as long as he existed, the principal restraint on the Roman power. For his fall recoiled upon others, and brought with it not only the downfall of his neighbors, but also that of those who were far removed from him. The fall of Carthage and of the Achaeans followed the ruin of the Macedonians, and when the state of all was convulsed by their disasters, the rest of the empires, already tottering for some time, were overthrown shortly after. And all fell beneath the Roman sway. It was my intention to lay here before the reader at a glance these events, so intimately connected in interest, though occurring at different times and places, whilst he contemplated the war impending over the Romans from Perseus. From which especially the Roman power drew the sources of its growth. Perseus was then concocting that war in secret, the Ligurians and Gauls provoked rather than employed the Roman arms. 2. Gaul and the Ligurians were the provinces assigned to the consuls, Marcus Junius Brutus, Aulus Manlius Volso, Gaul was assigned to Manlius, Liguria to Junius. As to the praetors, the city jurisdiction fell to Marcus Titinius Curvus. The foreign, to Tiberius Claudius Nero, Sicily, to Publius Aelius Ligus, Sardinia, to Titus Abutius, hither Spain, to the other Marcus Titinius, for there were two of that name praetors in that year, and the farther Spain, to Titus Fontius Capito. A fire broke out in the Forum, by which very many buildings were burnt to the ground, and the Temple of Venus was entirely consumed. The sacred fire of Vesta was extinguished, the virgin who had the care of it was punished with stripes, by order of Marcus Aemilius, the chief pontiff, and supplication was performed, as usual in such cases. In this year the lustrum was closed by Marcus Aemilius Lepidus and Marcus Fulvius Nobilier, censors, in which were rated 273,244 citizens. The ambassadors of Perseus arrived, requiring that he should be saluted by the Senate as king, ally, and friend, and that the treaty should be renewed with him which had existed with his father Philip. Perseus was an object of hatred and suspicion to the Romans, and most of them had no doubt, that as soon as an opportunity was presented, and his strength appeared to him adequate to the struggle, he would wage against the Romans the war. Prepared in secret by Philip, for so many years. However, that they might not appear to have provoked him when quiet and desirous of peace, and to have themselves furnished him with a cause for war, they conceded to him his demands. Perseus, when this answer was received, supposing that the kingdom was secured to him, began to acquire influence among the Greeks. Being desirous therefore of procuring their friendship, he recalled into Macedon all, without exception, who had gone into exile, when condemned for debt or by any judicial proceeding, and those who had left Macedon for high treason, by edicts. Openly announced in the island of Delos, and at Delphi, and at the temple of Minerva at Iton, in which he granted to those returning not only pardon, but also restoration of all their property, with the income. From that period in which each became an exile. He also remitted to those who were living in Macedon whatever was due to the royal exchequer, and released all those imprisoned for high treason. When by these acts he had encouraged the minds of many, he turned the attention of all Greece towards himself, and filled it with great hope. And besides, in the entire deportment of the rest of his life, he preserved the dignity of a king. For his mien was noble, and his person well fitted to discharge all the duties of war and peace, and his age, now matured, possessed a graceful majesty, beaming from brow and forehead. He had none of his father's wantonness, and licentious passions for women and wine. By these praiseworthy acts Perseus rendered the beginning of his reign agreeable, although it was destined to have a termination very different from its commencement. 3. Before those praetors who had obtained by lot the Spains could come to their provinces, great exploits were there performed by Postumius and Gracchus. But the praise of Gracchus was extraordinary, for he being in the prime of life, since he far surpassed all his coevals in courage and prudence, even then was lauded greatly by fame, and raised greater hope of himself with regard to the future. Twenty thousand Celtiberians were besieging Karabi, a city in alliance with the Romans. Gracchus hastened to bear aid to his allies. That anxiety tortured him, how he could signify his intention to the besieged, while the enemy pressed the city with so close a blockade, that it scarcely appeared possible that an enemy could reach it. 
the daring of Cominius executed the difficult task. He being prefect of a troop of horse, having previously weighed over the matter with himself, and having informed Gracchus of what he was preparing, dressed himself in a Spanish military cloak, and mixed with the enemy's foragers. Having entered the camp with them he galloped from it to the city, and announced the approach of Tiberius. The townsmen, being aroused by this intelligence from the depth of despair to cheerfulness and daring, and having determined to fight bravely to the last, were relieved from blockade on the third day. In consequence of the enemy having departed on the arrival of Gracchus. He himself having been afterwards attacked by a stratagem of the barbarians, by the union of skill and strength, so repelled the danger, that the artifice recoiled on its originators. There was a town, Compliga by name, that had been built several years before, but strengthened by fortifications and increased by speedy additions, into which many of the Spaniards had flocked. Who previously straggled here and there in need of territory. About twenty thousand men coming forth from that city in the garb of suppliants, and holding forth branches of olive, stood in view of the camp as if entreating peace. Immediately, having cast away the emblems of suppliants, and having suddenly attacked the Romans, they fill every place with alarm and consternation. Gracchus, by a prudent counsel, deserted the camp under the pretense of flight, and whilst they were plundering it with the usual greediness of barbarians, and were encumbering themselves with the spoil, he suddenly returned. And attacking them when in no apprehensions of such an evil, slew the most of them, and even made himself master of their town. There are some who tell the story differently, that Gracchus, when he had discovered that the enemy were distressed from want of food, abandoned his camp, which was very well furnished with all articles of food. That the enemy, having taken possession of it, and having intemperately filled themselves with what they had found, and gorged themselves to repletion, were suddenly cut off by the return of the Roman army. 4. But whether this is a different way of telling the same exploit, or quite a different affair and different victory, it is certain that Gracchus completely conquered several tribes, and moreover the entire nation of the Celtiberians. I would not however have the hardihood to assert that he took and destroyed three hundred of their cities, although Polybius, a writer of the highest authority, makes mention of it. Unless that under the name of cities we include towers and castles, by which description of falsehood both the generals in wars and the writers of histories take delight in setting off exploits. For Spain, with its dry and uncultivated soil, could not support a large number of cities. The wild and uncivilized manners of the Spaniards, with the exception of those that dwell on our sea, are also at variance with the assertion. Since the dispositions of men are accustomed to become more mild by the meeting with fellow citizens which occurs in towns. But whatever we may determine concerning the number or description of the cities taken by Sempronius, for writers vary also in the number, and some have related that 150 towns were taken by him. Others that 103 was the number, he certainly performed noble achievements. Nor was he distinguished by the praises he received in war only, but he also proved himself unparalleled in arranging and arbitrating peace and laws for the conquered nations. For he distributed lands among the poor and assigned them habitations, and by giving and receiving an oath, secured to all the tribes inhabiting that country, laws clearly defined, according to which they were to live in friendship and alliance with the Roman people. And posterity often appealed to the authority of this treaty in the wars which afterwards broke out. Gracchus appointed that the town which was hitherto called Alursus, should be distinguished by his own name, and called Gracuris, as a monument of his merit and actions. The report of the acts of Postumius is more involved in obscurity. However the Vacchians and Lusitanians were conquered by him, and forty thousand of these nations were slain. These affairs being transacted, they both, when they had delivered up the armies and provinces to their successors on their arrival, went home to triumph. In Gaul, Manlius the consul, to whom that province had fallen, when material for a triumph was wanting, eagerly seized an opportunity presented by fortune, of waging war against the Istrians. They had aided the Aetolians on a former occasion when making war against the Romans, and lately too had given trouble. At that time Epulo, a king of a violent disposition, ruled them, who was said to have armed the nation trained to peace by his father, and therefore was much endeared to the youth desirous of plundering. 1. 
When the consul held a council on the subject of a war with Istria, some were of opinion that it ought to be begun immediately, before the enemy could collect forces, others, that the Senate ought first to be consulted. The opinion was adopted which opposed delay. Accordingly the consul, marching from Aquileia, pitched his camp at the Lake Timavus, which lies very near the sea. Thither came Caius Furius, one of the naval commanders, with ten ships. For two naval commanders had been appointed against the fleet of the Illyrians, and these commanders, with twenty ships for the protection of the coast of the Hadriatic, were to make Ancona, as it were, the pivot of their position. So that Lucius Cornelius had to guard the coasts on the right, extending from the latter place to Tarentum, and Caius Furius those on the left, as far as Aquileia. This squadron was sent to the nearest port in the Istrian territory, with a number of transports and a large store of provisions, while the consul, following with the legions, encamped at the distance of about five miles from the coast. A plentiful market was soon established at the port, and everything conveyed thence to the camp. That this might be done with greater safety, outposts were fixed around the camp. A newly levied cohort of Placentines was posted between the camp and the sea, as a picket in the direction of Istria. And that the watering parties might likewise have protection at the river, orders were given to Marcus Abucius, military tribune, to take thither two companies of the second legion. Titus and Caius Elius, military tribunes, led out the third legion on the road towards Aquileia, in support of those that went for food and forage. In the same quarter, nearly a mile distant, was the camp of the Gauls, Catmulus acted as their chieftain, and they were not more than three thousand armed men. 2. When the Roman army first reached the Lake Timavus, the Istrians took post behind a hill, where they could not be seen. And on its march thence followed it through byways, watching attentively for some opportunity that might give them an advantage, nor did anything that was done, either on land or sea, escape their observation. When they saw that the advanced guards of the Romans were weak, and that the marketplace was filled with an unarmed crowd of persons trafficking between the camp and the sea, and that they had not fortified themselves either by works on land. Or by the help of ships, they made an assault on two of their posts at once, that of the Placentine cohort, and that of the two companies of the Second Legion. A morning fog concealed their design. And when this began to disperse as the sun grew warm, the light piercing through it in some degree, yet still being far from clear, and, as usual in such cases, magnifying the appearance of everything, deceived the Romans. And made the army of the enemy appear much greater to them than it really was. And when the troops in both the posts, terrified, had fled in the utmost confusion to the camp. There they caused much greater alarm than that which they were under themselves, for they could neither tell what made them fly nor answer any question that was asked. Then a shouting was heard at all the gates, since there were no guards at them which could withstand an attack, and the crowding together of the soldiers, who fell one against the other in the dark, raised a doubt as to whether the enemy was within the rampart. One only cry was heard, that of those urging to the sea. This cry uttered by one, and without an objective by chance, resounded everywhere throughout the entire camp. At first, therefore, a few with their arms and a greater part without them, as if they had received orders so to do, ran off to the seashore. Then followed more, and at length almost the whole of the army, and the consul himself, when, having attempted in vain to call back the fugitives, he had effected nothing by commands, advice, and, at last, by entreaties. Marcus Licinius Strabo, a military tribune of the Third Legion, with three companies alone, remained, being left behind by his legion. The Istrians having made an attack on the empty camp, after that no other had met them in arms came upon him while he was drawing up and encouraging his men at the general's quarters. The fight was maintained with more resolution than might be anticipated, from the small number of the defenders, nor did it cease until the tribune, and those who stood round him, were all slain. The enemy then, tearing down the general's tent, and seizing on all they could find, went on to the quester's quarters, and the adjoining forum, called Quintana. Thereupon, when they found all kinds of food dressed and laid out in the quester's tent, and the couches placed in order, their chieftain lay down and began to feast. Presently all the rest, thinking no more of fighting or of the enemy, did the same, 
and being unaccustomed to any sort of rich food, they greedily gorged themselves with meat and wine. 3. The appearance of affairs among the Romans was by no means the same. There was confusion both on land and sea, the mariners struck their tents, and hastily conveyed on board the provisions which had been sent on shore. The soldiers in a panic rushed into the boats, and even into the water. Some of the seamen, in fear lest their vessels should be overcrowded, opposed the entrance of the multitude, while others pushed off from the shore into the deep. Hence arose a dispute, and in a short time a fight, accompanied by wounds and loss of lives, both of soldiers and seamen, until by order of the consul, the fleet was removed to a distance from the shore. He next set about separating the armed from the unarmed, out of so large a number, there were scarcely found twelve hundred who had preserved their arms, very few horsemen who had brought their horses with them. While the rest were an ill-looking throng, like servants and sutlers, and would certainly have fallen a prey, if the enemy had not neglected the war. At length an express was dispatched to call in the third legion and the outpost of the Gauls. And at the same time the troops began to march back from all parts in order to retake the camp, and wipe off their disgrace. The military tribunes of the third legion ordered their men to throw away the forage and wood, and commanded the centurions to mount two elderly soldiers on horses from which the loads were thrown down and each of the cavalry to take a young foot soldier with him on his horse. He told them, it would be a great honor to their legion, if they should recover, by bravery, the camp which had been lost by the cowardice of the second. And that this might be easily effected, if the barbarians were surprised while busied in plundering. In like manner as they had taken it, so might it be retaken. His exhortation was received by the army with the utmost alacrity. They eagerly bear on the standards, nor do the soldiers delay the standard-bearers. However the consul, and the troops which were led back from the shore, reached the rampart first. Lucius Aetius, first tribune of the second legion, not only urged on his men, but informed them also, that, if the Istrians meant to retain the camp, which they had taken, by the same arms by which they took it, they would, in the first place, have pursued their enemy driven from his camp to the sea. And, in the next place, they would certainly have stationed guards outside the rampart, and that it was very likely that they were lying in sleep, or drowned in wine. 4. Immediately after this, he ordered his own standard-bearer, Aulus Beculonius, a man of known bravery, to bear in the standard, who replied, that if the men were willing to follow him, he would cause it to be done more quickly. Then, exerting all his strength, after throwing the standard across the entrenchment, he was the first that entered the gate. And on the other side, Titus Elias and Caius Elias, military tribunes of the third legion, with their cavalry arrived. And, quickly after them, the soldiers whom they had mounted in pairs on the beasts of burden, also the consul with the main body. Only a few of the Istrians, who had drunk in moderation, betook themselves to flight, death succeeded as the continuation of the sleep of the others and the Romans recovered all their effects unimpaired, except the victuals and wine which had been consumed. The soldiers, too, who had been left sick in the camp, when they saw their countrymen within the trenches, snatched up arms, and committed great slaughter. The bravery of Caius Papilius, a horseman, was preeminent above that of all. His surname was Labellus. He had been left behind in the camp, on account of a wound in his foot, notwithstanding which he slew by far the greatest number of the enemy. About eight thousand Istrians were killed, but not one prisoner taken. For rage and indignation had made the Romans regardless of booty. The king of the Istrians, though drunk after his banquet, was hastily mounted on a horse by his people, and effected his escape. Of the conquerors there were lost two hundred and thirty-seven men, more of whom fell in the fight in the morning, than in the retaking of the camp. 5. It happened that Gnaeus and Lucius Cavilius, new citizens of Aquileia, coming with a convoy of provisions, and not knowing what had passed, were very near going into the camp after it was taken by the Istrians. These men, when, leaving their baggage, they had fled back to Aquileia, filled all things with consternation and alarm, not only there, but, in a few days after, at Rome also. To which intelligence was brought, not only that the camp was taken, and that the troops ran away, 
as was really the case, but that everything was lost and that the whole army was entirely cut off. Wherefore, as is usual in a dangerous emergency, extraordinary levies were ordered by proclamation, both in the city and throughout all Italy. Two legions of Roman citizens were raised, and ten thousand foot and five hundred horse were demanded from the allies of the Latin nation. The consul Marcus Junius was ordered to pass on into Gaul, and demand from the several states of that province, whatever number of troops each was able to supply. At the same time it was decreed that Tiberius Claudius, the praetor, should issue orders for the fourth legion, and five thousand foot and two hundred and fifty horse, of the Latins, to assemble at Pisces. And that he should guard that province during the consul's absence, and that Marcus Titinius, the praetor, should order the first legion, and an equal number of allied foot and horse, to meet at Ariminum. Nero, habited in general's robes, set out for Pisces, which was in his province. Titinius, after sending Caius Cassius, military tribune, to Ariminum, to take the command of the legion there, held a levy at Rome. The consul, Marcus Junius, passed over from Liguria into the province of Gaul, and having immediately ordered a levy of auxiliaries through the states of Gaul, and having ordered the colonies to send soldiers, came to Aquileia. There he learned that the army was safe, wherefore, after dispatching a letter to Rome, that they might be no longer alarmed, he sent home the auxiliaries, which he had ordered the Gauls to furnish, and proceeded himself to join his colleague. There was great joy at Rome after the unexpected news, the levies were stopped, the soldiers who had taken the military oath were discharged, and the troops at Ariminum, who were afflicted with a pestilential sickness, were remanded home. The Istrians, when they with a numerous force were encamped at no great distance from the consul, after they heard that the other consul was arrived with a new army, dispersed, and returned to their several states. The consuls led back their legions into winter quarters at Aquileia. 6. The alarm caused by the affairs of Istria being at length composed, a decree of the Senate was passed, that the consuls should settle between themselves which of them should come to Rome, to preside at the elections. When two plebeian tribunes, Aulus Licinius Narva and Caius Papirius Tertus, in their harangues to the people, uttered severe reflections on Manlius, then abroad, and proposed the passing of an order, that although the government of their provinces had already been continued to the consuls for a year, yet Manlius should not hold command beyond the Ides of March, in order that he might immediately, after going out of office, be brought to trial. Against this proposition, Quintus Elius, another tribune, protested, and, after violent struggles, prevailed so far, as to prevent its being passed. About this time, when Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus and Lucius Postumius Albinus came home from Spain, an audience of the Senate is granted to them, by Marcus Titinius the Praetor, to speak of the services which they had rendered, and demand the honours they had merited, and also that thanksgiving should be offered to the immortal gods. At the same time also it was known by the letters of Titus Abucius the Praetor, which his son brought to the Senate, that there was great commotion in Sardinia. The Ilientians, having added to their forces Balearian auxiliaries, had invaded the province though at peace with them, nor could resistance be offered to them by a weak army, which had besides lost great numbers by a pestilence. Ambassadors from the Sardinians made the same representations, entreating the Senate to send relief to their cities, for as to the country, it was already entirely ruined. This embassy, and everything which referred to Sardinia, was referred to the new magistrates. There was an embassy from the Lycians, no less entitled to commiseration, who complained of the cruel treatment which they suffered from the Rhodians, to whose government they had been annexed by Lucius Cornelius Scipio. They had formerly, they said, been under the dominion of Antiochus, and their bondage under that king, compared to their present condition, appeared an honourable state of liberty. That they were not only oppressed by acts of government, but individually underwent real slavery. That they themselves, their wives, and children, were abused alike by them. That cruelties were practised on their persons, and their character blotted and dishonoured, a circumstance which would excite the indignation of every one. They were openly treated with contemptuous insults, merely for the purpose of exercising an usurped prerogative, that they might not doubt that there was no difference between them and purchased slaves. The Senate was highly displeased at such proceedings, 
and gave the Lycians a letter to the Rhodians, acquainting them, that it was the will of the Senate, that neither the Lycians should be subjected to the Rhodians as slaves. Nor should any other men who were born free become the slaves of any one. But that the Lycians should be under the government, and, at the same time, the protection of the Rhodians, in like manner as the allied states were subjected to the Roman people. 7. Two triumphs for conquests in Spain were then successively celebrated. First, Sempronius Gracchus triumphed over the Celtiberians and their allies. Next day, Lucius Postumius triumphed over the Lusitanians, and the other Spaniards in that quarter. Tiberius Gracchus carried in the procession 40,000 pounds weight of silver, Albinus 20,000. They distributed to each of their soldiers 25 denariuses, 311 double that sum to a centurion, triple it to a horseman, the same sums to the allied troops as to the Roman. The consul, Marcus Junius, happened to arrive at Rome at this time from Istria, in order to hold the elections. The plebeian tribunes, Papirius and Licinius, after harassing him in the Senate, with questions relative to what had passed in Istria, brought him into the assembly of the people. To which inquiries the consul answered, that he had been not more than eleven days in that province, and that as to what had happened when he was not present, he, like themselves, gained his information from report. But they still proceeded to ask, why, then, did not Manlius rather come to Rome, that he might account to the Roman people for his having quitted Gaul, the province allotted to him, and gone into Istria? When had the Senate decreed a war with that nation? When had the people ordered it? But he will say, though the war was indeed undertaken by private authority, yet it was conducted with prudence and courage. On the contrary, it is impossible to say, whether it was undertaken with greater injustice than the rashness with which it was conducted. Two advanced guards were surprised by the Istrians. A Roman camp was taken, with whatever infantry and cavalry were in it, the rest in disorder, without arms, and among the foremost the consul himself, fled to the shore and the ships. But he should answer for all these matters when he became a private citizen, since he had been unwilling to do so while consul. 8. The elections were then held, in which Caius Claudius Pulcher and Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus were chosen consuls. Next day the following persons were elected praetors, Publius Elius Tubero, a second time, Caius Quintus Flamininus, Caius Nemigius, Lucius Mummius, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, and Publius Valerius Lavinus. The city jurisdiction fell, by lot, to Tubero. The foreign, to Quintus, Sicily, to Nemigius, and Sardinia, to Mummius, but this last, on account of the importance of the war there, was made a consular province. Gracchus obtains it by lot, Claudius, Istria. Scipio and Lavinus received Gaul, which was divided into two provinces. On the Ides of March, the day when Sempronius and Claudius assumed the administration, a cursory mention only was of the provinces of Sardinia and of Istria, and of those who had commenced hostilities there. But on the day following, the ambassadors of the Sardinians, who had been referred to the new magistrates, were introduced, and Lucius Minucius Thermus, lieutenant general under the consul Manlius in Istria, attended. And by them the Senate was accurately informed how far these provinces were involved in war. Ambassadors from the Confederate states of Latium, who, after having ineffectually applied to the former consuls and censors, were at last introduced to an audience, made a powerful impression on the Senate. The amount of their complaints was that, their citizens, having been rated in the general survey at Rome, had most of them removed thither. And that if this practice were allowed, it would come to pass, in the course of a very few lustrums, that their deserted towns and country would be unable to furnish any soldiers. The Samnites and the Polygnians also represented, that four thousand families had emigrated to Fregelli, and that neither of these places furnished less soldiers on that account. That there had been practiced two species of fraud in individuals changing their citizenship, there was a law, which granted liberty to any of the allies or Latins, who should not leave his offspring at home, to be enrolled a citizen of Rome. Yet, by an abuse of this law, some did injury to the allies, others to the Roman people. For, at first, to evade the leaving offspring at home, 
they made over their children as slaves to some Roman, under an agreement that they should be again set free, and thus become citizens by emancipation. And then those men, who had now no children to leave, became Roman citizens. Afterwards, they neglected even these appearances of law. And, without any regard either to the ordinances or to progeny, passed indiscriminately into the Roman state by migration, and getting themselves included in the survey. To prevent such proceedings in future, the ambassadors requested the Senate to order the Allies to return to their respective states, and to provide by a law that no one should make any man his property. Or alienate such property for the purpose of a change of citizenship. And that if any person should by such means be made a citizen of Rome, he should not enjoy the rights of a citizen. 9. The Senate granted their petitions, and then Sardinia and Istria, the provinces which were in arms, were disposed of. Two legions were ordered to be enrolled for Sardinia, each containing 5,200 foot and 300 horse, and of allies and Latins, 12,000 foot and 600 horse. And it was decided that the consul should have ten ships, of five banks of oars, if he should think it requisite to take them from the docks. The same numbers of infantry and cavalry were decreed for Istria as for Sardinia. The consuls were ordered to send into Spain to Marcus Titinius, one legion, with three hundred horse and five thousand foot, and two hundred and fifty horse of the allies. Before the consuls cast lots for their provinces, several prodigies were reported, that in the Crustumine territory, a stone fell from the sky into the grove of Mars, that in the Roman territory, a boy was born defective in his limbs. That a serpent with four feet had been seen, that at Capua, many buildings in the Forum were struck by lightning, and, that at Putiali, two ships were burned by lightning. Amidst these prodigies which were reported from abroad, a wolf also, after entering Rome by the Colline Gate, was chased during the day, and, to the great consternation of its pursuers, escaped through the Esquiline Gate. On account of these prodigies, the consuls sacrificed victims of the larger kinds, and there was a supplication, for one day, at all the shrines. When the sacrifices were duly performed, they cast lots for their provinces. Istria fell to Claudius, Sardinia to Sempronius. Then Caius Claudius, by direction of the Senate, proposed a law and issued a proclamation, that any of the allies and Latin confederates, who themselves, or whose ancestors, had been surveyed among the associated states of Latium in the censorship of Marcus Claudius and Titus Quintius, or at any time since, should all return, each to his respective state, before the calends of November. Inquiry concerning such as did not obey, was entrusted to Lucius Mummius the praetor. To the law and the proclamation of the consul, was added a decree of the senate, that, the dictator, consul, interrex, censor, or praetor, who then should be in office, before whom any slave should be brought, to receive manumission. Should cause the said slave who was about to be made free, to make oath, that the person giving him liberty did not do it for the purpose of his changing his citizenship. They ordered that he, whoever would not swear this oath, should not be manumitted. The cognizance and jurisdiction in this business was, for the future, assigned to Caius Claudius the consul. 10. While these matters passed at Rome, Marcus Junius and Aulus Manlius, the consuls of the preceding year, after remaining during the winter at Aquileia, led their army early in the spring into the Istrian territories. Where when they spread their depredations through a great part of the country, grief and indignation, rather than any well-grounded hope of being able to make head against these joint forces, roused the Istrians. On perceiving the plunder of their property, a hasty levy of their young men being made from all their cantons this raw and tumultuary army made its first onset with more vigor than perseverance. About four thousand of them were slain in the field. And the rest, giving over the war, fled in different directions to their respective states. Soon after, they sent ambassadors to the Roman camp to sue for peace, and then delivered up the hostages required of them. When these transactions were made known at Rome, by letters from the proconsul, Caius Claudius, the consul, fearing that this proceeding might, perhaps, take the province and the army out of his hands, without offering vows. Without assuming the military habit, and unaccompanied by his lictors, having acquainted his colleague alone with his intention, set out in the night, 
and with the utmost speed hastened to the province. Where he conducted himself even with less prudence than he had shown in coming. For, in an assembly which he called, after making severe remarks on Manlius's running away from the camp, which were very offensive to the ears of the soldiers, as they themselves had begun the flight, and after railing at Marcus Junius. As having made himself a sharer in the disgrace of his colleague, he at last ordered both of them to quit the province. And when they replied, that when the consul should come, in the regular manner, agreeably to ancient practice. When he should set out from the city, after offering vows in the capital, attended by his lictors and dressed in the military habit, then they would obey his orders. Maddened by anger, he summoned the person who acted as quester to Manlius, and ordered him to bring fetters, threatening to send Junius and Manlius to Rome in chains. The consul's command was slighted by this man too. And the surrounding crowd of soldiers, who favoured the cause of their commanders, and were incensed against the consul, supplied him with resolution to refuse obedience. At last the consul, overpowered by the reproaches of individuals and the scoffs of the multitude, for they even turned him into ridicule, went back to Aquileia in the same ship in which he had come. Thence he wrote to his colleague, desiring him to give notice to that part of the new raised troops who were enlisted for Istria, to assemble at Aquileia, in order that he should have no delay at Rome, but set out, in the military habit. As soon as the ceremony of offering vows was finished. These directions his colleague punctually executed, and an early day was appointed for the assembling of the troops. Claudius almost overtook his own letter. On his arrival he called an assembly, that he might represent the conduct of Manlius and Junius. And, staying only three days in Rome, he offered his vows in the capital, put on the military habit, and, attended by his lictors, set out to his province with the same rapid speed which he had used in the former journey. 11. A few days before his arrival, Junius and Manlius had laid vigorous siege to the town of Nazatium, in which the principal Istrians, and Epulo their king, had shut themselves up. Claudius, bringing thither the two new legions, dismissed the old army, with its commanders, invested the town himself, and prosecuted the siege with regular works. He by the labor of many days changed the course of, and carried away in a new channel, a river which flowed on the outside of the wall, and greatly impeded the proceedings of the besiegers, while it supplied the Istrians with water. This event, of the water being cut off, terrified the barbarians, as if affected by some supernatural power, yet still they entertained no thoughts of peace, but set about killing their wives and children. Exhibiting a spectacle shocking even to their enemies, and, after putting them to death in open view on the walls, tumbled them down. Amid the simultaneous shrieking of women and children, and this horrid carnage, the soldiers, scaling the walls, effected an entrance into the town. As soon as the king heard the uproar of the captured city, from the cries of terror uttered by the flying inhabitants, he plunged his sword into his breast, that he might not be taken alive, the rest were either killed or taken prisoners. After this, two other towns, Mutila and Faviria, were stormed and destroyed. The booty, which exceeded expectation, considering the poverty of the nation, was all given up to the soldiers. 5,632 persons were sold by auction, and the fomenters of the war were beaten with rods and beheaded. By the destruction of these three towns, and the death of the king, the whole country of Istria was brought to terms of peace, every one of its states, giving hostages, submitted to the dominion of the Romans. 12. For some time before, the conclusion of the war with Istria, consultations were held among the Ligurians about the renewal of hostilities. Tiberius Claudius, proconsul, who had been consul the year before, with a garrison of one legion, held the command of Pisces. And when the Senate was informed by his letter of their proceedings, they vote that, the same letter should be carried to Caius Claudius, for the other consul had already crossed over into Sardinia. And they added a decree, that, since the province of Istria was subdued, he might, if he thought proper, lead his army into Liguria. At the same time, a supplication for two days was decreed, in consequence of the letter which he wrote concerning his actions in Istria. The other consul, Sempronius, likewise was successful in his operations in Sardinia. 
he carried his army into the territory of the Ilian tribe of Sardinians. Powerful reinforcements from the Balerians had come to the Ilians. He fought a pitched battle against the combined forces of the two states. The enemy were routed and put to flight, and driven from their camp, 12,000 armed men were slain. Next day, the consul ordered their arms to be gathered into a heap and burned, as an offering to Vulcan. He then led back his victorious troops into winter quarters in the allied cities. Caius Claudius, on receipt of the letter of Tiberius Claudius and the decree of the Senate, marched his legions out of Istria into Liguria. The enemy, having advanced into the plains, were encamped on the river Scultena, here a pitched battle was fought, in which 15,000 of the enemy were killed, and about 700 captured in the fight, and in the camp. For that too was stormed. And also 51 military standards were taken. The Ligurians who survived the slaughter, fled back in every direction into the mountains. No appearance of arms anywhere met the consul while ravaging the low country. Claudius, having thus in one year subdued two nations, and, what has rarely been achieved in a single consulate, completed the reduction of two provinces, came home to Rome. 13. Several prodigies were reported this year, that at Crustuminum a bird, which they call the osprey, cut a sacred stone with its beak, that a cow spoke in Campania. That at Syracuse a brazen statue of a cow was mounted by a farmer's bull which had strayed from the herd. A supplication of one day was performed in Crustuminum, on the spot. The cow at Campania was ordered to be maintained at the public expense, and the prodigy at Syracuse was expiated, the deities to whom supplications should be offered, being declared by the Aruspices. This year died, in the office of Pontiff, Marcus Claudius Marcellus, who had been consul and censor, and his son, Marcus Marcellus, was chosen into the vacant place. The same year a colony of 2,000 Roman citizens was settled at Lucca. The triumvirs, Publius Aelius, Lucius Aegilius, and Gnaeus Sicinius, planted it. Fifty-one acres and a half of land were given to each. This land had been taken from the Ligurians, and had been the property of the Etrurians, before it fell into their possession. Caius Claudius, the consul, arrived at the city, and after laying before the Senate a detail of his successful services in Istria and Liguria, a triumph was decreed to him on demanding it. He triumphed, in office, over the two nations at once. In this procession he carried 307,000 denariuses, 312 and 85,702 quinariuses.313 to each soldier 15 denariuses 314 were given, double that sum to a centurion, triple it to a horseman. The allied soldiers received less, by half, than the native troops, for which reason they followed his chariot in silence to show their disgust. 14. While this triumph over the Ligurians was celebrated, that people, perceiving that not only the consular army returned to Rome, but also that the legion at Pisi had been disbanded by Tiberius Claudius, shaking off their fears, and collecting an army secretly, crossed the mountains by winding paths, and came down into the plains, and after ravaging the lands of Mutina, by a sudden assault they gained possession of the colony itself. When this account was brought to Rome, the Senate ordered Caius Claudius, the consul, to hold the elections as soon as possible, and, after appointing magistrates for the ensuing year, to go back to his province. And rescue the colony out of the hands of the enemy. The elections were held as the Senate had directed, and Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Hispalus, with Quintus Petilius Spurinus, were chosen consuls. Then Marcus Papilius Leinus, Publius Licinius Crassus, Marcus Cornelius Scipio, Lucius Papirius Masso, Marcus Aburius, and Lucius Aquilius Gallus, were elected praetors. To Caius Claudius, the consul, his command was prolonged for a year, and likewise the administration of the province of Gaul. And he was ordered, lest the Istrians should follow the example of the Ligurians, to send into Istria the allied Latin troops, which he had brought home to attend his triumph. When the consuls, Gnaeus Cornelius and Quintus Petilius, on the day of entering into office, according to custom, sacrificed each an ox to Jupiter, the head of the liver was not found in the victim sacrificed by Petilius. Which being reported to the Senate, he was ordered to sacrifice oxen until the omens should be favorable. 
the Senate being then consulted concerning the provinces, decreed Pisi and Liguria to be the provinces of the consuls. They ordered that he to whose lot Pisi fell, should, at the time of the elections, come home to preside at them, and that they should severally enlist two new legions and three hundred horse. And should order the allies, and Latin confederates, to furnish ten thousand foot and six hundred horse to each. The command was prolonged to Tiberius Claudius, until such time as the consul should arrive in the province. 15. While the Senate was employed in these affairs, Caius Cornelius, being called by a beetle, went out of the Senate house. And, after a short time, returned with a troubled countenance, and told the conscript fathers that the liver of a fat ox, which he had sacrificed, had melted away. That, when this was told him by the person who dressed the victims, he did not believe it, and he himself ordered the water to be poured out of the vessel in which the entrails were boiled. And he saw all entire but the liver, which had been unaccountably consumed. While the fathers were under much terror on account of this prodigy, their alarm was augmented by the other consul, who informed them that, on account of the first victim having wanted the head of the liver, he had sacrificed three oxen. And had not yet found favorable omens. The Senate ordered him to continue sacrificing the larger victims until he should find favorable omens. They say that the victims offered to the other deities at length presented good omens. But that in those offered to health, Petilius could find none such. Then the consuls and praetors cast lots for their provinces, when Pisces fell to Gnaeus Cornelius, Liguria, to Petilius. Of the praetors, Lucius Papirius Masso obtained the city jurisdiction, Marcus Abucius, the foreign, Marcus Cornelius Scipio Melugenensis, the farther Spain, Lucius Aquilius Gallus, Sicily. Two of them petitioned to be excused from going into their provinces. First, Marcus Papilius requested that he might not be obliged to go to Sardinia, alleging that Gracchus was bringing that province into a state of tranquility. That Titus Abucius the praetor had been given to him by the Senate as his assistant. And that it was by no means expedient to interrupt the train of business, for the completion of which there was no method so efficacious as the continuing the management in the same hands. That, amid the transfer of command and initiation of the successors, who must be impressed with a knowledge of circumstances before they can proceed to action, opportunities of successfully transacting matters were frequently lost. The excuse of Papilius was admitted. Then Publius Licinius Crassus alleged that he was prevented from going into his province by solemn sacrifices. That which had fallen to his lot was hither Spain. But he was ordered either to proceed thither, or to swear in the public assembly that he was hindered by the performance of solemn anniversary sacrifices. When this determination was made in the case of Publius Licinius, Marcus Cornelius demanded that his oath, of the like import, might be admitted as an excuse for his not going into the farther Spain. Both the praetors accordingly took an oath in the same words. Marcus Titinius and Titus Fontius, proconsuls, were ordered to remain in Spain, with authority as before. And it was decreed that a reinforcement should be sent to them of three thousand Roman foot, with two hundred horse, and five hundred Latin foot, with three hundred horse. 16. The Latin festival was celebrated on the third day before the Nones of May, 315 and because, on the offering of one of the victims, the magistrate of Lanuvium had not prayed for the Roman people, the Karites, religious scruples were felt. When the matter was laid before the Senate, and they referred it to the College of Pontiffs, the latter determined that the Latin festival had not been duly performed, and must be repeated. And that the Lanuvians, on whose account they were repeated, should furnish the victims. Besides the concern excited by matters of a religious nature, another incident caused no small degree of uneasiness. The consul Gnaeus Cornelius, as he was returning from the Alban Mount, fell down. And being paralyzed in part of his limbs, set out for the waters of Cumi, where, his disorder still increasing, he died. His body was conveyed to Rome to be buried, and the funeral obsequies were performed with great magnificence, he was likewise a pontiff. The other consul, Quintus Petilius, was ordered to hold an assembly, as soon as the auspices could be taken, for the election of a consul in the room of his late colleague, and to proclaim the Latin festival. Accordingly, by proclamation, 
he fixed the election for the third day before the Nones of August 316 and the Latin festival for the third before the Ides of the same month. 317 While the minds of the people were full of religious fears, to add thereto, several prodigies were reported to have happened, that a blazing torch was seen in the sky at Tusculum. That the Temple of Apollo, and many private buildings at Gabii, and a wall and gate at Graviski, were struck by lightning. The Senate ordered these to be expiated as the pontiff should direct. While the consuls were detained, at first by religious ceremonies, and afterwards, one of them, by the death of the other, and then by the election and the repetition of the Latin festival, in the meantime Caius Claudius marched the army to Mutina, which the Ligurians had taken the year before. Before three days had elapsed from the commencement of the siege he retook it, and delivered it back to the colonists, on this occasion eight thousand Ligurians were killed within the walls. He immediately dispatched a letter to Rome, in which he not only represented this success, but likewise boasted that through his good conduct and good fortune there was not one enemy of the Roman people left on this side the Alps. And that a large tract of land had been taken, which might be distributed among many thousand men, giving each a share. 17. During the same period, Tiberius Sempronius, after gaining many victories, totally subdued the people of Sardinia. Fifteen thousand of the enemy were slain. All the tribes of the Sardinians, who had revolted, were brought under the dominion of Rome. On those which had formerly been tributary, double taxes were, imposed and levied. The rest paid a contribution in corn. When he had thus restored peace in the province, and received hostages from all parts of the island, to the number of two hundred and thirty, deputies are sent by him to Rome, to give information of these transactions, and to request of the Senate that in consideration of those services, performed under the conduct and auspices of Tiberius Sempronius, thanksgiving might be offered to the immortal gods, and permission granted him to quit the province and bring home the army with him. The Senate, having given audience to the deputies in the Temple of Apollo, ordered a thanksgiving for two days, and that the consuls should sacrifice forty victims of the larger kinds. But commanded the proconsul, Tiberius Sempronius, and his army, to continue in the province for the year. Then the election for filling the vacant place of a consul, which had been fixed by proclamation for the third day before the Nones of August, was finished in one day. And the consul Quintus Petilius declared Caius Valerius Lavinus duly elected his colleague, who was to assume immediately the administration of his office. This man, having been long ambitious of the government of a province, when, very seasonably for the gratification of his wishes, a letter now arrived with intelligence that the Ligurians were again in arms. On the knowns of August 318 assumed the military habit. And ordered that, on account of this alarm, the third legion should march into Gaul, and join Caius Claudius, proconsul, and that the commanders of the fleet should sail with their ships to Pisces and coast along the Ligurian shore. To terrify the people by the sight of a naval power also. The other consul, Quintus Petilius, had appointed a day for his troops to assemble in the same place. Besides, Caius Claudius, proconsul, on hearing of the rebellion in Liguria, having hastily collected some soldiers, in addition to those whom he had with him at Parma, brought this army to the frontiers of Liguria. 18. On the approach of Caius Claudius, the enemy, reflecting that this was the same commander who had defeated them at the river Scultena, resolving to rely on situation, rather than arms. For their defense against a force with which they had so unsuccessfully struggled, took post in two mountains, called Ledum and Ballista. And, for greater security, surrounded their encampment with a wall. Some, who were too slow in removing from the low grounds, were surprised and put to the sword, one thousand five hundred in number. The others kept themselves close on the mountains, and retaining, in the midst of their fears, their native savage disposition, vented their fury on the prey taken at Mutina. They put their prisoners to death after shocking mutilation, the cattle they butchered in the temples, rather than decently sacrificed, and then, satiated with the destruction of living creatures, they turned their fury against things inanimate. Dashing against the walls even vessels made for use rather than for show. Quintus Petilius, the consul, 
fearing that the war might be brought to a conclusion before he arrived in the province, wrote to Caius Claudius to bring the army into Gaul, saying, that he would wait for him at the Long Plains. Claudius, immediately on receipt of the letter, marched out of Liguria, and gave up the command of the army to the consul at the Long Plains. To the same place came, in a few days after, the other consul, Caius Valerius. There having divided their forces before they separated, they both together performed a purification of the troops. They then cast lots for their respective routes, it having been resolved that they should not assail the enemy on the same side. It was certain that Valerius cast his lot auspiciously, because he was in the consecrated ground. The augurs afterwards announced that there was this defect in the case of Petilius, that he himself when outside the consecrated ground cast his lot into the urn, which was subsequently brought into the sacred place. They then began their march in different directions, Petilius pitched his camp against the ridge of Ballista and Ledum, which joined the two together with one continued range. They report, that while he was here encouraging his soldiers, whom he had assembled for the purpose, without reflecting on the ambiguity of the word, he uttered this ominous expression, This day I will have Ledum. 319 He made his troops march up the mountain in two places at the same time. The division in which he was advanced briskly, the other was repulsed by the enemy, and the consul riding up thither, to remedy the disorder, rallied his troops. But whilst he moves about too carelessly in the front, he was pierced through with a javelin, and fell. The commanders of the enemy did not know that he was killed. And the few of his own party who saw the disaster, carefully covered the body from view, knowing that the victory rested on this. The rest of the troops, horse and foot, though deprived of their leader, dislodged the enemy, and took possession of the mountains. Five thousand of the Ligurians were slain and of the Roman army only fifty-two were lost. Besides this evident completion of the unhappy omen, the keeper of the chickens was heard to say, that there had been a defect in the auspices, and that the consul was not ignorant of it. Caius Valerius, when he was informed of the death of Quintus Petilius, made the army, thus bereft of its commander, join his own, then, attacking the enemy again, in their blood he offered a noble sacrifice to the shade of his departed colleague. He had the honour of a triumph over the Ligurians. The legion, at whose head the consul was killed, was severely punished by the senate. They determined that the campaign of this year should not be counted to the entire legion, and that their pay should be stopped, for not exposing themselves to the enemy's weapons in defence of their commander. About this time ambassadors came to Rome from the Dardanians, who mere greatly distressed by the numerous army of Bastarnians, under Clondicus, mentioned above. These ambassadors, after describing the vast multitude of the Bastarnians, their tall and huge bodies, and their daring intrepidity in facing danger, added, that there was an alliance between them and Perseus. And that the Dardanians were really more afraid of him than even of the Bastarnians. And therefore begged of the Senate that assistance should be sent them. The Senate thereupon agreed, that ambassadors should be sent to examine into the affairs of Macedonia, and immediately a commission was given to Aulus Postumius to go thither. They gave to him as colleagues some young men, that he might have the principal direction and management of the embassy. The Senate then took into consideration the election of magistrates for the ensuing year, on which subject there was a long debate, for people skilled in the rules of religion and politics affirmed, that, as the regular consuls of the year had died, one by the sword, the other by sickness, the substituted consuls could not with propriety hold the elections. An interregnum, therefore, took place, and the interrex elected consuls Publius Mucius Sivola, and Marcus Emilius Lepidus, a second time then Caius Papilius Leinas, Titus Annius Luscus, Caius Memmius Gallus, Caius Clovius Saxula. Servius Cornelius Sulla, and Appius Claudius Cento, were chosen praetors. The provinces assigned to the consuls were Gaul and Liguria. Of the praetors, Cornelius Sulla obtained Sardinia, Claudius Cento gained hither Spain. There is no record of those to whom the other praetorian provinces fell. This year was notorious for an epidemic, which however attacked cattle only. The Ligurians, a nation ever vanquished, yet ever rebelling, ravaged the lands of Luna and Pisces, and at the same time there were alarming rumours of disturbances in Gaul. 
Lepidus having easily quelled the commotions among the Gauls, then marched into Liguria. Several states of this country submitted themselves to his disposal. And he, supposing that they were rendered savage by the rugged mountain tops which they inhabited, as the dispositions of the inhabitants of a country generally resemble its natural features, by the precedent of some former consuls, brought them down to the plains. Of these the Garolians, Lapicinians, and Hercatians had lived on the other side of the Apennine, and the Briniatians on the farther side. 19. On the hither side of the river Audina, Quintus Mucius made war on those who had wasted the lands of Luna and Pisi, and having reduced them all to subjection, he took away their arms from them. On account of these services, performed under the conduct and auspices of the two consuls, the Senate voted a thanksgiving for three days, and sacrifices of forty victims. The commotions which broke out in Gaul and Liguria, at the beginning of this year, were thus speedily suppressed, without any great difficulty, but the apprehensions of the public, respecting a war with Macedon, still continued. For Perseus labored to embroil the Bastarnians with the Dardanians, and the ambassadors, sent to examine into the state of affairs in Macedon, returned to Rome, and brought certain information that hostilities had commenced in Dardania. At the same time came envoys from King Perseus, to plead an excuse that neither had the Bastarnians been invited by him, nor had they done anything at his instigation. The Senate neither acquitted the king of the imputation, nor urged it against him, they only ordered him to be warned to be very careful to show, that he considered the treaty between him and the Romans as inviolable. The Dardanians, perceiving that the Bastarnians, so far from quitting their country, as they had hoped, became daily more troublesome, as they were supported by the neighboring Thracians and Scorditions. Thinking it necessary to make some effort against them, though without any reasonable prospect of success, assembled together in arms from all quarters, at the town that was nearest to the camp of the Bastarnians. It was now winter, and they chose that season of the year, as supposing that the Thracians and Scorditions would return to their own countries. As soon as they heard that these were gone, and the Bastarnians left by themselves, they divided their forces into two parts, that one might march openly along the straight road to attack the enemy and that the other, going round through a wood, which lay out of sight, might assault them on the rear. But, before these could arrive at the enemy's post, the fight commenced, and the Dardanians were beaten, and pursued to the town, which was about twelve miles from the Bastarnian camp. The victors immediately invested the city, not doubting that, on the day following, either the enemy would surrender it from fear, or they might take it by storm. Meanwhile the other body of Dardanians, which had gone round, not having heard of the defeat of their countrymen, easily possessed themselves of the camp of the Bastarnians, which had been left without a guard. The Bastarnians, thus deprived of all their provisions and warlike stores, which were in their camp, and having no means of replacing them in a hostile country, and at that unfavorable season, resolved to return to their native home. Having therefore retreated to the Danube, they found it, to their great joy, covered with ice, so thick as to seem capable of sustaining any weight. But when the entire body of men and cattle, hastening on, and crowding together, pressed on it at the same time, the ice, splitting under the immense weight, suddenly parted, and being overcome and broken up. Left in the middle of the water the entire army which it had supported so long. Most of them were immediately swallowed in the eddies of the river. The fragments of the broken ice passed over many of them in their attempt to swim and drown them. A few out of the entire nation with difficulty escaped to either bank, with their persons severely crushed. About this time, Antiochus, son to Antiochus the Great, who had been for a long time a hostage at Rome, came into possession of the kingdom of Syria, on the death of his brother Seleucus. For Seleucus, whom the Greeks call Philippator, after having received the kingdom of Syria, which had been greatly debilitated by the misfortunes of his father. During an idle reign of twelve years never distinguished by any memorable enterprise at all, called home from Rome this his younger brother, sending, in his stead, his own son Demenlius, according to the terms of the treaty, which allowed the changing of the hostages from time to time. Antiochus had but just reached Athens on his way, when Seleucus was murdered, in consequence of a conspiracy formed by Heliodorus, one of the nobles. Eumenes and Attalus expelled him aiming at the crown, 
and put Antiochus in possession of it, and valued it highly that they had bound him to them by this so important a favor. They now began to harbor some jealousy of the Romans, on account of several trifling causes of disgust. Antiochus, having gained the kingdom by their aid, was received by the people with such transports of joy, that they gave him the surname of Epiphanes, or Rising Star, because when aliens to the royal blood were about to seize the throne, he appeared like a propitious star, to assert his hereditary right. He was not deficient in capacity or vigor of mind to make a figure in war. But he was so perverse and indiscreet in the whole tenor of his conduct and behavior, that they soon changed the surname which they had given him, and instead of Epiphanes, called him Epimanes or Madman. For often having gone forth from the palace without the knowledge of his servants, with one or two attendants, crowned with roses, and dressed in robes embroidered with gold, he used to go through the city. Sometimes striking those that he met with stones that he carried under his arms. Sometimes, on the other hand, throwing money among the mob, and shouting out, let him take to whom fortune shall give. But at another time he used to go through the workshops of the goldsmiths, and engravers and other artisans, arguing vainly concerning the art of each, at another time he engaged in conversation in public with any of the plebeian he met. Again, wandering around the common taverns, he indulged in potations with foreigners and strangers of the lowest grade. If by chance he had learned that any young men were celebrating an untimely banquet, he himself at once came upon them suddenly, with a glass and a concert, reveling and wantoning, so that most of them, struck with terror at the strangeness of the matter, fled away, and the remainder were silent in fear. It is ascertained also that, in the public baths, he used to bathe with the mob. As however there he was in the habit of using the most precious unguents, they report that a plebeian one day said to him. You are happy, O king, you savor of perfumes of the highest value. To whom Antiochus, delighted at his words, said, I will immediately make you so happy, that you will confess that you are sated and immediately ordered a large pot of most valuable unguent to be poured on his head, so that. The floor being drenched with it, both the others began to fall on the slippery surface, and the king himself, laughing heartily, came to the ground. 20. Lastly, having assumed the Roman gown instead of his royal robes, he used to go about the marketplace, as Lai had seen done by the candidates for office at Rome, saluting and embracing each of the plebeians. Soliciting at one time for the aedileship, at another for the plebeian tribuneship, until at last he obtained the office by the suffrages of the people, and then, according to the Roman custom, he took his seat in an ivory chair where he heard causes, and listened to debates on the most trivial matters. So far was his mind from adhering to any routine, for it wandered through every sort of life, that it was not ascertained either by himself or any one else what was his real character. He was accustomed not to speak to his friends, nor scarcely afford a smile, to his acquaintance. By an inconsistent kind of liberality, he made himself and others subjects of ridicule. For to some in the most elevated stations, and who thought highly of themselves, he would give childish presents of sweetmeats, cakes, or toys, others expecting nothing he enriched. Wherefore to many he appeared not to know what he was doing. Some said that he acted from a silly, sportive temper, others, that he was evidently mad. In two great and honorable instances, however, he showed a spirit truly royal, in the presence which he made to several cities, and the honor he paid to the gods. To the inhabitants of Megalopolis, in Arcadia, he made a promise to build a wall round their city, and he gave them the greater part of the money requisite for the purpose. At Tegea he began to erect a magnificent theater of marble. At Sisicum, he presented a set of golden utensils for the service of one table in the Pritaneum, the stateroom of the city, where such as are entitled to that honor dine together. To the Rhodians he gave presents of every kind that their convenience required, but none very remarkable. Of the magnificence of his notions, in everything respecting the gods, the temple of Jupiter Olympus at Athens can be a sufficient testimony, being the only one in the world, the plan of which was suitable to the greatness of the deity. He likewise ornamented Delos with altars of extraordinary beauty, and abundance of statues. A magnificent temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, which he promised to build at Antioch, 
of which not only the ceilings, but all the walls, were to be covered with plates of gold, and many other edifices which he intended in various places. He did not finish, as his reign was very short. He surpassed his predecessors, too, in the magnificence of the public games of every description, of which all the games but one were after their own custom, and celebrated by an immense number of Grecian actors. He gave a show of gladiators in the Roman manner, which at first, among and people unaccustomed to such sights, caused more terror than pleasure. But by frequently repeating them, and sometimes permitting the combatants to go no further than wounds, at other times to fight until one was killed, he rendered such kind of shows not only familiar to people's eyes, but even agreeable. And kindled in most of the young men a passion for arms. So much so that, although, at the beginning, he was obliged to entice gladiators from Rome, by high rewards, he soon found a sufficient number in his own dominions willing to perform for a moderate hire. But he displayed the same worthlessness and levity in exhibiting the games, as in the rest of his life, so that nothing could be seen more magnificent than the preparation for the games, nothing more vile or contemptible than the king himself. And when this appeared often on other occasions, it was then most conspicuous in those games, which, in emulation of the magnificence of those which were given by Paulus in Macedon, after the conquest of Perseus, he exhibited at immense expense. And with corresponding dishonor. To return, however, to the Roman affairs, from which the mention of this king has caused us to digress too far. Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, after holding the government of Sardinia two years, resigned it to Servius Cornelius Sulla, the praetor, and, coming home to Rome, triumphed over the Sardinians. We are told that he brought such a multitude of captives from, that island, that from the long continuance of the sale, Sardinians for sale, became a vulgar proverb, to denote things of little price. Both the consuls, Sivilla and Lepidus, triumphed over the Ligurians, Lepidus over the Gauls also. Then were held the elections of magistrates for the ensuing year. Spurius Postumius Albinus and Quintus Mucius Sivilla were chosen consuls. In the election of praetors, fortune involved Lucius or Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, son of Publius Africanus, one of the candidates, in a very invidious struggle with Caius Caesareus, who had been his father's secretary. For, after five praetors had been declared, namely, Caius Cassius Longinus, Publius Furius Philus, Lucius Claudius Acellus, Marcus Attilius Serenus, and Gnaeus Servilius Cipio. Although Scipio struggled hard to be admitted even in the last place, yet he was thought to have degenerated so far from the virtues of his father, that Caesareus would have been preferred by the votes of all the centuries, had not the latter. With singular modesty, corrected what might be considered either the fault of fortune or error of the elections. He could not reconcile it to himself, that, in a struggle in the elections, he should gain the victory over the son of his patron. But immediately throwing off the white gown, he became, from a competitor sure of success, the grateful friend and supporter of the interest of his rival. Thus, by the help of Caesarea Scipio obtained an honor which he did not seem likely to gain from the people, and which reflected greater glory on Caesarea than on himself. 21. The provinces assigned to the consuls were Gaul and Liguria. On the praetors casting lots, the city jurisdiction fell to Caius Cassius Longinus, and the foreign, to Lucius Cornelius Scipio. The province of Sardinia fell to Marcus Attilius, who was ordered to sail over to Corsica with a new legion, raised by the consuls, and consisting of five thousand foot and three hundred horse. And while he was engaged in carrying on the war there, Cornelius was continued in command, that he might hold the government of Sardinia. To Gnaeus Servilius Cipio, for the service of farther Spain, and to Publius Furius Philus for that of hither Spain, the following troops were assigned, to each, three thousand Roman foot with one hundred and fifty horse and five thousand Latin foot with three hundred horse. Sicily was decreed to Lucius Claudius, without any reinforcement. The consuls were ordered to levy two more legions, of the regular numbers of foot and horse, and to demand from the allies ten thousand foot and six hundred horse, but they met great difficulty in making the levies. For the pestilence, which the year before had fallen on the cattle, in the present year attacked the human species. Such as were seized by it, 
seldom survived the seventh day. Those who did survive, lingered under a tedious disorder, which generally turned to a court and ague. The slaves especially perished, of whom heaps lay unburied on all the roads. The necessary requisites could not be procured for the funerals of those of free condition. The bodies were consumed by putrefaction, without being touched by the dogs or vultures. And it was universally observed, that during that and the preceding year, while the mortality of cattle and men was so great, no vultures were anywhere seen. Of the public priests, there died by this contagion, Nias Servilius Cipio, father of the praetor, a pontiff, Tiberius Sempronius Longus, son of Tiberius, December of religious rites, Publius Elius Paetus, and Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, augurs. Caius Mamilius Vitulus, chief curio, and Marcus Sempronius Tididinus, a pontiff. In the vacant places of pontiffs 320 were chosen in Caius Sulpicius Galba, in the room of Tididinus. The augurs substituted were, Titus Veturius Gracchus Sempronianus, in place of Gracchus, and Quintus Elius Pataz, in place of Publius Elius. Caius Sempronius Longus was made December of religious rites, and Caius Scribonius Curio, chief curio. When the termination of the plague was not visible, the Senate voted that the December should consult the Sibylline books, and, by their directions, a supplication of one day was performed. And the people assembled in the forum made a vow, whilst Quintus Martius Philippus dictated the words, that, if the sickness and pestilence should be removed out of the Roman territory, they would solemnize a festival and thanksgiving of two days' continuance. In the district of Vi, a boy was born with two heads, at Sinuessa, one with a single hand, and at Oximum, a girl with teeth. In the middle of the day, the sky being perfectly clear, a rainbow was seen, stretching over the temple of Saturn, in the Roman Forum, and three suns shone at once. And the following night many lights were seen gliding through the air, about Lanuvium. The people of Caira affirmed that there had appeared in their town a snake with a mane, having its body marked with spots like gold. And it was fully proved that an ox had spoken in Campania. 22. On the knowns of June, 321 the ambassadors returned from Africa, who having first had an interview with King Masinissa, proceeded to Carthage. But they received much more certain information respecting what had taken place in Carthage from the king than from the Carthaginians themselves. They said they had sufficient proof that ambassadors had come from King Perseus, and that an audience of the Senate was given to them by night, in the temple of Aesculapius. And the king asserted, that the Carthaginians had sent ambassadors to Macedon, which they themselves did not positively deny. The Senate, hereupon, resolved to send an embassy to Macedonia. They made choice of Caius Laelius, Marcus Valerius Messala, and Sextus Digitius, who accordingly proceeded thither. About this time, Perseus, because some of the Dilopians were refractory, and in the matters in dispute were for referring the decision from the king to the Romans, marched an army into their country. And reduced the whole nation under his jurisdiction and dominion. Thence he passed through the mountains of Eda, and on account of some religious scruples affecting his mind, went up to Delphi, to apply to the oracle. His sudden appearance in the middle of Greece caused a great alarm, not only in the neighboring states, but also caused alarming intelligence to be brought into Asia to King Eumenes. He stayed only three days at Delphi, and then returned to his own dominions, through Thyotis, Achaia, and Thessaly, without doing the least injury or damage to those countries. He did not think it sufficient to conciliate the esteem of the several states through which his road lay. But dispatched either ambassadors or letters to every one of the Grecian powers, requesting that they would think no more of the animosities which had subsisted between them and his father. That the disputes had not been so violent that they might not, and ought not, to cease with regard to himself. On his part, there was no kind of obstacle to the forming of a cordial friendship. Above all, he wished particularly to find some way of ingratiating himself with the Achaean nation. 23. This nation, and the state of Athens, solitary exceptions to the whole of Greece, had carried their resentment to such a length, as to prohibit the Macedonians entering their territories. In consequence of this, Macedonia became a place of refuge for slaves running away out of Achaia. 
For, as the Achaeans had forbidden the inhabitants of Macedon to set foot in their territories, they could not presume to pass the boundaries of that kingdom. When Perseus observed this, he seized all the fugitives, and wrote a letter, but that they ought to consider of the proper means of preventing such elopements for the future. When this letter was read by the proetor Zenarchus, who was seeking a path to private influence with the king, the greater part who were present, but especially those who, contrary to their expectations, were about to receive the slaves they had lost, commended the moderation and kindness with which it was written. But Calirates, one who thought that the safety of the nation depended on the treaty with Rome being preserved inviolate, delivered his sentiments to this effect. To some of you, Achaeans, the matter under consideration appears trifling and unimportant. I think that a very great and important subject is not only under consideration, but to a certain extent decided. For we, who prohibited the kings of Macedonia, and all their subjects, from entering our territories, and made a perpetual decree, not to receive from those sovereigns either ambassadors or messengers, by whom the minds of any of us might be tampered with. We, I say, listen to the king speaking in a manner, though absent, and what is more, approve of his discourse. Although wild beasts generally reject and shun the food laid in their way for their destruction. Yet we, blinded by the specious offer of an insignificant favor, swallow the bait, and would, for the sake of recovering a parcel of wretched slaves, of no value worth mentioning, suffer our independence to be undermined and subverted. For who does not see that a way is being paved to an alliance with the king, by which the treaty with Rome in which all our interests are involved would be violated? That there must be a war between Perseus and the Romans, is not, I believe, a matter of doubt to any one, and the struggle which was expected during the life of Philip, and interrupted by his death, will, now that he is dead, most certainly ensue. Philip, you all know, had two sons, Demetrius and Perseus. Demetrius was much superior in birth, on the mother's side, in merit, capacity, and in the esteem of the Macedonian nation. But Philip, having set up the crown as the prize of hatred towards the Romans, put Demetrius to death, for no other crime than having contracted a friendship with that people. And made Perseus king, because he knew him to be an enemy to the Roman people almost before he determined on making him king. Accordingly, what else has the present king done since his father's death, than prepare for the war? In the first place, to the terror of all the surrounding nations, he brought the Bastarnians into Dardania, where if they had made a lasting settlement, Greece would have found them more troublesome neighbors than Asia found the Gauls. Disappointed in that hope, he did not drop his design of a war, nay, if we choose to speak the truth, he has already commenced hostilities. He subdued Delopia by force of arms. And would not listen when they wished to appeal concerning their disputes to the arbitration of the Romans. Then, crossing Eda, that he might show himself in the very center of Greece, he went up to Delphi. To what, think you did his taking a journey so uncommon tend? He next traversed Thessaly, and as to his refraining on his route from doing injury to the people whom he hated, I dread his machinations the more on that very account. He then sent a letter to us, with the hollow show of an act of kindness, and bade us to consider measures by which we may not require this gift for the future, that is, to repeal the decree by which the Macedonians are excluded from Peloponnesus. To receive again ambassadors from him their king, to renew intimacies contracted with his principal subjects. And, in a short time, we should see Macedonian armies, with himself at their head, crossing over the narrow strait from Delphi into Peloponnesus, and thus we should be blended with the Macedonians. While they are arming themselves against the Romans. My opinion is, that we ought not to resolve on any new proceeding, but to keep everything in its present state, until the question shall be reduced to a certainty, whether these our fears be well or ill-grounded. If the peace between the Romans and Macedonians shall continue inviolate, then may we also have a friendship and intercourse with Perseus, but to think of such a measure now, appears to me both premature and dangerous. 24. After him, Arco, brother to the praetor Zenarchus, said, Calicrates hath made the delivery of our sentiments difficult both to me and to every one who differs in opinion from him. For after his pleading in favor of the Roman alliance, alleging that it was undermined and attacked, 
although no one either undermines or attacks it, he has caused that whoever dissents from him must seem to argue against the cause of the Romans. In the first place, as if he had not been here with us, but had just left the senate house of the Roman people, or had been admitted into the privy councils of kings, he knows and tells us every transaction that passes in secret. Nay more, he divines what would have happened if Philip had lived, why Perseus became heir of the kingdom, in such a manner, what are the intentions of the Macedonians, and what the thoughts of the Romans. But we, who neither know for what cause, nor in what manner, Demetrius perished, nor what Philip would have done, if he had lived, ought to accommodate our resolutions to the transactions that have passed in open view. We know that Perseus, on his coming to the throne, sent ambassadors to Rome, and received the title of king from the Roman people, and we hear that ambassadors came from Rome to the king, and were graciously received by him. I consider that all these circumstances are signs of peace, not of war, and that the Romans cannot be offended, if as we imitated their conduct in war, so we follow now their example in peace. For my part, I cannot see why we alone, of all mankind, wage implacable war against the kingdom of the Macedonians. Are we exposed to insult by a close neighborhood to Macedon? Or are we like the Delopians, whom Perseus subdued lately, the weakest of all states? No, on the contrary, by the bounty of the gods, we are sufficiently secured, as well by our own strength, as by the remoteness of our situation. But we have as much reason to apprehend ill treatment, as the Thessalians and Aetolians, have we no more credit or influence with the Romans, though we were always their friends and allies, than the Aetolians, who but lately were their enemies. Whatever reciprocal rights the Aetolians, the Thessalians, the Epirots, in short, every state in Greece, allow to subsist between them and the Macedonians, let us allow the same. Why have we alone what may be termed a cursed neglect of the ties of humanity? Philip may have done some act on account of which we should pass this decree against him when in arms and waging war against U.S., what has Perseus deserved, a king just seated on the throne, guiltless of all injury against us. And effacing by his own kindness his father's feuds. Why should we be his only enemies? Although I might make this assertion, that so great have been our obligations to the former kings of Macedon, that the ill usage, suffered from a single prince of their line, if any has really been suffered from Philip. Especially after his death. When a Roman fleet was lying at Sencrii, and the consul, with his army, was at Alatia, we were three days in council, deliberating whether we should follow the Romans or Philip. Now, granting that the fear of immediate danger from the Romans had no influence on our judgments, yet there was, certainly, something that made our deliberation last so long. And that was, the connection which had long subsisted between us and the Macedonians, the distinguished favours in ancient times received from their kings. Let the same considerations prevail at present, not to make us his singular friends, but to hinder us from becoming his singular enemies. Let us not, Calicrates, pretend what is not even thought of. No one advises us to form a new alliance, or sign a new treaty, by which we might inconsiderately compromise ourselves, but merely that we may have the intercourse of affording and demanding justice. And that we may not by excluding his subjects from our territories, exclude ourselves from his dominions, and that our slaves may not have any refuge to fly to. How does this operate against the Roman treaty? Why do we give an air of importance and suspicion to a matter which is trifling and open to the world? Why do we raise groundless alarms? Why? for the sake of ingratiating ourselves still more particularly with the Romans, render others odious and suspected. If war shall take place even Perseus himself does not doubt our taking part with the Romans. While peace continues, let animosities if they are not terminated, be at least suspended. When those who approved of the king's letter expressed their approbation of this speech, the decree was postponed. Owing to the indignation of the chief men that Perseus should obtain by a letter of a few lines a matter which he did not even deign worthy of an embassy. Ambassadors were afterwards sent by the king, when a council was held at Megalopolis, but exertions were made by those, who dreaded a rupture with Rome, that they should not be admitted to an audience. 25. 
During this period the fury of the Aetolians, being turned against themselves, seemed likely to cause the total extinction of that nation by the massacres of the contending parties. Then both parties, being wearied, sent ambassadors to Rome, and also opened a negotiation between themselves for the restoration of Concord, but this was broken off by an act of barbarity, which revived their old quarrels. When a return to their country had been promised to the exiles from Hypata, who were of the faction of Proxenus, and the public faith had been pledged to them by Eupolemus, the chief man of the state. Eighty persons of distinction, whom even Eupolemus, among the rest of the multitude, had gone forth to meet on their return, though they were received with kind salutation, and right hands were pledged to them, were butchered on entering the gate. Though they implored in vain the honour that had been pledged, and the gods the witnesses of the transaction. On this the war blazed out anew, with greater fury than ever. Caius Valerius Lavinus, Appius Claudius Pulcher, Caius Memmius, Marcus Papilius, and Lucius Canulius, being sent as ambassadors by the Senate, arrived in that country. When the deputies from both parties pleaded their respective causes with great energy, Proxenus appeared to have greatly the advantage as well in the justice of his cause as in eloquence. A few days after, he was poisoned by his wife Orthobula, who being convicted of the crime, went into banishment. The same madness was wasting the Cretans also. But, on the arrival of Quintus Minutius, lieutenant general, who was sent with ten ships to quiet their contentions, the inhabitants had some prospect of peace. However, they only concluded a suspension of arms for six months, after which the war was again renewed with much greater violence. About this time, the Lycians, too, were harassed in war by the Rhodians. But the wars of foreign nations among themselves, or the several methods in which they were conducted, it is not my business to detail, since I have a task of more than sufficient weight in writing the deeds performed by the Roman people. 26. In Spain, the Celtiberians, who, since their reduction by Tiberius Gracchus, and their consequent surrender to him, had remained quiet. When Marcus Titinius, the praetor, held the government of that province, on the arrival of Appius Claudius, resumed their arms, and commenced hostilities by a sudden attack on the Roman camp. It was nearly the first dawn when the sentinels on the rampart, and the men on guard before the gates, descrying the enemy approaching at a distance, shouted to arms. Appius Claudius instantly displayed the signal of battle. And, after exhorting the troops, in few words, ordered them to rush out by three gates at once. But they were opposed by the Celtiberians in the very passage. And in consequence, the fight was for some time equal on both sides, as, on account of the narrowness, the Romans could not all come into action in the entrance. Then pressing forward on one another, whenever it was possible, they made their way beyond the trenches, so that they were able to extend their line, and form a front equal to the wings of the enemy, by which they were surrounded. And now they made their onset with such sudden impetuosity, that the Celtiberians could not support the assault. Before the second hour, they were driven from the field. About fifteen thousand were either killed or made prisoners, and thirty-two standards were taken. Their camp, also, was stormed the same day, and a conclusion put to the war. For those who survived the battle fled by different ways, to their several towns, and thenceforth submitted quietly to the Roman government. 27. Quintus Fulvius Flaccus and Aulus Postumius, being created censors, reviewed the Senate this year. Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, chief pontiff, was chosen chief of the Senate. Nine senators were expelled. The remarkable censures pronounced were on Marcus Cornelius Melogenensis, who had been praetor in Spain two years before. On Lucius Cornelius Scipio, who was then praetor and exercised the jurisdiction between natives and foreigners, and on Gnaeus Fulvius, brother to the censor, and, as Valerius Antius says, partner in property. The consuls, after offering vows in the capital, set out for their provinces. Marcus Aemilius was commissioned by the Senate to suppress an insurrection of the Patavians in Venetia. For their own ambassadors had given information that by the violent contests of opposing factions they had broken out into civil war. The ambassadors who had gone into Aetolia, to suppress commotions of a similar kind, reported on their return, 
that the outrageous temper of that nation could not be restrained. The consul's arrival among the Patavians saved them from ruin. And having no other business in the province, he returned to Rome. The present censors were the first who contracted for paving the streets of Rome with flint stones, for laying with gravel the foundation of roads outside the city, and for forming raised footways on the sides. For building bridges in several places, and affording seats in the theatre to the praetors' neediles, they fixed up goals in the circus, with balls on the goals for marking the number of courses of the chariots. And erected iron grates, through which wild beasts might be let in. They caused the Capitoline Hill to be paved with flint, and erected a piazza from the Temple of Saturn, in the capital, to the council chamber, and over that a public hall. On the outside of the gate Trigemina, they also paved a marketplace with stones, and enclosed it with a paling, they repaired the Emilian portico, and formed an ascent, by stairs, from the Tiber to the marketplace. They paved, with flint, the portico, from the same gate to the Aventine, and built a courthouse, contracted for walls to be built at Galatia and Oximum, and, after selling lots of ground there, which belonged to the public, employed the money arising from the sale in building shops round the forums of both places. Fulvius Flaccus, for Postumius declared, that, without a decree of the Senate, or order of the people, he would not expend any money belonging to them, agreed for building a temple of Jupiter at Pisorum, and another at Fundi. For bringing water to Pollentia, for paving the street of Pisorum, and for many various works at Sinuessa. Among which were, the structure of a sewer to fall into the river, the enclosure of the forum with porticos and shops, and erection of three statues of Janus. These works were all contracted for by one of the censors, and gained him a high degree of favor with those colonists. Their censorship was also very active and strict in the superintendence of the morals of the people. Many knights were deprived of their horses. 28. At the close of the year, there was a thanksgiving, for one day, on account of the advantages obtained in Spain under the conduct and auspices of Appius Claudius, the proconsul. And they sacrificed twenty victims, of the larger kinds. There was also a supplication, for another day, at the temples of Ceres, Liber, and Liberia, because a violent earthquake with the destruction of many houses was announced from the Sabines. When Appius Claudius came home from Spain, the Senate voted that he should enter the city in ovation. The election of consuls now came on, when they were held, after a violent struggle in consequence of the great number of candidates, Lucius Postumius Albinus and Marcus Papilius Leinas were elected consuls. Then Numerius Fabius Budio, Marcus Matinus, Caius Caesareus, Marcus Furius Crassipes, a second time, Marcus Attilius Serenus, a second time, and Caius Clovius Saxula, a second time, were chosen praetors. After the elections were finished, Appius Claudius Sento, entering the city in ovation over the Celtiberians, conveyed to the treasury ten thousand pounds weight of silver, and five thousand of gold. Gnaeus Cornelius was inaugurated flamen of Jupiter. In the same year a tablet was hung up in the temple of Mother Matuta, with this inscription, under the command and auspices of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, consul, a legion and army of the Roman people subdued Sardinia. In which province above eighty thousand of the enemy were killed or taken. Having executed the business of the public with the happiest success. Having recovered the revenues, and restored them to the commonwealth, he brought home the army safe, uninjured, and enriched with spoil, and, a second time, entered the city of Rome in triumph. In commemoration of which event he presented this tablet as an offering to Jupiter. A map of the island of Sardinia was engraved on the tablet, and pictures of the battles fought there were delineated on it. Several small exhibitions of gladiators were given to the public this year. The only one particularly remarkable, was that of Titus Flamininus, which he gave on occasion of his father's death, and it was accompanied with a donation of meat, a feast, and stage plays, and lasted four days. Yet, in the whole of this great exhibition, only seventy-four men fought in three days. The close of this year was rendered memorable by the proposal of a new and important rule, which occupied the state, since it was debated with great emotion. Hitherto, as the law stood, women were as equally capable of receiving inheritances as men. 
from which it happened that the wealth of the most illustrious houses was frequently transferred into other families, to the great detriment, as it was generally supposed, of the state. To which it was no small advantage that there should be a sufficiency of wealth to the descendants of distinguished ancestors, by which they might support and do honor to their nobility of birth. Which otherwise would form a burden rather than honor to them. Besides, since with the now growing power of the empire, the riches of private persons also were increasing, fear was felt, lest the minds of women, being rather inclined by nature to luxury, and the pursuit of a more elegant routine of life, and deriving from unbounded wealth incentives to desire, should fall into immoderate expenses and luxury, and should subsequently chance to depart from the ancient sanctity of manners. So that there would be a change of morals no less than of the manner of living. To obviate these evils, Quintus Boconius Saxa, plebeian tribune, proposed to the people, that no person who should be rated after the censorship of Aulus Postumius and Quintius Fulvius should make any woman, whether married or unmarried his heir. Also, that no woman, whether married or unmarried, should be capable of receiving, by inheritance, goods exceeding the value of 100,000 sesterces. 322 Voconius, also, thought it proper to provide that estates should not be exhausted by the number of legacies, which sometimes happened. Accordingly he added a clause to his law, that no person should bequeath to any person or person's property exceeding in value what was to go to the immediate heirs. This latter clause readily met the general approbation. It appeared reasonable, and calculated to press severely on nobody. Concerning the former clause, by which women were utterly disqualified from receiving inheritances, there were many doubts. Marcus Cato put an end to all hesitation, having been already, on a former occasion, a most determined adversary and reprover of women, in the defense of the Oppian law, who, although sixty-five years of age, with loud voice and good lungs advocated this law of still greater importance, against them, in vain, with his usual asperity, against the tyranny of women, and their unsufferable insolence token opulent, on the present occasion, too. He declaimed against the pride and arrogance of the rich matrons, because they oftentimes, after bringing a great dowry to their husband, kept back and retained for themselves the great sum of money, and lent that money on such terms afterwards to their husbands, on their asking it, that as often as they were angry they immediately pressed importunately on their husbands, as if they were strange debtors by a reserved slave who followed them in daily importuned payment. Moved by indignation at this, they voted for passing the law as Voconius proposed it. Book XLI. Quintus Fulvius Flaccus, the censor, spoiled the temple of Juno at Licinium of the marble tiles, to roof a temple which he was dedicating. The tiles were returned by a decree of the Senate. Eumenes, the king of Asia, complained before the Senate of Perseus, the king of Macedon, the outrages of the latter are laid before the Roman people. And when a war was proclaimed against him on account of these, Publius Licinius Crassus, the consul to whom it was entrusted, passed over into Macedon, and in trifling expeditions and cavalry actions, fought with Perseus in Thessaly. By no means successfully. An arbiter was appointed by the Senate to decide concerning land disputed between Massinissa and the Carthaginians. Ambassadors were sent to request of the allied states and kings, that they would abide by their agreements, as the Rhodians wavered. The lustrum was closed by the censors. 257,231 citizens were raided. It includes besides, the successes gained over the Corsicans and Ligurians. 1. When Lucius Postumius Albinus and Marcus Papilius Leinas brought before the Senate first of all the distribution of the provinces, Liguria was assigned the joint province of both, with directions that they should enlist new legions. By which they would hold that province, two were decreed to each. And also ten thousand foot and six hundred horse of the Latin confederates, and as a supplement to the army in Spain, three thousand Roman foot and two hundred horse. 1,500 Roman foot and 100 horse were ordered to be raised, with which the praetor, to whose lot Sardinia might fall, should cross over to Corsica, and carry on the war there. And it was further ordered, that in the meantime the former praetor, Marcus Attilius, should obtain the province of Sardinia. The praetors then cast lots for their provinces. 
Aulus Attilius Serenus obtained the city jurisdiction. Caius Clovius Saxula, that between natives and foreigners, Numerius Fabius Budio, hither Spain, Marcus Matinus, farther Spain, Marcus Furius Crassipes, Sicily, and Caius Caesarius, Sardinia. The Senate resolved that, before the magistrates went abroad, Lucius Postumius should go into Campania, to fix the bounds between the lands which were private property and those which belonged to the public. For it was understood that individuals, by gradually extending their bounds, had taken possession of a very considerable share of the common lands. He, being enraged with the people of Prinest because, when he had gone thither as private individual to offer sacrifice in the Temple of Fortune, no honor had been paid him either in public or private, by the people of Prinest. Before he set out from Rome, sent a letter to Prinest, ordering the chief magistrate to meet him, and to provide him lodging at the public expense. And that, at his departure, cattle should be ready to carry his baggage. No consul before him ever put the allies to any trouble or expense whatever. Magistrates were furnished with mules, tents, and every other requisite for a campaign, in order that they might not make any such demands. They had private lodgings, in which they behaved with courtesy and kindness, and their houses at Rome were always open to their hosts with whom they used to lodge. Ambassadors indeed sent to any place, on a sudden emergency, demanded each a single horse in the several towns through which their journey lay, but the allies never contributed any other portion of the expense of the Roman magistrates. The resentment of the consul, which, even if well founded, ought not to have been exerted during his office, and the too modest or too timid acquiescence of the Prenestans, gave to the magistrates, as if by an approved precedent. The privilege of imposing orders of this sort, which grew more burdensome daily. 2. In the beginning of this year the ambassadors, who had been sent to Aetolia and Macedon, returned, and reported that, they had not been able to obtain an interview with Perseus, as some of his court said that he was abroad. Others that he was sick. Both of which were false pretenses. Nevertheless, that it was quite evident that war was in preparation, and that he would no longer put off the appeal to arms. That in Aetolia, likewise, the dissensions grew daily more violent. And the leaders of the contending parties were not to be restrained by their authority. As a war with Macedon was daily expected, the Senate resolved, that before it broke out all prodigies should be expiated, and the favor of such gods, as should be found expressed in the books of the fates, invoked by supplications. It was said that at Lanuvium the appearance of large fleets was seen in the air, that at Provernum black wool grew out of the ground, that in the territory of Vi, at Remens, a shower of stones fell. And that the whole Pontine district was covered with clouds of locusts, also that in the Gallic province, where a plough was at work, fishes sprung up from under the earth as it was turned. On account of these prodigies the books of the fates were accordingly consulted, and the Decembers directed both to what gods and with what victims, sacrifices should be offered. Likewise that a supplication should be performed, in expiation of the prodigies, and also that another, which had been vowed in the preceding year for the health of the people, should be celebrated, and likewise a solemn festival. Accordingly, sacrifices were offered in accordance with the written directions of the Decembers. 3. In the same year, the temple of Juno Lacinia was uncovered. Quintus Fulvius Flaccus, the censor, was erecting a temple to equestrian fortune, which he had vowed when praetor during the Celtiberian War, with anxious desire that it should not be surpassed by any other at Rome, either in size or magnificence. Thinking that he would add a very great ornament to this temple if the tiles were marble, he went to Brutium, and stripped, off about the half of those belonging to the temple of the Licinian Juno. For he computed that so many would be sufficient to cover the one he was building. Ships were in readiness to take on board the materials, while the allies were deterred by the authority of the censor from preventing the sacrilege. When the censor returned, the marble was landed and carried to the temple, but though he made no mention of the place from which it was brought, yet such an affair could not be concealed. Accordingly, considerable murmuring arose in the Senate. From all sides of the house a demand was made that the consuls should lay that matter before the Senate. When the censor, on being summoned, appeared in the Senate house, they all, both separately and in a body, inveighed against him with great asperity. 
they cried out that, he was not content with violating the most venerable temple in all that part of the world, a temple which neither Pyrrhus nor Hannibal had violated, but he had stripped it shamefully, and almost demolished it. Though created censor for the purpose of regulating men's manners, and bound in duty, according to long-established rules, to enforce the repairing of edifices for public worship, and the keeping them in due order. He had nevertheless gone about through the cities of the Allies, stripping the roofs of their sacred buildings, and even demolishing them. In a word, what might be deemed scandalous if practiced on private houses, he committed against the temples of the immortal gods, and that he involved the Roman people in the guilt of impiety, building temples with the ruins of temples. As if the deities were not the same in all places, but that some should be decorated with the spoils of others. When it was evident what were the sentiments of the senators, before their opinion was asked. When the question was put, they unanimously concurred in voting, that a contract should be entered into for carrying the tiles back to the temple, and that atonements should be offered to Juno. What regarded the atonements was carefully executed. The contractors made a report that they were obliged to leave the marble in the court of the temple, because no workman could be found who knew how to replace the same. 4. Of the praetors who set out for the provinces, Numerius Fabius, on his way to hither Spain, died at Marseilles. Therefore when this was announced by envoys from Marseilles, the Senate resolved that Publius Furius and Gnaeus Servilius, to whom successors had been sent, should cast lots to determine which of them should hold the government of hither Spain. With a continuation of authority. And the lot determined, very fortunately, that Publius Furius, whose province it had formerly been, should continue. During the same year, on its appearing that large tracts of land in Gaul and Liguria, which had been taken in war, lay unoccupied, the Senate passed a decree, that those lands should be distributed in single shares. And Aulus Titilius, city praetor, in pursuance of the said decree, appointed ten commissioners for that purpose, namely, Marcus Emilius Lepidus, Caius Cassius, Titus Abucius Carus, Caius Tremelius, Publius Cornelius Cephagus, Quintus and Lucius Apulius, Marcus Cicilius, Caius Salonius, and Caius Munatius. They apportioned ten acres to each Roman, and three to each Latin colonist. During the same time in which these transactions took place, ambassadors came to Rome from Aetolia with representations of the quarrels and dissensions subsisting in that country. Likewise the Salian ambassadors, announcing the transactions in Macedon. 5. Perseus, revolving in his mind the war, which had been resolved on during the lifetime of his father, endeavoured, by sending embassies, and by promising a great deal more than he performed. To attach to himself not only the commonwealth of Greece, but also each particular state. However the feelings of the majority were inclined in his favour, and much better disposed towards him than Eumenes, although all the states of Greece, and most of the leading men, were under obligations to the latter for benefits and gifts. And although he so conducted himself in his sovereignty, that the cities which were under his dominion would not exchange their condition for that of any free state. On the contrary, there was a general report that Perseus, after his father's death, had killed his wife with his own hand. That Apelles, formerly the agent of his treachery in the destruction of his brother, and on that account sought anxiously by Philip, for punishment, being in exile, was invited by him, after the death of his father, by great promises. To receive a guerdon for rendering so important services, and was secretly put to death. Although he had rendered himself infamous by many other murders, both of his own relations and of others, and possessed not one good quality to recommend him. Yet the Grecian states in general gave him the preference to Eumenes who was so affectionate towards his relations, so just toward his subjects, and so liberal towards all mankind. Either because they were so prejudiced by the fame and dignity of the Macedonian kings, as to despise a kingdom lately formed, or were led by a wish for a change in affairs, and wished him to be exposed to the arms of the Romans. The Aetolians were not the only people in a state of distraction, on account of the intolerable burden of their debts, the Thessalians were in the same situation, and the evil, acting by contagion like a pestilence, had spread into Perhebia also. As soon as it was known that the Thessalians were in arms, the Senate sent Appius Claudius, as ambassador, to examine and adjust their affairs. 
he severely reprimanded the leaders of both parties. And after cancelling so much of the debts as had been accumulated by iniquitous usury, which he did with the consent of the greater part of the creditors themselves, he ordered the remaining just debts to be discharged by annual payments. Affairs in Perhebia were arranged in the same manner by the same Appius. In the meantime, Marcellus, at Delphi, gave a hearing to the disputes of the Aetolians, which they maintained with no less hostile acrimony than they had shown against each other in the heat of their civil war. Perceiving that they vied with each other in inconsiderate violence, he did not choose to make any determination, to lighten or aggravate the grievances of either party, but required of both alike to cease from hostilities, and forgetting what was past, to put an end to their quarrels. The good faith of the mutual reconciliation was confirmed by a reciprocal exchange of hostages. 6. Corinth was agreed upon as the place where the hostages should be lodged. Marcellus crossed over from Delphi, and the Aetolian council, into Peloponnesus, where Lai had summoned a diet of the Achaeans. There, by the praises which he bestowed on that nation, for having resolutely maintained their old decree, which prohibited the admission of the Macedonian kings within the limits of their territories. He manifested the inveterate hatred of the Romans towards Perseus. And this hatred broke out into effect the sooner, in consequence of King Eumenes coming to Rome, and bringing with him a written statement of the preparations made for war, which he had drawn up, after a full inquiry into every particular. Five ambassadors were now sent to the king, in order to take a view of affairs in Macedon. The same were ordered to proceed to Alexandria to Ptolemy, to renew the treaty of friendship. These were Caius Valerius, Gnaeus Latatius Circo, Quintus Bibius Sulca, Marcus Cornelius Mamula, and Marcus Cicilius Denter. About the same time, came ambassadors from King Antiochus. And the principal of them, called Apollonius, being admitted to an audience of the Senate, presented, on behalf of his king, many and reasonable apologies for paying the tribute later than the day appointed. He now brought, he said, the whole of it, that the king might require no favor except the delay of time. He brought besides a present of gold vases, in weight five hundred pounds. Antiochus requested, that the treaty of alliance and amity, which had been made with his father, might be renewed with him. And that the Roman people might demand from him every service which might be required from a king who was a good and faithful ally, that he would never be remiss in the performance of any duty. Such had been the kindness of the Senate towards him when he was at Rome, such the courtesy of the young men, that, among all ranks of men, he was treated as a sovereign, not as a hostage. A gracious answer was returned to the ambassadors, and Aulus Attilius, city praetor, was ordered to renew with Antiochus the alliance formerly made with his father. The city questors received the tribute, and the censors the golden vases. And the business of placing them in whatever temples they should judge proper, was assigned to them. One hundred thousand asses 323 were presented to the ambassador, and a house at the public cost was given him for his accommodation, and it was ordered that his expenses should be paid as long as he would remain in Italy. The ambassadors, who had been in Syria, represented him as standing in the highest degree of favor with the king, and a very warm friend to the Roman people. 7. The following were the events in the provinces during this year. Caius Caesareus, praetor in Corsica, fought the enemy in a pitched battle, in which seven thousand of the Corsicans were slain, and more than one thousand seven hundred taken. During the engagement the praetor vowed a temple to Juno Moneta. Peace was then granted to the Corsicans, on their petitioning for it, and a contribution was imposed, of two hundred thousand pounds weight of wax. Caesareus crossed over from Corsica, which he had reduced to subjection, to Sardinia. In Liguria, also, a battle was fought in the territory of Sadiella, at the town of Caristas. A large army of Ligurians had assembled there, who, for some time after Marcus Papilius' arrival, kept themselves within the walls. But afterwards, when they perceived that the Roman general would lay siege to the town, they marched out beyond the gates, and drew up in order of battle. The consul did not decline an engagement, as that was the object which he endeavored to gain by threatening a siege. The fight was maintained for more than three hours, in such a manner, that the hope of victory leaned to neither side. 
but when the consul perceived that the Ligurian battalions nowhere gave ground, he ordered the cavalry to mount their horses, and charge in three places at once, with all possible violence. A great part of the horse broke through the middle of the enemy's line, and made their way to the rear of the troops engaged, owing to which maneuver, terror was struck into the Ligurians. They fled in different directions on all sides. Very few ran back into the town, because in that quarter, chiefly, the cavalry had thrown themselves in their way. So obstinate a contest swept off great numbers of the Ligurians, and many perished in the flight. Ten thousand of them are said to have been killed, and more, than seven hundred taken, in various places, besides which, the victors brought off eighty-two of their military standards. Nor was the victory gained without loss of blood. Above three thousand of the conquerors fell in the conflict, for as neither party gave way, the foremost on both sides were cut off. 8. When the Ligurians reassembled in one body, after their scattered flight, they found that a much greater number of their countrymen were lost than left alive, for there were not above ten thousand men surviving, on which they surrendered. They did not stipulate for any terms, yet entertained hopes that the consul would not treat them with greater severity than former commanders. But he immediately took their arms from them, raised their town, and sold themselves and their effects. And he then sent a letter to the Senate, relating the services which he had performed. When Aulus Attilius, the praetor, read this letter in the council, for the other consul, Postumius, was absent, being employed in surveying the lands in Campania, the proceeding appeared to the Senate in a heinous light. That the people of Satiella, who alone, of all the Ligurian nation, had not borne arms against the Romans, should be attacked, when not offering hostilities. And even after surrendering themselves in dependence on the protection of the Roman people, should be butchered and exterminated, that so many thousands of innocent persons suffering, who had implored the protection of the Roman people, established the worst possible precedent, calculated to deter any one from ever venturing to surrender to them. Dragged as they were away into various parts of the country, and made slaves to those who were formerly the avowed enemies of Rome, though now reduced to quiet. That for these reasons the Senate ordered, that the consul, Marcus Papilius, should reinstate the Ligurians in their liberty, repaying the purchase money to the buyers. And should likewise use his best endeavors to recover and restore their effects. That arms should be made for them, as soon as possible, and that the consul should not depart from his province before he restored to their country the Ligurians that had surrendered. That victory derived its luster from conquering the enemy in arms, not from cruelty to the vanquished. 9. The consul exerted the same ferocious spirit in disobeying the Senate, which he displayed towards the Ligurians. He immediately sent the legions into winter quarters at Pisi, and, full of resentment against the senators and the praetor, went home to Rome. Where, instantly assembling the senate in the temple of Bologna, he used many invectives against the praetor, who, when he ought to have proposed to the senate that thanksgiving should be offered to the immortal gods. On account of the happy successes obtained by the Roman arms, had procured a decree of the senate against him, in favor of the enemy, by which he might transfer his victory to the Ligurians. And, though only a praetor, he had ordered the consul, in a manner, to be surrendered to them, he therefore gave notice, that he would sue to have him fined. From the senate he demanded, that they should order the decree of the senate passed against him to be cancelled. And that the thanksgiving, which they, though they were far from him, ought to have voted on the authority of his letter, sent from abroad, with an account of the success of the arms of the commonwealth, should, now when he was present, be voted. First, in consideration of the honor due to the immortal gods, and next, out of some kind of regard to himself. Being censured to his face no less severely than in his absence, in the speeches of several of the senators, and having obtained neither request, he returned to his province. The other consul, Postumius, after spending the whole summer in surveying the lands, without even seeing his province, came home to Rome to hold the elections. He appointed Caius Papilius Lienas and Publius Elius Ligus, consuls. Then Caius Licinius Crassus, Marcus Junius Pennus, Spurius Lucretius, Spurius Cluvius, Gnaeus Sicinius, and Caius Memmius, a second time, were elected praetors. 10. 
The lustrum was closed this year. The censors were Quintus Fulvius Flaccus and Lucius Postumius Albinus, the latter of whom performed the ceremony. In this survey were rated 269,015 Roman citizens. The number was considerably less, because the consul Lucius Postumius, gave public orders, in assembly, that none of the Latin allies, who, according to the edict of the consul, Caius Claudius, ought to have gone home, should be surveyed at Rome. But all of them in their respective countries. Their censorship was conducted with perfect harmony and zeal for the public good. They disfranchised and degraded from their tribes every one whom they expelled the Senate, or from whom they took away his horse. Nor did either approve a person censured by the other. Fulvius, at this time, dedicated the Temple of Equestrian Fortune, which he had vowed six years before, and when proconsul in Spain, during the battle with the Celtiberians. He also exhibited stage plays, which lasted four days, in one of which the performance was in the circus. Lucius Cornelius Lentulus, December in religious matters, died this year, and Aulus Postumius Albinus was substituted in his room. Such great crowds of locusts were suddenly brought by the wind over the sea into Apulia, that they covered the country far and wide with their swarms. In order to remove this pest, so destructive to the fruits of the earth, Caius Sicinius, praetor-elect, was sent in command, with a vast multitude of people assembled, to gather them up, and spent a considerable time in that business. The beginning of the year in which Caius Papilius and Publius Elius were consuls, was employed in the disputes which had arisen in the last. The senators were desirous that the business respecting the Ligurians should be reconsidered, and the decree renewed. Elias, the consul, was willing to propose it, but Papilius warmly interceded for his brother, both with his colleague and the senate. And by giving notice, that if they would pass any vote on the subject he would would enter his protest, he deterred him from proceeding in the matter. The senate being hereby equally incensed against them, persisted the more obstinately in their intention. And when they took into consideration the distribution of the provinces, although Macedon was earnestly sought by the consuls, because a war with Perseus was daily expected, yet the Ligurians were assigned as the province of both. They declare that they would not vote Macedonia to them, unless the question were put on the affair of Marcus Papilius. The consuls afterwards demanded that they might be authorized to raise either new armies, or recruits to fill up the old. Both demands were refused. To the praetors also, when seeking a reinforcement for Spain, a refusal is given, to Marcus Junius for hither Spain, and to Spurius Lucretius for the farther. Caius Licinius Crassus obtained by lot the city jurisdiction. Gnaeus Sicinius, the foreign, Caius Memmius, Sicily, and Spurius Cluvius, Sardinia. The consuls, enraged against the Senate on account of this conduct, having proclaimed an early day for the Latin festival, declared openly that they would go away to their province, and would not transact any kind of business. Except what belonged to their own government. 11. Valerius Antius writes, that, in this consulate, Atlas, brother to King Eumenes, came to Rome as ambassador, to lay heavy charges against Perseus, and give an account of his preparations for war. But the greater number of historians, and those deemed most worthy of credit, assert, that Eumenes came in person. Eumenes then, on his arrival, being received with every degree of respect which the Roman people judged suitable, not merely to his deserts, but also to their own former favours, bestowed on him in great abundance, was introduced to the Senate. He said, that, the cause of his coming to Rome, besides his wish to visit those gods and men who had placed him in a situation beyond which he could not presume to form a wish, was that he might in person forewarn the Senate to counteract the designs of Perseus. Then, beginning with the projects of Philip, he mentioned his murder of Demetrius, because that prince was averse to a war with Rome. That the Bastarnian nation was summoned from their homes, that, relying on their aid, he might pass over into Italy. While his thoughts were busied in plans of this sort, he was surprised by the approach of death, and left his kingdom to the person whom he knew to be, of all men, the bitterest foe to the Romans. Perseus therefore, said he, having received this scheme of a war, 
as a legacy bequeathed by his father, and descending to him along with the crown, advances and improves it, as his primary object, by every means that he can devise. He is powerful, in respect of the number of his young men, since a long peace has produced a plentiful progeny, he is powerful in respect to the resources of his kingdom, and powerful, likewise, in respect to his age. And as, at his time of life, he possesses vigor of body, so his mind has been thoroughly trained, both in the theory and practice of war. For even from his childhood he became inured to it, in his father's tent, not only in the wars against the neighboring states, but also against the Romans, being employed by him in many and various expeditions. Already, since he has received the government, he has, by a wonderful train of prosperous events, accomplished many things which Philip, after using his best efforts, could never effect, either by force or artifice. 12. There is added to his strength such a degree of influence as is usually acquired, in a great length of time, by many and important kindnesses. 4. In the several states throughout Greece and Asia, all men revere the dignity of his character. Nor do I perceive for what deserts, for what generosity, such uncommon respect is paid him. Neither can I with certainty say whether it occurs through some good fortune attending him, or whether, what I mention with reluctance a general dislike to the Romans attaches men to his interest. Even among sovereign princes he is great by his influence. He married the daughter of Seleucus, a match which he did not solicit, but to which he was solicited by her friends. And he gave his sister in marriage to Prusias, in compliance with his earnest prayers and entreaties. Both these marriages were solemnized amidst congratulations and presents from innumerable embassies, and were escorted by the most renowned nations, acting as bridal attendants. The Boeotians could never be brought, by all the intrigues of Philip, to sign a treaty of friendship with him. But now, a treaty with Perseus is engraved at three different places, at Thebes, in Delos, in the most venerable and celebrated temple, and at Delphi. Then, in the Diet of Achaia, only that the proceeding was quashed by a few persons, threatening them with the displeasure of the Roman government, the business was nearly effected of allowing him admission into Achaia. But, as to the honours formerly paid to myself, whose kindness to that nation have been such, that it is hard to say whether my public or private benefactions were the greater, they have been lost, partly through neglect. And partly by hostile means who does not know that the Aetolians, lately, on occasion of their intestine broils, sought protection, not from the Romans, but from Perseus? For, while he is upheld by these alliances and friendships, he has at home such preparations of every requisite for war, that he wants nothing from abroad. He has thirty thousand foot and five thousand horse, and is laying up a store of corn for ten years, so that he can be independent of his own territory or that of his enemies with respect to provisions. He has amassed money to such an amount, as to have in readiness the pay of ten thousand mercenary soldiers, besides the Macedonian troops, for the same number of years, as well as the annual revenue accruing from the royal mines. He has stored up arms for three times that number of men, and has thrace under subjection, from which, as a never-failing spring, he can draw supplies of young men if ever Macedon should become exhausted. 13. The rest of his discourse contained exhortations to timely exertions, conscript fathers, said he, I make these representations to you, and they are not founded on uncertain rumours, and too readily believed by me. Because I wished such charges against my enemy to be true. But on a clear discovery of the facts, as if I had been sent by you to reconnoitre, and I were now relating what took place before my eyes. Nor would I have left my kingdom, which you have rendered ample and highly respectable, and crossed such a tract of sea, to injure my own credit by offering you unauthenticated reports. I saw the most remarkable states of Asia and Greece, every day, gradually unfolding their sentiments, and ready to proceed, shortly, to such lengths as would not leave them room for repentance. I saw Perseus, not confining himself within the limits of Macedonia, but seizing some places by force of arms, and seducing, by favour and kindness, those which could not be subdued by force. I perceived the unfair footing on which matters stood, while he was preparing war against you, and you bestowing on him the security of peace, although, to my judgment, he did not appear to be preparing, but rather waging war. 
he dethroned Abropolis, your ally and friend. He put to death Artaterus, the Illyrian, another ally and friend of yours, because he heard that some information had been written to you by him. He managed that Aversa and Calicrates, the Thebans, who were leading men in their state, should be taken off, because, in the council of the Boeotians, they had spoken with more than ordinary freedom against him and declared that they would inform you of what was going on. He carried succor to the Byzantians, contrary to the treaty. He made war on Dolopia. He overran Thessaly and Doris with an army, in order to take advantage of the civil war then raging, and by the help of the party which had the worst cause to crush the other which had more justice on its side. He raised universal confusion and disorder in Thessaly and Perhebia, by holding out a prospect of an abolition of debts, that, by the means of the multitude of debtors thereby attached to his interest, he might overpower the nobles. Since he has performed all these acts with your acquiescence and silent endurance, and has seen Greece yielded up to him by you, he firmly believes that he will not meet with one opponent in arms, until he arrives in Italy. How safe or how honourable this might be for you, you yourselves may consider. For my part, I thought it would certainly reflect dishonour on me, if Perseus should come into Italy to make war, before I, your ally, came to warn you to be on your guard. Having discharged this duty, necessarily incumbent on me, and, in some measure, freed and exonerated my faith. What can I do further, but beseech the gods and goddesses that you may adopt such measures as will prove salutary to yourselves, to your commonwealth, and to us your allies and friends who depend upon you. 14. His discourse made a deep impression on the Senate. However, for the present, no one, without doors, could know anything more than that the king had been in the Senate House, in such secrecy were the deliberations of the Senate involved. And it was not until after the conclusion of the war, that the purport of King Eumenes' speech, and the answer to it, transpired. In a few days after, the Senate gave audience to the ambassadors of Perseus. But their feelings as well as their ears were so prepossessed by King Eumenes, that every plea offered in his justification by the ambassadors, and every argument to alleviate the charges against him, were disregarded. They were still further exasperated by the immoderate presumption of Harpalus, chief of the embassy, who said that the king was indeed desirous and even anxious that credit should be given to him when pleading in his excuse that he had neither said nor done anything hostile but that if he saw them obstinately bent on finding out a pretense for war, he would defend himself with determined courage. The fortune of war was open to all and the issue uncertain. All the states of Greece and Asia were full of curiosity to learn what the ambassadors of Perseus, and what Eumenes, had effected with the Senate. And most of them, on hearing of the latter's journey to Rome, which they supposed might produce material consequences, had sent ambassadors thither who pretended other business. Among the rest came an embassy from Rhodes, at the head of which was a person named Satyrus, who had no kind of doubt but that Eumenes had included his state in the accusations brought against Perseus. He therefore endeavoured, by every means, through his patrons and friends, to get an opportunity of debating the matter with Eumenes in presence of the Senate. When he obtained this, he inveighed against that king with intemperate vehemence, as having instigated the people of Lycia to an attack on the Rhodians, and as being more oppressive to Asia than Antiochus had been. He delivered a discourse flattering indeed, and acceptable to the states of Asia, for the popularity of Perseus had spread even to them, but very displeasing to the Senate, and disadvantageous to himself and his nation. This apparent conspiracy against Eumenes, increased, indeed, the favour of the Romans towards him, so that every kind of honour was paid, and the most magnificent presents were made him, among which were a curule chair and an ivory scepter. 15. After the embassies were dismissed, when Harpalus went back into Macedon with all the haste he could, and told the king that he had left the Romans, not indeed making immediate preparations for war, but in such an angry temper, that it was very evident they would not defer it long. Perseus himself, who all along believed that this would be the case, now even wished for it, as he thought himself at the highest pitch of power that he could ever expect to attain. He was more violently incensed against Eumenes than against any other. And being desirous of commencing the war with his bloodshed, he suborned Evander, a Cretan, commander of the auxiliaries, 
and three Macedonians, who were accustomed to the perpetration of such deeds, to murder that king. And gives them a letter to a woman called Praxo, an acquaintance of his, the wealthiest and most powerful person at Delphi. It was generally known that Eumenes intended going up to Delphi to sacrifice to Apollo. The assassins having reconnoitred the around with Evander, sought for nothing else than a fit place to execute their design. On the road from Syrah to the temple, before you come to the places thickly inhabited, there was a wall on the left side of a narrow path projecting a little from the foundation, by which single persons could pass. The part on the right formed a precipice of considerable depth by the sinking of the ground. Behind this wall they concealed themselves, and raised up steps to it, that from thence, as from a fortress, they might discharge their weapons on the king, as he passed by. At first, as he came up from the sea, he was surrounded by a multitude of his friends and attendants, afterwards the increasing narrowness of the road made the train thinner about him. When they arrived at the spot where each was to pass singly, the first who advanced on the path was Pantaleon, an Aetolian of distinction, who was at the time in conversation with the king. The assassins now, starting up, rolled down two huge stones, by one of which the head of the king was struck, and by the other the shoulder. And being stunned by the blow, many stones having been cast on him after falling, he tumbled from the sloping path down the precipice. The rest of his friends and attendants, on seeing him fall, fled different ways. But Pantaleon, with great intrepidity and resolution, kept his ground, in order to protect the king. 16. The assassins might, by making a short circuit of the wall, have run down and completed their business. Yet they fled off towards the top of Parnassus with such precipitation, that as one of them, by being unable to keep up with the rest through the pathless and steep grounds, retarded their flight, they killed him lest he should be taken. And a discovery ensue. The friends, and then the guards and servants of the king, ran together and raised him up, while stunned by the wound, and quite insensible. However, they perceived, from the warmth of his body, and the breath remaining in his lungs, that he was still alive, but had little or no hopes that he would ever recover. Some of his guards having pursued the tracks of the assassins, when they had reached even as far as the summit of Parnassus, and had fatigued themselves in vain, returned without being able to overtake them. As the Macedonians said about the deed injudiciously so, after making the attempt with boldness, they abandoned it in a manner both foolish and cowardly. His friends on the next day bore to his ship the king, now in possession of his faculties, and then, having drawn their vessel, across the neck of the isthmus, they cross over to Aegina. Here his cure was conducted with such secrecy, his attendants admitting no one, that a report of his death was carried into Asia. Attalus also gave more ready credence to it than was worthy the harmony of brothers. For he talked, both to Eumenes' consort, and to the governor of the citadel, as if he had actually succeeded to the crown. This, afterwards, came to the knowledge of the king. Who, though he had determined to dissemble, and to pass it over in silence, yet could not refrain, at their first meeting, from rallying Attalus, on his premature haste to get his wife. The report of Eumenes' death spread even to Rome. 17. About the same time, Caius Valerius, who had been sent ambassador to examine the state of Greece, and to observe the movements of King Perseus, returned from that country, and made a report of all things. Which agreed with the accusations urged by Eumenes. He brought with him from Delphi, Praxo, the woman whose house had served as a receptacle for the assassins, and Lucius Ramius, a Brundusian, who was the bearer of the following information. Ramius was a person of the first distinction at Brundusium, accustomed to entertain in his house the Roman commanders, and such ambassadors as came that way from foreign powers, especially those of the kings. By these means he had formed an acquaintance with Perseus, although he was distant from him. And in consequence of a letter from him, which gave hopes of a more intimate friendship, and of great advantages to accrue to him, he went on a visit to the king, and, in a short time, found himself treated with particular familiarity, and drawn, oftener than he wished, into private conversations. Perseus, after promises of the highest rewards, pressed him, with the most earnest solicitations, as all the commanders and ambassadors of the Romans used to lodge at his house. 
to procure poison to be given to such of them as he should point out by letter. And told him, that, as he knew the preparation of poison to be attended with the greatest difficulty and danger, and that ordinarily it could not be administered without the privity of several. Besides, the issue was uncertain, whether doses sufficiently powerful to produce the desired effect were calculated to escape detection, might be given. He would, therefore, give him some which neither in administering nor when administered could be discovered by any means. Ramius dreading, lest, in case of refusal, he should himself be the first on whom the poison would be tried, promised compliance, and departed. But did not wish to return to Brundusium, without first holding a conference with Caius Valerius, the ambassador, who was said to be at that time in the neighborhood of Chalcis. Having first laid his information before him, by his order he accompanied him to Rome, where, being brought before the Senate, he gave them an account of what had passed. 18. These discoveries were added to the information which had been given by Eumenes, and effected, that Perseus should the sooner be judged an enemy. As the Senate perceived that he did not content himself with preparing, with the spirit of a king, for a fair and open war, but pushed his designs by all the base clandestine means of assassination and poison. The conduct of the war is conferred on the new consuls. But, in the meantime, an order was given, that Gnaeus Sicinius, the praetor, whose province was the jurisdiction between natives and foreigners, should raise soldiers who should be led with all expedition to Brundusium. And thence carried over into Apollonia in Epirus, in order to secure the cities on the sea coasts. In order that the consul, who should have Macedon as his province, might put in his fleet with safety, and land his troops with convenience. Eumenes was detained a long time at Egina, by a dangerous and difficult cure. But, as soon as could remove with safety, he went home to Pergamus, and set on foot the most vigorous preparations for war, since the late atrocious villainy of Perseus now stimulated him. In addition to the ancient enmity which subsisted between them, ambassadors soon came from Rome, with congratulations on his escape from so great a danger. When the war with Macedon was deferred to the next year, the other praetors having gone away to their provinces, Marcus Junius and Spurius Lucretius, to whom the Spanish affairs had fallen. By importuning the Senate with frequent repetitions of the same request obtained at last that a reinforcement for their army should be given them, viz. 3,000 foot and 150 horse, for the Roman legions, they are ordered to levy, from the allies, for the confederate troops, 5,000 foot and 300 horse, these forces were carried by the new praetors into Spain. 19. In the same year, because, in consequence of the inquiries made by the consul Postumius, a large portion of the lands of Campania, which had been usurped by private persons indiscriminately, in various parts, had been recovered to the public. Marcus Lucretius, plebeian tribune, published a proposal for an order of the people, that the censors should let the Campanian land to farm. A measure which had been omitted during so many years, since the taking of Capua, that the greediness of individuals might have clear room to work in. After war, though not yet proclaimed, had been resolved on, while the Senate was anxious to know which of the several kings would espouse their cause, and which that of Perseus, ambassadors came to Rome from Ariarathes. Bringing with them his younger son. The purport of their message was, that, the king had sent his son to be educated at Rome, in order that he might even from childhood be acquainted with the manners and the persons of the Romans. And he requested, that they would allow him to be not only under the protection of his particular friends, but likewise the care, and in some measure the guardianship, of the public. This embassy was highly pleasing to the Senate. And they ordered, that Gnaeus Sicinius, the praetor, should hire a furnished house for the accommodation of the young prince and his attendants. Then that which they sought was given to ambassadors of the Thracians, who were disputing among themselves, and requesting the friendship and alliance of the Roman people, and presents of the amount of two thousand asses 324 were sent to each. For the Romans were rejoiced that these states were gained as allies the more so, as they lay at the back of Macedon. But, in order to acquire a clear knowledge of everything in Asia and in the islands, they sent ambassadors, Tiberius Claudius Nero and Marcus Decimus, with orders to go to Crete and Rhodes, to renew the treaties of friendship. 
and at the same time to observe whether the affections of the allies had been tampered with by Perseus. 20. While the minds of the public were in a state of extreme anxiety and suspense with respect to the impending war, in consequence of a storm happening in the night the pillar in the capital, ornamented with beaks of ships, which had been erected in the First Punic War by the consul Marcus Emilius, whose colleague was Servius Fulvius, was shattered to pieces, even to the very foundation, by lightning. This event, being deemed a prodigy, was reported to the Senate, who ordered, that it should be laid before the Aruspices, and that the Decembers should consult the books. The Decembers, in answer, directed that the city should be purified. That a supplication, and prayers, for the averting of misfortunes should be offered, and victims of the larger kinds sacrificed both in the capital at Rome, and at the promontory of Minerva in Campania. And that games should be celebrated as soon as possible in honor of Jupiter supremely good and great, during ten days. All these directions were carefully executed. The Aruspices answered, that the prodigy would prove happy in the issue. That it portended extension of territory and destruction of enemies, for those beaks of ships which the storm had scattered were spoils. There were other occurrences which occasioned religious apprehensions, it was said, that at the town of Satinia showers of blood fell during three successive days, that an ass with three feet was foaled at Calatia. That a bull, with five cows, were killed by one stroke of lightning, and that a shower of earth had fallen at Oximum. On account of these prodigies, also, public worship was performed, and a supplication and festival observed for one day. 21. The consuls had not yet gone to their provinces, for they would not comply with the Senate, in proposing the business respecting Marcus Papilius, and, on the other hand, the Senate was determined to proceed on no other until that was done. The general resentment against Papilius was aggravated by a letter received from him, in which he mentioned that he had, as proconsul, fought a second battle with the Ligurians of Stadiella, six thousand of whom he had killed. On account of the injustice of this attack, the rest of the states of the Ligurians took up arms. Then not only was Papilius, in his absence, severely censured in the Senate, for having, contrary to all laws, human and divine, made war on a people who had submitted to terms, and stirred up to rebellion states that were disposed to live in peace. But also the consuls for not having proceeded to that province. Encouraged by the unanimous opinion of the senators, two plebeian tribunes, Marcus Martius Sermo and Quintus Martius Silla, declared publicly that they would institute a suit for a fine to be laid on the consuls. If they did not repair to their destination. They likewise read before the Senate a proposal for an order of the people respecting the Ligurians, which they intended to publish. By it a regulation was made, that in case any of the surrendered state Yellens should not be restored to liberty before the Calends of August, then next ensuing, the Senate, on oath, should appoint a magistrate to inquire into the business. And to punish the person through whose wicked practices he had been brought into slavery. And accordingly, by direction of the Senate, they proclaimed the same in public. Before the departure of the consuls, the Senate gave audience, in the Temple of Bologna, to Caius Caesareus, praetor of the former year. After recounting what he had performed in Corsica, he demanded a triumph, but this being refused, he rode in state on the Alban Mount, a mode of celebration for victory without public authority, which had now become usual. The people, with universal approbation, passed and ratified the order proposed by Martius, respecting the Ligurians. And in pursuance of this resolution of the people, Caius Licinius, praetor, desired the Senate to appoint a person to conduct the inquiry, according to the order, whereupon the Senate directed that he himself should conduct it. 22. The consuls repaired, at last, to their province, and received the command of the army from Marcus Papilius. But the latter did not dare to go home to Rome, lest he might plead his cause while the Senate were so highly displeased with him, the people still more exasperated. And before a praetor likewise who had taken the opinion of the Senate on an inquiry pointed against him. The tribunes of the people met his evasion by the menace of another order, that if he did not come into the city of Rome before the Ides of November, Caius Licinius should judge and determine respecting him, though absent. When he, dragged by this fetter, had returned, his presence in the Senate called forth general hatred. 
There, when he was censured by the severe reproaches of many, a decree was passed, that the praetors, Caius Licinius and Gnaeus Sicinius, should take care that such of the Ligurians as had not been in open arms since the consulate of Quintus Fulvius and Lucius Manlius, should all be restored to liberty. And that the consul, Caius Papilius, should assign them lands on the farther side of the Po. By this decree many thousands were restored in this manner, led beyond the Po, and received portions of land accordingly. Marcus Papilius, being tried by the Martian law, twice pleaded his cause before Caius Licinius. But at a third hearing, the praetor, overcome by his regard for the absent consul, and the prayers of the Papilian family, ordered the defendant to appear on the Ides of March, on which day the new magistrates were to enter into office. So that he, being then in a private capacity, could not preside at the trial. Thus was the order of the people, respecting the Ligurians, eluded by artifice. 23. There were at this time in Rome ambassadors from Carthage, and also Galussa, son of Massinissa, between whom very warm words passed, in presence of the Senate. The Carthaginians complained that, besides the district, about which ambassadors were formerly sent from Rome, to determine the matter on the spot, Massinissa had, within the last two years, by force of arms, possessed himself of more than seventy towns and forts in the Carthaginian territories. This was easy for him, who cared for nothing. But the Carthaginians, being tied down by treaty, were silent, for they were prohibited from carrying arms beyond their own frontiers. And although they knew that if they forced the Numidians thence, they would wage the war within their own territory, yet they were deterred by another clause in the treaty, too clear to be mistaken, in which they were expressly forbidden to wage war against the allies of the Roman people. But the Carthaginians could not longer endure his pride, his cruelty, and his avarice. They were sent, they said, to beseech the Senate to grant them one of these three things, either that they should fairly decide what belonged to each, as became an ally of both. Or give permission to the Carthaginians to defend themselves in a just war against unjust attacks. Or finally, if favor swayed more with them than the truth, to fix at once how much of the property of others they wished should be bestowed on Massinissa. That the Senate would certainly be more moderate in their grants, and they themselves would know the extent of them, whereas, he would set no limits but the arbitrary dictates of his own ambition. If they could obtain none of these, and if they had, since the peace granted by Publius Scipio, been guilty of any transgression, they begged that the Romans themselves would rather inflict the punishment. They preferred a secure bondage under Roman masters, to a state of freedom exposed to the injustice of Massinissa. It was better for them to perish at once, than to continue to breathe under the will of, an executioner. After these words, they burst into tears, prostrated themselves on the ground, and, in this posture, excited both compassion for themselves, and no less displeasure against the king. 24. It was then voted, that Galussa should be asked what answer he had to make to these charges, or that, if it were more agreeable to him, he should first tell on what business he had come to Rome. Galussa said, that, it was not easy for him to speak on subjects concerning which he had no instructions from his father. And that it would have been hard for his father to have given him instructions, when the Carthaginians neither disclosed the business which they intended to bring forward, nor even their design of going to Rome. That they had, for several nights, held private consultations, composed of nobles, in the temple of Aesculapius, from whence ambassadors were dispatched with secret information to Rome. This was his father's reason for sending him into Italy, that he might entreat the Senate not to give credit to the common enemy accusing him, whom they hated for no other cause than his inviolable fidelity to the Roman people. After hearing both parties, the Senate, on the question being put respecting the demands of the Carthaginians, ordered this answer to be given, that, it was their will that Galussa should, without delay, return to Numidia. And desire his father to send ambassadors immediately to the Senate, to answer the complaints of the Carthaginians, and to give notice to that people to come and support their allegation. They had hitherto paid to Massinissa, and would continue to pay him, all the honor in their power, that they could not sacrifice justice to favor. Their wish was, that the lands should everywhere be possessed by the real owners. Nor did they intend to establish new boundaries, 
but that the old ones should be observed. When they vanquished the Carthaginians, they left them in possession of cities and lands, not with the purpose of stripping them by acts of injustice in time of peace of what they had not taken from them by the right of war. With this answer the Carthaginians, and the prince, were dismissed. The customary presents were sent to both parties, and the other attentions which hospitality inquired were performed with all courtesy. 25. About this time Gnaeus Servilius Cipio, Appius Claudius Sentho, and Titus Annius Luscus, who had been sent ambassadors to Macedonia, to demand restitution and renounce the king's friendship, returned. And inflamed to a still greater degree the Senate, already predisposed to hostilities against Perseus, by relating, in order, what they had seen and heard. They said, that, through all the cities of Macedonia they saw preparations for war, carried on with the utmost diligence. When they arrived at the residence of the king, they were refused admission to him for many days. At last, when, despairing of a conference, they were just setting out, then at length they were called back from their journey and brought before him. That the leading subjects in their discourse were, the treaty concluded with Philip, and, after his father's death, renewed with himself. In which he was expressly prohibited from carrying his arms beyond his own dominions, and, likewise, from making war on the allies of the Roman people. They then laid before him, in order, the true and well-authenticated accounts which they themselves had lately heard from Eumenes, in the Senate. They took notice, besides, of his having held a secret consultation, in Samothracia, with ambassadors from the states of Asia. And told him, that the Senate thought proper that satisfaction should be given for these injuries, as well as restitution, to them and their allies, of their property, which he held contrary to the tenor of the treaty. On this the king, being inflamed, spoke at first harshly, frequently upbraiding the Romans with pride and avarice, and with ambassadors coming one after another to pry into his words and actions. And with thinking proper that he should speak and do all things in compliance with their nod and order. After speaking a long time with great loudness and violence, he ordered them to return the next day, for he intended to give his answer in writing. Then the written answer was given to them. Of which the purport was, that the treaty concluded with his father in no respect concerned him, that he had suffered it to be renewed, not because he approved of it, but because, being so lately come to the throne, he had to endure everything. If they chose to form a new engagement with him, they ought first to agree on the terms. If they could bring themselves to make a treaty on an equal footing, he would consider what was to be done on his part, and he was convinced that they would provide for the interests of their own state. After this, he hastily turned away, and they were desired to quit the palace. They then declared, that they renounced his friendship and alliance. At which he was highly exasperated, stopped, and with a loud voice charged them to quit his dominions within three days. They departed accordingly. And neither on their coming, nor while they stayed, was any kind of attention or hospitality shown them. The Thessalian and Aetolian ambassadors were then admitted to audience. It pleased the Senate, that a letter should be sent to the consuls, directing, that whichever of them was most able should come to Rome to elect magistrates, in order that they might know what commanders the state was about to employ. 26. The consuls, during that year, performed no business of the Republic that deserved much notice. It appeared more advantageous to the Republic, that the Ligurians, who had been highly exasperated, should be pacified and appeased. While a Macedonian war was expected, Ambassadors from Issa gave them reason to suspect the inclinations of Gentius, king of Illyria, for they complained that, he had, a second time, ravaged their country. Affirming likewise, that, the kings of Macedon and Illyria lived on terms of the closest intimacy. That both were preparing, in concert, for war against the Romans, and that there were then in Rome Illyrian spies, under the appearance of ambassadors, and who were sent thither by the advice of Perseus, to ascertain what was going on. The Illyrians, being called before the Senate, said, that they were sent by their king, to justify his conduct, if the Issans should make any complaint against him. They were then asked why they had not applied to some magistrate, that they might, according to the regular practice, be furnished with lodging and entertainment, that their arrival might be known, and the business on which they came. 
When they hesitated in their reply, they were ordered to retire out of the Senate House. It was not thought proper to give them any answer, as delegates, because they had not applied for an audience of the Senate. They resolved, that ambassadors should be sent to the king, to announce to him the complaints made by the allies of his having ravaged their country, and that he acted unjustly, since he did not refrain from offering injury to their allies. On this embassy Aulus Terentius Varro, Caius Pletorius, and Caius Caesareus, were sent. The ambassadors, who had been sent to the several kings in alliance with the state, came home from Asia, and reported that, they had conferred in it with Eumenes, in Syria, with Antiochus, and at Alexandria, with Ptolemy. All of whom, though strongly solicited by embassies from Perseus, remained perfectly faithful to their engagements, and gave assurances of their readiness to execute every order of the Roman people. That they had also visited the allied states. That all were firm in their attachment, except the Rhodians, who seemed to be wavering, and infected by the counsels of Perseus. Ambassadors had come from the Rhodians, to exculpate them from the imputations which, they knew, were openly urged against them, but a resolution was made, that, an audience of the Senate should be given, when the new magistrates came into office. 27. The Senate were of opinion, that the preparations for war should be deferred no longer. The duty is assigned to Caius Licinius, that out of the old galleys laid up in the docks at Rome, which might be rendered serviceable, he should refit and get ready for sea fifty ships. If any were wanting to make up that number, that he should write to his colleague, Caius Memmius, in Sicily, directing him to repair and fit out such vessels as were in that province, so that they might be sent, with all expedition, to Brundusium. Caius Licinius, the praetor, was ordered to enlist Roman citizens of the rank of freedmen's sons, to man twenty-five ships. Gnaeus Sicinius, to levy, from the allies, an equal number for the other twenty-five, and likewise to require from the Latin confederates eight thousand foot and four hundred horse. Aulus Attilius Serenus, who had been praetor the year before, was commissioned to receive these troops at Brundusium, and transport them to Macedon, and Gnaeus Sicinius, the praetor, to keep them in readiness for embarkation. By direction of the Senate, Caius Licinius, the praetor, wrote to the consul, Caius Papilius, to order the second legion, which was the oldest then in Liguria, together with four thousand foot and two hundred horse, of the Latin nation. To be in Brundusium on the Ides of February, with this fleet, and this army, Gnaeus Sicinius, being continued a year in command for the purpose, was ordered to take care of the province of Macedon until a new governor should arrive. All these measures, which the Senate voted, were vigorously executed, thirty-eight quinquiremes were drawn out of the docks. Lucius Porcius Licinus was appointed to the command, with directions to conduct them to Brundusium, and twelve were sent from Sicily, three commissaries were dispatched into Apulia and Calabria, to buy up corn for the fleet and army. These were Sextus Digitius, Titus Juventius, and Marcus Cicilius. When all things were in readiness, the praetor, Gnaeus Sicinius, in his military robes, set out from the city and went to Brundusium. 28. The consul, Caius Papilius, came home to Rome when the year had almost expired, much later than had been directed by the vote of the Senate. To whom it had seemed advantageous to the Republic, that magistrates should be elected as soon as possible, when so important a war was impending. Therefore the consul did not receive a favorable hearing from the Senate, when he spoke in the Temple of Bologna of his acts among the Ligurians. There were frequent interruptions and questions, why he had not restored to liberty the Ligurians, who had been oppressed by his brother. The election was held on the day appointed by proclamation, the twelfth before the Calends of March. The consuls chosen were, Publius Licinius Crassus and Caius Cassius Longinus. Next day were elected praetors, Caius Sulpicius Galba, Lucius Furius Philus, Lucius Canulius Dives, Caius Lucretius Gallus, Caius Caninius Rebellus, and Lucius Vilius Annalise. The provinces decreed to these praetors were, the two civil jurisdictions in Rome, Spain, Sicily, and Sardinia, and one of them was kept disengaged, that he might be employed wherever the Senate should direct. The Senate ordered the consuls elect, that, on whatever day they would enter on their office, having sacrificed victims of the larger kind, they should pray to the gods that the war, 
which the Roman people intended to engage in. Might prove fortunate in the issue. On the same day the Senate passed an order, that the consul, Caius Papilius, should vow games, of ten days continuance, to Jupiter supremely good and great, with offerings in all the temples. If the commonwealth should remain for ten years in its present state. Pursuant to this vote, the consul made a vow in the capital, that the games should be celebrated, and the offerings made, at such expense as the senate should direct, when not less than a hundred and fifty persons were present. That vow was expressed in terms dictated by Lepidus, the chief pontiff. There died this year, of the public priests, Lucius Emilius Papus, December of Religious Rites, and Quintus Fulvius Flaccus, a pontiff who had been censor the year before. The latter died in a shocking manner, he had received an account, that, of his two sons who were in the army in Illyria, one was dead, and the other laboring under a heavy and dangerous malady, his grief and fears, together, overwhelmed his reason. And his servants, on going into his chamber in the morning, found him hanging by a rope. There was a general opinion, that, since his censorship, his understanding had not been sound, and the report was popular, that the resentment of Juno Lacinia, for the spoil committed on her temple, had caused the derangement of his intellects. Marcus Valerius Messala was substituted December in the place of Emilius, and Gnaeus Domitius Enobarbus, though a mere youth, was chosen into the priesthood as pontiff in the room of Fulvius. 29. In this consulate of Publius Licinius and Caius Cassius, not only the city of Rome, but the whole of Italy, with all the kings and states both in Europe and in Asia, had their attention fixed on the approaching war between Rome and Macedon. Not only old hatred, but also recent anger, because by the villainy of Perseus he had been almost slaughtered like a victim at Delphi, urged Eumenes against him. Persia's, king of Bithynia, resolved to keep clear of hostilities, and to wait the event. For as he did not think it proper to carry arms on the side of the Romans against his wife's brother, so he trusted that, in case of Perseus proving victorious, his favor might be secured through the means of his sister. Ariarathes, king of Cappadocia, besides having, in his own name, promised aid to the Romans, had, ever since he was allied by affinity to Eumenes, united with him in all his plans, whether of war or peace. Antiochus indeed entertained designs on the kingdom of Egypt, since he despised the unripe age of Ptolemy, and the inactive disposition of his guardians, and thought that he might, by raising a dispute about Coel Assyria, find sufficient pretext for proceeding to extremities, and carry on a war there without any impediment, while the Roman arms were employed against Macedon, yet, by his ambassadors to the senate, and to their ambassadors sent to him. He made the fairest promises. Ptolemy, on account of his age, was then influenced by the will of others. And his guardians, at the same time while they were preparing for war with Antiochus, to secure possession of Coel Assyria, promised the Romans every support in the war against Macedon. Massinissa both assisted the Romans with supplies of corn, and prepared to send into the field, to their assistance, a body of troops and a number of elephants, with his son Misogenes. He so arranged his plans as to answer every event that might take place. For if success should attend the Romans, he judged that his own affairs would rest in their present state, and that he ought to seek for nothing further, as the Romans would not suffer violence to be offered to the Carthaginians. And if the power of the Romans, which at that time protected the Carthaginians, should be reduced, then all Africa would be his own. Gentius, king of Illyria, had indeed given cause of suspicion to the Romans. But he had not yet determined which party to espouse, and it was believed that he would join either one or the other through some sudden impulse of passion, rather than from any rational motive. Codes, the Thracian king of the Odrysians, was openly in favor of the Macedonians. 30. Such were the inclinations of the several kings, while the free nations and states the plebeians, favoring as usual the weaker cause, were almost universally inclined to the Macedonians and their king. But among the nobles might be observed different views. One party was so warmly devoted to the Romans, that, by the excess of their zeal, they diminished their own influence. Of these a few were actuated by their admiration of the justice of the Roman government, 
but by far the greater number supposed that they would become powerful in their state, if they displayed remarkable exertions. A second party wished to court the king's favor, as debt, and despair of their affairs, while the same constitution remained, urged them hastily to complete revolution. And others, through a fickleness of temper, followed Perseus as the more popular character. A third party, the wisest and the best, wished, in case of being allowed the choice of a master, to live under the Romans rather than under the king. Yet, could they have had the free disposal of events, they wished that neither party should become more powerful by the destruction of the other, but rather that, the strength of both being uninjured, peace should continue on that account. For thus the condition of their states would be the happiest, as one party would always protect a weak state from any ill treatment intended by the other. Judging thus, they viewed in silence from their safe position the contest between the partisans of the two contending powers. The consuls, having on the day of their entering on office, in compliance with the order of the Senate, sacrificed victims of the larger kinds in all the temples where the lectisternium was usually celebrated for the greater part of the year. And having from them collected omens that their prayers were accepted by the immortal gods, reported to the Senate that the sacrifices had been duly performed, and prayers offered respecting the war. The Aruspices declared, that, if any new undertaking was intended, it ought to be proceeded in without delay, that victory, triumphs, and extension of empire were portended. The Senate then resolved, that, the consuls should, on the first proper day, propose to the people assembled by centuries, that whereas Perseus, son of Philip, and king of Macedon, contrary to the league struck with his father, and after Philip's death renewed with himself, had committed hostilities on the allies of Rome, had wasted their lands, and seized their towns, and also had formed a design of making war on the Roman people, and had for that purpose prepared arms, troops, and a fleet. Unless he gave satisfaction concerning those matters, that war should be proclaimed against him. The question was carried among the commons. Then a decree of the Senate was passed, that, the consuls should settle between themselves, or cast lots, for the provinces of Italy and Macedon. That the one to whose lot Macedon fell should seek redress by force of arms from King Perseus, and all who concurred in his designs, unless they made amends to the Roman people. 31. It was ordered that four new legions should be raised, two for each consul. This in particular was assigned to the province of Macedon, that although five thousand foot and two hundred horse were assigned to the other consuls' legions, according to the ancient practice. Six thousand foot and three hundred horse were ordered to be enlisted for each of the legions that were to serve in Macedonia. Of the allied troops also, the number was augmented in the army ordered into Macedon, namely, sixteen thousand foot and eight hundred horse, besides the six hundred horsemen carried thither by Gnaeus Sicinius. For Italy, twelve thousand foot and six hundred horse of the allies were deemed sufficient. The following remarkable concession was made to the service in Macedon. The consul was authorized to enlist at his option veteran centurions and soldiers, as old as fifty years. An unusual mode of proceeding with regard to the military tribunes was also introduced on the same occasion, for the consuls, by direction of the senate, recommended to the people, that, for that year. The military tribunes should not be created by their suffrages. But that the consuls and praetors should exercise their judgment and discrimination in their selection. Their respective commands were assigned to the praetors in the following manner, he to whose lot it fell to be employed wherever the senate should direct, had orders to go to Brundusium, to the fleet, that he might then review the crews, and dismissing such men as appeared unfit for the service, enlist in their places sons of freed men, taking care that two-thirds should be Roman citizens, and the remainder allies. For supplying provisions to the ships and legions, from Sicily and Sardinia, it was resolved, that the praetors who obtained the government of those provinces should be enjoined to levy a second tenth on the Sicilians and Sardinians. And that this corn should be conveyed into Macedon, to the army. The lots gave Sicily to Caius Caninius Rebellus, Sardinia, to Lucius Furius Philus, Spain, to Lucius Canulius, the city jurisdiction, to Caius Sulpicius Galba, and the foreign, to Lucius Vilius Annalis. The lot of Caius Lucretius Gallus was to be employed wherever the Senate should direct. 32. 
the consuls had a slight dispute, rather than a great contest, about their province. Cassius said, that, he would select Macedon without casting lots, nor could his colleague, without perjury, abide their determination. When he was praetor, to avoid going to his province, he made oath in the public assembly, that he had sacrifices to perform on stated days, in a stated place, and that they could not be duly performed in his absence. And surely they could no more be performed duly in his absence when he was consul, than when he was praetor. If the Senate thought proper to pay more regard to what Publius Licinius wished, in his consulship, than to what he had sworn in his praetorship, he himself, for his part, would at all events be ruled by that body. When the question was put, the senators thought it would be a degree of arrogance in them to refuse a province to him, since the Roman people had not denied him the consulship. They, however, ordered the consuls to cast lots. Macedonia fell to Publius Licinius, Italy to Caius Cassius. They then cast lots for the legions, when it fell to the lot of the first and third to go over into Macedonia, and of the second and fourth, to remain in Italy. The consuls held the levy with much greater care than usual. Licinius enlisted even veteran centurions and soldiers, and many of them volunteered, as they saw that those men who had served in the former Macedonian War, or in Asia, had become rich. When the military tribunes cited the centurions, and especially those of the highest rank, twenty-three of them, who had held the first posts, appealed to the tribunes of the people. Two of that body, Marcus Fulvius Nobilior and Marcus Claudius Marcellus, wished to refer the matter to the consuls. The cognizance of it ought to rest with those to whom the levy and the war were entrusted but the rest declared, that since the appeal had been made to them, they would examine into the affair. And, if there were any injustice in the case, would support their fellow citizens. 33. The business, therefore, came into the court of the tribunes. Thither Marcus Papilius, a man of consular dignity, the centurions, and the consul came. The consul then required that the matter might be discussed in a general assembly, and, accordingly, the people were summoned. On the side of the centurions, Marcus Papilius, who had been consul two years before, argued thus, that, as military men they had served out their regular time, and that they possessed bodies worn out through age and continual hardships. Nevertheless, they did not refuse to give the public the benefit of their services, they only entreated that they might be favored so far, that posts inferior to those which they had formerly held in the army should not be assigned to them. The consul, Publius Licinius, first ordered the decree of the Senate to be read, in which war was determined against Perseus, and then the other, which directed that as many veteran centurions as could be procured should be enlisted for that war. And that no exemption from the service should be allowed to any who was not upwards of fifty years of age. He then entreated that, at a time when a new war was breaking out so near to Italy, and with a most powerful king, they would not either obstruct the military tribunes in making the levies or prevent the consul from assigning to each person such a post as best suited the convenience of the public. And that, if any doubt should arise in the proceedings, they might refer it to the decision of the Senate. 34. When the consul had said all that he thought proper, Spurius Ligustinus, one of those who had appealed to the plebeian tribunes, requested permission from the consul and tribunes to speak a few words to the people. By the permission of them all he spoke, we are told, to this effect, Romans, I am Spurius Ligustinus, of the Crustuminian tribe, and I sprung from the Sabines. My father left me one acre of land, and a small cottage, in which I was born and educated, and I dwell there today. As soon as I came to man's estate, my father married me to his brother's daughter, who brought nothing with her but independence and modesty, except, indeed, a degree of fruitfulness that would have better suited a wealthier family. We have six sons and two daughters, the latter are both married, of our sons, for are grown up to manhood, the other two are as yet boys. I became a soldier in the consulate of Publius Sulpicius and Caius Aurelius. In the army which was sent over into Macedon I served as a common soldier, against Philip, for two years, and in the third year, Titus Quintius Flamininus, in reward of my good conduct, gave me the command of the tenth company of spearmen. When Philip and the Macedonians were subdued, 
and we were brought back to Italy and discharged, I immediately went as a volunteer, with the consul Marcus Porcius into Spain. Those who have had experience of him, and of other generals in a long course of service, know that no single commander living was a more accurate observer and judge of merit. This commander judged me deserving of being set at the head of the first company of spearmen. A third time I entered as a volunteer in the army which was sent against the Aetolians and King Antiochus. And Manius Asilius gave me the command of the first company of first-rank men. After Antiochus was driven out of the country, and the Aetolians were reduced, we were brought home to Italy, where I served the two succeeding years in legions that were raised annually. I afterwards made two campaigns in Spain. One under Quintus Fulvius Flaccus, the other under Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, praetors. I was brought by Flaccus among others whom he brought home from the province to attend his triumph, out of regard to their good services. At the request of Tiberius Gracchus, I went with him to his province. For times within a few years was I first centurion of my corps, thirty-four times I was honoured by my commanders with presents for bravery. I have received six civic crowns, I have fulfilled twenty-two years of service in the army, and I am upwards of fifty years of age. But, if I had neither served out all my campaigns, nor was entitled to exemption on account of my age, yet Publius Licinius, as I can supply you with four soldiers instead of myself, it were reasonable that I should be discharged. But I wish you to consider these words merely as a state of my case, as to offering anything as an excuse from service, that is what I will never do, so long as any officer, enlisting troops, shall believe me fit for it. What rank the military tribunes may think I deserve, rests with their power. That no one in the army may surpass me in a zealous discharge of duty, I shall use my best endeavours. And that I have always acted on that principle, my commanders and my comrades can testify. And now, fellow soldiers, you who assert your privilege of appeal, as you have never, in your youthful days, done any act contrary to the directions of the magistrates and the senate. Now too you ought to be amenable to the authority of the senate and consuls, and to think every post honourable in which you can act for the defence of the commonwealth. 35. Having finished his speech, he was highly commended by the consul, who led him from the assembly into the senate house, where, by order of the senate, he again received public thanks. And the military tribunes, in consideration of his meritorious behaviour, made him first centurion in the first legion. The rest of the centurions, dropping the appeal, submissively answered to their names in the levy. That the magistrates might the sooner go into their provinces, the Latin festival was celebrated on the calends of June. And as soon as that solemnity was ended, Caius Lucretius, the praetor, after sending forward everything requisite for the fleet, went to Brundusium. Besides the armies which the consuls were forming, Caius Sulpicius Galba, the praetor, was commissioned to raise four city legions, with the regular number of foot and horse, and to choose out of the senate four military tribunes to command them. Likewise, to require from the Latin allies fifteen thousand foot, with twelve hundred horse, that this army should be prepared to act wherever the senate should order. At the desire of the consul, Publius Licinius, the following auxiliaries were ordered to join the army of citizens and allies under his command, two thousand Ligurians. A body of Cretan archers, whose number was not specified, the order only mentioning whatever succors the Cretans, on being applied to, should send, likewise the Numidian cavalry in elephants. To settle concerning these last, ambassadors were sent to Massinissa and the Carthaginians, Lucius Postumius Albinus, Quintus Terentius Cullio, and Caius Aburius, also, to Crete, Aulus Postumius Albinus, Caius Decimius, and Aulus Licinius Nerva. 36. At this time arrived ambassadors from Perseus. It was the pleasure of the fathers that they should not be permitted to come into the city, as the senate had already decreed. And the people had ordered, a declaration of war against their king and the Macedonians. Being introduced before the senate in the temple of Bologna, they spoke in the following manner, that, King Perseus wondered what could be their motive for transporting troops into Macedon. And that if the senate could be prevailed on to recall them, the king would, at their arbitration, satisfactorily account for any injuries of which their allies might complain. 
Spurius Carvilius had been sent home from Greece, by Gnaeus Sicinius, for the purpose of attending this business, and was present in the Senate. He charged the king with taking military occupation of Perhebia, storming several cities of Thessaly, and other enterprises, in which he was either actually employed or preparing to engage. And the ambassadors were called on to answer to those points. After they declined to do so, declaring that they had no further instructions, they were ordered to tell their king, that, the consul Publius Licinius would soon be in Macedon at the head of an army. To him he might send ambassadors, if he were disposed to give satisfaction, but there was no use in his sending any more to Rome, for none of them would be permitted to pass through Italy. After they were thus dismissed, a charge was given to Publius Sicinius, to insist on their quitting Italy within eleven days, and to send Spurius Carvilius to guard them, until they embarked. Such were the transactions at Rome, before the departure of the consuls for their provinces. Gnaeus Sicinius, who, before the expiration of his office, had been sent to Brundusium to the fleet and army, had by this time transported into Epirus five thousand foot and three hundred horse, and was encamped at Nymphium. In the territory of Apollonia. From which place he sent tribunes, with two thousand men, to take possession of the forts of the Dacerians and Illyrians, as those people themselves solicited garrisons, to secure them from the inroads of the Macedonians in their neighborhood. 37. A few days after, Quintus Martius, Aulus Attilius, Publius Cornelius Lentulus, Servius Cornelius Lentulus, and Lucius Decimius, who were sent ambassadors to Greece, carried with them one thousand soldiers to Corsera, where they divided the troops among them, and settled what districts they were to visit. Decimius was sent to Gentius, king of Illyria, with instructions to sound him, as to whether he retained any regard for former friendship, and even to prevail on him to take part in the war. The two Lentuluses were sent to Cephalenia that they might cross over from it into Peloponnesus, and, before the winter, make a circuit round the western coast. The circuit of Epirus, Aetolia, and Thessaly is entrusted to Martius and Attilius, they were directed to take a view afterwards of Boeotia and Euboea, and then to pass over to Peloponnesus, where, by appointment, they were to meet the Lentuluses. Before they set out on their several routes from Corsera, a letter was brought from Perseus, in which he inquired the reason of the Romans sending troops into Greece, and taking possession of the cities. They did not think proper to give him any answer in writing, but they told his messenger, who brought the letter, for the sake of guarding the cities themselves. The Lentuluses, going round the cities of Peloponnesus, after exhorting all the states, without distinction, as they had assisted the Romans with fidelity in spirit, first in the war with Philip, and then in that with Antiochus, to assist them now. In like manner, against Perseus, heard some murmuring in the assemblies. For the Achaeans were highly offended that they, who, from the very first rise of the war with Macedon, had given every instance of friendship to the Romans, and had been open enemies to the Macedonians in the war with Philip, should be treated on the same footing with the Messenians and Elians, who had borne arms on the side of Antiochus against the Roman people, and who, being lately incorporated in the Achaean Union, made heavy complaints as if they were made over to the victorious Achaeans as a prize. 38. When Martius and Attilius went up to Gitani, a town of Epirus, about ten miles from the sea, a council of Epirotes being held there, they were listened to with universal approbation. And they sent thence four hundred young men of that country to Oresti, to protect those whom they had freed from the dominion of the Macedonians. From this place they proceeded into Aetolia where, having waited a few days, until a praetor was chosen, in the room of one who had died, and the election having fallen on Lysiscus, who was well known to be a friend to the interest of the Romans, they passed over into Thessaly. The envoys of the Acarnanians and the exiles of the Boeotians came thither. The Acarnanians had orders to represent that, whatever offences they had been guilty of towards the Romans, first in the war with Philip, and afterwards in that with Antiochus, in consequence of being misled by the professions of those kings. They had found an opportunity to expiate. Since in spite of their demerits they had experienced the clemency of the Roman people, so they would now, by their endeavours to merit favour, make trial of its generosity. The Boeotians were upbraided with having united themselves in alliance with Perseus. 
but they threw the blame on Ismenias, the leader of a party, and alleged, that, several states were drawn into that measure, contrary to their own judgment to which Martius replied, that, this would appear. As they intended to give to every one of the states the power of judging for itself. The council of the Thessalians was held at Larissa. There too the Thessalians had a wide field for giving thanks to the Romans for the blessing of liberty conferred on them. And the ambassadors, because they had been vigorously assisted by the Thessalians in the wars with Philip and Antiochus. The feelings of the assembly were acted on by this mutual acknowledgement of favors to such a degree that they voted every measure which the Romans wished. Soon after this meeting, ambassadors arrived from King Perseus, chiefly through reliance on a connection of hospitality subsisting between him and Martius, which had existed between their fathers. The ambassadors began by reminding him of this bond of amity, and then requested him to give the king an opportunity of conferring with him. Martius answered, that, he had received from his father the same account of the friendship and hospitable connection between him and Philip, and the consideration of that connection induced him to undertake the present embassy. That he would not have so long delayed giving the king a meeting, could it have been done without inconvenience. And that now he and his colleague would, as soon as it should be in their power, come to the river Peneus, where the passage was from Omolium to Diam, messengers being previously sent to announce it to the king. 39. Perseus, on this, withdrew from Diam into the heart of the kingdom, having conceived a slight inspiration of hope from the expression of Martius, that he had undertaken the embassy out of regard to him. After a few days they all met at the appointed place. The king's suite was a large one, since a crowd of friends attended him, as well as his bodyguards. The ambassadors came with a train not inferior in numbers, as many accompanied them from Larissa, and also the delegates of many states, who had met them there. Wishing to carry home information on the positive testimony of what they themselves should hear. All men felt a strong curiosity to behold a meeting between so powerful a king, and the ambassadors of the first people in the world. After they came within sight, on the opposite sides of the river, some time was spent in sending messengers from one to the other, to settle which of the two should cross it. For one party thought the compliment due to royal majesty, the other to the fame of the Roman people, especially as Perseus had requested the conference. Martius by a jest roused them from their delay, let the younger, said he, cross over to the elder, the son to the father, for his own surname was Philip. The king was easily persuaded to comply. But then another perplexity arose, about the number he should bring over with him. He thought it would be proper to be attended by his whole retinue. But the ambassadors required that he should either come with three attendants only, or if he brought so great a band, that he should give hostages that no treachery should be used during the conference. He accordingly sent as hostages Hippias and Pentacus, two of his particular friends, and whom he had sent as ambassadors. The hostages were demanded not so much to get a pledge of good faith, as to make it apparent to the allies, that the king did not meet the ambassadors on a footing of equal dignity. Their salutations were not like those between enemies, but kind and friendly, and seats being placed for them, they sat down together. 40. After a short silence, Martius began thus, I suppose you expect us to give an answer to your letter sent to Corsera, in which you ask the reason, why we ambassadors come attended by soldiers, and why we send garrisons into the cities. To this your question I dread either to refuse an answer, lest it should appear haughty in me, or to give a true one, lest, to your ears, it might seem too harsh. But since the person who infringes a treaty must be reproved, either with words or with arms, as I could wish that the war against you had been entrusted to any other rather than to myself, so I will undergo the task, however disagreeable, of uttering rough language against my friend, as physicians, when they, for the recovery of health, sometimes apply painful remedies. The Senate is of opinion that, since you came to the throne, you have acted but in one particular as you ought to have done, and that is, in sending ambassadors to Rome to renew the treaty made with your father. And yet it would have been better never to have renewed it, they think, than afterwards to violate it. You expelled from his throne Abropolis, an ally and friend of the Roman people. You gave refuge to the murderers of Artaterus, that it might appear that you were pleased at his assassination, to say nothing worse. 
though they put to death a prince, who, of all the Illyrians, was the most faithful to the Roman nation. You marched with an army through Thessaly and the Italian territory to Delphi, contrary to the treaty. You likewise, in violation of it, sent succors to the Byzantians. You concluded by an oath a separate alliance with the Boeotians our confederates, which you had no right to do. As to Aversa and Callicritus, the Theban ambassadors, who were slain in returning from Rome, I wish rather to inquire who were their murderers, than to charge any one of the crime. To whom else than your agents can the civil war in Aetolia, and the deaths of the principal inhabitants, be imputed? The country of the Dolopians was ravaged by you in person. King Eumenes, when he was returning from Rome to his own dominions, was almost butchered, as a victim, at the altars in consecrated ground, at Delphi, and it grieves me to know the person whom he accuses. With regard to the secret crimes which the host at Brundusium states in his communication, I take it for certain, that all the particulars were written you from Rome, and that your ambassadors reported them to you. There was one way by which you might have avoided my speaking of these matters, which was, by not inquiring why we brought troops into Macedonia, or sent garrisons into the cities of our allies. When you had asked the question, it would have been more haughty to keep silence, than to answer according to truth. Out of regard to the friendship derived to us from our fathers, I am really disposed to listen favorably to whatever you may say, and wish that you may afford me some grounds of pleading your cause before the Senate. 41. To this the king answered, a cause which would approve itself good if tried before impartial judges, I must plead before judges who are at the same time my accusers. Of the circumstances laid to my charge, some are of such a nature that I know not whether I ought not to glory in them, others there are which I would not blush to confess. And others, which as they are backed by bare assertions, it will be sufficient to deny. Supposing that I were this day to stand a trial, according to your laws, what does either the Brundusian informer, or Eumenes, allege against me that would be deemed a well-founded accusation, and not rather a malicious aspersion? Had Eumenes, although both in his public and private capacity he has done many grievous injuries to so many people, no other enemy than me? Could I not find a better agent for the perpetration of wickedness than Ramius, whom I had never seen before, nor had any probability of ever seeing again? Then, I must give an account of the Thebans, who, it is well known, perished by shipwreck. And of the death of Artaterus, with regard to whom nothing more is alleged against me, than that his murderers lived in exile in my dominions. I will not object to the injustice of this assumption, provided you will admit it on your side. And will acknowledge that, whatever exiles have taken refuge in Rome or in Italy, you are yourselves abettors of the crimes for which they have been condemned. If you admit not this principle, as other nations will not, neither will I. In truth, what advantage were it to any one that exile lay within his grasp, if nowhere was there room for an exile? As soon however as I understood from your representations, that those men were in Macedon, I ordered that search should be made for them, and that they should quit the kingdom, and I prohibited them forever from setting foot on my dominions. These accusations are brought against me as if I were a criminal pleading my cause, the others affect me as a king, and must derive their decision from the treaty which exists between you and me. For if it is thus expressed in that treaty, that even if any one would wage war against me, I am not permitted to protect my kingdom. I must then confess I have infringed it, by defending myself with arms against Abrupolis, an ally of the Roman people. But, on the other hand, if it is both allowed by the treaty, and is an axiom established by the law of nations, that arms may be repelled by arms. How, I pray you, ought I to have acted when Abropolis had spread devastation over the frontiers of my kingdom as far as Amphipolis, carried off great numbers of free persons a vast multitude of slaves, and many thousands of cattle? Ought I to have lain quiet, and let him proceed until he came in arms to Pella, into my very palace? But, allowing that I avenged my wrongs in a just war, yet he ought not to have been subdued, and made to suffer the evils which occur to the vanquished. Nay, but when I, who was the person attacked, underwent the hazard of all these, how can he, who was the cause of the war, complain if they happen to fall upon himself? As to my having punished the Dolopians by force of arms, I mean not, Romans, to defend myself in the same manner. 
because, whether they deserved that treatment or not, I acted in right of my own sovereign authority, for they were under my sovereign power and dominion, annexed to my father's territories by your decree. Nor, even if I were to give an account of my conduct, I do not say to you, nor my other confederates, but even to such as disapprove of a severe and unjust exercise of authority, even over slaves. Would I appear to have carried my severity against them beyond the limits of justice and equity? For they slew Euphranor, the governor whom I had set over them, in such a manner, that death was the slightest of his sufferings. 42. But, when I proceeded to visit Larissa, Antron, and Telios, that I might be within a convenient distance to pay vows, due long before, I went up to Delphi, in order to offer sacrifice. And here, with the purpose of aggravating the imputed guilt, it is subjoined, that I went with an army, with intent to do what I now complain of your doing, to seize the towns, and put garrisons in the citadels. Now, call together, in assembly, the states of Greece, through which I marched. And if any one person complain of ill-treatment, offered by a soldier of mine, I will not deny that I may appear, under a pretense of sacrificing, to have had a different object. We sent aid to the Aetolians and Byzantians, and made a treaty of friendship with the Boeotians. These proceedings, of whatever nature they may be, have been repeatedly avowed by my ambassadors. And, what is more, excuse before your senate, where I had several of my judges not so favourable as you, Quintus Martius, my paternal friend and guest. But at that time, my accuser, Eumenes, had not come to Rome. One who, by misrepresenting and distorting every occurrence, rendered it suspicious and odious, and endeavoured to persuade you that Greece could not be in a state of freedom, nor enjoy your kindness, while the kingdom of Macedon subsisted. The wheel will come round, people will soon be found who will insist, that Antiochus was in vain removed beyond the mountains of Taurus, that Eumenes is more burdensome to Asia than Antiochus was. And that your allies can never enjoy peace so long as there is a palace at Pergamus, for this was raised as a citadel over the heads of the neighboring states. Quintus Martius and Aulus Attilius, I am aware that the charges which were made by you, and my reply to them, will have just so much weight as the ears and the tempers of the hearers are disposed to allow them to have. And that the question what I have done, or with what intention, is not of so much importance, as what construction you may put on what has been done. I am conscious to myself that I have not, knowingly, done wrong. And that, if I have done any wrong, erring through imprudence, I am capable of receiving correction and reformation from these reproofs. I have certainly committed no fault that is incurable, or deserving punishment by war and plunder, for surely the fame of your clemency and consistency of conduct, spread over the world, is ill-founded, if on such causes as are scarcely deserving of complaint or expostulation, you take up arms against kings in alliance with you. 43. As he uttered these words with the apparent approbation of the ambassadors, Martius advised him to send ambassadors to Rome, as he thought it best to try every expedient to the last, and to omit nothing that might afford any prospect of peace. The consideration still remained, how the ambassadors might travel with safety. And although, to this end, it was necessary that the king should ask a truce, which Martius wished for, and in fact had no other view in consenting to the conference, yet he granted it with apparent reluctance. And as a great favour to the persons requesting it. At that juncture the Romans had not made sufficient preparations for war, they had no army, no general, whereas Perseus had everything prepared and ready. And if a delusive hope of peace had not blinded his judgment, he might have commenced hostilities at a time most advantageous to himself and distressing to his enemies. At the breaking up of this conference, the truce being ratified by both parties, the Roman ambassadors bent their route towards Boeotia, where great commotions were now beginning. For several of the states withdrew themselves from the union of the general confederacy of the Boeotians, from the time that the answer of the ambassadors was announced. That, it would appear what particular states were displeased at the formation of the alliance with the king. First deputies from Kyrenia, then others from Thebes, met the Romans on the road, and assured them, that they were not present in the council wherein that alliance was resolved on. The ambassadors, giving them no answer at the time, ordered that they should go with them to Chalcis. 
At Thebes a violent dissension arose out of another contest. The party defeated in the election of praetors of Boeotia, resolving to revenge the affront, collected the multitude, and passed a decree at Thebes, that the new Beatarchs should not be admitted into the cities. All the persons thus exiled betook themselves to Thespiae. Being recalled from it, for they were received there without hesitation, to Thebes, owing to a change in the minds of the people, they passed a decree that the twelve persons who, without being invested with public authority, had held an assembly in council, should be punished by banishment, and afterwards the new praetor, he was Ismenias, a man of distinction and power, by another decree, condemns them, although absent, to capital punishment. They had fled to Chalcis, and thence they proceeded to Larissa, to the Romans, and threw on Ismenias alone the blame of the alliance concluded with Perseus, asserting that the contest originated in a party dispute. Yet ambassadors from both sides waited on the Romans, as did the exiles, accusers of Ismenias, and Ismenias himself. 44. When they were all arrived at Chalcis, the chiefs of the other states, each by a particular decree of their own, renounced the alliance of Perseus, and joined themselves to the Romans. A circumstance which gave very great pleasure to the latter. Ismenias recommended, that the Boeotian nation should be placed under the orders of Rome. On which so violent a dispute arose, that, if he had not fled for shelter to the tribunal of the ambassadors, he would not have been far from losing his life by the hands of the exiles and their abettors. Thebes itself, the capital of Boeotia, was in a violent ferment, one party struggling hard to bring the state over to the king, the other to the Romans. And multitudes had come together, from Coroni and Haliardus, to support the decree in favor of Perseus. But by the firmness of the chiefs, who desired them to judge, from the defeats of Philip and Antiochus, how great must be the power and fortune of the Roman Empire, the same multitude was overcome. And not only resolved that the alliance with the king should be cancelled, but also, to gratify the ambassadors, sent the promoters of that alliance to Chalcis. And ordered, that the state should be recommended to the protection of the Romans. Martius and Attilius heard the Thebans with joy, and advised both them and each state separately to send ambassadors to Rome to renew the treaty. They required, above all things, that the exiles should be restored, and condemned by their own decree the advisers of the treaty with the king. Having thus disunited the members of the Boeotian council, which was their grand object, they proceeded to Peloponnesus, after summoning Servius Cornelius to Chalcis. An assembly was summoned to meet them at Argos, where they demanded nothing more from the Achaeans, than the furnishing of one thousand soldiers, which were sent as a garrison to defend Chalcis until a Roman army should come into Greece. 45. Martius and Attilius having finished the business that was to be done in Greece, returned to Rome in the beginning of winter. An embassy had been dispatched thence, about the same time, into Asia, to the several islands. The ambassadors were three, Tiberius Claudius, Publius Postumius, and Marcus Junius. These, making a circuit among the allies, exhorted them to undertake the war against Perseus, in conjunction with the Romans. And the more powerful any state was, the more earnestly they requested them, judging that the smaller states would follow the lead of the greater. The Rhodians were esteemed of the utmost consequence on every account. Because they could not only countenance the war, but also assist in it by their own strength, having, pursuant to the advice of Hegesilochus, forty ships ready for sea. This man being chief magistrate, whom they call Prytanes, had, by many arguments, prevailed on the Rhodians to banish the hope of courting the favor of kings, which they had, in repeated instances, found fallacious. And to maintain firmly the alliance with Rome, which was the only one in the earth that could be relied on for strength or honor. He told them, that, a war was upon the point of breaking out with Perseus, that the Romans would expect the same naval armament which they had seen lately in that with Antiochus, and formerly in that with Philip, that they would be hurried. In the hasty equipment of a fleet, when it ought to be sent at once, unless they immediately set about the repairing and manning of their ships, and that they ought to do this with the greatest diligence, in order to refute. By the evidence of facts, the imputations thrown on them by Eumenes. Roused by these arguments, they showed to the Roman ambassadors, on their arrival, 
a fleet of forty ships rigged and fitted out, so that it might appear that they did not require to be urged. This embassy had great effect in conciliating the affections of the states in Asia. Decinius alone returned to Rome without effecting anything, and disgraced by the suspicion of having received money from the Illyrian kings. 46. When Perseus, after the conference with the Romans, had retired into Macedon, he sent ambassadors to Rome to carry on the negotiation for peace commenced with Martius, giving them letters, to be delivered at Byzantium and Rhodes. The purport of the letters to all was the same, viz. That he had conferred with the Roman ambassadors. What he had heard from them, and what he had said, was, however, represented in such a manner that he might seem to have had the advantage in the debate. In presence of the Rhodians, the ambassadors added, that, they were confident of a continuation of peace, for it was by the advice of Martius and Attilius that they were sent to Rome. But if the Romans should commence their hostilities, contrary to treaty, it would then be the business of the Rhodians to labor, with all their power and all their interest, for the re-establishment of peace. And that, if they should effect nothing by their mediation, they ought then to take such measures as would prevent the dominion of the whole world from coming into the hands of one nation only. That, as this was a matter of general concern, so it was peculiarly interesting to the Rhodians, as they surpassed the other states in dignity and power, which must be held on terms of servility and dependence. If there were no other resource for redress than the Romans. Both the letter and the discourse of the ambassadors were received by the Rhodians with every appearance of kindness, but by no means exerted any influence in working a change in their minds. For by this time the best judging party had the superior influence. By a public order this answer was given, that, the Rhodians wished for peace. But, if war should take place, they hoped that the king would not expect or require from them anything that might break off their ancient friendship with the Romans. The fruit of many and great services performed on their part both in war and peace. The Macedonians, on their way home from Rhodes, visited also the states of Boeotia. Thebes, Coronea, and Haliartus. For it was thought that the measure of abandoning the alliance with the king, and joining the Romans, was extorted from them against their will. The Thebans were not influenced by his representations, though they were somewhat displeased with the Romans, on account of the sentence passed on their nobles, and the restoration of the exiles. But the Coroneans and Haliartians, out of a kind of natural attachment to kings, sent ambassadors to Macedon, requesting the aid of a body of troops to defend them against the insolent tyranny of the Thebans. To this application the king answered, that, on account of the truce concluded with the Romans, it was not in his power to send troops. But he recommended to them, to guard themselves against ill-treatment from the Thebans, as far as they were able, without affording the Romans a pretext for venting their resentment on him. 47. When Martius and Attilius returned to Rome, they reported in the capital the result of their embassy, in such a manner that they assumed no greater merit for any one matter, than for having overreached the king by the suspension of arms. And the hope of peace given him. For, he was so fully provided, they said, with every requisite for the immediate commencement of war, while on their side no one thing was in readiness. That all the convenient posts might have been preoccupied by him before an army could be transported into Greece. But, by gaining so much time by the truce, the Romans would begin the war better provided with everything, whereas he would come into the field in no respect better prepared. They mentioned, also, that, they had so effectually disunited by stratagem the members of the Boeotian Council, that they could never again, with any degree of unanimity, connect themselves with the Macedonians. A great part of the Senate approved of these proceedings, as conducted with consummate wisdom. But the older members, and those who retained the ancient simplicity of manners, declared, that, in the conduct of that embassy, they could discover nothing of the Roman genius. Their ancestors waged were not by stratagems and attacks in the night, nor by counterfeiting flight and returning unexpectedly on an unguarded foe, nor in such a manner as to glory in cunning more than in real valor. That they were accustomed to proclaim war before they waged it, that they sometimes appointed the day of battle and marked out the ground on which they were to fight. That with the same honorable feeling information was given to King Pyrrhus of his physician plotting against his life, 
and, from the same motive, they delivered bound, to the Felicians, the betrayer of their children. These were the acts of the Roman law, not resulting from the craft of Carthaginians or the subtlety of Greeks, among whom it is reckoned more glorious to deceive an enemy than to overcome him by force. Sometimes greater present advantages may be acquired by artifice than by bravery. But an adversary's spirit is finally subdued for ever, when the confession has been extorted from him, that he was vanquished, not by artifice, nor by chance, but in a just and open war, in a fair trial of strength hand to hand. Such were the sentiments of the elder members, to whom this modern kind of wisdom was displeasing. But that part of the Senate who paid more regard to utility than to honor, prevailed, and passed a vote approving of Martius' conduct in his former embassy. At the same time ordering that he should be sent again into Greece with some ships, and with authority to act in other matters as he should judge most conducive to the public good. They also sent Aulus Attilius to keep possession of Larissa in Thessaly, fearing lest, on the expiration of the armistice, Perseus might send troops and secure to himself that metropolis. For the execution of this, Attilius was ordered to receive from Gnaeus Sicinius two thousand infantry. And three hundred soldiers of the Italian race were given to Publius Lentulus, who had returned from Achaia, that he should fix his quarters at Thebes, in order that Boeotia might be kept in obedience. 48. After these preparations were made, the Senate, notwithstanding their determination for war was fixed, yet judged it proper to give audience to the king's ambassadors. Their discourse was, principally, a repetition of what had been urged by Perseus in the conference. The accusation of laying the ambush against Eumenes was defended with the greatest care, and yet with the least success, for the thing was manifest. The rest consisted of apologies, but their hearers were not in a temper to be either convinced or persuaded. Orders were given them to quit the city of Rome instantly, and Italy within thirty days. Then orders were given to Publius Licinius, the consul, to whose lot the province of Macedon had fallen, to appoint as early as possible the day for assembling the army. Caius Lucretius, the praetor, whose province was the fleet, sailed from the city with forty quinquiremes, for it was judged proper that some of the vessels that were repaired should be kept at Rome for other exigencies. The praetor sent forward his brother, Marcus Lucretius, with one quinquireme, ordering him to collect from the allies the ships due by treaty, and to join the fleet at Cephalonia. He received from the regions one trireme, from the Locrians two, and from the Eurites four, and then, coasting along the shore of Italy, until he passed the farthest promontory of Calabria, in the Ionian Sea, he shaped his course over to Dyrrhachium. Finding there ten barks belonging to the Dyrrhachians, twelve belonging to the Aeseans, and fifty-four to King Gentius, affecting to understand that they had been brought thither for the use of the Romans, he carried them all off. And sailed in three days to Corsera, and thence directly to Cephalonia. The praetor Caius Lucretius set sail from Naples, and, passing the strait, arrived on the fifth day at Cephalonia. There the fleet halted, waiting until the land forces should be carried over, and until the transport vessels, which had been separated from the fleet and scattered over the sea, might rejoin it. 49. About this time the consul Publius Licinius, after offering vows in the capital, marched out of the city in his military robes. This ceremony is always conducted with great dignity and solemnity. On this occasion particularly, it engaged people's eyes and thoughts in an unusual degree, and this, by reason that they escorted the consul against an enemy formidable and conspicuous both for abilities and resources. For not only their desire to pay him the customary respect, but an earnest wish to behold the show, and see the commander, to whose wisdom and conduct they entrusted the maintenance of the public safety, brought them together. Then such reflections as these entered their minds, how various were the chances of war, how uncertain the issue of the contest, how variable the success of arms, how frequent the vicissitudes of losses and successes. What disasters often happen through the unskillfulness and rashness of commanders, and on the contrary, what advantages their judgment and valor conferred. What human being could yet know either the capacity or the fortune of the consul whom they were sending against the enemy? 
whether they were shortly to see him at the head of a victorious army ascending the capital in triumph, to revisit the same gods from whom he now took his departure, or whether they were to give a like cause of exultation to their enemies. Then King Perseus, against whom he was going, had a high reputation, derived from the great martial character of the Macedonian nation, and from his father Philip, who, besides many prosperous achievements, had gained a large share of renown even in his war with the Romans. Besides too, the name of Perseus himself, which had never ceased, since his accession to the throne, to be the subject of conversation, owing to the expectation of the war. Two military tribunes, of consular rank, Caius Claudius and Quintus Mucius, were sent with him, and three illustrious young men, Publius Lentulus, and two of the name of Manlius Asidinus, one the son of Marcus Manlius, the other of Lucius. With these he went to Brundusium to the army, and sailing over thence with all his forces, pitched his camp at Nymphium, in the territory of Apollonia. 50. A few days before this, Perseus, after the ambassadors returned from Rome, and cut off every hope of peace, held a council, in which a contest was carried on for some time between different opinions. Some were of opinion that he ought to pay a tribute, or even to cede a part of his dominions, if they should deprive him of that. In short, that he ought not to refuse, for the sake of peace, whatever must be submitted to, nor act in such a manner as would expose himself and his kingdom to such a perilous hazard. For, if he retained undisputed possession of the throne, time and the revolution of affairs might produce many conjunctures, which would enable him not only to recover his losses, but to become formidable to those whom he now had reason to dread. A considerable majority, however, expressed sentiments of a bolder nature. They insisted that the cession of any part would be followed by that of the whole kingdom. The Romans were in want of neither money nor territory, but they considered that all human affairs, even kingdoms and empires are subject to many casualties. They had themselves broken the power of the Carthaginians, and settled in the neighborhood a very powerful king, as a yoke on their necks, and had removed Antiochus and his future successors beyond the mountains of Taurus. There now remained only the kingdom of Macedonia near in situation, and such as might, if any where the fortune of Rome should waver, inspire its kings with the spirit of their forefathers. Perseus therefore ought, while his affairs were yet in a state of safety, to consider well in his own mind, whether he should prefer to give up one part of his dominions after another, until at length, stripped of all power and exiled from his kingdom, he should be reduced to beg from the Romans either Samothracia or some other island, where he might grow old in poverty and contempt. Or, on the other hand, armed in vindication of his fortune and his honour, as is the part of a brave man, either should endure with patience whatever misfortune the chance of war might bring upon him. Or by victory deliver the world from the tyranny of Rome. There would be nothing more wonderful in the Romans being driven out of Greece, than in Hannibal's being driven out of Italy. Nor, in truth, did they see how it could consist with the character of the prince, to resist with the utmost vigour his brother, who unjustly aspired to the crown, and, after he had fairly obtained it himself, surrender it up to foreigners. Lastly, that war had its vindication as well as peace, so that nothing was accounted more shameful than to yield up a dominion without a struggle. And nothing more glorious than for a prince to have experienced every kind of fortune in the defence of his crown and dignity. 51. The council was held at Pella, in the old palace of the Macedonian kings. Let us then, Perseus said, with the help of the gods, wage war, since that is your opinion. And, dispatching letters to all the commanders of the troops, he concentrated his entire force at Sidium, a town of Macedon. He himself, after making a royal offering of one hundred victims, which he sacrificed to Minerva, called Alcidemos, set out for Sidium, attended by a band of nobles and guards. All the forces, both of the Macedonians and foreign auxiliaries, had already assembled in that place. He encamped them before the city, and drew them all up, under arms, in order of battle, in a plain. The amount of the whole was forty-three thousand armed men, of whom about one half composed the phalanx, and were commanded by Hippias of Beroia. There were then two thousand selected for their superior strength, and the vigour of their age, out of the whole number of their shield-bearers, 
this legion they called, in their own language, Ajima. And the command of them was given to Leonidas and Thrasippus of Euleia. Antiphilus of Edessa commanded the rest of the shield-bearers, about three thousand men. Peonians, and men from Peroria and Parstramonia, places subject to Thrace, with Agrians, and a mixture of some native Thracians, made up the number of about three thousand men. Didus, the Paeonian, the murderer of young Demetrius, had armed and embodied these. There were two thousand Gallic soldiers, under the command of Asclepiodotus. Three thousand independent Thracians, from Heraclea, in the country of the Scythians, had a general of their own. An equal number nearly of Cretans followed their own general, Susus of Thalassarna, and Silas of Knossus. Leonidas, a Lacedaemonian, commanded a body of five hundred Greeks, of various descriptions, this man was said to be of the royal blood, and had been condemned to exile in a full council of the Achaeans on account of a letter to Perseus which was intercepted. Lyco, an Achaean, was the commander of the Aetolians and Boeotians, who did not make up more than the number of five hundred men. These auxiliaries, composed of so many states and so many nations, made up about twelve thousand fighting men. Of cavalry, he had collected from all parts of Macedon, three thousand, and Codes, son of Sutha, king of the Odrysian nation, was arrived with one thousand chosen horsemen, and nearly the same number of foot. The total number was thirty-nine thousand foot, and four thousand horse. Most certainly, since the army which Alexander the Great led into Asia, no king of Macedonia had ever been at the head of so powerful a force. 52. It was now twenty-six years since peace had been granted to the suit of Philip. And Macedon, having through all that period enjoyed quiet, was become exceedingly populous, and very many were now grown up and become qualified for the duties of the field. And owing to the unimportant wars with the neighboring states of Thrace, which had given them exercise rather than fatigue, were in continual practice of military service. Besides, a war with Rome having been long meditated by, first, Philip, and afterwards by Perseus, had effected that all things should be arranged and prepared. The troops performed some few movements, but not the regular course of exercise, only that they might not seem to have stood motionless under arms. He then called them, armed as they were, to an assembly. He himself stood on his tribunal, with his two sons, one on each side of him, the elder of whom, Philip, was by birth his brother, his son by adoption, the younger, named Alexander, was his son by birth. The king exhorted his troops to a vigorous prosecution of the war. He enumerated the injuries offered by the Romans to Philip and himself. Told them, that, his father, having been compelled, by every kind of indignity, to resolve on a renewal of hostilities, was, in the midst of his preparations for war. Arrested by fate, that ambassadors were sent by himself at the same time that soldiers were sent to seize the cities of Greece that then, under the pretext of re-establishing peace, they spun out the winter, by means of a fallacious conference. In order to gain time to make their preparations. That their consul was now coming, with two Roman legions, containing each six thousand foot and three hundred horse, and nearly the same number of auxiliaries. And that, should they even be joined by the troops of Eumenes and Massinissa, yet these could not amount to more than seven thousand foot and two thousand horse. He desired them, after hearing the number of the enemy's forces, to reflect on their own army, how far it excelled both in number and in the qualifications of the men, a body of raw recruits, enlisted hastily for the present occasion. Whereas they themselves had from childhood been instructed in the military art, and had been disciplined and inured to toil in a course of many wars. The auxiliaries of the Romans were Lydians, Phrygians, and Numidians. While his were Thracians and Gauls, the bravest nations in the world. Their troops had such arms as each needy soldier procured for himself. But those of the Macedonians were furnished out of the royal stores, and had been made with much care at the expense of his father, in a course of many years. They must bring their provisions not only from a great distance, but expose them to all the hazards of the sea, while he, besides his revenue from the mines, had laid up a store, both of money and food, sufficient for the consumption of ten years. The Macedonians possessed in abundance every advantage, in point of preparation, 
that depended on the kindness of the gods, or the care of their sovereign, they ought therefore to have the same daring spirit which their fathers had before them. Who, after subduing all Europe, passed over into Asia, and opened by their arms a world unknown to fame, and never ceased to conquer until they were stopped by the Red Sea, and when nothing remained for them to subdue. But in truth fortune has determined the present struggle to be carried on, not for the far remote regions of India, but for the possession of Macedon itself. When the Romans made war on his father, they held out the specious pretense of liberating Greece. Now, they avowedly aimed at reducing Macedon to slavery, that there might be no king in the neighborhood of the Roman Empire, and that no nation, renowned in war, should have the possession of arms. For these must be delivered up to their imperious masters, together with the king and kingdom, if they chose to decline a war, and obey their orders. 53. Notwithstanding that, during the course of his speech, he was frequently interrupted by the exclamations of the multitude. Then truly such shouts arose from the army, expressing indignation and menaces against the foe, and urging him to act with spirit, that he put an end to his discourse. He only ordered them to be ready to march. Because it was reported that the Romans were quitting their camp at Nymphium. And then, dismissing the assembly, he went to give audience to deputies from the several states of Macedon, who were come to offer money and corn, in proportion to the abilities of each. He gave thanks to all, but declined their proffers. Telling them that the royal stores were sufficient to answer every purpose. Carriages only were demanded for the conveyance of the engines, and the vast quantity of missile weapons that was prepared, with other military implements. He then put his army in motion, directing his route to Yordia, and after encamping at the Lake Beggarites, advanced, next day, into Elimea, to the river Haliakman. Then passing the mountains through a narrow defile called Cambunii, he marched against the inhabitants of the district called Tripolis, consisting of Azores, Pythios, and Delish. These three towns hesitated, for a little time, because they had given hostages to the Laracians, however being overcome by the fear of immediate danger, they capitulated. He received them with expressions of favor, not doubting that the Parabibians would be induced to follow their example. And accordingly, on his first arrival he got possession of their city, without any reluctance being shown on the part of the inhabitants. He was obliged to use force against Cyrishii, and was even repulsed the first day by bodies of armed men, who defended the gates with great bravery. But on the day following, having assaulted the place with all his forces, he received their surrender before night. 54. Mylas, the next town, was so strongly fortified, that the inhabitants, from the hopes of their works being impregnable, had conceived too great a degree of confidence. Not content with shutting their gates against the king, they cast insulting reproaches on himself and on the Macedonians, which behavior, while it provoked the enemy to attack them with greater rancor, kindled a greater ardor in themselves to make a vigorous defense, as they had now no hopes of pardon. During three days, therefore, the town was attacked and defended with great spirit. The great number of Macedonians made it easy for them to relieve each other, and to support the fight by turns. Not only wounds, but want of sleep and continual labor, were wearing out the besieged, who guarded the walls by day and night. On the fourth day, when the scaling ladders were raised on all sides, and one of the gates was attacked with unusual force, the townsmen, who were beaten off the walls, ran together to secure the gate, and made a sudden sally. Since this was the effect rather of inconsiderate rage than of a well-grounded confidence in their strength, they being few in number, and worn down with fatigue, were routed by men who were fresh. And having turned their backs, and fled through the open gate, they allowed the enemy to enter through it. The city was thus taken, and plundered, and even the persons of free condition who survived the carnage were sold. The king, after dismantling and reducing to ashes the greater part of the town, removed, and encamped at Phalana, and next day arrived at Jerton. But understanding that Titus Minucius Rufus, and Hippias, the praetor of the Thessalians, had gone into the town with a body of troops, he passed by, without even attempting a siege, and received the submission of Alatia and Ghani, whose inhabitants were dismayed by his unexpected arrival. Both these towns, particularly Ghani, 
stand at the entrance of the pass which leads to Tempe, he therefore left the latter under a strong guard of horse and foot, and fortified it, besides, with a triple trench and rampart. Advancing to Securium, he determined to wait there the approach of the Romans. At the same time he ordered his troops to collect corn from all parts of the country subject to the enemy, for Securium stands at the foot of Mount Ossa, the southern side of which overlooks the plains of Thessaly. And the opposite side Macedonia and Magnesia. Besides these advantages of situation, the place enjoys a most healthful air, and a never-failing supply of water, from the numerous springs which lay around. 55. About the same time the Roman consul, marching towards Thessaly, at first found the roads of Epirus clear and open. But afterwards, when he proceeded into Athamania, where the country is rugged, and almost impassable, with great labour and by short marches he with difficulty reached Gomphi. If, while he was leading his raw troops through such a territory, and while both his men and horses were debilitated by constant toil, the king had attacked him with his army in proper order, and at an advantageous place and time. The Romans themselves do not deny that they must have suffered very great loss in an engagement. When they arrived at Gomphi, without opposition, great contempt of the enemy was added to their joy at having effected their passage through such a dangerous road, since they showed such utter ignorance of their own advantages. The consul, after duly offering sacrifice, and distributing corn to the troops, halted a few days, to give rest to the men and horses. And then, hearing that the Macedonians were overrunning Thessaly, and wasting the country of the allies, he led on to Larissa his troops, now sufficiently refreshed. Proceeding thence, when he came within about three miles of Tripolis, they call the place Skia, he encamped on the river Peneus. In the meantime, Eumenes arrived by sea at Chalcis, accompanied by his brothers Attalus and Athenius, bringing with him two thousand foot, the command of whom he gave to the latter, having left his other brother, Philidorus, at Pergamus to manage the business of his kingdom. From thence, with Attalus and four thousand foot and one thousand horse, he came and joined the consul, two thousand foot were left at Chalcis. Of which Athenius had the command, whither also arrived parties of auxiliaries from every one of the states of Greece. But most of them so small that their numbers have not been transmitted to us. The Apollonians sent three hundred horse and one hundred foot. Of the Aetolians came a number equal to one cohort, being the entire cavalry of the nation. And of the Thessalians, all their cavalry acted separately, not more than three hundred horsemen were in the Roman camp. The Achaeans furnished one thousand young men, armed mostly in the Cretan manner. 56. In the meantime, Caius Lucretius, the praetor and naval commander at Cephalenia, having ordered his brother, Marcus Lucretius, to conduct the fleet along the coast of Malia to Chalcis, went himself on board a trireme. And sailed to the Corinthian Gulf, that he might as early as possible put the affairs of Boeotia on a proper footing. But the voyage proved tedious to him, particularly from the weak state of his health. Marcus Lucretius, on his arrival at Chalcis, when he heard that Haliardus was besieged by Publius Lentulus, sent a messenger to him, with an order, in the praetor's name, to retire from the place. The lieutenant general, who had undertaken this enterprise with Boeotian troops, raised out of the party that sided with the Romans, retired from the walls. But the raising of this siege only made room for a new one, for Marcus Lucretius immediately invested Haliardus with troops from on board the fleet, amounting to ten thousand effective men. And who were joined by two thousand of the forces of King Eumenes, who were under Athenius. Just when they were preparing for an assault, the praetor came up from Creusa. At the same time, ships sent by the allies arrived at Chalcis, two Carthaginian quinquiremes, two triremes from Heraclea in Pontus, four from Chalcedon, a like number from Samos, and also five quinquiremes from Rhodes. The praetor sent back these to the allies, because there was nowhere a naval war. Quintus Martius also came to Chalcis with his ships, having taken a lope, and laid siege to Larissa, called likewise Cremast. While such was the state of affairs in Boeotia, Perseus, when, as has been mentioned, he lay encamped at Securium, after collecting the corn from all the adjacent parts, sent a detachment to ravage the lands of the Phereans. 
hoping that the Romans might be drawn away from their camp to succor the cities of their allies, and then be caught at a disadvantage. And when he saw that they were not put in motion by this disorderly expedition, he distributed all the booty, consisting mostly of cattle of all kinds, among the soldiers, that they might feast themselves with plenty. The prisoners he kept. 57. Both the consul and the king held councils nearly at the same time, to determine in what manner they should begin their operations. The king assumed fresh confidence, from the enemy having allowed him, without interruption, to ravage the country of the Phoreans, and in consequence, resolved to advance directly to their camp, and give them no further time for delay. On the other side, the Romans were convinced that their inactivity had created a mean opinion of them in the minds of their allies, who were exceedingly offended that aid was not borne to the Phoreans. While they were deliberating how they should act, Eumenes and Attalus were present in the council, a messenger in a violent hurry acquainted them that the enemy were approaching in a great body. On this the council was dismissed, and an order to take arms instantly issued. It was also resolved, that in the meantime a party of Eumenes troops, consisting of one hundred horse, and an equal number of javelin bearers on foot, should go out to observe the enemy. Perseus, about the fourth hour of the day, being nearly one thousand paces from the Roman camp, ordered the body of his infantry to halt and advanced himself in front, with the cavalry in light infantry. Accompanied by Codes and the other generals of the auxiliaries. They were less than five hundred paces distant, when they described the Roman horse, which consisted of two cohorts, mostly Gauls, commanded by Cassignatus, and attended by about one hundred and fifty light infantry, Mysians and Cretans. The king halted, as he knew not the force of the enemy. He then sent forward two troops of Thracians, and two of Macedonians, with two cohorts of Cretans and Thracians. The fight, as the parties were equal in number, and no reinforcements were sent upon either side, ended without any decided advantage. About thirty of Eumenes' men were killed, among whom fell Cassignatus, general of the Gauls. Perseus then led back his forces to Securium, and the next day, about the same hour, brought up his army to the same ground, and a number of wagons carrying water followed him. For the road for twelve miles had no water, and was very full of dust, and it was apparent that if they came to an engagement on the first view of the enemy, they would be greatly distressed in the fight by thirst. When the Romans remained quiet, and even called in the advance guards within the rampart, the king's troops returned to their camp. In this manner they acted for several days, still hoping that the Roman cavalry might attack their rear on their retreat, which would bring on a battle. Considering, likewise, that when they had once enticed the Romans to some distance from their camp, they could, being superior in both cavalry and light infantry, easily, and in any spot, face about upon them. 58. After this design did not succeed, the king moved his camp nearer the enemy, and fortified it at the distance of five miles from the Romans. From it at the dawn of the next day, having drawn up his line of infantry on the same ground as before, he led up the whole cavalry and light infantry to the enemy's camp. The sight of the dust rising in great abundance and nearer than usual, caused a great alarm in the Roman camp. And at first they scarcely believed the person announcing the circumstance, because during all the preceding days the Macedonians had never appeared before the fourth hour, and it was now only sunrise. Afterwards, when their doubts were removed, by the shouting of great numbers, and the men running off from the gates, great confusion ensued. The tribunes, prefects, and centurions hastened to the general's quarters, and their soldiers to their several tents. Perseus formed his troops within less than five hundred paces of the rampart, round a hill, called Callinicus. King Codes, at the head of his countrymen, had the command of the left wing, the light infantry were placed between the ranks of the cavalry and separated them. On the right wing were the Macedonian horse, with whose troops the Cretans were intermixed. Milo, of Beroia, had the command of these last, Mino, of Antigone, that of the cavalry, and the chief direction of the whole division. Next to the wings were posted the royal horsemen, and a mixed kind of troops selected out of the auxiliary corps of many nations, the commanders here were Patricles of Antigone, and Didus the governor of Paeonia. In the center was the king. And on each side of him the band called Ajima, 
with the consecrated squadrons of horse, in his front the slingers and javelin bearers, each body amounting to four hundred. The command of these he gave to Ion of Thessalonus, and Timoner, a Delopian. The king's troops were posted in this manner. On the other side, the consul, drawing up his infantry in a line within the trenches, sent out likewise all his cavalry in light infantry, which were marshalled on the outside of the rampart. Caius Licinius Crassus, the consul's brother, had the command of the right wing, which consisted of all the Italian cavalry, with light infantry intermixed. On the left wing, Marcus Valerius Lavinus commanded the cavalry of the Allies, being sent by the states of Greece, and the light infantry of the same nation, Quintus Mucius, with a chosen body of cavalry, levied on the emergency, led the centre. In the front of this body were placed two hundred Gallic horsemen, and of the auxiliaries of Eumenes, three hundred Sertians. Four hundred Thessalian horse were posted at a little distance, beyond the left wing. King Eumenes and Attalus, with their whole division, stood on the rear, between the rear rank and the rampart. 59. Formed in this manner, and nearly equal in numbers of cavalry and light infantry, the two armies encountered. The fight being begun by the slingers and javelin bearers, who preceded the lines. First of all the Thracians, just like wild beasts which had been long pent up, rushing on with a hideous yell, fell upon the Italian cavalry in the right wing with such fury, that even those men who were fortified against fear, both by experience in war and by their natural courage, were thrown into disorder. The footmen struck their spears with their swords, sometimes cut the hams of their horse, and sometimes stabbed them in the flanks. Perseus, making a charge on the center, at the first onset routed the Greeks. When the enemy pressed hard on their rear, the Thessalian cavalry, who had been posted in reserve at a little distance from the left wing, clear of the shock, at first mere spectators of the fight, afterwards. When affairs took this unfortunate turn, were of the utmost service to the Greeks. For they retreating leisurely, and keeping their ranks, after they joined the auxiliary troops under Eumenes, in concert with him afforded a safe retreat between their ranks to the confederates, who fled in disorder. And as the enemy did not follow in close bodies, they even had the courage to advance, and by that means saved many of the flying soldiers who made towards them. Nor did the king's troops, who in the ardor of the pursuit had fallen into confusion, dare to encounter men regularly formed, and marching with a steady pace. When the king, victorious in the cavalry action, shouted out that the war was finished, if they would aid him by even slight exertions, the phalanx came up seasonably while he was encouraging his troops. For Hippias and Leonidas, as soon as they heard of the victory gained by the horse, without waiting for orders, advanced with all haste, that they might be at hand to second any spirited design. While the king, struck with the great importance of the attempt, hesitated between hope and fear, Evander, the Cretan, who had been employed by him to waylay King Eumenes at Delphi, after he saw the body of infantry advancing round their standards, ran up, and warmly recommended, to him, not to suffer himself to be so far elated by success, as rashly to risk his all on a precarious chance, when there was no necessity for it. If he would content himself with the advantage already obtained, and proceed no farther that day, he would have it in his power to make an honorable peace. Or if he chose to continue the war, he would be joined by abundance of allies, who would readily follow fortune. The king's own judgment rather inclined to this plan. Wherefore, after commending Evander, he ordered the standards to be borne back, and the infantry to return to their camp, and the trumpeters to sound the signal for retreat to the cavalry. On the side of the Romans there were slain that day two hundred horsemen, and not less than two thousand footmen, about two hundred horsemen were made prisoners, but of the kings, only twenty horsemen and forty footmen were killed. 60. When the victors returned to their camp, all were full of joy, but the insolent transports of the Thracians were particularly remarkable, for on their way back they chanted songs, and carried the heads of the enemy fixed on spears. Among the Romans there was not only grief arising from their ill success, but dread lest the enemy should immediately attack their camp. Eumenes advised the consul to take post on the other side of the Peneus, that he might have the river as a defense, until the dismayed troops should recover their spirits. 
the consul was deeply struck with the shame of an acknowledgment of fear. Yet he yielded to reason, and leading over his troops in the dead of the night, fortified a camp on the farther bank. Next day the king advanced with the intention of provoking the enemy to battle. And on seeing their camp pitched in safety on the other side of the river, admitted that he had been guilty of error in not pushing the victory the day before, and of a still greater fault, in lying idle during the night. For by sending his light-armed troops, without calling out any of his other soldiers, the army of the enemy might in a great measure be destroyed, during their confusion in the passage of the river. The Romans were delivered, indeed, from any immediate fears, as they had their camp in a place of safety, but, among many other afflicting circumstances, their loss of reputation affected them most. In a council held in presence of the consul, every one concurred in throwing the blame on the Aetolians, insisting that the panic and flight took place first among them. And that then the other allied troops of the Grecian states followed their cowardly example. Five chiefs of the Aetolians, who were said to be the first persons that turned their backs, were sent to Rome. 61. The Thessalians were publicly commended in a general assembly, and their commanders even received presents for their good behavior. The spoils of the enemies who fell in the engagement were brought to the king, out of which he made presents, to some, of remarkable armor, to some, of horses, and to others he gave prisoners. There were above 1,500 shields. The coats of mail and breastplates amounted to more than 1,000, and the number of helmets, swords, and missile weapons of all sorts was much greater. These spoils, ample in themselves, were much magnified in a speech which the king made to an assembly of the troops, he said, You have given the prestige of victory to the issue of the war, you have routed the best part of the enemy's force. The Roman cavalry, which they used to boast of as invincible. For, with them, the cavalry is the flower of their youth, the cavalry is the nursery of their senate, out of them they choose the members of that body, who afterwards are made their consuls, out of them they elect their commanders. The spoils of these we have just now divided among you. Nor have you a less evident victory over their legions of infantry, who, stealing away in the night through fear of you, filled the river with all the disorderly confusion of people shipwrecked, swimming here and there. But it will be easier for us to pass the Peneus in pursuit of the vanquished, than it was for them in the hurry of their flight. And, immediately on our passing, we will assault their camp, which we should have taken this morning if they had not run away. Or if they should choose to meet us in the field, anticipate the same result in an infantry action, as took place yesterday when the cavalry were engaged. Those troops who had gained the victory, while they bore on their shoulders the spoils of the enemies whom they had killed, were highly animated at hearing their own exploits, and, from what had passed, conceived sanguine hopes of the future. While the infantry, especially those of the Macedonian phalanx, were inflamed with emulation of the glory acquired by the others, wishing impatiently for an opportunity to display their exertions in the king's service, and to acquire equal glory from the defeat of the enemy. The king then dismissed the assembly, and next day, marching thence, pitched his camp at Mopsius, a hill situate halfway between Tempe and Larissa. 62. The Romans, without quitting the bank of the Peneus, removed their camp to a place of greater safety. Thither came Misogenes, the Numidian, with one thousand horse, and a like number of foot, besides twenty-two elephants. The king soon after held a council on the general plan to be pursued. And as the presumption inspired by the late success had by this time subsided, some of his friends ventured to advise him to employ his good fortune as the means of obtaining an honorable peace. Rather than to let himself be so far transported with vain hopes, as to expose himself to the hazard of an irretrievable misfortune. They observed, that, to use moderation in prosperity, and not to confide too much in the calm of present circumstances, was the part of a man of prudence, who deserved success. And they recommended it to him to send to the consul, to renew the treaty, on the same terms which his father had received from Titus Quintius, his conqueror. For the war could never be terminated in a more glorious manner than by such a memorable battle, nor could a surer hope of a lasting peace ever occur, than that afforded by existing circumstances, as they were likely to make the Romans. Dispirited by their defeat, more willing to come to terms. But should they, 
with their native obstinacy, spurn reasonable conditions, then gods and men would bear witness both to the moderation of Perseus, and to the stubborn pride of the others. The king's inclination was never averse to such measures. Therefore this opinion received the approbation of the majority. The ambassadors sent to the consul had audience in a full council, summoned for the purpose. They requested that a peace might be concluded. Promising that Perseus should pay the Romans the same tribute which Philip had engaged to pay, and should evacuate the same cities, lands, and places, which Philip had evacuated. Such were the proposals of the ambassadors. When they withdrew, and the council deliberated concerning them, the Roman firmness prevailed in their determination. So completely was it the practice of that time, to assume in adversity the countenance of prosperity, and in prosperity to moderate the temper. They resolved to give this answer, that peace should be granted on this condition only. That the king should give to the senate an entirely unconditional right, of deciding concerning him and all Macedon. When the ambassadors brought back this answer, such as were unacquainted with their usual mode of acting, were astonished at the obstinate perseverance of the Romans, and most people advised the king to make no further mention of peace. For, the enemy would soon come to solicit that which they now disdained when offered. Perseus feared this haughtiness, since it proceeded from a confidence in their strength, and increasing the sum of money, with the hope of purchasing peace by treasure, did not cease to solicit the mind of the consul. After the consul made no change in the answer which he had first given, Perseus, having despaired of peace, returned to Securium, from which he had set out with the intention of trying again the fortune of war. 63. The news of this cavalry action spread through Greece, produced a discovery of the wishes of the people. For not only those who professed an attachment to the Macedonians, but the generality, who were bound to the Romans under the weightiest obligations, and some who had even felt the power and haughty behavior of the Macedonians, received the account with joy. And that for no other cause, than out of an evil passion which the mob displays, even in contests of sports, of favoring the worse and weaker party. Meanwhile, in Boeotia, the praetor, Lucretius, pushed the siege of Haliartus with all imaginable vigor. And although the besieged had no foreign aid, except some young Coronians, who had come into the town at the beginning of the siege, and were without hope of relief, yet they maintained the defense with courage beyond their strength. For they made frequent eruptions against the works, and when the ram was applied, they crushed it to the ground, by dropping on it a mass of lead. And whenever those who worked the engine avoided the blow by changing its position, the besieged by working in masses, and collecting stones out of the rubbish, quickly erected a new wall in the room of that which had been demolished. The praetor, when the progress by machines was too slow, ordered scaling ladders to be distributed among the companies, resolving to make a general assault on the walls. He thought the number of his men sufficient for this, and the more so because on one side of the city, which is bounded by a morass, it would neither be useful nor practicable to form an attack. Lucretius himself led two thousand chosen men to a place where two towers, and the wall between them, had been thrown down. Hoping that, while he endeavored to climb over the ruins, and the townsmen crowded thither to oppose him, the walls, being left defenseless, in some part or other might be taken by escalade. The besieged were not remiss in preparing to repel his assault. For, on the ground, overspread with the rubbish, they placed faggots of dry bushes, and standing with burning torches in their hands, they often threatened to set them on fire, in order that, being covered from the enemy by the smoke and flames, they might have time to throw up a wall in the inside. But a casualty prevented this plan from succeeding, for there fell suddenly such a quantity of rain, as hindered the faggots from being kindled, thus a passage was laid open by drawing the smoking faggots aside. And while all were attending to the defense of one particular spot, the walls were mounted by escalade in many places at once. In the first tumult of storming the town the old men and children, whom chance threw in the way, were put to the sword indiscriminately, while the men who carried arms fled into the citadel. Next day, these, having no remaining hope, surrendered, and were sold by public auction. Their number was about 2,500. The ornaments of the city, consisting of statues and pictures, with all the valuable booty, 
were carried off to the ships, and the city was razed to the ground. The praetor then led his army into Thebes, which fell into his hands without a dispute. When he gave the city in possession to the exiles, and the party that sided with the Romans, and sold, as slaves, the families of those who were of the opposite faction, and favored the king and the Macedonians. After performing these acts in Boeotia, he returned to the sea coast to his fleet. 64. Whilst these events were taking place in Boeotia, Perseus lay a considerable time encamped at Securium. Having learned there that the Romans were busily employed in collecting corn from all the adjacent grounds, and that when it was brought in, they cut off the ears with sickles, each before his own tent, in order that he might thresh it the cleaner. And had by this means formed large heaps of straw in all quarters of the camp, he, supposing that he might set it on fire, ordered torches, faggots, and bundles of tow, dipped in pitch, to be got ready. And thus prepared, he began his march at midnight, that he might make the attack at the first dawn, and without discovery. But his stratagem was frustrated, the advanced guards, who were surprised, alarmed the rest of the troops by the tumult and terror among them, orders were given to take arms with all speed. And the soldiers were instantly drawn up on the rampart and at the gates in readiness to defend the camp. Perseus immediately ordered his army to face about, the baggage to go foremost, and the battalions of foot to follow, while himself, with the cavalry and light infantry, kept behind, in order to cover the rear. For he expected, what indeed happened, that the enemy would pursue and harass his rear. There was a short scuffle between the light infantry, mostly in skirmishing parties. The infantry and cavalry returned to their camp, without any disturbance. After reaping all the corn in that quarter, the Romans removed into the territory of Crano, which was yet untouched. While they were encamped there, deeming themselves secure on account of the distance between the camps, and the difficulty of the march, through a country as destitute of water as was that between Securium and Crano, the king's cavalry and light infantry appeared suddenly, at the dawn of day, on the nearest hills, and caused a violent alarm. They had marched from Securium at noon the preceding day, and had left their infantry at the dawn in the next plain. Perseus stood a short time on the hills, in expectation that the Romans might be induced to come to a cavalry action. But after they did not move, he sent a horseman to order the infantry to return to Securium, and he himself soon followed. The Roman horse pursued at a small distance, in expectation of being able to attack such as might disperse and separate. But seeing them retreat in close order, and attentive to their standards and ranks, they desisted, and returned to their camp. 65. The king, disliking the length of the march, removed his camp from Securium to Mopsalum. And the Romans, having cut down all the corn about Crano, marched into the lands of Philana. When Perseus learned from a deserter that they carried on their reaping there, without any armed guard, straggling at random through the fields, he set out with one thousand horsemen and two thousand Thracians and Cretans. And after marching with all the speed that he possibly could, unexpectedly fell on the Romans. Nearly a thousand carts, with horses harnessed to them, most of them loaded, were seized, and about six hundred men were taken. The charge of guarding this booty, and conducting it to the camp, he gave to a party of three hundred Cretans, and calling in the rest of his infantry and the cavalry who were spread about, killing the enemy, he led them against the nearest station. Thinking that it might be overpowered without much difficulty. Lucius Pompeius, a military tribune, was in command. Who led his men, who were dismayed by the sudden approach of the enemy, to a hill at a little distance, hoping to defend himself by means of the advantage of the ground, as he was inferior in number and strength. There he collected his men in a circular body, that, by closing their shields, they might guard themselves from arrows and javelins. On which Perseus, surrounding the hill with armed men, ordered a party to strive to climb it on all sides, and come to close fighting, and the rest to throw missile weapons against them from a distance. The Romans were environed with dangers, in whatever manner they acted, for they could not fight in a body, on account of the enemy who endeavoured to mount the hill. And, if they broke their ranks in order to skirmish with these, they were exposed to the arrows and javelins. They were galled most severely by the Sestrospendina. A dart, 
two palms in length, was fixed to a shaft, half a cubit long, and of the thickness of a man's finger, round this, which was made of pine, three feathers were tied, as is commonly done with arrows. To throw this they used a sling, which had two beds, unequal in size and in the length of the strings. When the weapon was balanced in these, and the slinger whirled it round by the longer string and discharged it, it flew with the rapid force of a leaden bullet. When one half of the soldiers had been wounded by these and other weapons of all kinds, and the rest were so fatigued that they could hardly bear the weight of their arms, the king pressed them to surrender, assured them of safety, and sometimes promised them rewards. But not one could be prevailed on to yield, and hope now dawned on them determined to die. For when some of the foragers, fleeing back to the camp, had announced to the consul that the party was surrounded. Alarmed for the safety of such a number of his countrymen, for they were near eight hundred, and all Romans, he set out with the cavalry in light infantry, joined by the newly arrived Numidian auxiliaries, horse, foot, and elephants. And ordered the military tribunes, that the battalions of the legions should follow. He himself, having strengthened the light-armed auxiliaries with his own light infantry, hastened forward at their head to the hill. He was accompanied by Eumenes, Attalus, and the Numidian prince, Misogenes. 66. When the standards of the Romans first came in sight of the surrounded troops, their spirits were raised from the depth of despair. Perseus's best plan would have been to have contented himself with his accidental good fortune, in having killed and taken so many of the foragers, and not to have wasted time in attacking this detachment of the enemy. Or, after he had engaged in the attempt, as he was sensible that he had not a proper force with him, to have gone off, while he might, with safety. Instead of which, intoxicated with success, he waited for the arrival of the enemy, and sent messengers in haste to bring up the phalanx, which would have been too late for the emergency. The men must have engaged in all the disorder of a hurried march, against troops duly formed and prepared. The consul, arriving first, proceeded instantly to action. The Macedonians, for some time made resistance. Afterwards, when they were equal to their enemies in no respect, having lost three hundred foot, and twenty-four of the best of their horse, of what they call the sacred cohort, among whom fell Antimachus, who commanded that body. They endeavoured to retreat, but this march back was more disorderly and confused than the battle itself. When the phalanx, being summoned by a hasty order, was marching at full speed, it met first, in a narrow pass, the carts laden with corn, with the mass of prisoners. These they put to the sword, and both parties suffered great annoyance. But none waited till the troops might pass in some sort of order, but the soldiers tumbled the loads down a precipice, which was the only possible way to clear the road, and the horses, when they were goaded, pushed furiously through the crowd. Scarcely had they disentangled themselves from the disorderly throng of the prisoners, when they met the king's party and the discomfited horsemen. And now the shouts of the men, calling to their comrades to go back, raised a consternation not unlike a total rout. Insomuch, that if the enemy had ventured to enter the defile, and carry the pursuit a little farther, they might have done them very great damage. But the consul, when he had relieved his party from the hill, content with that moderate share of success, led back his troops to the camp. There are writers who state that a general engagement took place that day, in which eight thousand of the enemy were killed, among whom were Sopater and Antipater, two of the king's generals, and about two thousand eight hundred taken. With twenty-seven military standards. And that it was not a bloodless victory, for that above four thousand three hundred fell, and five standards of the left wing of the allies were lost. 67. This day revived the spirits of the Romans, and struck Perseus with dismay, to such a degree that, after staying at Mopsalum a few days, chiefly out of anxiety to bury his dead, he left a very strong garrison at Ganus, and led back his army into Macedon. He left Timotheus, one of his generals, with a small party at Philadelphia, ordering him to endeavor to gain the affection of the Magnesians, by his proximity to them. On his arrival at Pella, he sent his troops to their winter quarters, and proceeded with Codes to Thessalonica. 
There an account was received that at Lesbis, a petty prince of Thrace, and Coragus, an officer belonging to Eumenes, had made an inroad into the dominions of Codes, and seized on the district called Marine. Supposing, therefore, that he must send Codes home to defend his own territories, he honoured him at his departure with very magnificent presents, and paid to his cavalry two hundred talents, three twenty-five which was but half a year's pay. Though he had agreed to give them the pay of a whole year. The consul, hearing that Perseus had left the country, marched his army to Ganus, in hopes of being able to take that town, which standing directly opposite to the pass of Tempe, at its entrance, serves as the safest barrier to Macedon. And renders a descent into Thessaly easy. But the city, from the nature of its situation and the strength of the garrison, was impregnable, he therefore gave up the design, and turning his route to Perhebia, having taken Malia at the first assault, he demolished it. And after reducing Tripolis, and the rest of Perhebia, returned to Larissa. From that place he sent home Eumenes and Attalus, and quartered Mysogenes and his Numidians, for the winter, in the nearest towns of Thessaly. One half of his army he distributed through Thessaly, in such a manner that all had commodious winter quarters, and served at the same time as a defense to the cities. He sent Quintus Mucius, lieutenant general, with two thousand men, to secure Ambracia, and dismissed all the allied troops belonging to the Grecian states, except the Achaeans. With the other half of his army he marched into the Achaean Thyotis. Where, finding Telium deserted by the inhabitants, he leveled it to the ground. He received the voluntary surrender of Antron, and he then marched against Larissa, this city was likewise deserted, the whole multitude taking refuge in the citadel, to which he laid siege. First the Macedonians, who constituted the king's garrison, withdrew through fear, and then the townsmen, on being abandoned by them, surrendered immediately. He then hesitated whether he should first attack Demetrius, or take a view of affairs in Boeotia. The Thebans, being harassed by the Coronians, pressed him to go into Boeotia. Wherefore, in compliance with their entreaties, and because that country was better adapted for winter quarters than Magnesia, he led his army thither. Book XLI. Several praetors were condemned because they had conducted themselves with avarice and cruelty in the administration of their provinces. Publius Licinius Crassus, the proconsul, took by storm several cities in Greece, and plundered them with great cruelty. For this reason the captives, who were sold by him, were subsequently, by a decree of the Senate, restored to their respective states. Many tyrannical acts were done to the allies by the admirals of the Roman fleets also. This book contains likewise the successful operations of King Perseus in Thrace, with the conquest of Dardania and Illyricum, Gentius was the king of the latter country. The commotions which arose in Spain through the agency of Olonicus, were quelled by his death. Marcus Aemilius Lepidus was chosen by the censor's prince of the Senate. 1. In the same summer in which the Romans were conquerors in the cavalry action in Thessaly, the lieutenant general, sent by the consul to Illyricum, compelled, by force of arms, two opulent cities to surrender. And gave the inhabitants all their effects, in hopes, by the reputation of his clemency, to allure to submission the inhabitants of Carnus, a city strongly fortified. But after he could neither induce them to surrender, nor take their city by a siege, that his soldiers might not be fatigued by the two sieges without reaping any advantage, he sacked those cities which he had spared before. The other consul, Caius Cassius, performed nothing memorable in Gaul, the province that fell to his lot, but made an ill-judged attempt to lead his army through Illyricum to Macedon. The Senate learned his having undertaken that march from deputies from Aquileia, who complained that their colony, which was new, weak, and but indifferently fortified, lay in the midst of hostile states, Istrians and Illyrians. And begged the Senate to take into consideration some method of strengthening it. These, being asked whether they wished that matter to be given in charge to the consul Caius Cassius, replied, that Cassius, after assembling his forces at Aquileia, had set out on a march through Illyricum into Macedon. The fact was at first deemed incredible, and each individual was under the impression that he had gone on an expedition against the Carnians, or perhaps the Istrians. The Aquilians then said, that all that they knew, or could take upon them to affirm, 
was that corn for thirty days had been given to the soldiers, and that guides, who knew the roads from Italy to Macedon, had been sought for and carried with him. The Senate were highly displeased that the consul should presume to act so improperly as to leave his own province, and remove into that of another. And lead his army by a new and dangerous route through foreign states, and thereby open for so many nations a passage into Italy. Assembled in great numbers, they decreed that the praetor, Caius Sulpicius, should nominate out of the Senate three deputies, who should set out from the city on that very day, make all possible haste to overtake the consul, Cassius. Wherever he might be, and tell him not to engage in a war with any nation, unless that against which the Senate voted that such war should be waged. These deputies left the city, Marcus Cornelius Cephagus, Marcus Fulvius, and Publius Martius Rex. The fears entertained for the consul and his army caused the business of fortifying Aquileia to be postponed for that time. 2. Then were introduced to the Senate ambassadors from the several states of both the Spains. These, after complaining of the avarice and pride of the Roman magistrates, fell on their knees, and implored the Senate not to suffer them, who were their allies, to be more cruelly plundered and ill-treated than their enemies. When they complained of other unworthy treatment, and it was also evident that money had been extorted from them. A charge was then given to Lucius Canulius, the praetor, to whom Spain was allotted, to appoint out of the senatorian order five judges delegate, to try each person from whom the Spaniards might demand back their money. And that they should give the latter power to choose whomsoever they pleased as patrons. The ambassadors being called into the senate house, the decree of the senate was read aloud, and they were ordered to name their protectors. They named four, Marcus Porcius Cato, Publius Cornelius Scipio, son of Gnaeus, Lucius Emilius Paulus, son of Lucius, and Caius Sulpicius Gallus. The judges entered on the business with the case of Marcus Titinius I, who had been praetor in hither Spain, in the consulate of Aulus Manlius and Marcus Junius. The cause was twice adjourned, and on the third hearing the accused was acquitted. A dispute took place between the ambassadors of the two provinces, and the states of hither Spain chose for their patrons Marcus Cato and Scipio, those of farther Spain, Lucius Paulus and Sulpicius Gallus. Publius Furius Philus and Marcus Matinus were brought before the judges, the former by the states of the hither province, and the latter by those of the farther. The former of whom had been praetor, three years before, in the consulate of Spurius Postumius and Quintus Mucius, and the latter, two years before, when Lucius Postumius and Marcus Papilius were consuls. Both, being accused of most heinous crimes, were remanded, but when the cause was about to be pleaded anew, it was represented on their behalf that they had quitted the country as voluntary exiles. Furius had gone to Prenest, Matinus to Tiber, to live in exile. There was a report that the plaintiffs were not suffered, by their patrons, to bring charges against people of high birth and power. And Canulius the praetor increased this suspicion, for having neglected that business, he applied himself to the enlisting of soldiers. Then he suddenly went off to his province, lest more might be accused by the Spaniards. Although past transactions were thus consigned to silence, yet the Senate deliberated for the interest of the Spaniards in future, for they passed an order that the Roman magistrates should not have the valuation of the corn. Nor should they compel the Spaniards to compound for their twentieths at such prices as they pleased, and that officers should not be placed in command of their towns for the purpose of exacting money. 3. There came also from Spain another embassy, from a new race of men. They, representing that they were the offspring of Roman soldiers and Spanish women, to whom the Romans had not been united in wedlock, and that their number amounted to more than four thousand petitioned for a grant of some town to be given them in which they might reside. The Senate decreed, that, they should put their names on a list before Lucius Canulius, and that, if he should judge any of them deserving of freedom, it was their pleasure that they should be settled as a colony at Cartiae, on the ocean. That such of the present inhabitants of Cartiae as wished to remain there, should have the privilege of being considered as colonists, and should have lands assigned them that this should be deemed a Latin settlement, and be called a colony of freedmen. At this time Prince Galussa, son of King Massinissa, arrived from Africa as ambassador from his father. Carthaginian ambassadors also came. 
Gulesa, being first introduced to the Senate, gave a detail of the succors sent by his father to the maintenance of the war in Macedon, and promised, that if they wished to order anything besides, he would execute it in return for the meritorious deeds of the Roman people. And he warned the conscript fathers to be on their guard against the treachery of the Carthaginians. That they had formed the design of fitting out a powerful fleet, in favor, as they pretended, of the Romans, and against the Macedonians. But when it should be equipped and ready for action, they would have it in their power to make their own option which party they would treat as a friend, and which as a foe. Then he pleaded Massinissa's cause concerning the land and towns, which, according to the complaint of the Carthaginians, were wrested from them, by him. And the question was debated with great warmth between the prince and the Carthaginian ambassadors. We have not ascertained what were the arguments brought forward by both parties, or what was the reply given by the Senate. However this contest ceased, and seemed to slumber for several years. It was subsequently renewed, and burst forth into the flames of that war which was undertaken by the Carthaginians against Massinissa, necessarily waged against Rome, and terminated only by the downfall of Carthage. We find, in the annals of this year, that a son was born of a virgin, while she was under the strict guardianship of her parents, and by the order of the soothsayers was conveyed to a desert island. The elections were held by Caius Cassius the consul, in which Aulus Hostilius Mancinus and Aulus Attilius Serenus were appointed consuls. Then Marcus Recius, Quintus Manius, Lucius Flatensius, Quintus Elius Paetus, Titus Manlius Torquatus, and Caius Hostilius, were elected praetors. Italy and Macedon are declared the consular provinces. Italy fell to Attilius, and Macedon to Hostilius. With regard to the praetors, Reus obtained by lot the city jurisdiction, Meni as the foreign. The fleet, together with the sea coast of Greece, fell to Hortensius. The rest of the Praetorian provinces were, without doubt, those of the former year, viz. Spain, Sicily, and Sardinia. But what praetors obtained the command in each cannot be ascertained, in consequence of the silence of the ancient records. In the meantime Publius Licinius, as if he were sent to wage war not against Perseus, but the Greeks, turned the rage of war, so ineffectual against the real enemy, towards wretches who were unable to cope with him. And took by storm and plundered in a most merciless manner several cities in Boeotia, in which he was passing the winter. When the Coronians, who were the most ill used, threw themselves on the protection of the Senate, that august body decreed that the captives who had been sold should be restored to freedom. Lucretius the praetor, who had the command of the fleet, imitated, or rather surpassed, the cruelty and avarice of the consul, he was oppressive to the allies, despicable in the sight of the enemy. Since Perseus, by a sudden attack on the fleet stationed at Orium, took twenty transports laden with corn, sunk the rest of them, and even made himself master of four galleys of five banks of oars. Matters were successfully managed by Perseus in Thrace also where he made a diversion in that country in favor of Codes against the forces of Atlespis and Caragus. Nor truly was Codes false to his own interests, as he was a man indefatigable in war, and preeminent in council, a Thracian by birth alone, not by his habits. For he was singularly sober and temperate, and, besides, quite amiable, owing to his mercy and moderation. The tide of war flowed on in favor of Perseus, for at this time the nation of the Epirotes also passed over to his party, by the advice of Cephalus, who however was induced to revolt more by necessity, than his own free will. He was a man of remarkable prudence and firmness, and even then influenced by the best of feelings. For he had prayed to the immortal gods that war might never break out between the Romans and Perseus, and that they might never come to a decisive struggle. For he had determined, when the war broke out, to aid the Romans according to the written articles of the treaty, but to do nothing further than the conditions of that treaty demanded, and not to be complacent in a servile or disgraceful manner. These plans were confounded by one Charopus, the grandson of that Charopus who opened the pass at the river Arus to Titus Quinctius, in the war against Philip. This Charopus was a worthless flatterer of those in power, and a strange adept at forging calumnies against men of the best character. He was educated at Rome, 
having been sent there by his grandfather, in order that he might learn thoroughly the Roman language and literature. Owing to this he became acquainted with, and dear to, very many of the Romans. And yet, after his return home, as he was naturally of a fickle and depraved disposition, and besides inspired with confidence, owing to his intimacy with the Roman nobles, he was constantly sneering at the leading men of the state. At first he was despised by all, nor was any regard paid to his allegations. But after the war with Perseus broke out, and suspicions were rife throughout Greece, as many openly professed their zeal for Perseus, and still more felt it in secret. Charopus never ceased accusing before the Romans those who were invested with authority among the Epirotes. The intimate connection that Cephalus, and the others who adopted that line of politics, had formerly with the kings of Macedon, gave a specious appearance and false colouring to his calumnies. Already, in truth, by malignantly prying into all their acts and words, and putting the worst construction on them, and by falsifying the truth by adding and subtracting whatever he chose, he was succeeding in having his accusations believed. Nor however were Cephalus, and, those who had been the associates of his designs in the management of the Republic, moved by these allegations, since they relied on the full consciousness of unsullied fidelity towards the Romans. But when they perceived that the Romans lent an ear to these calumnies, and that some of the Aetolian nobles, whom the calumnies of slanderers had rendered objects of suspicion as well as themselves, were taken away to Rome. Then at length they believed it necessary to provide for the safety of themselves and their property. And they, when no other resource than the king's friendship suggested itself to them, were compelled to form an alliance with Perseus, and give their nation into his hands. Aulus Hostilius and Aulus Attilius, the consuls, having entered on their office at Rome, and having performed such religious and political acts as are usually executed by the consuls in and around the city, set out for their provinces. Hostilius, to whose lot Macedon had fallen, when he was hastening into Thessaly, to join the army there, entered Epirus, which had not yet openly revolted, and was very near falling into the hands of Perseus. For one Theodotus and Philostratus, under the impression that, if they would deliver him up to the king, they would receive great favour from Perseus. And, besides, would strike a very severe blow against the Romans at the time, sent letters to the king, desiring him to come up with all the speed he could. And were it not that Perseus was retained by delay, thrown in his way by the Molossians, at the passage of the river Laos, and that the consul, being informed of his danger, had changed his intended route. There was not a possibility of his escaping. Therefore, having left Epirus, he sailed to Antisyra, and from the latter place proceeded to Thessaly. Having received the command of the army there, he marched at once against the enemy. But he was not a whit more successful in the operations of the war than his predecessor. For having engaged in battle with the king, he was beaten, and when at first he attempted to force his way through Elimea, and afterwards to march secretly through Thessaly, he was compelled to desist from his useless attempts. As Perseus anticipated all his maneuvers. Nor did Hortensius the praetor, to whom the fleet had fallen, carry on any of his operations with sufficient skill or success, for none of his acts deserves better to be remembered than his cruel and perfidious plundering of the city of the Abderdes. When they endeavoured to avert, by entreaty, the intolerable burdens imposed on them. Perseus, therefore, now despising the Romans, as if he were completely at leisure and disengaged, made an incursion, for the purpose of gaining a fresh wreath of laurel, against the Dardanians, and having slain ten thousand of the barbarians. Bore away great booty. 4. In this year the Celtiberians made some warlike motions in Spain, at the instigation of a strange leader named Olonicus, some give him the name of Salindicus. He was a man of great cunning and boldness, and brandishing a silver spear, which he pretended was sent to him from heaven, with the agitation of a person inspired, he attracted universal attention. But when he, with corresponding rashness, had approached the camp of the Roman praetor, in the dusk of the evening, with the intention of slaying him, bringing with him an associate in his mad enterprise, he was killed, near the very tent. By a sentinel with a javelin, his companion paid the same penalty for his foolish undertaking. The praetor immediately ordered both their heads to be cut off and fixed on spears, 
and then given to some of the prisoners to bear to their countrymen. These entering the camp and showing the heads caused such panic, that if the Romans had instantly advanced to the camp they might have taken it. As it was, a general flight took place. And some were of opinion that ambassadors should be sent to supplicate for peace. While a great number of states, on hearing this intelligence, surrendered, and when the praetor had given pardon to them while endeavouring to excuse themselves. And laying all the blame on the madness of the two individuals who had voluntarily offered themselves for punishment, he proceeded immediately to the other states, every one of which acknowledged his authority, and he passed with his army in peace. Without doing any injury, through the tract of country where before the flames of war raged with the utmost fury. This mercy shown by the praetor, by which he overcame without bloodshed a very savage people, was the more pleasing to the senate and people. As the war had been conducted in Greece both by the consul Licinius and the praetor Lucretius with uncommon avarice and cruelty. The plebeian tribunes, daily in their speeches to the people, censured Lucretius for being absent, though it was alleged in his favour that he was abroad on the business of the public. But so little was then known of what passed, even in the vicinity of Rome, that he was, at that very time, at his own estate near Antium, and with money amassed in his expedition, was bringing water thither from the river Lorisina. He is said to have contracted for the execution of this work at the expense of 130,000 asses. Point 326 He also decorated the temple of Aesculapius with pictures taken from among the spoils. But ambassadors from Abderet diverted the public displeasure, and the consequent disgrace, from Lucretius to his successor. These stood weeping at the door of the senate house, and complained, that, their town had been stormed and plundered by Hortensius. His only reason, they said, for destroying their city was, that, on his demanding from them 100,000 denariuses, 327 and 50,000 measures of wheat, they had requested time until they could send ambassadors on the subject. Both to the consul Hostilius, and to Rome. And that they had scarcely reached the consul, when they heard that the town was stormed, their nobles beheaded, and the rest sold for slaves. This act appeared to the senate deserving their indignation, and they passed the same decree respecting the people of Abdera as they had passed concerning the Coronians. They also ordered Quintus Manius, the praetor, to publish the notice in a general assembly, as had been done the year before. Two ambassadors, Caius Sempronius Blasius and Sextus Julius Caesar, were sent to restore the Abderites to liberty and were likewise commissioned to deliver a message from the senate to the consul Hostilius, and to the praetor Hortensius, that the senate judged the war made on the Abderites to be unjust, and had directed that all those who were in servitude should be sought out and restored to liberty. 5. At the same time, complaints were laid before the senate against Caius Cassius, who had been consul the year before, and was then a military tribune in Macedon, under Aulus Hostilius, and ambassadors came from Sincibilis, a king of the Gauls. His brother made a speech to the Senate, complaining that Caius Cassius had entirely wasted the country of the Alpine Gauls, their allies, and carried off into slavery many thousands of their people. Ambassadors came at the same time from the Carnians, Istrians, and Iapidans, who represented, that at first guides had been demanded from them by the consul, Cassius, to point out the road to him leading his army into Macedon, that he had parted from them in a peaceable manner, as if to carry war elsewhere. But afterwards, when he had proceeded halfway, he returned, and overran their country in a hostile manner, spreading depredations and fires through every quarter. Nor had they as yet been able to discover for what reason they were treated as enemies by the consul. The following answer was returned to the absent prince of the Gauls, and the states present, that, the Senate had no previous knowledge of those acts of which they complained, nor did they approve of them if they did take place. But that it would still be unjust to condemn, unheard and absent, a man of consular rank, especially as he was employed abroad in the business of the public. That, when Caius Cassius should come home from Macedonia, if they chose then to prosecute their complaints against him, in his presence, the Senate, after examining the matter, would endeavour to give them satisfaction. It was further resolved, that not only a verbal answer should be given, but that ambassadors should be also sent to those nations, two to the Transalpine chieftain, and three to the other states, to notify to them the determinations of the Senate. 
they voted, that presents, to the amount of 2,000 asses, 328 should be sent to the ambassadors, and to the prince, and his brother, some of extraordinary value, two chains made of gold, and weighing five pounds. Five silver vases, amounting to twenty pounds weight, two horses, fully caparisoned, with grooms to attend them, and horsemen's armor and cloaks, besides suits of apparel to their attendants, both freemen and slaves. These were presented to them. And, on their request, permission was given to each of them to purchase ten horses, and convey them out of Italy. Caius Laelius and Marcus Aemilius were sent ambassadors with the Gauls, to the regions on the northern side of the Alps. And Caius Sicinius, Publius Cornelius Blasio, and Titus Memmius, to the other states. 6. Embassies from many states of Greece and Asia arrived at Rome at the same time. The first that had audience of the Senate were the Athenians, who represented, that, they had sent what ships and soldiers they had to the consul Publius Licinius, and the praetor Caius Lucretius, who did not think proper to employ their forces. But ordered the state to furnish one hundred thousand measures of corn. And, notwithstanding that they were the cultivators of a sterile soil, and that they fed even the husbandmen with imported grain, yet that they might not appear deficient in their duty, they had made up that quantity. And were ready to perform any other service that might be required of them. The Milesians making no mention of their past services, promised to readily afford any assistance in the war which the Senate should think proper to demand. The Alabandians said, that they had erected a temple to the city of Rome, and instituted anniversary games to her divinity. That they had brought a golden crown, of fifty pounds weight, to be deposited in the capital, as an offering to Jupiter supremely good and great. Also three hundred horsemen's bucklers, which they were ready to deliver to any person appointed to receive them, and they requested permission to lodge the said offering as intended, and to perform sacrifice. Ambassadors from Lampsicus, who brought a crown of eighty pounds weight, made the same request, and represented to the Senate that, they had renounced the party of Perseus as soon as the Roman army arrived in Macedon. Though they had been under the dominion of that monarch, and formerly of Philip. In return for which, and for their having contributed every assistance in their power to the Roman commanders, they only requested to be admitted into the friendship of the Roman people. And that, if peace should be made with Perseus, they should be exempted from falling again into his power. A gracious answer was given to the rest of the ambassadors, and the praetor, Quintus Manius, was ordered to enroll the people of Lampsicus as allies. Presents were made to all, and two thousand asses were given to each. The Alabandians were desired to carry back the bucklers into Macedon, to the consul Aulus Hostilius. At the same time ambassadors came from Africa. Those of the Carthaginians acquainted the Senate that they had brought down to the sea coast a million of measures of wheat, and five hundred thousand of barley, to be transported to whatever place the Senate should order. They were sensible, they said, that this offer, an act of duty, were very inferior to the deserts of the Roman people, and to their own inclinations. But that on many other occasions, when both nations were in favorable circumstances, they had performed the duties of faithful and grateful allies. In like manner, ambassadors from Massinissa offered the same quantity of wheat, one thousand two hundred horsemen, and twelve elephants. Desiring, that if he could be of service in any other particular, the Senate would lay their commands on him, and he would execute them with as much zeal as if he had proposed them himself. Thanks were returned both to the Carthaginians and to the king, and they were requested to send the supplies, which they had promised, into Macedon, to the consul Hostilius. A present of two thousand asses was made to each of the ambassadors. 7. When the ambassadors of the Cretans mentioned that they had sent into Macedon the number of archers which had been demanded by the consul, Publius Licinius, on being interrogated. They did not deny that a greater number of their archers were serving in the army of Perseus than in that of the Romans, on which they received this answer. That, if the Cretans were candidly and sincerely resolved to prefer the friendship of the Roman people to that of King Perseus, the Roman Senate, on their part, would answer them as allies who could be relied on. In the meantime, that they should announce to their countrymen, that the Senate required that the Cretans should endeavor to call home, as soon as possible, all the soldiers who were in the service of King Perseus. 
The Cretans being dismissed, the ambassadors from Chalcis were called, whose embassy seemed to be a matter of extreme necessity, from the very circumstance of their entering the Senate House at all, since Mixion, their chief, having lost the use of his limbs, was introduced on a litter, and either the plea of bad health had not appeared to himself an adequate motive for seeking exemption from duty, though he was in such a distressing state. Or exemption had not been given him at his request. After premising that no other part was alive but his tongue, which served him to deplore the calamities of his country, he represented, first, the friendly assistance given by his state to the Roman commanders and armies. Both on former occasions and in the war with Perseus. And then, the instances of pride, avarice, and cruelty, which his countrymen had suffered from the Roman praetor, Caius Lucretius, and were at that very time suffering from Lucius Hortensius. Notwithstanding which, they were resolved to endure all hardships, should they be even more grievous than they underwent at present, rather than swerve from their allegiance. With regard to Lucretius and Hortensius, they knew that it would have been safer to have shut their gates against them, than to receive them into the city. For those cities which had so done, remained in safety, as Amathia, Amphipolis Moronia, and Enus, whereas, in Chalcis, the temples were robbed of all their ornaments. Caius Lucretius had carried off in ships, to Antium, the plunder amassed by such sacrilege and had dragged persons of free condition into slavery, the property of the allies of the Roman people was subjected to rapine and plunder every day. For Hortensius, pursuing the practice of Caius Lucretius, kept the crews of his ships and lodgings both in summer and winter alike. So that their houses were filled with a crowd of seamen, and those men who showed no regard to propriety, either in their words or actions, lived among the inhabitants, their wives, and children. 8. The Senate resolved to call Lucretius before them, that he might argue the matter in person, and exculpate himself. But when he appeared, he heard many more crimes alleged against him than had been mentioned in his absence. And two more weighty and powerful accusers stood forth in support of the charges, Manius Juventus Thalna and Gnaeus Aufidius, plebeian tribunes. These not only arraigned him bitterly in the Senate, but dragged him out into the assembly of the people, and there, after reproaching him with many heinous crimes, they instituted a legal prosecution against him. By order of the Senate, the praetor, Quintus Manius, gave this answer to the ambassadors of Chalcis, that, the Senate acknowledged their account of the good offices done by them to the Roman people, both on former occasions and during the present war, to be true. And that their conduct met with gratitude, as it ought, that as to the ill-treatment, which they complained of having received formerly from Caius Lucretius, and now from Lucius Hortensius, Roman praetors. Who could suppose that such things were done with the approbation of the Senate, who would consider that the Roman people had made war on Perseus, and, before that, on his father Philip, for the express purpose of asserting the liberties of Greece. And not that their friends and allies should receive such treatment from their magistrates, that they would give them a letter to the praetor, Lucius Hortensius, informing him that the proceedings, of which the people of Chalcis complained, were highly displeasing to the Senate, charging him to take care that all free persons, who had been reduced to slavery, should be sought out as soon as possible, and restored to liberty. And commanding that no seamen, except the masters of vessels, should be permitted to lodge on shore. Pursuant to the Senate's order, a letter to this purport was written to Hortensius. A present of two thousand asses was made to each of the ambassadors, and carriages were hired for Mixion, at the public expense, to carry him commodiously to Brundusium. When the day of Caius Lucretius's trial came, the tribunes pleaded against him before the people, and demanded that he should be fined in the sum of one million of asses. 329 and an assembly of the people being held, every one of the thirty-five pronounced him guilty. 9. In Liguria, nothing worthy of record occurred in that year. For the enemy made no hostile attempt, nor did the consul march his legions into their country. On the contrary, having made himself sure that there would be peace that year, he discharged the soldiers of the two Roman legions within sixty days after his arrival in the province. Sent the troops of the Latin confederates early into winter quarters at Luna and Pisi, and himself, with the cavalry, visited most of the towns in the Gallic province. 
Although there was no open war anywhere but in Macedon, yet the Romans suspected Gentius, king of Illyria. The Senate, therefore, voted that eight ships, fully equipped, should be sent from Brundusium to Issa, to Caius Furius, lieutenant general, who, with only two vessels belonging to the inhabitants, held the government of that island. In this squadron were embarked two thousand soldiers, whom the praetor, Quintus Manius, in pursuance of a decree of the Senate, had raised in the quarter of Italy opposite Illyria. And the consul Hostilius sent Appius Claudius, with four thousand foot, into Illyria, to protect the states that bordered on it. But Appius Claudius, not content with the force which he brought with him, collected aid from the allies, until he armed as many as eight thousand men of different nations. And after overrunning all that country, took post at Lycnidus, in the territory of the Dacerians. 10. Not far from this place was Uscana, a town generally deemed part of the dominions of Perseus. It contained ten thousand inhabitants and a small party of Cretans, who served as a garrison. From this place messengers came secretly, to Claudius, telling him that, if he brought his army nearer, there would be people ready to put the town into his hands, and that it would be well worth his while. For he would satiate with plunder not only his friends, but also his soldiers. The hopes presented to his avarice blinded his understanding to that degree, that he neither detained any of those who came, nor required hostages as a pledge for his security. In a business which was to be transacted clandestinely and treacherously. Neither did he send scouts to examine matters, nor require an oath from the messengers, but, on the day appointed, he left Lycnidus, and pitched his camp twelve miles from the city, which was the object of his design. At the fourth watch he set out, leaving about one thousand men to guard the camp. His forces, in disorder, extending themselves in a long irregular train, and few in number, as they were separated by a mistake in the night, arrived in this state at the city. Their carelessness increased when they saw not a soldier on the walls. But as soon as they approached within a weapon's cast, a sally was made from two gates at once. Besides the shout raised by the sallying party, a tremendous noise was heard on the walls, composed of the yells of women and the sound of brazen instruments, while the rabble of the place, mixed with a multitude of slaves, made the air resound with various cries. Such a number of terrific circumstances, presented to them on all sides, had such an effect, that the Romans were unable to support the first onset of the sallying party. So that a greater number of them were killed in the flight than in the battle, and scarcely two thousand, with the lieutenant general himself, effected their escape. The enemy had the greater opportunity of overtaking the weary Romans, in proportion to their distance from the camp. Appius, without even halting in the camp to collect his scattered troops, which would have been the means of saving many stragglers, led back, directly, to Lycnidus, the remains of his unfortunate army. 11. These and other unfavorable occurrences in Macedon were learned from Sextus Digitius, a military tribune, who came to Rome to perform a sacrifice. The Senate being apprehensive on account of these advices of some greater disgrace ensuing, deputed Marcus Fulvius Flaccus and Marcus Caninius Rebellus to go to Macedon, and bring certain information of what was going on there. At the same time ordering that the consul, Aulus Hostilius, should summon the assembly for the election of consuls, and arrange that it might be held in the month of January, and should come home to the city as soon as possible. In the meantime instructions were given to the praetor, Marcus Recius, to call home to Rome, by proclamation, all the senators from every part of Italy, except such as were absent on public business. And it was resolved that none of those who were in Rome should go further than one mile from the city. All this was done pursuant to the votes of the Senate. The election of consuls was held on the fifth day before the calends of February. Quintus Martius Philippus a second time, and Gnaeus Servilius Cipio, were elected consuls. Three days after, Caius Decimius, Marcus Claudius Marcellus, Caius Sulpicius Gallus, Caius Martius Figulus, Servius Cornelius Lentulus, and Publius Fontius Capito, were chosen praetors. Four other provinces in addition to the two in the city were assigned to the praetors elect, these provinces were Spain, Sardinia, Sicily, and the fleet. Towards the end of February the deputies returned from Macedon, 
and gave an account of the successful enterprises of Perseus during the preceding summer, and of the great fears which had taken possession of the allies of the Roman people. On account of so many cities being reduced under the king's power. They reported, that, the consul's troops were very thin, in consequence of leave of absence being granted to great numbers, with the view of gaining popularity. The blame of which the consul laid upon the military tribunes, and they, on the other hand, on the consul. The Senate understood them to make little of the disgrace sustained through the rashness of Claudius, since they represented that very few soldiers of Italian extraction were lost. The greatest part being the soldiers raised in that country by an irregular levy. The consuls elect received orders, immediately on entering into office, to propose the affairs of Macedon to the consideration of the Senate, and Italy and Macedon were appointed their provinces. An intercalation was made in the calendar of this year, intercalary calends being reckoned on the third day after the feast of Terminus. There died of the priests during this year, Lucius Flaminius, Augur, and two pontiffs, Lucius Furius Philus, and Caius Livius Salinator. In the room of Furius, the pontiffs chose Titus Manlius Torquatus, and in that of Livius, Marcus Servilius. 12. In the beginning of the ensuing year, when the new consuls, Quintus Martius and Gnaeus Servilius, had proposed the distribution of the provinces for consideration, the Senate voted that they should, without delay, either settle between themselves about Macedon and Italy, or cast lots for them. And that, before the lot should decide this matter, and while the destination of each was uncertain, lest interest might have any influence, the supplies of men, which the exigency required for each province, should be ordered. 6,000 Roman foot and 6,000 of the Latin allies, 250 Roman horse and 300 of the allies, were voted for Macedon. The old soldiers were to be discharged, so that there should be in each Roman legion no more than 6,000 foot and 300 horse. The number of Roman citizens, which the other consul was to enlist for a reinforcement, was not precisely determined. There was only this limitation mentioned, that he should raise two legions, each of them to contain 5,200 foot and 300 horse. A larger number of Latin infantry was decreed to him than to his colleague. No less than 10,000 foot, with 600 horse. An order was given for raising four other legions, to serve wherever occasion might require. The consuls were not allowed the appointment of the military tribunes, the people elected them. The confederates of the Latin nation were ordered to furnish 16,000 foot and 1,000 horse. This force was intended only to be kept in readiness, to march out should any exigency demand it. Macedon gave the Senate most anxiety. They ordered, that 1,000 Roman citizens, of the rank of freed men, should be enlisted in Italy, as seamen, to man the fleet, and the same number in Sicily. And instructions were given the praetor, to whose lot the government of the latter province fell, to the effect that he should take care to carry these over to Macedon, to whatever place the fleet should be stationed at. 3,000 Roman foot and 300 horse were voted to recruit the army in Spain. Then also the number of men in each legion was limited to 5,000 foot and 330 horse. Besides these, the praetor, to whose lot Spain should fall, was ordered to levy from the allies 4,000 foot and 300 horse. 13. I am well aware, that, through the same disregard of religion, owing to which the men of the present day generally believe that the gods never give portents of any future events, no prodigies are now either reported to government or recorded in histories. But for my part, while I am writing the transactions of ancient times, my sentiments, I know not how, become antique. And a kind of religious awe prevents me from considering events, which the men of those days, renowned for wisdom, judged deserving of the attention of the state and of public expiation, unworthy of being recorded in my history. From Anagnia two prodigies were reported this year, that a blazing torch was seen in the air, and that a cow spoke, and was maintained at the public expense. About the same time, at Minturni, the sky appeared as in a blaze of fire. At Riate, a shower of stones fell. At Cumi, the image of Apollo, in the citadel, shed tears during three days and three nights. In the city of Rome, two of the keepers of the temples made strange announcements, 
one that in the temple of fortune, a snake, with a mane like that of a horse, had been seen by many. The other, that, in the temple of Fortuna Primogenia on the hill, a palm sprung up in the court, and that a shower of blood fell in the middle of the day. Two prodigies were not attended to, one, because it happened in a place belonging to a private person, Titus Martius Figulus having reported, that a palm sprung up in the inner court of his house. The other, because it occurred in a foreign place, Frigelli, where, in the house of Lucius Arius, a spear which he had bought for his son, who was a soldier, burned, as was said, for more than two hours. And notwithstanding the fire consumed none of it. The Sibylline books were consulted by the Decembers on account of the public prodigies. They directed that the consuls should sacrifice forty of the larger victims to the deities, whom they pointed out, that a supplication should be performed. And that all the magistrates should sacrifice victims of the larger kinds in all the temples, and the people wear garlands. All these acts were performed according to the injunctions of the Decembers. 14. Then the elections were held for the creation of censors. Several of the first men in the state, including Caius Valerius Lavinus, Lucius Postumius Albinus, Publius Mucius Sivola, Marcus Junius Brutus, Caius Claudius Pulcher, and Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, were candidates for this office. The Roman people appointed the two last censors. As, on account of the Macedonian War, greater attention was paid to holding the levy than usual, the consuls made a complaint to the Senate against the plebeians, that even the younger men did not obey their summons. But, in opposition to them, Caius Sulpicius and Marcus Claudius, tribunes of the people, pleaded in favor of the plebeians. Asserting, that, the levying of soldiers was a difficult task, not to the consuls in general, but to such consuls as affected popularity, that no man was made a soldier by them against his inclination. And that the conscript fathers might be convinced of the truth of this, the praetors, who in their office had less power and authority, would, if it seemed good to the senate, complete the levy. That business was accordingly committed to the care of the praetors by an unanimous vote of the senate, not without great murmuring on the part of the consuls. The censors, in order to forward it, published, in a general assembly, the following notice, that, they would make it a rule in conducting the survey, that, besides the common oath taken by all citizens, the younger part should swear in this manner. When challenged, you are younger than forty-six years, and you shall attend at the levy, pursuant to the edict of Caius Claudius and Tiberius Sempronius, censors. And you shall attend at the levy, as often as there shall be a levy held by any magistrate during the aforesaid censor's continuance in office, if you shall not have been already enlisted. Also as there was a report, that many men belonging to the legions in Macedon were absent from the army on furloughs, which did not limit the time, and were granted by the commanders to ingratiate themselves with the soldiers. They issued a proclamation concerning all who had been drafted for Macedon in the consulate of Publius Elius and Caius Papilius, or since that period. That, such as were in Italy should, after being first registered by them in the survey, repair within thirty days to the province in which they served. And that, if any were under the power of a father or grandfather, the names of such should be notified to them. That they would also make inquiry into the cases of the soldiers who had been discharged. And that they would order those, whose discharge should appear to have been obtained through favor, before the regular number of campaigns were served, to be enlisted again. In consequence of this proclamation, and letters from the censors being dispersed through the market towns and villages, such multitudes of young men flocked to Rome, that the extraordinary crowd was even inconvenient to the city. Besides enrolling those whom it was necessary to send as a reinforcement for the armies, for legions were raised by the praetor, Caius Sulpicius, and the levies were completed within eleven days. 15. The consuls then cast lots for their provinces. The praetors, on account of the civil jurisdiction, had determined theirs earlier in the season. The civil jurisdiction had fallen to Caius Sulpicius, the foreign, to Caius Decimius, Marcus Claudius Marcellus had obtained by lot Spain. Servius Cornelius Lentulus, Sicily, Publius Fontius Capito, Sardinia, and Caius Martius Figulus had received the command of the fleet. In the arrangement of the consular provinces, Italy fell to Gnaeus Servilius, and Macedon to Quintus Martius. 
and the latter set out as soon as the Latin festival could be celebrated. Kipio then desired the Senate to direct which two of the new legions he should take with him into Gaul. When they ordered, that the praetors Caius Sulpicius and Marcus Claudius should give the consul such of the legions, which they had raised, as they should think fit. The latter, highly offended at a consul being subjected to the will of praetors, adjourned the senate, and standing at the tribunal of the praetors, demanded, that pursuant to the decree, they should assign him two legions. But the praetors left the consul to his own discretion in selecting them. The censors then called over the list of the senate. Marcus Aemilius Lepidus was now, by the third censors, chosen prince of the senate. Seven were expelled that body. In making the survey of the people, they discovered from the rolls how many of the soldiers belonging to the army in Macedonia were absent, and obliged them all to return to that province. They inquired into the cases of the men who had been discharged. And, when any of their discharges appeared irregular in respect of time, they put the following oath to them, do you truly swear, that you will, without deceit or evasion, return into the province of Macedon, according to the edict of the censors? Caius Claudius and Tiberius Sempronius. 16. In the review of the knights their censorship was very severe and harsh, they deprived many of their horses. And after giving offence to the equestrian order in this matter, they inflamed the general displeasure to a higher degree by an edict, in which they ordered that, no person who had farmed the public revenues or taxes from the censors Quintus Fulvius and Aulus Postumius, should attend their sale, or have any partnership or connection in the contracts then to be made. When the former tax contractors could not prevail on the Senate, by their frequent complaints, to check the power of the censors, at length they found a patron of their cause in Publius Rutilius, a plebeian tribune, who was incensed against the censors in consequence of a dispute about a private concern. They had ordered a client of his, a freedman, to throw down a wall, which stood opposite to a public building in the sacred street, because it was built on ground belonging to the public. The tribunes were appealed to by the citizen. When none of them would interfere, except Rutilius, the censors were sent to seize the property of the citizen, and imposed a fine on him in a public assembly. When the present dispute broke out, and the old revenue farmers had recourse to the tribunes, a bill was suddenly promulgated under the name of one of the tribunes, that, with regard to the public revenues and taxes, which Caius Claudius and Tiberius Sempronius should have hired out, all contracts made by them should be null and void, that they should all be let anew, and that every person, without distinction, should be at liberty to bid for and take them. The tribune appointed the day for an assembly to vote on this bill. When the day came, and the censors stood forth to argue against the order, there was deep silence while Gracchus addressed them, when the voice of Claudius was drowned in the murmurs, he directed the crier to cause silence, that he might be heard. When this was done, the tribune, complaining that the assembly which he had summoned was taken out of his rule, and that he was reduced to a private capacity, retired from the capital, where the assembly met. Next day he raised a violent commotion. In the first place, he declared the property of Tiberius Gracchus forfeited to the gods, because he, by fining and seizing the goods of a person who had appealed to a tribune, and by refusing to admit the tribune's right of protesting, had reduced him to a private capacity. He instituted a criminal process against Caius Claudius because he had summoned the assembly away from him, and declared his intention of prosecuting both the censors for treason. And he demanded of Caius Sulpicius, the city praetor, that he would fix a day for an assembly to try them. As the censors offered no objection to the people passing their sentence on them as soon as they pleased, their trial for treason was fixed to come the eighth and seventh days before the calends of October. The censors went up immediately to the Temple of Liberty, where they sealed the books of the public accounts, shut up the office, and dismissed the clerks. Affirming, that they would do no kind of public business until the sentence of the people was passed on them. Claudius was first brought to trial. And after eight out of the eighteen centuries of knights, and many others of the first class, had given sentence against him, the principal men in the state, immediately taking off their gold rings, in the sight of the people, put on mourning. In order that they might suppliantly solicit the commons in his favor. Yet, it is said, 
that Gracchus was the chief means of making a change in their sentiments. For when shouts arose from the commons on all sides that Gracchus was in no danger, he took a formal oath, that if his colleague were condemned, he would be his companion in exile, without waiting for their judgment concerning himself. After all, the case of the accused was so near being desperate, that the votes of eight centuries only were wanting to condemn him. When Claudius was acquitted, the tribune said, that he would not delay Gracchus. 17. This year, when the ambassadors of the Aquilians demanded that the number of the colonists should be increased, 1,500 families were enrolled by a decree of the Senate. And Titus Annius Luscus, Publius Decius Subulo, and Marcus Cornelius Cephagus, were appointed commissioners to conduct them. During the same year, Caius Papilius and Gnaeus Octavius, who had been sent ambassadors into Greece, read, first at Thebes, and afterwards carried about to all the other states of Peloponnesus, a decree, ordering that no person should furnish the Roman magistrates with anything for the use of the war, except what the Senate should determine. This afforded the Allies a pleasing confidence, with regard to the future also, that they would be relieved from the heavy burdens and expenses, by which they were exhausted, in consequence of the various demands of those magistrates. In the Council of Achaia, held at Aegeum, the ambassadors spoke, and were heard with sentiments of mutual esteem and affection, and then, leaving that faithful nation in confident assurance of lasting prosperity, they crossed over to Aetolia. No civil war had yet broke out in that country, but all places were full of suspicion and mutual recrimination. The ambassadors having demanded hostages on account of these disputes, set out from this place to Acarnania, without putting an end to the evil. The Acarnanians gave to the ambassadors an audience of their general council at Therium. Here, too, there was a struggle between opposite factions, some of the nobles required that garrisons might be placed in their cities, to protect them against the madness of those who were endeavouring to bring the nation over to the Macedonians. And others objected to the measure, lest peaceful and allied cities should receive such an insult, as was usually offered only to towns taken in war, or engaged in hostilities. Their objection was reckoned reasonable. The ambassadors returned to Larissa, to Hostilius, for by him they had been sent. He kept Octavius with him, and sent Papilius, with about a thousand soldiers, into winter quarters at Ambracia. 18. Perseus did not venture, at the commencement of winter, to go out of the limits of Macedon, lest the Romans might make an eruption into the kingdom by some unguarded quarter. But on the approach of the winter solstice, when the depth of the snow renders the mountains between it and Thessaly impassable, he thought the season favourable for crushing the hopes and spirits of his neighbours. Lest any danger should be lurking there, while his attention was turned to the Romans. Since Codes afforded him security in the direction of Thrace, and Cephalus, by his sudden revolt from the Romans, freed him from uneasiness on the side of Epirus, and his late expedition had subdued the Dardanians. He considered that Macedon was only exposed on the side next to Illyria, the Illyrians themselves being in motion, and having offered a free passage to the Romans, hoping, however, that if he reduced the nearest tribes of Illyrians, Gentius himself, who had long been wavering, might be brought into alliance with him, he set out at the head of ten thousand foot, the greater part of whom were soldiers of the phalanx, two thousand light infantry, and five hundred horse, and proceeded to Stabera. Having there supplied himself with corn sufficient for many days, and ordered every requisite for besieging towns to be sent after him, he encamped on the third day before Ascana, the largest city in the Panestian country. Before he employed force, he sent emissaries to sound the dispositions, sometimes of the commanders of the garrison, sometimes of the inhabitants, for, besides some troops of Illyrians, there was a Roman garrison in the place. When his emissaries brought back no friendly message, he resolved to attack the town, and made an attempt to take it by a line of circumvallation formed of troops. But though his men, relieving one another, continued without intermission, either by day or night, some to apply ladders to the walls, others to attempt to set fire to the gates, yet the defenders of the city sustained that shock. For they had hopes that the Macedonians would not be able to endure any longer the severity of the winter in the open field. And besides, that the king would not have so long a respite from the war with Rome, that he would be able to stay there. 
But, when they saw the machines in motion, and towers erected, their resolution was overcome. For, besides that they were unequal to a contest with his force, they had not a sufficient store of corn, or any other necessary, as they had not expected a siege. Therefore when they had no hopes of being able to hold out, Caius Carvilius Spoletinus and Caius Afranius were sent by the Roman garrison to request from Perseus, first, to allow the troops to march out with their arms. And to carry their effects with them. And then, if they could not obtain that, to receive his promise of their lives and liberty. The king promised more generously than he performed. For, after desiring them to march out with their effects, the first thing he did was to take away their arms. As soon as they left the city, both the cohort of Illyrians, five hundred in number, and the inhabitants of Ascana, immediately surrendered themselves and the city. 19. Perseus, placing a garrison in Ascana, carried away to Stubera the whole multitude of prisoners, almost equal to his army in number. He then distributed the Romans, who amounted to four thousand, besides officers, among several cities, to be kept in custody. And, having sold the Ascanians and Illyrians, led back his army to Panestia, to reduce the city of Oenius, the town is advantageously situated in other respects, and besides, in that direction there is a passage into the country of the Labiations. Where Gentius was king. As he passed by a fort, named Drodicum, which was full of men, one of the persons, well acquainted with the country, told him that, there was no use in taking Oenius unless he had Drodicum in his power. For the latter was situated more advantageously in every respect. When his army was brought against it, the garrison surrendered unanimously and at once. Encouraged by the surrender of this place, which was earlier than he hoped, and perceiving what terrors his march diffused, by taking advantage of the like fears, he reduced eleven other forts to submission. Against a very few he had occasion to use force, the rest submitted voluntarily, among whom one thousand five hundred Roman soldiers were taken, who had been divided among the Roman garrisons. Carvilius Spoletinus was very serviceable to him in his conferences with the garrison, by declaring that no severity had been shown to his own party. At length he arrived at Oenius, which could not be taken without a regular siege. The town possessed a much greater number of young men than the others, and was strong in its fortifications. It was enclosed on one side by a river called Artatus, and on another by a very high mountain of difficult access. These circumstances gave the inhabitants courage to make resistance. Perseus, having drawn lines of circumvallation, began, on the higher ground, to raise a mound, which he intended should exceed the wall in height. By the time that this work was completed, the besieged, in their many actions, when sallying out to defend their works, or to obstruct those of the enemy, had lost great numbers by various chances. While the survivors were rendered useless by wounds, and by continual labor both in the day and night. As soon as the mound was brought close to the wall, the royal cohort, the men of which are called Nicators, rushed from it into the town, while an assault was made by Scalade in many places at once. All the males, who had reached the age of puberty, were put to the sword, their wives and children were thrown into confinement, and everything else was given as booty to the soldiers. Returning thence victorious to Stabera, he sent, as ambassadors to Gentius, Pluratus, an Illyrian, who lived in exile at his court, and Adeus, a Macedonian, from Beroia. He gave them instructions to represent his exploits against the Romans and Dardanians during the preceding summer and winter, and to add the recent operations of his winter campaign in Illyria. And to exhort Gentius to unite with him and the Macedonians in a treaty of friendship. 20. They crossed over the top of Mount Scordus, and through desert tracts of Illyria, which the Macedonians had laid waste, for the purpose of preventing the Dardanians from passing easily into Illyria or Macedon. And, at length, after undergoing prodigious fatigue, arrived at Skadra. King Gentius was at Lysus. To which place the ambassadors were invited, and received a favorable audience while stating their instructions, but obtained an indecisive answer, that he wanted not inclination to go to war with the Romans. But was in extreme want of money to enable him to enter on such an undertaking, though he wished to do so. This answer they brought to the king at Stubera, 
whilst he was engaged in selling the Illyrian prisoners. The same ambassadors were immediately sent back, with an accession to their numbers in Glaucius, one of his bodyguards, but without any mention of money, the only thing by which the needy barbarian could be induced to take a part in the war. Then Perseus, after ravaging in Syra, led back his army once more into Panestia, and having strengthened the garrison of Uscana, and the surrounding fortresses which he had taken, he retired into Macedon. 21. Lucius Celius, a Roman lieutenant general, commanded at that time in Illyria. While the king was in that country he did not venture to stir, but, on his departure, he made an attempt to recover Ascana, in Panestia. In which being repulsed, with great loss, by the Macedonian garrison, he led back his forces to Lycnidus. In a short time after he sent Marcus Trebellius Fregellanus, with a very strong force, into Panestia, to receive hostages from the cities which had faithfully remained in friendship. He ordered him, also, to march on to the Parthenians, who had likewise covenanted to give hostages, which were received from both nations without any trouble, those of the Panestians were sent to Apollonia. Those of the Parthenians, to Dyrrhachium, then more generally called by the Greeks Epidamnus. Appius Claudius, wishing to repair the disgrace which he had suffered in Illyria, made an attack on Phanot, a fortress of Epirus. Bringing with him, besides the Roman troops, Athamanian and Thesprotian auxiliaries, to the amount of six thousand men. Nor did he gain any advantage to recompense his exertion, for Clevas, who had been left there with a strong garrison, effectually defended the place. Perseus marched to Elymea, and, after reviewing his army in the vicinity of that town, led it to Stratus, in compliance with an invitation of the Epirotes. Stratus was then the strongest city in Aetolia. It stands on the Ambracian Gulf, near the river Inachus. Thither he marched with ten thousand foot and three hundred horse, for, on account of the narrowness and ruggedness of the roads, he led a smaller army than he would otherwise have done. On the third day he came to Mount Sidium, which he could scarcely climb over, by reason of the depth of the snow, and with difficulty found even a place for his camp. Leaving that spot, rather because he could not conveniently stay, than that either the road or the weather was tolerable, the army, after suffering severe hardships, which fell heaviest on the beasts of burden. Encamped on the second day at the temple of Jupiter, called Nicaeus. After a very long march thence, he halted at the river Arachthus, being detained there by the depth of the water, during the time in which a bridge was being constructed. He then led over his army, and, having proceeded one day's march, met Archidamus, an Aetolian of distinction, who proposed delivering Stratus into his hands. 22. On that day Perseus encamped at the borders of the Aetolian territory. And, on the next, arrived before Stratus, where, pitching his camp near the river Achilles, he expected that the Aetolians would come in crowds to put themselves under his protection. But on the contrary, he found the gates shut, and discovered that the very night on which he arrived, a Roman garrison, under Caius Papilius, lieutenant general, had been received into the town. The nobles, who, induced by the authority of Archidamus, while he was present, had invited the king, as soon as he went out to meet Perseus had become less zealous, and had given an opportunity to the opposite faction to call in Papilius. With one thousand foot, from Ambracia. At the same juncture came also Denarchus, general of the Aetolian cavalry, with six hundred foot and one hundred horse. It was well known that he came to Stratus intending to act with Perseus. But that, with the change of fortune, he had changed his mind, and joined the Romans, against whom he had come. Nor was Papilius less on his guard than he ought to be among people of such fickle tempers. He immediately took into his own keeping the keys of the gates, with the direction of the guard of the walls, and removed Denarchus and the Aetolians, together with the young men of Stratus, into the citadel, under pretense of garrisoning it. Perseus sounded the garrison, by addressing them from the eminences that hung over the upper part of the city, and finding that they were obstinate, and even kept him at a distance with weapons. Removed his camp to the other side of the river Petitaris, about five miles from the town, there he held a council, wherein Archidamus and the refugees from Epirus were for detaining him there. 
but the Macedonian nobles were of opinion that he ought not to fight against the severity of the season without having magazines of provisions. In which case the besiegers would feel a scarcity sooner than the besieged, especially as the winter quarters of the enemy were at no great distance, being deterred by these considerations, he removed his camp into Aparantia. The Aparantians, in consequence of the great interest and influence which Archidamus possessed among them, submitted to Perseus with universal consent, and Archidamus himself was appointed their governor, with a body of eight hundred soldiers. 23. The king then returned into Macedon with his men and horses, not less harassed than they had been in their advance to Stratus. However, the report of Perseus's march to that place obliged Appius to raise the siege of Phanote. Clevas, with a body of active young men, pursued him to the foot of some mountains, which formed a defile almost impassable, killed one thousand men of his disordered troops, and took two hundred prisoners. Appius, when he got clear of the defile, encamped for a few days in a plain named Melion. Meanwhile Clevas, being joined by Philostratus, who was invested with the chief power among the nation of the Epirotes, proceeded over the mountains into the lands of Antigonia. The Macedonian setting out to plunder, Philostratus, with his division, posted himself in ambush, in a place where he could not be seen. When the troops at Antigonia sallied out against the straggling plunderers, they pursued them in their flight with too great eagerness, until they precipitated themselves into the valley which was beset by the enemy, who killed one thousand and made about one hundred prisoners. Being thus successful everywhere, they encamped near the post of Appius, in order to prevent the Roman army from offering any violence to their allies. Appius, as he was wasting time there to no purpose, dismissed the Chaunian and other Epirotes, and with his Italian soldiers marched back to Illyria. Then sending the troops to their several winter quarters, in the confederate cities of the Parthenians, he went home to Rome on account of a sacrifice. Perseus recalled from the nation of the Panestians one thousand foot and two hundred horse, and sent them to garrison Cassandria. His ambassadors returned from Gentius with the same answer as before. Still he did not cease from soliciting him, but sent embassy after embassy. Yet, notwithstanding that he was sensible of the powerful support he would find in Gentius, the Macedonian could not prevail on himself to expend money on the business, although it was to him a question of vital importance. 